this way and uh, looks like the festival. I don't even have a microphone. Okay, let's see if this microphone is live and working. That would help, wouldn't it? And then try to establish a call that would tether me. Okay. Let's see what we can do. Hello. He may even have answered by now. I wouldn't know. I don't have the earbuds in. Let me put them in. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, you're a lifesaver. Okay, you know what to do. It's all yours. Stage jobs. Gotcha. <laughs> Call everybody. Uh, Amanda, I you in particular. To... Let's see if we can get her. And uh, if all else fails, uh, we should have Salmon and some of the regulars. And in the interim, let's see if I can fuck this all up. Give me just a second here to do my best to do that. I'm going to go mute it so that I don't embarrass us all. Give me a second here. Uh... All right. So, hello, everyone. Uh, we have someone <laughs> else on call beside myself. You do? We will just pretty much belittle and berate the human race for our failure. Oh, God, God, not do that. Jesus Christ. We, we lost all our numbers last time. That was. Uh, I'm, uh, okay. I'm just joking. Understood, understood. And, Salman, uh, yeah, do you introduce I, yourself, I, sir, I, before I go mute? Asalaamu Alaikum, Brother Douglas. I come with the greetings of peace and love for you, Brother Jamo, and all of our brothers and sisters of Team Dietrich. I come in peace and love for all. God bless you, and thank you so much. Uh, I dearly appreciate that wonderful, peaceful uh, intonation that uh, is a blessing in and of itself that our man Salman Sheikh uh, utters, uh, before, you know, pretty much to help us open. And uh, what I'm going to do, Salman, is uh, remind you, because I'm going to endeavor to remember, but I'll probably forget, your envelope arrived. Uh, so probably arrived yesterday, and so I haven't had a chance to open it yet. Uh, but I do know that Salman has uh, provided uh, financial assistance, uh, probably, if I remember correctly, he sent a $100 check this month, so I will provide him a shout-out in the uh, time that I usually provide the shout-outs, but I just want to get that out of the way right now in case I forget, <laughs> in case something happens, so that he knows at least that I got the envelope. <laughs> Thank you, Brother Douglas, yeah. and I encourage uh, all of our listeners and those that love D Douglas Dietrich, please support him weekly, bi-weekly, monthly with check, money order, PayPal, because he is our brother and we're on this fight against the enemy. And I also use my Sufi energies to expel all of the NSA interlopers. God bless you. I mean, that's so appreciated. And, uh, and, and, and it's all quite real. I do want people to understand this. Uh, I published a promotional banner. I'll go into this later. And uh, for the first time, I actually uh, provided a photograph of my psychologist. This is in disambiguation from my psychiatrist. And um, she almost, uh, she, she essentially participated in allowing that because it's almost like um, just an act of defiance because the enemy already knows her name. And uh, she's quite well aware that much of what I speak to her about, well, essentially all of it is true, but uh, she, of course, is confronted with the more occult aspects, and that's very, how would I say it? Any psychiatrist has to interpret that via via their training, their culture, there's several combinations, their personal experience. Uh, whether or not she accepts that or interprets that from a psychological perspective, uh, she's come to realize over the years is really a moot point. <laughs> Rather, the, the real point is that she suffers from harassment and terrorism from Richard K. Cole Jr. and the other people who try to terrorize everyone that I know, and therefore certainly knows that the gang stalking is very real. Um, and in that sense, it's almost uh, allowed uh, her, uh, her photograph to be published just because of defiance. I mean, they already know everything about her. Uh, the same thing that Richard K. Cole Jr. always does with everyone is he doxes them. He publishes all of their social security numbers, all of their phone numbers, all of their addresses, all of their credit history. He has all of this, of course, through the NSA connections of Michael Aquino. And even after Michael Aquino's death, the resources of the federal government are his. And uh, this is a man who gets paid to stay at home all day and fuck his dogs, which is what he's bragged about doing, and just terrorize uh, myself and everyone that I know. And uh, this is what he does 24 hours a day and reaches out to other white trash pieces of shit who will join him in that terrorist campaign. 
Uh, one of the people who fell for that being, uh, of course, uh, the uh, individual whose name I purged out of my mind, uh, the Mormon character, David J. West, David John West, uh, who decided he was going to publish uh, the book Vampirology. But uh, thank the gods of my ancestors, he, he rattled before he struck and actually published a, a bunch of uh, crap on uh, the blog spot of Richard K. Cole Jr. that... Uh, uh, the book that I had published was never published, and therefore it was all like something that he had total control over. So that's why uh, he, Mr. Moon and I had to publish just half the book. We published essentially half the book just to get it out there. Uh, and that was all the physiological aspects of the notes that I had uh, taken from the intelligence agency years ago, decades at this point, like maybe well certainly around 30 years ago and uh when and those themselves were uh, a product of the 60s the 70s so we're talking about they're almost half a century old at this point and um when it came to barely averting that catastrophe because of the arrogance of the enemy um then uh we count on you of course to buy enough copies of that book so we can fully publish the rest of it at uh, some point in the future hopefully sooner rather than later and um that will take care of that i alluded to that with our latest transmission so do review that uh also uh I'll, I'll bring up later on the transmission something i never technically realized before because of course i learn about production as i go along and um, i'm a creature of the 20th century and this is not my technology. So uh, it's only recently I've learned how to correctly timestamp the episodes, which I had not been doing. And um, no one ever corrected me on that. So I guess no one else noticed it. And so uh, you, the, I, I correctly timestamped. I went back and timestamped uh, maybe a, yeah, about 20 episodes, maybe, you know, a dozen. But I'll try and do that with the rest that are timestamped. I'll try and correctly timestamp them just by adding two further zeros to intimate the seconds that actually brings the timestamp to the correct time in the video, which I was not doing. I was thinking in hours and minutes, but the video works down to seconds, which in the old days when this sort of thing started, I, I don't remember it doing that. Uh, so whether my memory is correct or not doesn't matter. That's the way it's been working for quite some time now. So nobody was able to actually, if they were using the timestamps to hear my episodes, they were going into just minutes into the episode as opposed to the hours when I started. So uh, probably no one's ever brought that to my attention because no one ever used the timestamps or they just said, fuck it. And they just listened to the whole episode in the background anyway and just turned it off for uh, all 12 hours. Yeah, that's what I generally do. I generally mm -hmm. listen to the entire episode from start to finish um, right. Right. when as, I'm doing reviews. That makes sense. As, as opposed to doing, you know, listening towards the monologues or something, because no one ever pointed that out. Uh, it's just like a lot of times people will still compliment me on the Vampirology book, even though half the text is mixing. <laughs> no one seems aware of that because it is such a technical uh, piece of work. Uh, but really, the history is missing. All the physiology is there, or the overwhelming majority of it, but the majority of the history of the book is missing. How the vampires, were, as a subspecies, were identified and isolated by uh, the former Soviet Union, etc. So uh, all of this is, is quite important because, for whatever reason, um, Peter Moon's been going a lot into vampires lately and a lot about the Christianity involved with my subspecies. And uh, in terms of himself, he has left me a message saying he will be available at 9 o'clock. He intends to be home at 9 o'clock, so we will attempt to call him. Doubtless we'll get an update at that time, uh, but he is, I believe, in Montauk. So um, he's supposed to be in Montauk and then returning home by the regular time, Eastern Standard Time, that which we call him. So uh, all of that being said... I presume all of the normal calls have been made. I'm going to allow uh, yes, yeah, Jason and Salman to dominate the stage for a little bit while I try and get my act together, and then further introduce people into uh, some of what's uh, been going on. Uh, nothing negative in terms of the New Year. Thank God the Asian Lunar New Year has had me heavily preoccupied. I took some uh, time from all of that to actually continually check into online because my psychologist was wanting to see how that works. She was invited to the estates with myself. This was actually the first time in her life she's ever been to some of these places. 
And uh, this was because um, it was Asian Lunar New Year, and she finally acquiesced to uh, visiting the places herself with me because uh, it's Asian Lunar New Year, and we were having these celebrations. And um, so she wanted to see me in action a bit on the computer, and we did um, publish a birthday card and poem, which I worked on, for Amanda Yu. And so Amanda Yu, of course, had her birthday recently and was going through all the excitement involved with that. Um, other than that, uh, what I'll do is uh, try my best to make tonight's transmission worthwhile. Uh, obviously, I feel under the pressure because uh, the marvelous Jojo, shout out to her, and we'll give shout outs again later, was saying how much she was looking forward to tonight. And uh, for the life of me, uh, it's one of those things that when somebody says that, oh my God, I feel like, well, I've got to, you know, say something that's uh, not just news analysis. So I'll try to be a bit more cultural tonight because many people come here for that as opposed to the news analysis. I do notice that when I concentrate heavily on the geopolitics, people really aren't interested in that, which is kind of distressing to myself because that yeah, is my it's, Yeah, it's, it's equally distressing to me because that's that's one of the things I, I that's one of the reasons why I started listening to you regularly. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, my God. Well, I better get the the uh, production screen up and all the rest of that. Um, holy shit. It always just feels so weird when I do that belatedly. But uh, such is the nature of the beast. And I'll do that. And if worse comes to worse uh, and um, you do need uh, to somebody to just kind of uh, fill in some airtime, don't be afraid to call Penny. And, uh, you know, if she's unable to come on, we might do that again later. Um, depends on how, you know, revved up I get towards the evening in terms of being able to speak or, um, uh, you know, occupy bandwidth myself. But um, we'll, we'll, we'll make it work. And in the meantime, uh, my love to both of these gentlemen, it wouldn't be possible without them. Our friend Salman Sheikh has done a bit of investigation into Chinese culture further than he's gone before. And uh, I mean, he's gone very deeply into many of these areas. And uh, he's talked about Chinese Freemasonry and how different it is. And I think his, uh, one of his episodes recently, well, he's going to talk about that and get Jameson started in, you know, a, a kind of direction. And, you know, at least that's a start. And he'll certainly talk about where people can access his episodes. So again, Salman, if you will come on the stage while I go mute, tell people how they can access your yes, channel. Yes, Brother Douglas. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, thank, thank you. Uh, you know, first I would like to say for my New Year's resolution for Asian Lunar New Year and the Year of the Tiger is for all the Pakistani men to stop messaging Brother Douglas. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, uh, I, I learned a lot. I was so honored uh, because one of my friends here from Philadelphia, Chinatown, he's from a, uh, a family that comes from a lot of these, um, how do you say it, um, this background of Chinese Freemasonry. And he was able to come on my platform and talk about these different dynasties and how basically it all goes back to the Ming Dynasty the societies of earth, man, and heaven, and I was able to learn about uh, the Sun Yi On and about the, the 14K and the three incense sticks, the white lotus societies. So it shows you that even in the word of the, the world of the triad, earth, man, and heaven, you have all these different groups and societies, but it all goes back to the, the Ming dynasty. So it, it gave me a different appreciation for Chinese culture, how basically... <clears throat> There were these groups that were there for the aspect of self-mastery, self-mastery, self-improvement, and all this stuff was already there. What, what we know as Freemasonry in the West today was already being done by the Chinese in terms of esoteric knowledge and so much uh, cultural trades and routes that even Prince Shotoku from Japan was inspired by Confucius philosophy. So it, it gave me a very deep appreciation for the Chinese peoples and their legacy and what they're doing to this day. And it, it showed me the triad from a different perception, not what the West shows you, like uh, from a criminal perspective, but it gave me a deeper appreciation for who these people are and what kind of culture that they're trying to protect as time goes on in these ever-changing times that we're in. And even if you look at the, the Masonic symbolism of the square and the compass, which is the, the symbol of the, uh, the fraternity, if you look at the god, the god and goddess Nuba and Fuxi, that originates from there, where one is holding the square, one is holding the compass. And it's basically one body of God divided into a mirror. Sorry about that. Go on. One body the of androgynous. 
Yeah. Do you hear me, Brother Douglas? I, I can. I'm sorry. I was turning on the screensaver, and that brings a lot of <laughs> white noise with it. So I, I silenced that immediately. So uh, continue. Uh, we're talking about, uh, of course, the fact that the triads were organized uh, in a uh, manner that the communists on the mainland would interpret them as primitive revolutionaries, quote unquote. In other words, that they were acting against uh, many of the occupational dynasties that came later it as the Mongols and the Manchus. They served as kind of a resistance network. And in that sense, the communists try and, um, shall we say, co-opt them or uh, appropriate their history as to part of the natural quote-unquote evolution towards the collectivization of the mainland. Uh, but uh, what you're speaking of is something that's far more ancient than that. And that brings us back to the goddess. So please um, start from there again. Thank you. Yes, Brother Douglas, and uh, thank you for that. And it, again, it showed me a deeper appreciation for the Chinese peoples and culture as I saw Nuwa and Fuxi, this one godhead separated into a male and female form but connected to the same source, that one is holding the Masonic square, one is holding the Masonic compass, and together they're recreating this world. But if you look at, uh, let's say, the Western version of Freemasonry, they would tell you that it originated with the, um, the stone builders and the stone cathedrals in Europe. So that's like a Eurocentric uh, white version of the, um, the history. But all this stuff in terms of the initiatic experience, the symbolism, self-mastery, becoming a master of self and the elements around you. It was I, I, uh, the Chinese already had it since day one. And it makes me appreciate how a lot of these cultures are still preserved in terms of Chinese Freemasons being in Philadelphia, in New York, in San Francisco. Uh, I even saw them when I was in London, in, the, in Chinatown, London. So that culture has been beautifully preserved. And it, it showed me because when the word triad is mentioned, you just think of one group. So when I found out about Sun Yi On and 14K and uh, these different groups like Three Incense Sticks and White Lotus Society, it just shows you like the jurisprudence even within the triad community where it's all they're all working for the same goal but everyone i believe has their own interpretation so that gave me um a, another appreciation for the chinese culture and the aspect of confucian philosophy which is uh, respect for your neighbors respect for your elders for yourself preserving the integrity of your neighborhoods and even here in Philadelphia, when a lot of the Asian students were getting jumped and beaten up because of the uh, the COVID stuff that was going on, all the racism, uh, it was the Chinese Freemasons and their security teams that made sure that they set up security teams in Philadelphia Chinatown. So the elderly would not be getting attacked. So the kids coming from high school would not be getting attacked. So they, they do a lot of good for the community and a lot, a lot of their line dances that they do every Lunar New Year. And a lot of the charity that they do, teaching kids self-defense, charity for the community. So it shows you that these societies, from how, how ancient it goes back, even what Brother Douglas has taught us, to this very day, are still preserving this tradition in terms of so much anti-Asian racism that we're seeing in this country. So I, I was very grateful to see the concept of Earth, Man, and Heaven, which is basically, you have the, our Earth. And man as man as a species, and then you have heaven. And even what Shotoku, what I learned from his point of view is that if anything falls out of balance with each other, that's when you invite chaos. Yes. So that's what I was able to um, appreciate that. And um, in the future, uh, I, I uh, appreciated going to Philadelphia's Chinatown. I've seen London's Chinatown. I've seen New York's Chinatown. So I had in the back of my mind maybe July or August to visit San Francisco's Chinatown and see that history as well. So that, that's been on the back of my mind to plan a future trip around July or August to come visit. And hopefully they're a bit more open and COVID has uh, uh, lifted its uh, dead heavy hand uh, a bit so that you can see it more as an active place. Uh, Definitely. But it, it's beautiful, Brother Douglas. Um, you know, I love the Chinese peoples and you, you are absolutely right in terms of the geopolitics because that, that's what my friend pointed out too is because right now there's a difference between the original Chinese ancient culture and what we know as the communist regime today, which is, does not exemplify those original values. So people have to realize that there is a difference. And in the original Chinese peoples, they allowed all faiths and philosophies to flourish within their lands. 
yes. as there were people who focused on trade, culture, and basically how what they're doing now with uh, the aspect of exemplifying the Ming Dynasty. So yeah, it, it goes it goes really way back, and you know I would love Brother Douglas's thoughts on all of this in terms of what I learned from my friend in, the, in terms of Chinese Freemasonry and the triad societies and how these societies are basically benevolent instead of evil in terms of what the West teaches us. Absolutely. Well, what I can tell you is that uh, just as a good example of this is the tenderloin. And I can bring up uh, some examples to try and uh, help people get a better grasp of uh, uh, the tenderloin, but of course, as I said, that's the worst ghetto on earth. The only place that matches it that I've ever seen has been uh, Hunters Point Bayview in San Francisco. Both of these places are in San Francisco, and uh, anyone who doesn't believe me is invited to simply visit those places themselves, and they'll quickly discover everything I say is true. I've been to war zones all over the world when they were active war zones, and uh, I've never been anywhere in my life that was worse than either of those places. And uh, so it, it's uh, definitely something that uh, has a greater impact when you understand that when the Saigon fell and uh, they began bringing in a great number of refugees, something which uh, Joseph Biden uh, at that time tried to prevent, uh, but uh, when they brought in these refugees, uh, many of them were dumped into the uh, worst place that they could be dumped, which was the Tenderloin District of San Francisco, which was a Pacific Gateway was, of course, San Francisco, the gateway to the Orient, uh, much more so than Los Angeles, even at that time. And uh, gradually, you saw many of uh, the Vietnamese communities and other Southeast Asian communities, Laotian, etc., scatter across the west coast of uh, both uh, California more than uh, any other place. You did not see them scatter as much up in the North Pacific Northwest. It was simply too violently white supremacist. And uh, I've given the history of the reasons why in the past uh, because of the uh, war in the Philippines, which was America's first Vietnam. Uh, which also involved very heavy drug abuse and uh, far, f far greater genocide than was ever experienced in Vietnam uh, when it came to uh, active uh, genocidal operations on part of the United States as an empire. Uh, and um, what happened was the, many of the veterans who returned from that war were so, they were so incapable of re-socializing them. And we're talking about literally thousands of veterans. We're not talking about a few hundred guys. We're talking about thousands and thousands of veterans who came home and all, they were all basically mass rapists and uh, mass murderers at that point. There was no other way to describe them. Uh, that's simply all they would have done had they been re-released into society. So they could not release them into society. They simply parked them all up in the Pacific Northwest and uh, let, gave them land, just gave them land so that they could uh, be among themselves. And uh, that's why when you go to the Pacific Northwest that you feel it. It's just nothing but just, just uh, white class crazy. Uh, I mean, like murderous crazy. Uh, I was talking to uh, uh, Amanda about that. I called her right before midnight on her birthday to make certain that I got to her just like I had to publish her her birthday card her e-card before midnight and uh, she I made certain that uh, I called her and was able to reach her and when I what I told her was every time I see some bit of news about uh, and it's always the same kind of shit some poor white woman got killed up in uh, Oregon or Portland in particular and I'll say geez, I'll catch some news flash like that there's never a name release of course uh, just some uh, white woman got killed but by the way they don't say white woman they'll just say woman got killed in Portland Oregon or something like that you know it's white because <laughs> there's no colors up in Oregon demographically. Uh, that's why, by the way, for people who don't know, uh, the Pacific Northwest was the only branches of the KKK where the KKK was inclusive. By that, instead of being exclusive, 
they were racially open to blacks and Jews and people of color because there was nobody up there that was of color or, or black or Jewish. They, they, so they were openly just saying, oh, we welcome people of other colors because, you know, it was like that was like saying we welcome unicorns and, and centaurs and, you know, uh, satyrs, uh, etc. Various of Lilith's children because uh, we, we have, <laughs> yeah, because because they just didn't expect any of them to show up. Uh, but they, that's the only place in the world you, where you would have found politically correct Klansmen. And uh, so it, it's one of the few places you can actually see Klansmen. And if you're a colored person, you could, you know, back in the old days, you wouldn't need to be afraid. Everything's gotten worse now. Of course, everything's the, the, the white people have all gotten more radicalized because of the Internet. They, you know, in the days before the Internet, probably up until I'd say the 90s. Uh, well, yeah, about the 90s. Yeah, you could still see Klansmen actively, as I did, and just walk on by. It, it's not like, I mean, people wearing full sheets and all that. But such being said, it's no longer the case now. So, and she told me uh, that every, my fears were justified, that uh, she was afraid to go into various parts of Portland now. The violence has ratcheted up so extremely. that. But my point is, okay, so most of the Asians wound up in San Francisco, later Los Angeles. And my point is that um, until the Vietnamese were dumped into uh, the um, San Francisco, the tenderloin that I grew up in uh, before it became quote unquote little Saigon was just not in any way, shape or form a family environment. It was like there was nothing there that uh, it was just um, senior citizens who were just dumped in there to die. There was no other place they could afford with whatever their fixed pension was. And they were living in the ghetto apartments. There was uh, nothing but an ocean of blacks to the point where at that time of the zebra killings, which was black people killing white people based on color. And uh, this was inspired, of course, by a pan-Africanist terrorist movement that was active in the United States. Um, so the police would literally go around with bullhorns uh, saying uh, Negroes do not congregate. Negroes do not congregate because if you got enough blacks together, you were going to have a massive riot like in Watts. So uh, that was, by the way, the inspiration for the Battle of the Planet of the Apes, which was the original Battle of the Planet of the Apes takes place in San Francisco. It was all based on breaking up black gatherings. That it, You see a massive cataclysmic or climatic battle between the apes and the San Francisco uh, police department, which is operating in the film as a as an army that was all based on what was going on in San Francisco at that time in the zebra killings. So uh, the original Battle of the Planet of the Apes that you need to say, I, I think that was the Battle of the Planet of the Apes. Or what was it? The revolt? Uh, it was the one that takes place in San Francisco. I mean, whichever one takes place in San Francisco might not have been the battle for the Planet of the Apes, but whichever one was the rebellion of the apes led by Caesar. But my whole point is that all of that changed with, you know, other the only women there were prostitutes and adult entertainers. So I grew up with surrounded by the sex industry, etc. And prostitutes, of course, uh, were just readily available. They would make passes to me um, when I was well under 18 uh, because, you know, they were just looking for money and uh, would take it from anybody. And uh, so the point was that obviously a hypersexualized environment, which, which certainly impacted myself a lot. All of that changed with the influx of the, of the Vietnamese and the Laotians and the Cambodians and everything else. Uh, I've gone into the past before about the Cho, their impacts on the community, but the Vietnamese have the same Confucianist uh, tradition and therefore the same triad tradition as the Chinese. And so what happened was Vietnamese gangs turned the little Saigon the, from the Tenderloin when it as it transitioned into little Saigon for the very first time in its history it became as ghettoized as it is as dangerous as it still is it became uh, somewhat of a family environment and this was only because of the gangs that were sponsored by the Vietnamese triads that uh, enabled a uh, establishment of a kind of protection for the community uh, against just the just all of the violence and the the hordes of uh, of just other ethnic, obviously black. Uh, though there were all kinds of whites in the area, you really couldn't call it a black ghetto because that's up in Hunters Point, Bayview, uh, where the cabs don't even enter. Uh, the cabs will enter the Tenderloin because of economic necessity, because there's no other way to get to the financial district. 
But if you're sitting in a cab, and I swear this is the way it used to be, it probably still is, probably worse now. If you're in a cab and you have your windows open, the cab driver will demand you roll your windows up or he's not going to drive through the tenderloin. Uh, that, that's, uh, you know, he'll say, he'll make certain the doors are locked. He'll say, make certain your doors locked. You know, he'll roll the windows up, this kind of shit. And it's just, uh, that's just the kind of environment that it is. But, um, there you have that. So, so that gives everybody some background and it got real bad during the Omicron, of course. Well, before that was the Corona, the COVID to the point where my gang brother Beaver, who is a member of the Chinese triads, uh, he basically, was someone myself my status among that is honorary as opposed to like even though i'm a blood brother i've gone through the rituals uh i'm not ethnically pure chinese and uh it's more like how useful i was to the uh tongs in san francisco that rendered my participation with them just part of a lifetime uh kind of background but in terms of uh beaver himself he would, uh, he had a thing for the Vietnamese sandwiches and the Vietnamese cuisine and stuff. And he would go down to Little Saigon to patronize. And during the original first wave of Corona, when nobody did anything to clean up garbage for months, uh, he basically drove his car through there and decided he was not going to park. <laughs> that was how bad it got. Uh, just piles of of garbage just in the streets that were the size of small uh, housing units uh just seething with rats and roaches and uh so you can imagine what it was like for the residents living through that trying to keep a restaurant operating for months for the rest of the community just unbearable to think of such pain so uh with that hopefully that provides some perspective before i finally i gotta tend to the hyperlinks and everything i'm gonna go completely mute i'm gonna count on these gentlemen to hold it the stage uh i do want to uh thank the people in the live stream uh james forsyth uh forsyth excuse me james forsyth says and greeting wish all a great evening shane bridges says greeting everyone uh some idiot in their name Colac cardi got deleted by james and i don't know what he said <laughs> oh that, that that was a bot that was oh, one okay. of those uh yeah. and, bots and i do remind everyone we do get slammed right at the very beginning so that the episode does not distribute via searches uh with all the down votes you can imagine so you've got to use whatever different ip addresses you have your your cell phone your ipad your your personal computer your laptop use all the different ipad uh excuse me uh ip addresses that you've got to put in a thumbs up because it's the only way that these episodes get distributed uh, it's a stupid aggregate that youtube works with based on popularity otherwise it doesn't show up in searches so to get us to show up do what you have to do the enemy does everything they can uh like uh, peter moon was saying the other day you know and none of this should surprise him he said you know nobody wants to interview me anymore you know and i'm like well you're affiliated with douglas dietrich now what did you expect it's like uh, so yeah, of course they're not going to interview him anymore it's it's like it's not it, it's uh basically what we have to say about history is irrefutable so no one's attacking the history no one's attacking the history anymore they simply try to attack the distribution of our episodes and ignore uh myself and peter moon completely and that's the price he pays for affiliating with myself uh so good thing he was stable enough uh before he decided to uh pursue uh publishing uh works with me because uh they won't publish a second work or he won't publish his second work unless you know the uh, roswell deception sells enough to even justify that uh, of course, he might support himself a bit through his Romanian publications, which is like a totally different trip. But uh, you, the best we could do is ask you to uh, purchase the Roswell Deception and uh, make everyone aware with it of of it. And uh, no one's attacking the history; they're just ignoring it completely because that's the only thing they can do is ignore it. They can't attack the content, so they have to ignore it. And so he's been ignored ever since he paired up with me uh so good thing he's kind of semi-retired anyway uh but um with that i will turn it over to salman shake and then he can segue it back to jameson reese but salman you can i'm going to go completely mute and i may not hear what you say but for the record do respond to what i said about the tenderloin and hopefully that will you know uh resonate with what you've just said as well hopefully that makes sense thank you thank you brother douglas and you know speaking of beaver i, I was laughing that one time when 
Beaver was dealing with that Asian Indian who came to get a uh, a cheap sandwich, and it it, it showed it showed him the aspects of how cheap one can really be. <laughs> Thank you. No, no, that's important because yeah, what he what he what Beaver said it was like at that point he got the impression he said it's like they they're part of some game and the whoever dies with the most wins. He said it's like, it didn't it doesn't make any fucking sense. It was just like there's no point in living if you're not going to enjoy life. Right? I mean, as a matter of fact, Salman, you can share with us your latest video telling Americans to stop working so fucking hard and just start enjoying your life. Yes, by all oh, means. Of, of course. And, you know, speaking of the uh, the tenderloin, we also have uh, districts here in Philadelphia, what is known as North Philly. And also, if you look up Kensington on YouTube, Kensington, Philadelphia, you'll see that it's like a... Um, a mile, two miles just worth of do people that are just doping and shaking like zombies, even in the middle of winter and snowstorms. That's how bad it is over here. And no cab driver will take you to Kensington. And if you if you watched any of the Rocky movies, a lot of the Rocky movies were filmed in that Kensington area. But now it's just like a um, a, a major drug hub where if you're looking for drugs or prostitutes, uh, it's it's all there. So it, Basically, I noticed like even with the Tenderloin in San Francisco or Hunter's Point where those uh, homeless mutants attacked Brother Douglas, it's, it's, it's the aspect uh, we have that here, too. We have these certain districts like North Philly and Kensington and you, all of these dope fiends going around everywhere. But it's, it's unfortunate. It just shows you the reality of this country that we're dealing with in all major cities across America. Thank that you. they're they're always worrying about other places in the world, but they don't want to fix their own home. And speaking of the the video that I made, basically you're, we're living in this system where you could work your ass off and pay your pay your mortgage for thirty years, forty years, but at the end, if you don't pay the local taxes, they'll just come the next day, put a sh lien on your home, do the sheriff's sale, and take it from you. Every day I go through the newspaper, and in the back it shows you all of these old couples that passed away. And then their homes are on sheriff sales because either they didn't have any ad, uh, advanced directive, which means like a, a will of some kind to pass it on to somebody. So they couldn't maintain the taxes and all that whole lifetime they spent maintaining that home, paying the taxes, paying the mortgages. And at the end, they just take it right back from you. So that's what I'm trying to tell people is that you don't own anything in this country. Just relax, enjoy your life and find that balance in your life. Yeah, of course, there is that under human understanding of working and trying to survive and pay bills and rent. I get all of that. But at the same time, don't kill yourself for the system, which replaces you in a heartbeat, where you could be working at a workplace and anything happens to you the next day, your replacement will be there. Anything happens to you and your home, you can't pay the mortgage or the, the, the local township taxes or the county taxes, they'll have a sheriff and sell it out uh, the bank will come and sell it out so this system is not designed to serve you in any way so just relax enjoy yourself and it's like uh, what brother douglas dietrich said like a, a lot of these veteran administrations military take all of their budget away and give it to the american people give it to the people here the homeless people that i see in philly homeless people right next to the park there's a market where, where the, the park that i go to do, to do pull-ups and feed the birds Right next to it is a major market, and everywhere you go, there's homeless people that are uh, basically drug addicts or they don't have a place to sleep. They're asking for food, and it just goes to show you that you have this country that has like a $787 billion military budget. Why don't they help the people over here? I, I go to New York, and I saw the same thing in certain areas of New York where certain areas cannot be considered safe. Uh, you always got to like look around, watch your six all the time. And it just shows you the reality of this country, Brother Douglas. And, uh, you know, I, I thank you. I thank you for exposing all of this like you have, because people have the shade in front of their eyes, like the glamour, glamorizing the military, glamorizing the American empire, not knowing in, from the inside out you're rotting, like the trash piling up in San Francisco. That's how this country is rotting dead from the inside out. Because they're looking at the exterior image, but not looking at what's going on inside of the house that's falling apart at the seams. So that's basically it. Even in Philadelphia, it's the same exact thing. You have certain areas uh, like Hunter's Point and Tenderloin, which are you can't go there unless you have some kind of a 
protection with you. I mean, if you can, if you know how to defend yourself or if you have people that can do that for you, that's the only way you go into those areas. And even the local government and authorities really don't care because it's like uh, one of the monologues or transmissions uh, I heard of Brother Douglas in the past. It, it's, it runs like a local economy because one hand supports the other. So that's basically how a lot of the system is run. And a, a, as for all of the gang stalkers and the the, hum, uh, the, the home, homeless mutants at Hunter's Point, may Allah destroy them. But yeah, that's oh. that's that's basically it. And uh, yeah, brother Jamo, uh, have you seen anything like that in New York? What I've described in Kensington, like you have a whole block full of dope fiends. Oh yeah, yeah. New York has its uh, has its hot spots. Uh, they have their places where the police won't even intervene or go to that address if you call nine one one from it. Uh, so um. Yeah, it's it's it, this is something that I think we're seeing all over the place as far as cities are concerned. Uh, it's how do, how, do, how do I put this? It's it's just the uh, result of what was the inevitable buildup of a population um, of basically irresponsible baby boomers who more or less decided they want everything now rather than looking towards the future. And so what you have, what do you leave your future generations with? Shit. Streets lined with shit. Yeah, that's that's basically it, my brother. And, you know, a lot, a lot of them are not dying off fast enough while our generation also is getting older and there's no relationships. People are not like settling down at that kind of level like they used to. Uh, the job opportunities are kind of tight too. I mean, it's not about what you know, it's about who you know. So that kind of ruins the merit-based system because those that are qualified, those kids that are talented, young adults that are skillful and talented, they have a hard time getting ahead anywhere. So I see no difference between America and a third world country. And that's the reason why many people escape third world countries to get better opportunities, but it's the same here now. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, this this is a third world country. It's a it's a third world hellhole of uh, massive disparities. And for anyone to say you, you're, 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 those are your fucking <laughs> retards um, who just don't have any idea what anyone the fuck else is going through. Um, and you know, well, I, I suppose that's one of the problems when it comes to terms with when one. Uh, approaches the beast that is white supremacy society which is all america basically has been since day one um you know everyone's like oh times are getting bad it's like dude well for everyone else times have always been bad (laughs) where the fuck have you been you know exactly that that's exactly right and you know it's it's basically it goes back to a system that was not designed to treat you like a human being anyway and I, I look at some of the kids here in the local Philly area where I'm at, and these, a lot of these kids are, they're great. They've never been in any kind of trouble, super talented, super smart, and they're growing up. And when I ask one of them, okay, where are you working? One of them saying, oh, I'm working at a, at a subway because it's owned by a Pakistani or some uh, other ethnic person, and he's the only one that hired me and gave me an opportunity. I asked the other kid, where are you working at? Oh, I'm working at a cell phone store because the only person that wanted to hire me or give me a chance was a part. The, the boss was an ethnic person. So this this the system of white supremacy does have long term consequences, even when they tell you just work hard, stay out of trouble, get good grades. It, it, it's all BS. It's about who you are, who you know and what area you live in. It's as simple as that in this country. Yeah. And you have to fight for it. You have to fight like hell to get anything if you really want it here. Uh, you yes. you are going against a uh, machine where if you're not smart enough, if you're not in the right place in the right time, you're fucked. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly it. And, you know, unfortunately, the white supremacy system that we're dealing with is some people – just don't have it in, in them genetically or in their blood or in their soul to understand or sympathize with what black and brown people of this world go through. Even the, the foreign policy of this country 
just bombing out of smithereens black and brown people of the world for God knows how long. With that same money, they could have been helping their own people. But then again, when you tell them, they just they, they just don't get it. And when you do tell them something, they'll be like, oh, I don't care what you have to say. You know, that's that white superiority mentality. Like, yo, you're beneath me. I don't, I don't give a damn what you have to say. Your opinion doesn't count. So even when you try to educate somebody, I mean, how far can you get with it, honestly? Well, those consequences will echo through generations to come. We're already seeing this, uh, especially with, you know, uh, with with uh, what's going on with the, in Canada. That seems to be uh, that has my eye for a, a very that 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 uh, that has me very uncomfortable right now. Uh, due to the fact that uh, the Republicans have decided to throw their 10 cents in on what's going on in Canada as far as the truckers who are on strike and the people in the communities living there are having a very hard time. They can't get rid of these guys and they're they're keeping them up uh, all, all night and everything. And so um, what this is doing is this is serving as an aggregate that just pulls in more and more lint you know it's 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 like if you have something that that attracts static you know um and you have uh lint from a dryer it's just like it's all congealing to that and it's uh the problem is that's also a health hazard because you got people who probably have covid who are like on this anti anti lockdown anti max tirade and you're just gathering for the next mutation of death definitely my brother and thank you for addressing that point because i noticed even the 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 right wing factor is seeped into many parts of canada in america and and even in england with the uh, english it's everywhere it's everywhere everywhere on planet earth it's It's everywhere country on planet earth i don't care who's running it, whether they're ethnic, whether they're not ethnic, it's, it's, it's literally everywhere. It's, 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 it's the uh, polarization of an entire species. And it makes me wonder mm. if we're not on the epoch of a, another mutation that will be a, a stepping stone in our evolution as a species. Although I'm not certain as to what form it will take. It mm-hmm. does seem to be it does seem to be too large of a pattern for one to ignore. Yes, yes, and uh, thank you for that, brother Jamo. That's absolutely correct. There has to be something done about this, and people have to just stop looking the other way. There, there comes a time of tolerance, and then there comes a time of flipping tables, like even what Christ did in the Book of Matthews, or what even the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, teaches us that you have to be a mystic. And a warrior, because both good and bad come from God. That's embodied in yourself and the creation as well. So you can't just uh, have that mindset of toxic positivity, thinking that, yeah, everything is fine. Keep smiling. There is that aspect of giving love, happiness and friendship to those that deserve it. But also you have to give the enemy his due as well in terms of dealing with him accordingly in the, be- in the best ways through education and awareness. So people kind of wake up and see this. And, you know, speaking of Canada, JMO, there was somebody that uh, sent me a uh, Facebook message from Canada from some guy named Imam Tawhidi. So he, he's some fake imam out of Australia, and he's propped up by Western Intelligence Agency. And this guy's always tweeting stuff against Islam. So he's just like another house Muslim. Oh, God, he's probably in bed with Stephen Outram. There you he, go. He is. And, you know, it's interesting <laughs> because they, they want these people who kind of support their views so they could say, see, we have a Muslim person who agrees with our views. Oh, we have yeah. a black person that oh, agrees they, with our views. They love ethnic people who agree with white supremacy. Exactly. Um, they, they love black people who, they love white people of any color who can go lockstep into their white supremacy agenda. They, they're always looking for that, you know. Oh, look, you'll get a nice house, a car, and a white woman, and you will be happy for the rest of your life. <laughs> I mean, it's like, it's, it's, it's bullshit. Uh, for what, you know? I mean, you're not going to have a world left to live in. Uh, yes. I honestly, 
Well, I mean, I'm not I'm, I'm going to say as much as we're advancing technologically, unfortunately, we're not advancing sociologically. Yes, yeah, that, that, that's right. And a lot of these people that have a high profile, whether they're a Muslim or they're black and they're in usually with these right wing crowds that are supporting and endorsing them, they're part of these plants by these different agencies that are there to further cause that divide and, and conquer. And, you know, something's got to give, uh, even what like what Brother Sammy said, it's the as aspect of the payback. Something is going to happen in this country within the next five to 10 years. And because that boiling point is uh, the water is getting hotter and hotter and hotter. So, Brother Jamo, you're dead on. I'm, well, I'm glad you bring that up because I suspect that the uh, the chimera that the, that these agencies have had under their control is no longer going to be able to be controlled even by them <laughs> mm -hmm. because the person who was able to do all that and was able to somehow hold all of that down was is now dead yeah so yeah that's so, right so even the even these uh even these uh old um what do you call it even these relic uh projects that have been going on for time time after time and time that have had some degree of oversight, they're disintegrating. Uh, this is this is literally chaos, pandemonium. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's pretty. That's pretty much it. I mean, right now we're in the year of the midterms, so it's really going to be interesting how things play out from now until November, and then from 2023 to 2024, it's going to be interesting how like all, all how the stars align and just what's going to happen in this country where you have the system kind of barely holding on for bare life in terms of governmental services, the education system, the workplace system. Everywhere I look, Brother Jamo, it's just barely hanging on by a thread. Yeah, and it it, it is, you know, this, this this needs to be pointed out. It seemed in the the uh, largest in the larger scale in the macrocosmic sense, this is a uh war of tyranny versus um those who you know those who probably deserve their fair share and aren't being given it you mm -hmm. know uh on the other hand there's just there's so much polarization it's not even funny um this schism is going to necessitate a sort of uh we're going to need, in order to be able to hold up society, in order to hold up the infrastructure, we're going to need to rely on artificial intellects and artificial intelligences and things of that sort to sort of aid us. We need something that's superior to human beings to keep human beings in check. Because if you don't have something superior to humans to keep them in check, things go apeshit. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I mean, just look at the whole uh, Canada situation and everywhere, even across this country where, I mean, you, you look at a country like Vietnam, let's say, which is much smaller than America in so many comparisons. So not only they defeated America in a war, but they also defeated America in the COVID-19, how, how they were able to contain COVID-19. And a country that doesn't have a health care system like the U.S., see what you're dealing with is a culture that is disciplined. So in the East, you're dealing with more disciplined people. And in the West, you're dealing with people that take everything for granted. So that's another slap in the face that they gave to America by getting COVID under control while here the, the rage is still going on. Well, the problem is we, we have a polarization on both sides, the East and the West, because we see now where some of that discipline, you know, if we look at Winnie the Pooh, um, we see where, where some of that uh, discipline has its overreach where it, it becomes a sort of tyranny in and of itself. And here in the West, we have the individual, the individualism, the egoism on a rampage. And that egoism without having a purpose, without having a greater purpose, you know, the, 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 the greatest, uh, I, 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 I have to argue that the only person who stands out in the West as being one who was able to unite people would be Adolf Hitler. Yes, that's absolutely right. And even if you look at the, the pictures 
there's a book, Brother J-Mo, it's called The um, the Practices of Sufi Freemasons, and it's written by somebody that was from, basically from Nazi Germany at that time, who went and studied with the Sufis in, in the Middle East and in the Holy Land, and it, it showed you how accepting they were of each other, and even if you look at the different aspects of how they interacted with each other, there was aspects of knowledge, unity, bringing people together. So history as we know it, like whoever they told you the bad guy was, it's usually an inversion, like we're living in an inverted reality. So, yeah, my brother, I agree with you. And it needs to be emphasized that the Nazism of the West, as we see here in the United States, is not the National Socialists of Germany, where mm -hmm. they included soldiers of all ethnicities in their ranks. They were all inclusive, while the West and the European allies were extremely bigoted. So, yes, the, the entire, you know, the entire construct of everything we've been taught as far as what's right and what's wrong is skewed. And um, this is the result. We look around, we see what's what's crumbling, what's deteriorating. This is the result of that. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And that this is another reason why the people should buy the Roswell deception and demystification of World War II. Because it, one of the chapters in there is about the, the triple nickel units. And you'll see what the U.S. government did to a lot of the African-American soldiers that were trying to do the right thing. And in their cause were basically on that aspect of honor and fighting for a country which didn't consider them human in the first place, while these other places which are described as evil and degenerate, they were the ones that had people of all ranks as equals. So that is that disambiguation in our history and in our, in our culture, especially this whole World War II phenomena about this, uh, these memes that I see that, oh, we're the back-to-back -back champs and all that stuff. It, it's all a bunch of lies. And People need to read the Roswell Deception so that illusion can be broken of what the history books have taught you. And majority of the school history that's been taught to you are lies, I'm afraid. That's one of the ones, that's one of the reasons why what happened to Whoopi Goldberg in current events is very disconcerting. Uh, because uh, she said that it wasn't a war on race, it was a war on Judaism. And honestly, she would be correct in saying that. Unfortunately, that was taken out of context and they NBC suspended her. So, I mean, you know, the, and, and these things are not, no one's analyzing this from a accurate historical perspective. People are just running with the narrative that the military shit complex uh, wants to throw in our faces. And we can, uh, oh my gosh, I mean, what's going on with the mili with our uh, military complex now, they are showing how their ineptitude, uh, Hawaii is suffering from poisoning of their water through, uh, what do you call it? I, I guess this uh, oil, oil, oil that seems to have spilled into the aquifer from the naval base nearby. It's now there's thousands of people who are like um, the victim of this and they're, you know, coming down with symptoms from having, you know, dr bathed in or drunk in uh, contaminated water. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's a it's a good point. You bring that up because uh, one, one of the, the Sufi sheikhs that I was talking to, he was saying that what we're seeing with Tonga and uh, probably eventually La Palma, it's basically Mother Nature or the living being of this earth we know as a whole that's rebelling against the people that are controlling it. So it's that re nature is rebelling against the global hegemony, white supremacy system, which is exploiting resources all over the world, not treating the environment properly. Who knows, like besides having jobs or homes, if our kids and future generations will even have water to drink or air to breathe. That's how complicated the situation has gotten. And you see that aspect of nature that's also rebelling back against uh, people in control, whether they be white or any other forms of systems of control that are on a global basis. So th this needs to be addressed, though, what we're dealing with. Okay. And now you, yeah, I'm sorry. you also know uh, why women and men aren't getting together to have families anymore, because I get what? it. <laughs> I get it. 
Okay, great. So Peter's here with us now, or rather, um, he's telling me in the messages he's uh, back. <laughs> so uh, if we can bring him on the call, uh, that would be appreciated. Both of you have done uh, wonderfully up to this point. Um, haven't been able to listen, been taking care of uh, everything around me in the environment, uh, but uh, will now try and live up to my responsibilities on the net with the production. I just noticed something I never noticed before that says we have a duration of 300 minutes uh, on the uh, this, which is only five hours. So hopefully tonight's episode lasts the full 12. If something, I, I think it will, but, um, it, you know, it's just this may have always been there and I never noticed it. But, uh, you, you know, this is the part of the thing that I, the, the tragedy of learning to produce while I'm going, uh, getting a little, you know, just, you know, it's, it's like learning to steer a ship, uh, as Peter Moon will understand, or navigate while you're sailing it's something that uh just uh you shouldn't be doing it like that but <laughs> nevertheless that's that's how i'm forced to do it so uh we have peter on with us and uh of course salman uh, by all means uh help segue us to peter uh you've been uh, talking about uh your episodes that you've been doing lately uh our man jameson reese will be right back and um, just close off perhaps whatever you were saying and introduce Peter for our for all of our listeners. Thank you. Yes, definitely. So, uh, you know, looking into the different things that are going on right now in the world and the environment, uh, many of the social and racial issues that we're dealing with today, it's the aspect of us coming together in unity as a human family. And, you know, what yourself, Brother Douglas Dietrich, are doing in terms of educating everyone on the geopolitics, it's very important. And also... I've been able to learn that knowledge from Peter Moon's books as well. I greatly enjoyed Montauk Book of the Living. I'm currently 100 pages in into Montauk Book of the Dead, and it gives me an appreciation for Peter's life in terms of growing up in Southern California, seeing different aspects of California, such as Taft and Davis and these different communities that he dealt with, the synchronicities that he experienced, it all leading him up to the sea organization. So it, it's all relative in this journey, human journey that we're in, where even in Sufism, uh, the Sheikh will teach us that it basically everyone you meet is a mirror reflection of the creator that's guiding you, that's teaching you, that's mentoring you in their own way. So, you know, I deeply thank both brothers, Douglas Dietrich and Peter Moon. And in the future, I would love to have Peter back on for a part two to talk about the Roswell deception or anything else that he would like to discuss so we can continue getting these messages out there yes. in terms of educating the public. So with that, I say good evening to Peter and I hand it over to him. Yes. Thank you so much. Oh, Welcome, Peter. You. Thank you. It's nice to be back with everybody. I've been, um, we, you know, I had a, didn't get a lot of sleep last night and I had, um, got up and played football and then we took off up, uh, upstate to, uh, to Judy's house where she was having a, a Asian lady who was having a New Year's uh, gathering, Chinese Fabulous. New Year's. Oh, that's so exciting. And uh, just so everybody knows, it's a very specific day in the Asian Lunar New Year, uh, each and every day reflecting at the beginning of each year, uh, the uh, original uh, four twin knit or 14 nights of creation. And uh, so this is the sixth day of creation that is celebrated on the Asian lunar calendar. And uh, today is the day of the horse when the divine empress knew uh, and she created uh, new way um, would be another way of pronouncing it very similar to new way. So think of it that way. And that'll be easier for the English language and romanization. This was the day, the sixth day of Genesis. Genesis on which she created the Ma or the horse and uh, tomorrow uh, which we will transition to at midnight uh, whatever time zone you're in it translates into the uh, uh, the year of man or rather the day of the human uh, Renri, or the seventh day on which humans were created by the divine empress and so the celebrations for that anniversary began uh, during the Han Dynasty. And uh, so this is, of course, Yu Nian, the year of the tiger. And uh, right now we're in the midst of the Chunjie, the spring festival. And uh, obviously, I will uh, bring it all back to Peter Moon. I just want to say hello to the wonderful uh, young lady in the chat room, Sarah Thomas. 
who gives us three pink pulsating hearts and was talking about protests around the world for a few years now. The large protests of, of late, she uh, remembers, started with Hong Kong and the yellow vests in France. Of course, these were very, very different uh, m uh, motivations, of course, in France, very uh, propelled in a, in a sense by the right wing and uh, Russian sponsored. And uh, in Hong Kong, they were dem democracy protests and they were ultimately crushed uh, by communist China. It was just horrible, just, just a horrific tragedy. And I don't think Hong Kong will ever be the same. Hopefully someday it can recover. But it was a very, very special city and a very wealthy city state. And uh, now it's been devastated by the communist Chinese. Uh, all of this, of course, against all the promises they made, just as Putin broke all his promises about not violating the, uh, the territorial sovereignty of Ukraine. And uh, so all of that for later, perhaps in the meantime, Peter Moon is with us. And uh, I, I was under the impression as well that you might have been visiting Montauk. So this was not a trip to Montauk. No, this was a trip no, to... No, okay. Montauk is next week. Uh, this was... Uh, uh, Judy is one of the students of Tamarinda, uh, Paula's stepmother. Okay. And many of the students were there. Oh. And uh, I, I know all of them. And we, we you know, and, and I, Judy, I asked her uh, if she... Uh, I asked her, what is the, this is the year of the water tiger? I asked, what is the meaning of the water tiger? And she goes, uh, she says, I don't know. I'm Chinese American. I, you, you know more about Chinese than I do. <laughs> 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 it's really fair because, but the Qigong and, and the Taoist Holy House, I have some, some uh, uh, deep appreciation, but I am by no means a, an expert uh, or in Chinese culture. Uh, but anyway, she she uh, does speak. She said she she did learn some Cantonese. I didn't tell her what you think of the Cantonese language, uh, it, but uh, yeah. <laughs> though I, I, I'll, I'll tell you the truth, my my I've changed a lot in terms of feeling such sympathy for Hong Kong that I do I do value the Ch Cantonese language in that sense that it's a it's an ethnic you know heritage, and I do hope they preserve it. So I'm so glad she's doing that. So go on. Well, I, I don't know how well she speaks it, but she she uh, she grew up in America, so she's very, very American, and, and she's a. Uh, I really like her because she she just uh, she's very. She said that you know sometimes men have problems with her because she's so uh, dominating. You know, she's like she could, you know, really takes charge. Dragon uh, lady, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I I, I like her because she talks. Yeah. I, I much prefer somebody who talks than. You know, somebody who doesn't say nothing. Right. But uh, no, and, and many, many of uh, the other people I know. So we had, a, we had a. Actually, I, you know, spent a lot of time sleeping in the living room. <laughs> Delightful. Yeah, Delightful. yeah. She was very, she was very happy that I felt so comfortable as to uh, do that. To oh my god. House. Yeah, Dagwood because Bumstead, go on. I, I was tired, and and I had to get up for this, so I I. Uh, I, I just uh, had some cappuccino to uh, keep me. I, I slept for a half an hour before the show here. So I, I think I can sustain myself for uh, at least a couple hours, if not more. Wow. So, uh, it, yeah. But anyway. Uh, Thank you. I think what I'll share tonight is, is something that somebody wrote to me. Because people see things and it, it's good for people to be informed. <clears throat> of course, I've, I've spoken before. Mark Hamill is a key character in the life of Preston Nichols. Mm -hmm. He's talked about the music of time and also in the uh, uh, Montauk Revisited. He was a childhood friend of Preston's. And he is he was in a movie called Time Runner. Al Bielik claimed that Mark Hamill was the one that recruited him for the Montauk Project. Uh, you know, Mark is a very unusual character and highly talented they don't really talk about all his musical talent because he he was also involved with many of the bubblegum hits of the 19 early 1970s so anyway somebody wrote to me on facebook and he said strangest peter strangest thing on the new star wars series Boba Fett or Boba Fett. I, <laughs> Boba Fett. I, yeah, I, I didn't know what it was. I had no idea what he was talking about. And, and he he basically told me, 
you know, he, he you know, I, I, Star Wars, there's just so much Star Wars is coming out of, you know, every orifice in the Disney empire. Yes. Uh, so I, I don't know what he was talking about, but anyway, it's, it's a uh, Boba, Boba Fett episode six. It says a young Mark Hamill starred doing scenes and lines he's never done before. Looked to be in his 20s. Having worked with some great editors, I didn't see any signs of computer graphics. And uh, he says, this confused the... Oh, oh no, no, that's me talking. I thought it said, confused the hell out of me because I know nothing about the new, new Star Wars stuff and I'm not interested. Uh, but I said, it's interesting. What is this Mark... Uh, ha young Mark Hamill doing. So I asked my uh, producer friend in Hollywood who, who's option the screen rights, and he's like the the king of computer graphics. Right, CGI. And, and oh. he, he, he knows everything there is to know, and th this is what he said to me. He says, it's deep fake technology. Right. He, he wondered if this was like Mark Hamill in some sort of time warp or something. Uh-huh. He says, it's deep fake technology, but it's easier to say it's driven by a technique called machine learning. Last year, when they completed the second season of The Mandalorian, Mandalorian is a uh, series on Amazon Prime, I believe it's on it, or Netflix, that that uh, is a Star Wars knockoff. So when they completed the second season of The Mandalorian, they paid millions of dollars for a shitty old version that was good enough, but I knew immediately who they should have hired. In essence, a guy worked by himself, a guy working by himself, Shamrock, or Sh Shamuk, excuse me, Shamuk. He says, Shamuk on YouTube redid their work and posted it, and it was 100% better than the original that they did. So they hired him, and that's why you have the amazing transformation. In essence, you take old footage of an actor like Mark Hamill, and you let the machine examine the face in old footage. As the machine does its evaluation, it already understands the building blocks of the optical interactions of light, expression, motion blur, and structure. Then you take a new actor, shoot footage, then you tell the software. Replace the actor's face with the face I'm providing, which is the data the machine learning model has spent time on. And now you now have an amazing Luke Skywalker that sells 90, 99% of all taken footage from the Oh, and they can sell 99% of all the taken footage from an Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi. So that they can, they can you know, it's, it's just amazing what they can do now. And then he goes into a big technical gobbledygook, which he identifies as gobbledygook, which we won't go into, about how they do it. So anybody wondering that about that, it's, it's very interesting because... Uh, this guy I, I option the rights to is, he's the best. He's, he's the best. Uh, so, oh, God, I, I don't know if I should tell this story or not. But, um, <laughs> but um, I had, I had a dream. Uh, my dream was not so noble as Martin Luther King's dream. No, I had a dream speech. I had, I had a dream the other night that I was being, there's more to it, but I was being uh, pursued and adored by this gay guy. And it, at first it was just adoration about my work and my personality. And, and then it got a bit more personal. And I said, you know, and, and it was, there was no question in, in, in my mind what it was. I won't go into the details of, you know, because it's just, you know, kind of, Weird, but but um, he he then says I can build a PR machine for you. You wouldn't believe what a PR machine I built for you. And then he says, and you know, a million dollars I can get you a million dollars. And I just said, stop, stop, stop. That's it. I'm not interested. And I I walked away because. And then then later uh, that day, that same day, I got a. Uh, a book order from, uh, I won't say his name. That's right. A, a, a mega producer in Hollywood. 
who is admittedly gay and um, is married to a man. And he ordered the first three Montauk books in the white bag. So he is previously uh, was advertised in, in the press as going to do the Montauk project. He was going to do the Montauk project. And I, I sent his office a certified letter with a return receipt requested. And of course it, it was the post office returned it. Yeah. It, it, it didn't say rejected, refused. It just returned it. Yeah. As and, they you know, did with I, my books, when you were sending me the, the, the free books to give out, go on. Yeah. Well, it's not like that. A, a registered letter or an, a certified letter is, you know, you can't, you can't just return it to the, the sender. Okay. It's gotta be say refused or something. Yeah. Uh, so, it, there was no explanation and, and it confused the postman. I, I, you know, you pay $5 for, it. I don't remember if they gave me my $5 back or not. I think they did. So anyway, I took the letter, opened it back up, copied everything, explained how it had been turned back, sent another certified letter. This time it was, it was accepted and said, you know, you have to be aware of possible copyright infringement. You write it very politely. And of course, they they didn't pursue that. Uh, I think eventually, Stranger Things, but the, Ryan Murphy was never involved with Stranger Things, to my knowledge. Uh, I let the name slip out there. Okay. So, uh, but but anyway, you know, he will be. Uh, he's interested in the books, and, and and that will stir conversation. It will stir conversation and things up because we we did turn already turn down a media deal, uh, but because everything is so twisted, and what they try to do is is get you to hope, and they, they hope oh hope and we were offered so many things, and you know we're going to be executive producers we're going to be this we're going to be that we're going to I mean this is this is offers you don't get, and. But the language was so twisted in the contracts. I, I really, after I read the first contract or tried to, I, I was never interested in it. I, I didn't, I just let all the negotiations go on. I was never interested. Uh, and then eventually, you know, my option holder came around to the same conclusion. But he, he learned a lot in the process. Um, and and, and I, I looked up narcissistic negotiation and it's all about, okay, what do you want? They, they tried it on your hope, your hope, your hope. Mm -hmm. And and then um, then they change it, you know, because they've ignited your hope. Well, you know, you're going to be, you know, you're going to be the third baseman for the New York Yankees. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then, you know, it turns out, well, yeah, yeah you, you're going to play third base for their lowest level farm team. You know that that's how the contract will work out. It won't it won't say that. You know, and so you know it's just and 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 then some of uh, the professionals that he works with that are interested in our product were just horrified at the contract. They they couldn't even read it. Right. People who do real deals and have quite a reputation they say we can't do this. You know, I mean, this is how can you know he had the same reaction I did. So such manipulation. Uh, it's it's so good to not be involved with that. So I don't know where this will go, but but it will stir conversation and that's good. But I can be very blase about it. And then, you know, because uh, I'm I'm in the same. What would I say? I, I wanna, I wanna, I'm thinking of one of those. Uh, you know, I, I don't know, carts from the movie King Rat that they put the soldiers in. <laughs> King Rat, uh, you know, I'm in the same cart with Douglas Dietrich, you know, it's, it's, um, yes. <laughs> you yes. know, it's like, yeah, I, I, and I, I would prefer to be there. But by, by the uh, way, just so people understand what Peter Moon is referring to, King Rat is a novel based uh, very heavily on history, as are all the novels of James Clavell. And uh, James Clavell is one of the few uh, Caucasian authors that I can highly recommend in terms of his writings on Asian culture. And, and he wrote on both Chinese and Japanese cultures. Uh, he, probably his most notable uh, Chinese book was Taipan, 
uh, and the other one was Noble House. These were two books he wrote on, on Chinese culture. The, the books he wrote on Japanese culture that stand out the most are Shogun, of course, uh, that led to the miniseries that revolutionized the 80s as the cultural propaganda vanguard for Japanese normalization uh, with, uh, with America. That's what brought in all the ninja and samurai movies to a great extent. It did for the Japanese what Bruce Lee films did for the Chinese in the 70s. And, uh, and it, it helped to kind of acclimatize and lead to a kind of rapprochement with Japan uh, where Americans uh, respected and admired them uh, while they were uh, basically helping to redevelop or basically rebuild American industry. And uh, when all of that uh, began to crash and burn with attempts to uh, try and isolate or start a trade war with the Japanese, that's when they divested and uh, removed all their assets and uh, relocated or revested into communist China, uh, creating the made in China boom that we're all dealing with today in terms of its problematic results. Uh, but uh, in, in King Rat, uh, that's very similar to the bridge over the river Kwai or, uh, or the movie starring David Bode Bowie, uh, David Bowie, uh, Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence, etc. Uh, it was a Japanese prison camp film, and it was talking about how the Allies were treated, and they had a card, of course, for the Allies, uh, whether they were, the, the prisoners of war, whether they were alive or dead, they would just uh, take them from mass burial <laughs> if they were collapsed to the point where they were obviously not going to recover uh, without uh, advanced medical life support, then they'd put them in the special card <laughs> and take them off to a, a shallow mass grave. Uh, because of the just the pragmatic nature of the brutal reality of war, and uh, th this is and, and of course no uh, no hiding the fact that uh, uh, Allied prisoners of war uh, died at seven times the rate in Japanese prisoner of war camps than they did in Nazi prisoner of war camps, and uh, I, I could go on and on about the reasons for that, but uh, it's it's more than simple sadism. Of course, it's simply the fact that just even though in obeying the Geneva Conventions, which are as that you feed your prisoners about a third of what your rations a third of the amount of rations that your troops would get in the field well the japanese ate almost nothing in the field <laughs> so basically a third of what they ate was air uh and so prisoners were basically perennially starving and uh i mean literally starving as in malnourished and uh so uh, that's uh, just uh, just an overall brutal situation, and uh, so King Rat and um, and as what uh, the I will segue it back to Peter now, but uh, just to reemphasize what he's saying, uh, it would be naive not to simply presume, uh, assume that word has gone out because that is what has happened. A great example, just to segue back to Peter Moon with this topic and, and let him continue with it. And he sounds great. You sound great, Peter, despite the fact that you had little sleep, went through a football game, you know, went to a party, though you got yourself some sleep there and congratulations. Uh, when it comes to uh, what's gone out in terms of the word on us, uh, just understand and accept the word is out on us and always has been the moment Peter started working with myself. And uh, the, uh, the terrorism campaign or gang stalking campaign against myself has entered a, a very different phase. And this is where I uh, bring up the promotional banner for tonight's show. I don't know if Peter noticed it on his page. Presumably the tag hit and it manifested on his page. Uh, but uh, one of the photographs shows myself with my psychologist in disambiguation from my psychiatrist who is... Um, uh, very scarred. I mean, just scarred to the point where we're talking um, uh, body level uh, scarring from napalm that uh, is uh, cinematic in its level of impact, where this is something that it would take makeup artists to literally try and emulate the impact that this has had on my psychiatrist physically. And uh, so she understandably would never want to be photographed. But uh, in terms of uh, my psychologist, it's a different case. And she allowed herself to be photographed. She actually visited me for Asian Lunar New Year and came with me up to the Estates, uh, where my son photographed us. 
and uh, she uh, you did so because at this point she just feels there's no point in hiding her identity. I will do so to the degree that I'm not going to name her, of course, because she's already been overexposed. But Richard K. Cole Jr. has been doxing her for years at this point, literally putting out her social security number, her uh, address, her phone number, everything about her, her entire credit history, etc. Um, she's complained to the FBI about it multiple times, and they just told her, you know, go fucking die, you chink little bitch, you know, uh, get out of here, goot cunt, etc. You know, and they, they, it's these are the kinds of terms they use. So just understand, for an Asian Pacific Islander in America. Uh, you're treated as uh, less than human and someone to be spit upon. And especially in this age with the uh, Chinese Cold War uh, against the, the mainland, there's no concept of trying to make life amenable to where people will defect, just as there was no concept of that in World War II with the Japanese. The idea is simply to intern them and eventually exterminate them but in the meantime they might exploit them for as they did with the japanese as expendable soldiers where they send them as the cannon fodder in place of the whites or to rescue the whites who are trapped etc which is what they did with the japanese units in world war ii who actually had the highest rate of service medal aggregation in other words they collected more medals than any other combat unit in the entire united states during world war ii because your japanese units were the only ones fucking worth a damn and doing all the fighting because uh, the americans would just throw them in front and to rescue uh the whites and uh whoever argues with that is completely ignorant of the reality of history you can look that up yourself and you'll find everything i say is true but they never got these medals until President Clinton. So if you don't know that, it's another example of your ADC. It was until President Clinton, it wasn't until him that there was an apology, however lame, for the internment. And uh, this was at the same time while he was waging a Cold War against Japan on behalf of the uh, military elite, the old uh, relics, the old living fossils of uh, the American military industrial complex who were alive at the time of Roswell and uh, actively trying to hide the atrocities by launching a trade war against Japan uh, and preventing the Roswell uh, Memorial Museum from opening up, which of course resulted in divestiture and the total destruction of your economy, which has never recovered, of Japanese uh, investment, which is only now beginning has been for several years now beginning to reinvest in the united states because of the hostilities with communist china that have been developing over the past decade so it's been the past decade things have been slowly reversing and now they're coming to a head but now there's this enormous anti-chinese sentiment but uh whichever the case it's just all asians that get targeted so she cannot get protection from the fbi or anything done about richard k cole jr and he's allowed all of this information by the NSA, which, of course, he was affiliated with through Michael Aquino. So you're talking about somebody who's paid on your tax dollars to stay at home all day fucking his dogs, which he's bragged about doing, and uh, his chickens and shit, which he raises, and just uh, attacking everyone in my life. So uh, in the case, of course, of white trash, he converts them, like uh, David John West, quote unquote, a co-author of mine, who wound up uh, publishing on the Richard K. Cole Jr. blog, that, uh, that I had never written anything about vampires and that there was never a book published, etc., which is why Peter Moon and I had to rush out half the book in order to make certain we retained copyright on it because, you know, thank the gods of my ancestors, uh, David John West was telegraphing. He was, he was rattling before he struck so that he could publish the book and just plagiarize everything and claim it as all his own work because he was counted as the co-author on the original book because... He had done so much work for it, but none of it was anything that was worth publishing. It was just he was trying to make a story of it, which I felt he needed credit because I couldn't pay him. Uh, but uh, certainly all the material is strictly mine, uh, certainly as published now. And the only way we're going to publish the rest of it, which is the history behind the vampire physiology, uh, will be if people start buying copies of the book. So do that, as well as purchase Ro the Roswell Deception and the Demystification of World War II. Uh, because that's the only way to rationalize Peter Moon publishing uh, another book uh, that this time we'll be talking about the Presidio military base and uh, Aquino and all of the uh, human child trafficking that uh, led to the Presidio military base closure. And of course, Peter has also been investigating the vampire phenomena and Christianity behind it with me over the past several episodes. And uh, hopefully all of this puts into context turning the stage back to Peter and uh, just the fact that uh, don't think for a moment 
that it's not the case that the word hasn't gone out. So when Peter affiliated with myself, when we got the book published, then the gang stalking entered a different phase. And this time it's much more concentrating less on terrorism uh, than it is on suppression. They may terrorize people like my psychologist uh, to the point where in defiance, she allows a photograph to be taken because it's just, you know, there's no point. And otherwise the enemy already knows everything about her and she realizes everything I say is true. Uh, and uh, she understands that the enemy acts with total impunity, that if you're a white trash piece of shit, you can terrorize people of ethnicity, you can pill kill people of ethnicity, ultimately, and nothing will be done to you. Uh, and whoever doubts that, you can check out the hate crimes that happened in the 1980s when a Chinese uh, office worker was killed by two white trash pieces of shit because they thought he was Japanese and were beating him to death because of the Japanese uh, devastation of American industry. Uh, and uh, then uh, nothing was done to them. They were made national heroes on, on national media. So uh, there's, uh, if you're an Asian Pacific Islander American in the United States, like I have Richard K. Cole Jr. constantly calling for my deportation to communist China, a nation that I wasn't even born in, you can get away with this kind of terrorism. And uh, I, on the other hand, I have no distribution. I can talk about this, but it's just a voice in the wilderness. And uh, the end result is any book that Peter Moon publishes working with me, uh, he, things may be different with the next book. Peter argues otherwise. He feels that there's no hope for it selling because it's talking about uh, Satanism and that it will also be suppressed. And that may be the case. But either way, uh, all of it just falls back on yourself, the listener. None of this will uh, get out there without you. All of this will ultimately be read by millions of people. Uh, maybe after our lifetimes. And uh, if that's the case, then that's just the cycles of history. And that's almost certainly how uh, it will work if it doesn't manifest in any financial returns now. But uh, the one thing we can say is that uh, whatever the case is, unless you do something about it, then this situation truly is hopeless. So it's your war and you have to fight it. I've been fighting it for you for far too long. And you just can't keep counting on myself. I simply want to stop doing what I'm doing now and just truly just disappear. Uh, find some lady to settle down with and just, just you know, check out, so to speak. Uh, but, uh, and of course, I know that's not going to happen in the sense that I'd like it to because we have civil war approaching and God knows our world's going to fall apart anyway. At which point, uh, then we'll see the cycles of history and, where that takes me. But in the meantime, we're counting on you. And with that, I turn it back to Peter Moon, who will re-emphasize skybooksusa.com, where to get the books, uh, where to get Vampirology on Amazon, as well as uh, the Roswell Deception and everything else that he'll take from here, because all of it's important. Thank you, Peter. Appreciate it. Well, yes. And <clears throat> the uh, to, to get back, well, <clears throat> with regard to what Douglas said, <clears throat> after our last transmission, uh, Douglas presented a pretty ugly picture of the world situation. I'm not talking about the Civil War. I, I'm talking about the, you know, the state of humanity. Uh, this war stuff going on is kind of late on the chain. Um, <clears throat> humanity is in a, it's always been in a predicament. It's It, it goes back you know, so you have wars and you have all this and throughout history, you'll have certain people or places surviving the war. I, I know that some of the people I met today are, and some of them already have, who were not there, have, have moved down south looking for, you know, waiting for the cataclysm to happen. <clears throat> I'm not one who has ever bought into the cataclysm i've explained that before because or like at least for what i'm doing because uh you know you you can calculate to move to pike's peak in colorado not that anybody could live up there but <laughs> you know, to, to escape the the tidal waves or whatever and you could find that pike's peak could crack in half with an earthquake you know it's it's um uh, the earth does many strange things and it's not necessarily what we think or where we think. You could you could move into the south 
or a Midwest place and, and be uh, suffer tornadoes. We had some of that showing up in places very devastatingly that, you know, you, you wouldn't think you, you'd be. So, so it's, you, know, you, you can, you can calculate, but you can miscalculate. So that's, that's a personal choice people make, but, uh, <clears throat> to, to get back, I, I realized there's an energetic block on the book. And I mean, this is without even going into the, the conspiracy or the whispering campaign. There is a whisper. I was talking about neurological uh, pain that people suffer. Uh, Timothy Leary, I was quoting him uh, when you talk about liberating, liberating people. Uh, yeah, there is a neurological pain people suffer. And, and it even goes into the more subtle energy field. So what the Roswell deception, the book certainly reverses the understandings that people have had, the false understandings that people have had about World War II, uh, the United States of America, and what it's doing behind the scenes. <clears throat> so, what's, but what's more devastating and, and more the energetic block is is all the other stuff not not and not just the story of the presidio which is gru grizzly but who douglas actually is it's 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 you know this is not it's hard for people to understand and it's even harder for them to digest it's just like i'll run from here and <clears throat> this is unfortunately uh the burden that we bear. However, those of you who listen to the program are, you know, people have had some, very, we've had some very interesting conversations amongst us and, and feedback from, uh, from some of the people I know. And it's, uh, it's very interesting who are both, uh, I guess what you'd say, two of them are very laden with Christian upbringings and backgrounds and scholarship yes. so um let me see here i hope they uh, uh took well what i had to say with our latest transmission uh, if, if you were able to get a uh for some feedback yes. yes they were less concerned with some of the stuff uh than i was yeah. you know they, they, I, and I, I look at it from well how are people going to accept this um some people can really uh, get into this. But this was something interesting that one of my friends brought up. And he said, uh, he, he was actually quoting Radu Sinemar's book, History Abruptly Cuts Off About the 5th Century A.D. Um this is what Radu says. He, he's watching a holographic um, history of the world in, in this incredible projection hall beneath the Sphinx in Romania. And he says, you can watch the history of the world. It will be tailored to your biofeedback. In other words, you're going to see a 45 minute, 50 hour history of the world. It's going to be different for you than it is for me. Douglas's might show more stuff of China or Asia um, than, say, somebody who's non-Asian. We all might see something from Asia, but whatever. It's it's tailored to the individual and what the individual thinks. A, uh, he mentioned that this, this cutting off of the 5th century AD is a possible synchronicity to the revelation of the Magi document being written or published written or published in the 5th century uh, and, and, and and it concerning energy distortions as well. And so he thinks that, so why, you know, we can ask why did the this projection hall cut off in, in the 5th century? And I, I mentioned that um, 
this time coincides with the Dark Ages. It also coincides... Now, the, the, this uh, scholarship that is the... Uh, that is the return. What is it? The revelation of the Magi. Yes. Is is uh, you know has been obscured and and hidden and whatnot, or just mostly obscured, uh, certainly by circumstance to a large degree, and and it was it, yeah it brings up a lot of issues that, that are uncomfortable, but it, it's the Dark Ages. There's an author named Alan Wilson, I don't remember the name of the book, who wrote about King Arthur and his brother, Prince Modoc. This is mentioned in my book that Salman has read, the Montauk Book of the Living. Prince Modoc migrated from Egypt into, quote unquote, Camelot in the British Isles and eventually migrated to America. Now, this is uh, researched by Alan Wilson. It includes many place names that appear as you come up the Mississippi from Alabama. I think it's called, I don't forget the name of the island, but it's it, it the southern part of Alabama. And it goes up the Mississippi River, you eventually have a town called Montauk, Missouri, which is in this stream of migration. And the only thing you look up Montauk, Missouri, it says it was named after uh, people from Long Island who descended from, came from Montauk. It makes no sense. I mean, you know, you got to call something in the middle of Missouri Montauk. It, it doesn't make any sense. It, it, it makes sense if you look at it in this ancient uh, migration and Modoc because the medicine man told me Montauk Pharaoh was from Egypt he I think it's the same person Modoc Montauk Modoc you have phonetic uh, consistency and alteration so this migration from the British Isles by this uh, Prince Madoc Modoc or Madoc it's Madoc I'm sorry they, the Indians migrate, become the Mandan Indians, blue, Welsh Indians. And then there's a migration that goes further to Shasta, where I'm going, which is the Modoc Indians. The Modoc were the last tribe to surrender, the last Native American tribe to surrender in California. Right. And they fought in these volcanic pits and craters and, and whatnot. Yes. And I, I didn't know anything about the uh, Modoc Indians. I never heard of them until I had walked into the Capitol building in Sacramento. I think I was with my friend Doug, and I don't know why the hell I went. To, maybe we were just walking. Maybe we went to, but we went to the Capitol building, which is someplace I, I'd been to as a kid, of course. And and I saw Queen Calafia, uh the inspiration for the name California, and they had some, I think it was on the inside of the rotunda, or something, they had, you know, a carving tribute to the Modoc Indians, or all the tribes of California said Modoc. Right. Uh, it's interesting how they pay tribute to the tribes in the Capitol buildings. Uh, it's it's very interesting. It, well, it's, it's kind of like... Uh... Uh, the concept that the Americans had that all the Japanese were going to be exterminated, so they were setting up anthropological museums so that future generations would know what a Japanese was by collecting their bones to show how different they were from human beings because they were considered non-human. Uh, this was uh, kind of like, albeit at this point in history, it's meant as respectful. It's kind of like a tokenism where uh, now that the Indians are so um, devastated. Uh, there's kind of a combination of guilt and almost just like a museum attitude of, well, now that they're all gone, uh, let the people know that they once existed. Kind of like the California flag is of an extinct golden bear. It's the bear that uh, humanity drove to extinction that's represented on our state flag. And uh, so, you know, it's that level of... Uh, 
bizarre perversity that is not necessarily malevolent, but in a sense almost may as well be. Uh, at the same time, what's fascinating personally about your story is everyone should understand, of course, many place names in the United States are after dead and devastated or exterminated Indian tribes are taken from them. Uh, Modoc County in California, there is a county uh, named after the uh, tribe that was so devastated. And as our man Peter Moon says, they um, actually uh, are affiliated uh, with the history of the Mandan, which if my father or the man who raised and guided me, Chief Petty Officer George Joseph Henry Dietrich, if he is indeed my biological father, of which, you know, the chances of that are very slim. Uh, but uh, if he is my uh, biological father, then I would be uh, one eighth of the Mandan tribe f from from the tribe of Mandan, which I, I actually brought up before in the early days when I was introducing myself to the public. And uh, of course, I've tried to contact the Mandan tribe and they're just, uh, for all intents and purposes, they may as well be in another solar system. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's impossible to contact anyone. Uh, and uh, so these tribes are very tight knit. They're, they're basically incestuous. And um, so it's, it's really a kind of tragedy that gets compounded as, as time goes on uh, because uh, they, they downbreed because there's so few people to, they don't want to breed out. And so there's few le so few left that there's kind of a morbid inbreeding phenomena that's ongoing. And uh, so... That being said, I turn it back to Peter with that, and that helps to contextualize further, you know, some of Well, it, it says right here that, uh, um, according to legend, Welsh Prince Madoc yeah. found America before Columbus did. His people lived with the Mandan tribe, whose language is a Welsh dialect. Absolutely. Uh, Prince Madoc Owain of Wales and his people found America in 1170 CE. I think... Uh, Montauk Farrell is given by the medicine man whose whose in, information is very, very verbal and very inspired at a different date. But uh, it might have been 1400. It might have been even earlier. I, I don't remember. But and then then also what you have is you have generations of names, just like, uh, you know, you have many Cleopatras. Yeah. It's. You, it's it's very. I pointed out to archaeologists in Romania. There are many Zalmox. Uh, there's Zalmoxis was here. Zalmoxis was there, and I said, you know, maybe there were many people named Zalmoxis. I mean, you know, yeah. there's many people in Mexico named Jesus. It, I've also read in my recent studies that Yeshua was a very popular name in Jerusalem, uh, in Israel of those days. They didn't call it Israel. I forget what they called it. Judah. Uh, Judah, yeah, it was a very popular name, yeah. so it was a common name, but um, so so the the Modoc and the Madoc, into, I mean, you can't separate the the phonetics of those things. Yeah, it, it's uh, and, and then of course the, the, when you get deeper into the native culture, you see all of these connections between all of the tribes. I mean, there are divisions, but there are also connections. And, and it gets it gets a lot more interesting. But uh, to go back to the Dark Ages, so you have this uh, story of, of, and of course there's all these place names of King Arthur and Modoc as you come up into uh, Tennessee and Kentucky. He goes into them in the book. Uh, but the Dark Ages, this coincides with the Dark Ages. He's leaving uh, Egypt to go to the UK, and at that time, there was a dark cloud over the world. And this reminds me of what Douglas was talking about with Mary Shelley and the Frankenstein book, how there was the eruption in Indonesia. Tambora. And at, at, as I recall, there was a much stronger eruption, or what would you call it, darkness, that, that overran the earth at that time. It was not carbon emissions from old Atlantean technology. Uh, it was it was the same sort of phenomena, dark ages. Now we associate the dark ages uh, with the fall of the Roman Empire. There's no question that the fall of the Roman Empire and the, the extinguishing of cats 
uh, enhanced the plague. They, they destroyed cats. It was it was one of the the Roman Catholic Church would throw cats off of towers. Yes, it was to to kill a cat was um, you know an a act holy... of righteousness. Yes. Yeah, and 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 this is very this is part of the Dark Ages, very very disgusting, uh, and it's a complete annihilation of the feminine energy, as well. But um, so so we have in this period that Radu Sinemar mentions in his work is the history cuts off. We have the collapse of the Roman Empire, the Dark Ages, the persecution of cats, an excessive rat population, and we have disease and we have plague. And I, I thought this was particularly synchronistic with what you brought up with Mary Shelley uh, and, and, and what influenced her. So I don't know if you have anything to say about darkness that, I'm uh, talking about darkness in the air that accompanied what we know as the Dark Ages and no learning and all of the backwardness that, uh, that the Catholic Church rose out of and began to quote unquote flourish. Can you enlighten us anything on those, the Dark Ages in a uh, climatological sense? It's uh, well, definitely what you say has been proposed by many people. It's one of those things that I, you know, other than what I've said already, I don't consciously have anything that comes to the tip of my mind that emerges uh, that could add to that right now. But it's something that people can look up, which is basically there were times uh, in our planetary history when uh, the world was indeed quite literally very dark. And uh, this certainly is uh, he's impacted man's psyche. And, uh, you know, a good example of this, as a matter of fact, uh, would be just give me a moment to think uh, here and I can dredge it out of my uh, subconscious mind, because honestly, it is uh, hope. Well, is what comes to my mind. And so uh, the thing that people can look up will be uh, hope. Well, and let me see if I can uh, just uh, find maybe something to put inside of our text box here uh, concerning hope. Well, and um, that would help with uh, providing our um, dear friend uh, Peter Moon and everybody who's with us a kind of visualization, and he can describe it. But um, if people remember the Cahokia Mounds and the Mound Civilization... Very important. Yeah, and the Mound Civilization in America, this was profound. If you really wanted to imagine the uh, American civilization, and it was a civilization uh, before the coming of uh, the Europeans. Uh, this was a, a, a civilization that, imagine the Aztecs, a kind of Mesoamerican Roman Empire that expanded much farther north than people are aware of. And this was something that I learned from Michael Aquino. One of the things to always remember about Michael Aquino was that he was someone who uh, obviously had Scottish um, descent, and he always hid his Filipino uh, descent, but he was very proud of his uh, Anglo-Celtic, Scottish uh, kind of background, uh, to the point where he would dress up in the kilt and everything else. So I would hear from him quite a bit about Celtic culture. And uh, one of the things that I can assure you is that it's largely due to Michael Aquino that if you went on Wikipedia, which I've spoken of his deep connections with Wikipedia before, how he basically ran it from the very beginning as a psyop to suppress information, not make it accessible. Uh, one of the things you'll notice if you look up the Mandan tribes on Wikipedia, they go in to great pains to deny the Welsh connection. They will claim that, oh, there's this uh, completely ignorant myth 
that there is a, uh, you know, some kind of, uh, uh, you, you know, connection between the Mandan tribes and uh, some Welsh settlement in North America. Uh, none of this is true. All of this is uh, absolute, it, you know, it is just, I can't believe I found it. Okay, there we are. Now let me press the entry button. So I just got this out of my files. Hopefully this opens. Uh, it may not open uh so if that's the case then um it, well, it, it does open okay so i put that into the text box this will help uh peter moon and uh others on the round table with us tonight to visualize what i'm talking about and this is of course the mound culture of north america that was so impacted by the cometary apocalypse when the world went dark a very short time ago. In other words, uh, the uh, this was a comet that literally exploded. This is cinematic. It is out of a nightmare. And uh, so this was recorded by the mound culture, which was eradicated. You're talking about something as developed as the uh, pyramids, uh, the mound uh were as developed as the pyramids down in Mesoamerica and they were disintegrated it's because this uh comet caused great destruction just 1500 years ago so we're talking about like yesterday uh it, so it, this is uh something that is uh shall we say uh terrifying when you think about it and needs to be more widespread and uh now that i'm beginning to remember about it uh i remember what i learned from uh, michael aquino that i believe just may be Coming out now, I mean, the uh, if I remember other references to it, it was through the Hindustan Times, which, uh, of course, uh, can be found in English because the, um, the largest, uh, the most commonly spoken language in India between all of the different cultures as a default is English because of the English Raj. So basically, the earth was scorched and it was covered with ash. Buildings vanished, leaving nothing but charred marks in the soil where posts had been. Uh, the uh, temperature on the ground reached 1,400, 1,400 degrees Fahrenheit. And the Native Americans told of the sun falling from the sky. And they described a great horned serpent that dropped rocks from the heavens. And after that event, which at the most would have been 1,700 years agone, 1,700 years ago, uh, on a spot in what is now southwestern Ohio, the scientists have proven that the Indians created a huge earthwork impression on which can be seen a streaking comet. I have given an old, this is a very old sketch of this comet-shaped earthwork. This was taken by a German archaeologist uh, like maybe half a hundred years ago. Uh, but it was only this week, finally, that the experts at the University of Cincinnati confirmed that the explosion in the atmosphere was a piece of that cometary uh, entity Entity, uh, an airburst that annihilated the Hopewell culture, which had flourished in the eastern United States from 100 BC to about 400 AD. And uh, so that is probably being published in the journal Scientific Reports. In fact, I believe it was published on uh, Tuesday of last week. So that team was headed by the anthropologist Kenneth Tankersley. Uh, now, by the way, e e Asian Indian or the Vedic languages are something I don't know at all. Uh, I'm trying to look up the English uh, print version edition of the Hindustan Times, where I know this was finally mentioned. Uh, but they, uh, in there, you'll probably find uh, the modern evidence of what Aquino had educated myself about, the devastation of extensive uh, Native American culture in the Ohio River Valley, chiefly in um, southern Ohio. And uh, that was obviously a time when uh, we entered a dark age. Uh, the world went quite dark. Uh, as a matter of fact, when it comes to uh, the, this, this team and uh, what they're working on, it, they could not determine how, how many people might have been killed. 
uh, but Aquino educated to myself that it was a good part of the Earth's population uh, because wherever they excavated, everywhere, they only found burned earth, fire-hardened, burned villages, uh, ash-covered surfaces with post molds filled with wood charcoal. Uh, it was of these mounds that Howard Phillips Lovecraft wrote when he wrote The Horror in the Burial Mound. And at another site, the earth looked as if it had been exposed to heat from a blast furnace and limestone had been thermally reduced to lime itself. So this is a process that requires a temperature of about 1400 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, by the way, what I'm speaking of is memory from what I learned from Michael Aquino. I only know that an excavation was finally performed by civilian archaeologists, but everything he told me was military archaeologists, or rather archaeologists contracted by the Department of Defense. And uh, so they found ash-covered surfaces with post molds filled with wood charcoal. And uh, at another site, the earth looked as if it had been exposed to heat from a blast furnace. Uh, so the Ottawa tribe, they talk about it as a day when the sun fell from the sky. This is a northeastern United States tribe, a southern Canadian tribe. In southern Canada, they would be known as a First Nation. Uh, in America, they're just uh, another reservation collective. Uh, it would have been that bright. Uh, the airburst, even if it had occurred during the daytime, it would have been as bright as the sun itself. Uh, so if a similar event took place over New York City or Washington District of Columbia today, it would be automatically presumed as a thermonuclear device having gone off. So, again, we're talking about a thousand years before major European contact with the Western Hemisphere, when ancient American Indian or Native American civilization would have been so advanced that they would have annihilated the Europeans invading America. They had entire fortresses. Uh, and uh, when the original French explorers came in, they said that there were entire cities of Native Americans with their own wooden stockade-type fortresses that had their own uh, castellated uh, kind of uh, embankments. In other words, they were like a kind of cavalry fortress you would see out in the frontier west, only these were Native American built of logs, and uh, the original French that encountered them Later on, all of that was devastated, and because it was wood, it all returned to nature, and that was due to the Colombian plagues brought by the conquistador. But long before that, what they had wiped out with their diseases, with their biological warfare, was simply the vestigial degenerate remnants of what would have been a pyramid culture. And the pyramid culture would have been able to confront the Europeans with full cavalry and just uh, the Europeans would never have made inroads into America had this comet not destroyed that civilization first between uh, 252 and 383 AD. That's when Michael Aquino told me about the airburst. Uh, now, it's not just the well, airburst. They had the comet because they didn't have Richard Hoagland to save them. Well, there you go. I mean, you, you know, I can, yeah, that's, that, talk about bitterness. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that's, uh, uh, so, so it, it's uh, the catastrophic event of the cometary airbus that caused the socioeconomic uh, collapse of this culture. Uh, the, uh, it was similar to the explosion over Tunguska River in Siberia in 1908, which flattened forests for hundreds of miles. Uh, so all of this is to be uh, taken into account whenever um, we reflect back on this. Uh, I'm trying to uh, remember exactly uh, what else uh, that uh, Aquino uh, told me about it and what the Defense Department contracted anthropologists and archaeologists had found, uh, but uh, the Iroquois, they speak of a sky panther, the Dajoji, which has the power to tear down forests. And that's what happened in Tunguska, and that's what happened 
here in America. The Hopewell are the genetic ancestors of the Iroquois, uh, the Miami, the Lenape. I, I, I would, I would emphasize, I would, uh, yes, corroborate that because when you have Iroquois yeah. and Erie, yes, which are not far away, Erie is right next to New York State where the Iroquois were mainly, and this all comes down into the Ohio Valley. Uh, Erie's technically in Pennsylvania, but it's just a little sliver of land. And then you have Ohio, and this comes all the way down in the valley, extending down as far as uh, uh, St. Louis. And the ear, I-R, means cat. Yes. Cat. This is what the natives have taught me. Ir, a koi. Ir, ir, iri. That was... And it, you, can even, you can even compare the phonetics to Iraq or Aaron, as in Aaron is in Ireland, 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 and even the name Aaron, Aaron, uh, of course, Aaron, E-R-I-N, means Ireland. And so, so anyway, this area is... The, the, the University of Cincinnati, you know, found evidence of, of the cosmic airburst, airburst at 11 Hopewell archaeological sites in three states stretching across the Ohio River Valley. Now, this is particularly synchronistic and interesting to my work because uh, many, and, and this concerns the, the man who uh, Salman Sheikh interviewed, uh, who I introduced him to who I refer to as Mr. Ford. And he, uh, I, I told him something. This occurred in 2015, a uh, couple months after I had the podcast with David Anderson that led to the Time Travel Education Center. Uh, there was a person who read my White Bat book, which contains a very important exercise taught by my Qigong teacher called The Dark Room, which... Uh, my friend Jojo, who's listening right now, has just completed, did a very good job. She's now officially my best student in Qigong, and she's just started, but she she did a very substantial thing here. Uh, for the fifth week of the exercise, I tell the person to contact me so they can uh, they can find out what it is. I do not put the fifth week in the book. It's sort of a weeding out process. Very few people have have done the process. Also, when my teacher taught it to the class, he announced to the class it was the last time he would ever teach it. Teach it. When I came to him for, to, I did exactly what he said for four weeks, wrote it down, and I came to him for the fifth week, and he was shocked. He said, shocked anybody come and ask him. Like, you know, he's used to being ignored. He says, uh, he says, he says, pay attention to today's lesson. He says, you, however, will do this in the dark room, but don't tell any of the class. He gave us a certain exercise. So we taught it to everybody, but he says, to you, you're going to do this in the dark room. Uh, I never saw him teach that exercise again. Maybe he did. Uh, and I preserved at least four-fifths of the lessons in the book. Now, the person who called, I call him A.H., is the only the second person to call in and ask about the exercise. And... This impressed me. After I told him how to do it, he said he would like to go to a sacred spot and do it. And I suggested a couple places in L.A. because he lives there. Uh, and, and I'm familiar with L.A. So he, I said, but follow your intuition. So he followed his intuition and guess where he went? St. Louis. And he went to the Cahokia Mounds. That's exactly where he went. Wow. And I introduced him, I think, by email to my friend, uh, Mr. Ford, who, who is from the St. Louis area, if not St. Louis itself. Uh, and let uh, me see. I, I've got some more here, but go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to emphasize that uh, I found um, another sketch where I just... Uh, took this photo down from the internet now and this is something that uh hopefully will provide some further perspective i've entered that into the text box and what this is is a profound example of native americans 
documenting their own history. And what they're documenting here is the cataclysm that ended their culture, which had this not happened, then the Native Americans in North America would have had a culture that would have been rival to the Europeans and the Chinese. Rather than thinking as we do in terms of the kind of economics of a world today, a balance between Europe and Asia and America as the product of this bastardized uh, hybridization, we would be thinking of a Native American culture uh, balancing the Western Hemisphere between the two supercultures of uh, the Old World, just as if Africa had not been plundered, colonized, and uh, become slave-circuited in the most literal sense into the emergent global economy of exploitation. They would have had a fourth uh, balancing pole, uh, in other words, a polarity of uh, cultural uh, competition with Europe and Asia. So uh, in, in terms of the comet itself, I remember that it was, uh, there were about 69 that were believed to have passed close to Earth during that period, including Halley's Comet, uh, and uh, aside from that excavation that proved uh, the mysterious comet-like earthwork in Milford, Ohio, was uh, built after the explosion because the suspected comet remnants were found below the level of the earthwork itself. One of the reasons that Aquino actually had the Department of Defense contract the archaeologists uh, in order to begin excavating and proving to the military that this had happened. And I guess at this point, probably all of the documents that I was ordered to collate as opposed to destroy probably were declassified. And then what happened when they were declassified was academia, which was the same academics whose departments or the universities whose departments were contracted by the Department of Defense, they probably just sent a new uh, archaeological dig uh, to simply give credit to what they already knew. Does that make sense? Am I being coherent? But the reason why they were contracted in the first place during the time that I was working with Aquino was because he was grave robbing. And he was grave robbing for various satanic rituals. And when uh, it was basically a local cemetery that uh, mostly disappeared. Uh, there used to be a cemetery there, and uh, the earthwork had this flaring tail a half mile long and a cometary head uh, engraved into the earth more than a quarter mile around. Now, this was according to documents that I assessed for Aquino that were drawn in 1823. And it was looking up those documents that I see they've been finally released. What I'm showing these gentlemen now in this chat room, uh, the text box of the uh, of our Skype, not in the chat room, because unfortunately we can't show things in the chat room, that was drawn by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in 1823. That was classified. So that must have just been recently declassified along with the original Department of Defense contracted archaeologists. So the involved universities just sent a new team. Uh, and with all of this released now, they can talk about it to the public. All of this was above top secret. Because this was the Cahokia Mounds, this, this little, uh, the circle with the, the things going, the circles. Yes, that's right. That's right. And they're very similar to the Cahokia Mounds and part of that entire network of civilization that encompassed all of North America. Now, uh, so basically, we're talking about uh, the, uh, you know, the true tribal names of these people were lost over the millennia. And like I said, they were far more civil civilized than anything in Europe and possibly even in Asia. Uh, but the name Hopewell, I remember now that that comes from a Satanist named Mordecai C. Hopewell, who in the 1890s owned the land where this massive earthwork complex that included 29 burial mounds 
had been found outside Chillicothe, Ohio. Now, this is how Michael Aquino began the grave robbing. He was trying to find the body of Mordecai Hopewell so that he could take the bones and use them as part of his reliquary to integrate into his artillica, his uh, occult machinery, uh, ultimately to make part of the Vox Arcana. M as Mordecai, what was his last name? Mordecai C. Hopewell. As a matter of fact, I can tell you some of Mordecai C. Hopewell's bones are within the Vox Arcana. So uh, in terms of uh, the what happened to uh, the Hopewell, as I said, their genetic ancestors, uh, the savage degenerate remains of the once pyramid building civilization were the Iroquois, the Miami, the... Lenape or Lenape? I don't know how to correctly pronounce Lenape. it. Lenape. They are they are part of the Montauks. Okay. They they evolved into the Montauks, the Lenny Lenape. Thank you. And the Shawnee, the Ojibwe, all. Uh, and uh, but uh, in terms of uh, what's going on now, one thing I can guarantee you: whatever archaeologists they've uh, brought out into the open now to basically expose what the Department of Defense had uh, unearthed uh, at the time I was working with Aquino, they have to have Native American uh, archaeologists because they, the, the Native Americans, uh, along with the National Park Service, uh, in cooperation with the National Park Service, what used to be the Bureau of Indian Affairs, won't allow anyone to unearth Native uh, artifacts other than Native Americans. There has to be at least one Native American archaeologist or anthropologist involved with the team. So... Uh, uh, whoever it is, uh, probably some, you know, that would be something to look up. And uh, so uh, other than that, hopefully that puts what uh, Peter Moon said about a uh, dark age into uh, uh, well, perspective. There's, there's, more, there's more to add here because this is fascinating with this. Uh, now, Mordecai Hopewell lived. I, I, I see him. It says Mordecai Cloud Hopewell uh on whose property an excavation was carried out. Uh, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know, this person seemed to have lived in the 1800s. Uh, I'm a little confused about who he is, I, 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 except he's a Native American. Uh, and he's a, an essential creature, but this is, this is bringing up a lot of threads because we're talking about, first off, when I'm doing the dark room, we're bringing up chi energy. And my whole access to the dark room comes via Montauk and the Modern Talk Medicine Man into my my teacher, who's um, who's part Cherokee Indian. Most people would recognize him as black, but he was part Cherokee Indian. And he um, he was very aware of those energies. And of course, his knowledge comes to him via uh, a feminine tradition uh, from the Shaolin Temple of only females that practice it, not men, and via his his teacher who was half Korean and half Chinese. Now, this uh, so you have a lot of sacred energy running, much like I was talking about Chuck Levine and Cave. Now I'm I'm going to take everybody uh, to another place in the Ohio Valley, which I learned from my friend, Dr. True Ott, uh, who left the Mormon church after having a very high level position in Freemasonry and in the Mormon church. In 1979, he was sent on a church mission to Palmyra in New York, where the golden uh, tablets were uh, given to Joseph Smith by uh, their history. Where he participated in the annual pageant every summer uh, now, while he's there, he's staying in the nearby city of Syracuse, New York, which you've all heard of. It's not far from the area. The, the Palmyra is, is in between Syracuse and Rochester. Not that far away. While staying in Syracuse, he was boarding at an Italian woman's house. And she just happened to have a brother who was a Jesuit priest. One weekend, the Jesuit came home to visit his sister. 
He was a rather friendly man. He got to drinking and began to tell True a very interesting story about Mormon history. And what he actually did, what True had done, and I, I had heard from some uh, reader who, who had really enjoyed my L. Ron Hubbard book, L. Ron Hubbard, The Tao of Insanity. And he had, I said I provided some interesting insights, but he wanted to recant what I said about Freemasonry because he'd studied Albert Pike. And of course, everything I wrote was in complete contradiction to Albert Pike. Uh, Albert Pike, I was talking about 32 chambers in the pyramid. Oh, there are no 32 chambers and are corresponding to the degrees of Freemasonry. Of course, the average Freemason is not going to be given these degrees. And there is, I you know, told him he's doing pedestrian or plebeian Freemasonry. Uh, True was a high-level Freemason. And he flashed this Jesuit the sign of the nail. Now, I think the sign of the nail is probably, I don't remember what it is, I don't care, but it's its like it might be sticking your thumb through your middle fingers or something. I don't know, he gave him the sign of the nail. Now, the sign of the nail, if you look at the top of Mormon churches, you will find a nail at the peak of their, their church. It's a nail. And this is symbolic of the nail that crucified Christ. This is what they relate to. Uh, it's a satanic reference point. So anyway, he shows the, the Jesuit the sign of the, the nail, and then the Jesuit is rather, you know, uh, sounds like the ghost of Christmas present or something, and he's he's very friendly, and he's, he's drunk, and he starts telling him a, a very interesting story when because he sees that he's quote-unquote one of them. According to this Jesuit, his order... The Jesuit order had visited the Ohio Valley in the 1620s in order to chronicle the history of a large tribe known as the quote-unquote Indian pharaohs who wore pharaonic headdresses and had the accoutrements of ancient Egypt. Now, this is very important because if you study the work of Ralph Ellis, you will see that the, the Egyptians and the Hebrews were one and the same. The pharaohs and the and the the, the high priests, it, it and, and then it kind of separates with Moses, or that there's this inter, you know, they, they've got by names. Uh, so the Jesuits learned everything they could about the history of these people. They recorded it on scrolls, and they kept these scrolls in a cave. For some unknown reason uh, that they they couldn't determine. The uh, Algonquin, Algonquins and Iroquois banded together and fought these pharaohs and completely wiped them out. And they thought that their own interaction with the Jesuits might have been to blame. The, the Jesuits said they might be at fault just because the Algonquins and the Iroquois didn't trust them. So these scrolls remained in a cave. Uh, and years later, a man by the name of Solomon Spaulding was traveling along Canute Creek and found these scrolls by the Jesuits that were written in Latin. While the average person has never heard of Solomon Spaulding, and the name Solomon makes you wonder if he was indeed a Freemason, uh, he is a very keen interest to many who have vigorously debated the origin of the Mormon religion. Prior to the foundation of Joseph Smith's religion, Spalding wrote a fiction book entitled, quote, Manuscript Found, quote, which in many respects is hauntingly similar to the Book of Mormon. It was a fiction book that this character, Solomon uh, Spalding, wrote prior to Joseph Smith's Book of Mormon. It is not, however, identical. Many Mormon critics have asserted that Joseph Smith plagiarized or borrowed from this work in order to construct his book. Although scholars have debated this ad nauseum, none of them have heard the story you're about to read. You are amongst the first to learn it. Seeing the scrolls he discovered were written in Latin, Spalding could not read them. Instead, he took them to one of the most distinguished Latin scholars in his vicinity, a man named Signe Rigdon. Rigdon not only knew Latin, he later became deeply involved with Joseph Smith. 
Spalding only brought forth fragments to Rigdon to be translated. According to the Jesuit, Rigdon never had access to the entire contents. In the early 1820s and prior to Smith discovering the golden tablets, Rigdon moved north from Ohio to the Palmyra area and met with Smith. This is documented. It is possible that he fed Smith the actual information from the scrolls, but there is no certainty that this is the case either. It would stand to reason that he discussed what he learned with Smith. Um, my intuition, meaning Peter Moon's intuition, suggests that the manuscript Rigdon might have read, read might have provided clues for what Smith might have actually found at Hill Cumorah, where the tablets were given to him. Remember, Mormon elders have stated to the Moors that the original golden tablets were Washita tablets, Washita being the tribe, the Washita Empire, which which is was basically the Napoleonic, uh, what do they call that, the Louisiana Purchase, that the, the United States purchased from Napoleon, which uh, he actually didn't even own. So it was kind of a, you know, kind of a quick claim sell. After Solomon Spaulding passed away, his heirs forward his manuscript to a publisher in Pittsburgh in hopes of having it published. It eventually was and is titled Manuscript Found. The heirs, however, not knowing what they really had on their hands, also delivered the original Latin scrolls to the publisher. It just so happened that the publisher was a Catholic and notified his own church. Catholic authorities came to Pittsburgh, took the scrolls and said, Thank you for returning our property. To this day, these scrolls are said to be under seal of the Vatican. Uh, this paints a, big, a sketch of the beginnings of the Book of Mormon. Um, and, and this is, you know, an ancient, ancient history of how the Mormon church came into play. Sydney, Sydney Rigdon is one of the characters, I believe, who was witness to the book being given by an angel, if I'm not mistaken. And this is, you know, puts it into great suspicion. Uh, Joseph Smith was clearly an inspired individual who had magnetic abilities and even um, healing abilities, and True goes into it in his book, which isn't published, but he was also, like he was, um, but he was also corrupt and um, and really messed up because he had a lot of trauma. He was uh, he suffered a lot of trauma with his uh, early disease. Now, this is the Cahokia Mounds extend, you know, down to St. Louis. It's it's really a a fascinating um, story here. Yes. I want to share. I want to share. Um, let me see here. There's um... and while well, uh, Peter's uh, looking that up, uh, certainly what I can do is just uh, provide people just a few more things. We got a wonderful message from uh, Diane Hillis Buchberger. So thank you, honey. Love you dearly. And she sent me a link to an article from ScienceDaily.com, uh, and one of its releases is speaking of. Uh, 12,900 years ago, uh, North American comment impact theory, uh, quote unquote, disproved. This is this is very bizarre. But what they're saying is maybe it didn't impact because it's basically an airburst. This is basically what they're trying to say. So this is some kind of scientific doublespeak. But basically, if you read the article, what they are uh, articulating is as I'll read what Diane Hillis Buchberger has to say. Pretty much everything burnt down. Only people who covered themselves with mud and water in the swamps or went underground in caves survived. And we're talking about people who be, began to live in the swamps or uh, began to dwell in the caves uh, survived, not just like running away. And then uh, it, it's, it's this is kind of like all out nuclear war. Uh, it takes a long time for the environmental impact of this sort of thing to uh, resettle our nature to reestablish its equilibrium. Now, I'm going to link to the Science Daily article itself. 
And uh, I noticed that this is extraordinarily uh, technically written uh, in a format that, you know, it's very similar to, well, nothing's like Dietrichonic, but it's kind of like something your average person's going to look at this and then look away. <laughs> but um, uh, this is uh, basically this, this launched. Um, here we are. Uh, this is what they're saying that you will not get in any popularly accessible articles. For instance, when I talked about the Hindustan Times, this is one of the few places where they write about it and it's accessible, but you're not going to find out much. You're just going to find out basically that research by the University of Cincinnati has found evidence proving that the falling debris of a comet about 1500 years ago rained fire rained fire over a huge swath of North America. In fact, it's been measured at as much as 9,200 square miles, 9,200 square miles. For that area, at least, the sky was burning. And uh, so this happened, uh, like I said, just yesterday for, from a historical uh, perspective. And uh, they point out that uh, they've all uh, found um, high levels the, at, at 11 Hopewell archaeological sites that what the, uh, what the American uh, professionals are proving now uh, is that they, they found high levels of iridium and platinum. Uh, these are like uh, iridium and, and platinum are like miracle metals. It's the stuff you use in high technology. Platinum is far more valuable than gold. Uh, and this all indicates the presence of meteorite debris. This is why they're so valuable. They're not, uh, they're, they're not part of uh, your terrestrial inventory. And uh, so um, aside from that, uh, they, 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 they're looking at the pollen that's been trapped in layers of sand to understand how the comet air bursts affected the Ohio River Valley's botanical landscape. You're not going to get much more out of the Indian article than that. In the scientific article that was sent by Diane Hill Hillis Buchberger, God bless her, uh, basically they said that uh, y you've got this, uh, um, you know, continent-wide wildfires. Uh, that uh, that basically uh, did everything to uh, destroy uh, the world. Uh, so uh, they're talking about uh, the uh, the lakes uh, containing the charcoal are in Alaska, three sites, British Columbia, at seven sites. You know, it just goes on and on to to list the the global charcoal database. And um, so uh, aside from that, it's uh, it is what it is. Um, so this, of course, is from 2009. It's the University of Bristol. Uh, now, forgive me, this is going to sound really stupid. There's got to be a Bristol in the United States, but I always think England when I, when I hear that. And um, the, uh, you know, because everything in America, so much of it is named after England as well. So uh, we, whatever the case may be, um, it's, it's, this, this was written way before the, all this stuff was declassified. So whatever they're saying in this scientific article is not necessarily all that, it's not going to help anybody all that much. Uh, but one thing we do know is that was the end of the Younger Dryas about 11,700 years ago. That was an interval when the temperature of Greenland warmed by over five degrees Celsius in less than a few decades. Um, kind of what's happening now. Uh, so, um, anyhow, uh, there were clear changes in biomass burning and fire frequency uh, whenever climate changes abruptly. Uh, and uh, most particularly when temperatures increased at the end of the Younger Dryas cold phase. So, aside from all that, you know, moving back to where we are now. Thank you so much, Diane. And um, I'm going to turn it back over to Peter. He may have found what he was looking for. Well, yes, 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 and, and no. But uh, what's what's interesting about, uh, I will add a little bit more about, about the Mormon history. Uh, when Joseph Smith was killed in uh, Nauvoo, Illinois, b before he was killed, he directed his brethren to move north to Wisconsin. And he left his designated successor was not Brigham Young. It was James Strang, st spelled strange. 
Strang. And, and John Strang took over and led a key group of Mormons, including Smith's personal family, to Voree, Wisconsin. Brigham Young, a known Freemason, rebelled against this and insisted the Mormons move west. He actually wanted to go to the peninsula we know today as San Francisco. Uh, Young was tried as an usurper, but he had enough political power with his Mason roots to steer most of the Mormons his way. And Smith's re remaining family and the Wisconsin Mormons became known as Strangites and were considered a splinter group, yet they were closer to the true teachings of Smith than were Young's group. Now, it, it sounds like Strang was just a, a small cult. He was not. He was extensive. They went to Michigan and Wisconsin, and they had an island, in, to which is technically Michigan, and they had a, a huge community there. And they were very much a cult. And I, I once read an excellent novel. I would have loved to have made a movie of this novel about, and they, uh, I think, they're, they're, what, what actually got him killed, I think he was killed, because he had uh, one of their uh, uh, brethren had misbehaved or whatever, and he paraded him naked through the streets or something like that to humiliate him. And the brother of this guy, you know, fought back and they they really attacked James Strang. And I think he got he got killed. It was a really good novel that I read it was online. Really good, compelling story. Uh, but he was a very powerful cult leader uh, and was the designated successor of Joseph Smith. That's why the family went with him. But uh, that was interesting about the Strangites, they were following the path of the Montauk Indians who, who did, as they were dislocated, move to Wisconsin themselves. And he discovered the grave of a giant man, at least seven feet tall, who was buried with Egyptian hieroglyphics on a plate. These were said to complement or supersede the plates found by Joseph Smith. What is more interesting uh, to me is that they seem to be from where they were trailing the Montauk Indians. Uh, now, the Montauks eventually migrated to Brotherton, Wisconsin, only a short distance from where the Strangites settled. Uh, the above makes sense when you consider the oral, tra oral tradition of the Montauks. When Montauk Farrell came from Egypt to Montauk, he brought Masons with him. Now, this shouldn't shock anybody because Montauk Farrell was somebody who came from Egypt. That's why he was called Farrell. And he brought Masons with him. Well, who built the pyramids? The original Masons. Uh, the Freemasons built Solomon's Temple, which was all based upon fitting into the capstone of the Great Pyramid. So, or containing the capstone of the Great Pyramid. These Masons were very tall. They married into the locals and eventually became Narragansetts of Connecticut. Others moved on to Ohio and built mounds. Uh, now, what's interesting is, now the, the, the mounds are very old. They're older than that. But the burial mounds featured thousands of mummies, and archaeologists have dug up more than a few examples with plates of plates with Egyptian hieroglyphics. Uh, Tecumseh Brown Eagle, who is a friend of mine uh, from the Erie uh, tribe, informs me of historical accounts of locomotives using these mummies for combustible fuel. Yes, as they were as they were far cheaper than coal or lumber. The railroad men would often joke, there goes another pharaoh, when they would hear a sudden pop from the fire. Yes, yes. Uh, and it's, it's yeah, right. horrible. I, I mean, it was, it's just horrific, the amount of historical uh, material that was destroyed uh, when they were using uh, the, the, the mummies for fuel to during the, the railroad age. Uh, I'm sorry, go on. It's just, you, you just, you... You shake your head. I mean, there's nothing else to do. You want to kill these people and stop it if you were to go back in time. Uh, so go on. Well, you know, the, the dead feed the living. The dead feed the living. It's, it's. I mean, it's, it's, it's just the way it works. The, the fact that it's, it's just what happens. It's like using fertilizer. You're making use of the dead. But 
I'm not saying it's right, it's just what happens. Uh, the based upon oral and written sources, there is a distinct tradition of the pharaohs moving westward. It has already been established that the Moors had cities with namesakes like Cairo, Illinois, and Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, the pharaoh is at the center of it all. Uh, now, this whole connection with uh, St. Louis uh, is also interesting because, um, let me see, I had, uh, there was, um, there's a whole underground. I've, I've, I would really like to visit St. Louis someday. It's, it's a, a place I've never been to. It was the a place where you, if you were going westward or with the covered wagons or whatnot, this is, this is the direction you would go. It was, um, uh, and, and there was this, this whole underground there and, and Bush beer, uh, they used the underground to, to keep their beer cold. Yes. So they kind of took possession of what was the underground. They were the gatekeepers to the underground in St. Louis, or at least a substantial portion of it because keep your beer cold under there. So there was a, a man that Mr. Ford knew named Kronos, who's a homeless person, uh, a very strange guy. He's a very strange guy. Uh, he's going to try and look him up. He hasn't seen him. I think Kronos went down to New Orleans, but he had he had uh, archives underground. He knew about archives underground. It just you know seems to come in a concept which Peter Lamborn Wilson identified as sacred drift. It's just like things go to the most humble positions or stations in uh, in life. So, yes. I, I, when, you know, when you talk, start talking about this stuff with the Hopewell, yeah. and can you go back over what Aquino, he, he wanted to use the, this, uh, what was this guy's name, Mordecai? Yes. Who, who was Mordecai again? He was a... He, he was uh, apparently a Satanist, or so Michael Aquino said, that uh, if he was of Native American extraction, that means he would have been one of those who had become so disenchanted, so uh, disenamored of the white man pushing the Christianity uh, upon the Native Americans that there were a few of them who decided that they would uh, go to the dark side, so to speak, and whatever the white man was promoting, they would go to the enemy of the white man's God and, uh, and then uh, call that evil uh, a, upon uh, the white man uh, to uh, help to drive him from the land. Uh, so he may have been of that nature, or that's the impression uh, that I got from Michael Aquino. And in terms of uh, this is why Michael Aquino was searching for his remains and uh, searching to integrate them into Artillica, such as the Vox Arca. And, uh, it's fascinating because he's taking the magic of, he's, you know, he's taking the magic of, of the, the, pharaoh, the pharaohs is what he's trying to do. And the pharaohs are the uh, interlocutor between heaven and earth. Yes. And, and that's what this capstone business is. Um, Jesus says the rejected stone is the interlocutor from a Christian perspective. And it, it, so this is Aquino attempting to be the interlocutor, you know, the Vox Arca. He can, he can command the, you know, the forces. Now, what's very interesting to me, when I go back and look at the history of this Montauk Pulse, which is, I'm reading from, mostly from the spring of 2007. Volume 3 of the Montauk Pulse, number 10. And it has an article, The History of the Pharaohs, a Mormon Jesuit connection, which I've been reading to you. It also has an article where True Ott uh, connects Brookhaven with the Mormons and, and Preston Nichols. Uh, it has an article of the Son of Sam murders and the Montauk connection. A lot of articles here. And, the, and then... Uh, mentions the Mormons have a whole satellite dedicated to just their church. Rather than rent space on a satellite, they spend a half a billion. They spend a half a billion dollars a year to maintain a satellite in orbit uh, to put mind control beams into the church. <laughs> 
true, true art did this research. Um, Are you serious? And, With yeah, the mind very, of... serious, very serious. Okay. You know. uh, now, but the most interesting part of all, see, it's like all this energy, uh, you know, coming together in this one newsletter, History of the Pharaohs. Of course, that ties to Montauk as well. Brookhaven, Mormons, Dr. Soderholm, Preston Nichols, you know, because he built the equipment they were using for the Mormons. And it was Preston that I first visited the, the uh, Hill Camorra with because we had just seen Dr. Anderson, David Anderson. We went up to Rochester to meet with David and to get what he had left of the Time Travel Research Center. Right. And so the last page features a no, page four, not the last page of pictures. It says a postcard from David Anderson. And here's David Anderson sending me a postcard. Mm -hmm. Hello, Peter. Finishing work on an interesting project. We need to talk sometime soon. Sometime things, sometimes things are simply not what they seem. And then he has all these uh, four lines of nonsense letters with a line drawn through them. Would be great to meet to share thoughts at one point of your regular meetings. I hope all is well, your friend in time. And the front side is a partial view of Bethlehem. This was sent from uh, Tel Aviv. Mm -hmm. And I, I sent this newsletter out. It arrived at Montauk at my friend's house who we saw recently and who we're going to see next weekend. And her boyfriend at the time, not the same one she has now, immediately decoded this. Oh. I sent it out. It got to Montauk from having been mailed from the post office in Westbury and got immediately, and this thing was decoded within 24 hours from Montauk. This, this cryptic letter he wrote, this cryptic code. And I might as well read the article because it's, see, it's interesting how all of these elements, now all this newsletter was written, I see, it came out in the spring, that means it was written in March, or yes, and, and sent out in March, and this was just a month before I would start my Qigong training. Now, let me see here. This, uh, I should get, okay, I'll read the article. Mm -hmm. As I finished writing this newsletter, I received a timely but very cryptic postcard from David Anderson. It has been reproduced below, minus the picture of Bethlehem, the birthplace of King David, on the front, which is where the card was postmarked from on March 4th. It, was, it wasn't postmarked from, it was postmarked from Tel Aviv. The message is not signed, but it is written in David's handwriting and ends with his signature closing, your friend in time. Oddly, I had just written him a fairly long email reminding him that it has now been four years since he said that he would be ready to work with me in four or five years. Our message is crossed in the mail, so it is apparent we both decided to communicate at the same time. What is most peculiar is that it seems his train of thought was interrupted by some sort of message, quote, from the outside, quote, which is expressed in gobbledygook. It is crossed out and makes no sense. Amato Crowley used to communicate like this when he would go, quote, out, but that writing was easy to decipher. He would write kind of spontaneous handwriting for me. He, my take on this is that it is an outside or alien communication coming through David, a communication from the jinn, so to speak. If any of you are good at decoding, please send in your thoughts on the coded part of the message. It's a mystery. Another interesting point is that I did not set out to write about David, but he appears at four key junctures in this newsletter. One, the postcard itself. Two, the satellite article, because David... Uh, originally began his time research uh, to stabilize uh, satellites in space. And he had patented technology for satellites. So I figured if his if the Mormons had a satellite in space, they were using his patented technology. Number three, 
the inception of the Mormon investigation, the more my Mormon investigation begins when I go to see David Anderson in Rochester. On the way home, uh, we stop at Preston's house in Cairo, New York, which they like to call Cairo, like syrup, but it's Cairo. It was Preston said the town was founded by a man with a fez that was a fez and nobody knew much about him. And that that was a central part of Freemasonry, Cairo, New York. Well, Preston's house, in fact, was a old lodge that most of the presidents visited of that day. He bought it in a distress sale and he showed me the property. It was a bargain. Uh, he, you know, aggressively ran it down, but that was later. But while he was buying it, he came home and he said, as soon as he got home, the Mormons tried to undercut the deal and buy it from him. It was as if they were tagging us from when we went to Hill Cumorah after meeting David Anderson and came right down. We're on the way home. And he says, hey, you want to see my new property? I said, sure. So we stopped by and I, stopped, I saw it before he bought it. So that, that was interesting. You have all these different threads here, Preston Nichols, including Preston, you know, when we're going down to Hill Camorra, he says, I think you better turn off this way. We're on the highway. Be okay, I did. He knew where we were going, but he didn't uh, because he used to make this equipment that they used to, to control the weather. And because they never, a truce said they never had a problem with the weather and he never understood it. He went up to the parking lot where the, the angel is where the, where the tablets were given or discovered, they have this huge parking lot and he's up there eating lunch and he sees all this equipment, huge amount of equipment uh, that, that is there for the pageant. They bring it up every year starting in April, pageants in July. They have to bring it up because there's so much of it and they have to coordinate it. And it says Brookhaven Labs. He says, how come, you know, it's this Dr. Soderholm who, uh, who, who, you know, who, who was responsible for it. So when, when I found out this, all this out, I said to Preston, I said, uh, um, have you ever heard of a guy named Dr. Soderholm? And he said, yeah, but he's not a doctor. I know him at Brookhaven Labs, but he's not a doctor. They call him doctor, but he's not a doctor. And, uh, I told him about the equipment. He says, well, yeah. He says, who do you think made it? I made it for him. So Preston was, you know, making weather equipment, which is is right down his, his alley, of course. And all the synchronicity, now I'm looking back, floating through this, this newsletter. Now, we move on to uh, the next summer of 2007. By now, I'm, I'm doing Qigong. I'm in my second month of Actually, I should qualify that. I did Qigong for a year prior to starting with Roosevelt Ganey. I did about 10 or 15 minutes of Qigong daily. It really helped me with the football. It, it prevented injuries. But 10 or 15 minutes is nothing like doing an hour or two. So, and I, But it was like I was qualifying myself. I was The universe was testing me. And if I did this every day for a year, I might have missed 10 days. I was now qualified to start with Roosevelt Ganey. Uh, and take it seriously, really, you know, putting in uh, an hour or two a day. In the last issue of the Montauk Pulse, it was reported that David Anderson, the mysterious founder of the Time Travel Research Center, had sent me a postcard from Israel that was postmarked March 4th. Uh, okay, I re reiterated uh, what he said. And let me see here. So I get I got a call from my friend, who's my friend to this day, and she told me that the message was decoded, taking all of these letters, because her boyfriend happened to have a aptitude for decoding a message. Now, let me see what David said here. Um, okay. This is what the message decoded, this guy decoded. This guy at Montauk who worked at Gurney's, this is what David said. In this world and time, nothing happens by accident. If it happens, you can bet it was planned that way. Now, this was actually 
kind of a borrowed quote from FDR, who said, in politics, nothing happens by accident. If it happens, you can bet it was planned that way. But David is saying, in this world and time, nothing happens by accident. If it happens, you can bet it was planned that way. Now here I, I'm, this is, I'm reading this years, over a decade later, decade and a half later, and it's, all of these coincidences are flowing into this, this newsletter. And the implication of the above is kind of obvious. In the quantum stream of consciousness, all events are relevant to all other events. This is too basic, however. What was David referring to specifically when he said this? In this world and time, nothing happens by accident. If it happens, you can bet it was planned that way. I notified him by email about the decoding and received an answer one month later. After stating a bit of personal information, he wrote the following. Regarding message, there is much more there than appears. The random lines and crossouts are a way to reduce the effectiveness and screening by text scanning algorithms. If this failed, there is the encryption by substitution, which only takes a little effort to decode what would appear to be an obvious and non-significant message as your reader in Montauk suggested. But this encryption by substitution result is a misdirection designed only to ensure the original message reached you safely. There is a second level of encryption in the text that yields the true message. This will in turn lead to information I believe you and your readers would find to be very remarkable and surprising, something I believe you have already anticipated that will change many things we know and believe today. The information is already waiting at a designated point, but I cannot say here, more here, other than the message will lead you and your readers there. I may not be accessible for some time, but as always, I send my best wishes to you and yours, your friend in time, David. Now, so uh, I went in to the um, encryption. I gave it to, well, people gave it to top decoders. They could not decrypt it. Really people who are professional code decryptors. They couldn't do it. So it went nowhere. Until years later. And I eventually found out, he actually said to me, uh, he said to me that the encryption, now at that time he was in Tel Aviv. And I remember him telling me that he was going through the airport and all these Hasidics were drunk. It's a day that they celebrate where, you know, everybody's just, they all get drunk, uh, really drunk, not just a few beers, not just a few, whatever they drink over there. I don't think it's beer, but whatever they drink. <laughs> and it's a celebratory day. And it was very weird. And he told me that at that point in time, he was very concerned about his life and losing his life and that this technology being lost it's the world. And he said to me that he wanted me to know he thought I was his best chance. And it was at a designated point. Now, I would only assume that was the patent filing. And it was years. Well, so what happens after this in 2007? It's four or five years when he said he would he wouldn't be able to work with me. I don't really hear from him significantly until I'm now in Qigong for a half a year. I start reading Radu's book. I work out a contract with the publisher for the first book. And when that contract, this negotiation went on for months. Once the contract was signed, one week later, David contacts me and he says, would you like to go to Romania? I thought there was a great coincidence and significance here. And there is a, a coincidence, but it's, I thought they were in league together. Well, they are, but they're not because there's no, you know, they're different threads. So I start preparing to go, you know, to uh, Romania as early as April. 
and David gets on the phone with me and I, I, I said, I think I finally asked him this in person, how, you know, you said you'd be with me five years. I said, it's, it's Easter. Well, I mean, how can you be so accurate? He says, I'm not always that good. You know, in other words, it was a deed of coincidence. It was exactly like within one week of five years to the exact date that he said it would be five or five years to work with me. And it was very odd that he had this, this intuitive sense of time. Uh, so eventually, I don't remember where he said it to me, but he said that, yeah, I thought you would be the one to where I could, could, could get this. And eventually I got the patent and the reason I got the patent was because Deepak Chopra was asking questions about the world genesis, about the time reactor. He knew what they were doing, or heard what they were doing in India, and he wanted his hands on it. And that was not going to happen. And he started to, you know, act like the true character that he is. He, he could have helped the World Genesis Foundation. He chose not to. And basically, but but he, this was supplied to a friend of um, Deepak Chopra's, Alan Seinfeld, who that's where I met Jojo. Uh, and of course, Alan glad handle glad hands everybody in the in the celebrity world or alternative celebrity world because that's that's what he does. He's a tremendous networker. He knows he you know he was interviewing Andy Warhol in the seventies. He's got a long tradition of this. So anyway, he gave it he gave a, a copy to Alan. He gave a copy to me and maybe to a couple other people. This was sent to me. There was a particular woman in India who forwarded to me. And uh, the patent, I, I, you know, published it. I wrote about it. It's it's eventually been, uh, it's a patent application that the time reactor, I broke it down. I wrote about it. That kind of took, took a while to, you know, do and whatnot. But then... When I did the podcast with him in 2015, I asked him about it, and he misdirected. He redirected to China, talking about China. Why did you? He just he sidestepped the question. Now, uh, it's interesting, and it just kind of hangs there. Uh, there was also a dream I had had where he had uh, given me time technology, the secrets of time technology, the tape was erased and all this sort of thing. But eventually I did get that uh, when I went to Romania and when I uh, um, learned what I learned from him, but it took me six years to, you know, figure out what the hell he was talking about to the point where I could write it, where anybody could understood it. He liked the article and I eventually turned it into videos. Now it's interesting in this same uh, news, the second newsletter, I'm talking about, I have an article called The Pharaoh's Ghost. And it's funny, when I was out at uh, Montauk just the last time, this, this whole thing came up. And I, I, I remembered I'd written about it. Uh, and I, it was about my new psychic friend from Montauk, who I call Electra. I don't tell her, call her real name. Her name's not Electra. And I was accompanied by my friend Yonda, who was then working at Brookhaven Labs, which was so weird because she was with me, you know, when I first met Preston. And she was now working as an English teacher at Brookhaven Labs for foreign scientists because she's a teacher by profession. So she was teaching these scientists and they would tell her how terrible the United States was. It's horrible. And they would they were so prejudiced. And she would get right in their faces. You don't even know what the United States is. They just were like all. Rah, 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 rah. And she's teaching them how to speak English. But they hated they hated America. Uh, but not with a real foundation. It was just kind of they were parroting. It wasn't like what they knew was really thought out. Amidst other adventures, Electra wanted to visit an Indian burial ground mentioned in one of the Montauk books. It is located just off of Pocahontas Lane, a small street off of East Lake Drive, 
Maps generally do not clearly depict this burial ground and it is almost as if it is obscured on purpose. When we, get to po when we got to Pocahontas Lane, Electra said she had been to this very spot before, but she could not find it. I directed her up a rather vague path that sits between driveways of houses. I then pointed to the grave site, which is surrounded by a corral type fence. It consists only of grass and stone, save for the one quartz gravestone, which is that of Stephen Talkhouse Farrell. Only his grave is not marked by name. And I had just last previous month had, you know, told her if, if her house was a post office, Stephen Talkhouse Farrell went there because he was the greatest postman in the history of Long Island. Uh, Still inside the car, Electra could now plainly see the graveyard and expressed her disbelief that she had been in this very place before, but had not been able to find it. When we got outside the car, Electra was compelled to repeat that she could not believe she had been right at this very spot, but had not noticed the graveyard. As soon as she said it the second time, a random thought went through my head. I said, uh, that's because you did not have the gatekeeper with you. I thought, I thought, I thought of this silently referring to myself. At that exact moment I said that, a gate from the fence opened on its own. And it was odd because the gate blends into the fence so well that you would not even notice it unless you are looking for it. In other words, there is no noticeable gate. It blends in. There was no wind or spring that opened the gate. It just opened. And Yonda, who's sitting not far from the fence, immediately noticed it and affirmed exactly what I had witnessed. And she says, I didn't move it. Uh, and then I said, we've been invited to go inside. This was a sacred grave area. Uh, as we entered, I left an offering on the gravesite of Stephen Farrell. Seems like maybe I should do that next time we're out there. What might loosely be termed a spontaneous meditation then ensued between the three of us. Yonda, who was a terrific reader of energy, then said that she picked up that there was a very strong connection between this ground and the Pentagon, but she did not know what it was. That is easy, I suggested. The actions of the Pentagon have all but destroyed these people. What was once considered the most sacred nation and most sacred land on the continent has suffered convoluted and insidious attempts to destroy it. Despite this, the graves and the descendants of the pharaohs live on. None of this was new to me, but it soon became apparent that the ghost of Stephen Farrell was imparting a message to me. If that is not what exactly happened, it is certainly the most convenient explanation. Stephen Talkhouse Farrell was perhaps the most glorified of the Montauks. He was featured in P.T. Barnum's traveling circus as the last king of the Montauks. He really wasn't a king. That's P.T. Barnum. This was not true in any sense. It was his cousin David who was referred to as a king. Even though Stephen was not a king of the Montauks, it made good poster board for bringing people into the circus. As a Civil War hero, Stephen was already a celebrity in his own right and was known for his ability as a courier and expert whaler. The next day, I thought I was all done with Stephen Talkhouse Farrell, at least for the time being. To my surprise, he came to me within 24 hours of me placing an offering on his grave. While doing an internet search on a Montauk land deed, his name unexpectedly came up in the search engine. What I noticed, however, was that his middle name was spelled as Taukus, T-A-U-K-U-S, and not Talkhouse. Most history books spell his name Talkhouse, but it is obviously a degenerated form of what was his original name. When I told Amsa Sidcatlit Bay, he pointed out to me that the name Taukus is equivalent in meaning to black cat, where talk is, back, is a backwards version of cat and kush means black, as in the King of Cush or the Cushites. This was very interesting, but I soon witnessed a principle that someone taught me years ago, and that is that synchronicity often comes in threes. The following day, I was pursuing what I thought was a completely different tangent. Specifically, I was researching the Ark of the Covenant for the Montauk Book of the Living when I inadvertently came across a word I had not noticed before, Takash, T-A-C-H-A-S-H. -S -S -H. It's like Takash, but it's Takash, same word phonetics. This is a very interesting word that is not only virtually the same as Takish, but is also very mysterious in its own right. A Takish 
is described as an unknown animal from biblical times whose skins were used to wrap up the Ark of the Covenant when it was transported between locations during the times of the tabernacle in the wilderness. This was where the Ark was housed prior to the building of Solomon's temple. The tent for the tabernacle was also made of Takish skins. Scholars do not really know what a Takish is, but there have been various assertions as to what it refers to. These include a one-horned, multicolored animal, a duogong, which is the cousin of the manatee, a dolphin, a giraffe, or even a unicorn. Although this remains a mystery to students of the Ark, it is a mystery that is largely ignored by the Jewish, Jewish faith. This great mystery, however, has now yielded to, is now yielded due to the visit from Takis Pharaoh. Takish and Takis are words that are basically the same. If we consider the aforementioned data from Hamza that the skins referred to are that of a cat, the picture begins to make a lot more sense. Ordinary scholarship will tell you that before Moses and Aaron came along, there were earlier Semitic versions of what might be considered the Ark. The cherubs in these earlier versions, however, consisted of she-cats with wings. In this case, the cherubs are actually sphinxes. This allusion to the cat makes even more sense when you consider that the most holy exaltation of the high priest was Kadosh, or Kadash, Kadosh. This corresponds to Kadiska, a Berber word for cat, which is related to Kadis, a Nubian word which also means cat. The Hebrew religion specifically states that the most sacred expression of divinity, the Shekinah, is the feminine essence. Kadosh represents the same thing and is represented as a cat. In my research of the Moors, the cat has appeared in again and again. Now it is being reiterated by the ghost of Pharaoh. Hamsa has said time and again that the cat is the ultimate expression of interdimensionality. All of this corroborates what the oral history of the Montauks is telling us. The Montauks descended from the Egyptian pharaohs who were also the Hebrews of the Bible. The connection to the cat is also recognized in the culture of Egypt and will be covered in my next book. That's that. So this is very interesting because the indigenous energies, I have to bring this newsletter back to uh, the woman I call Electra. I gave her a very exotic name, named after the star of the Pleiades. But uh, th this, is, this is fascinating to me because I go back and I see all of this and all of it's connected to Montauk. Now, now David Anderson comes in again here because last time I saw him physically was in 2010 and it was at Montauk when he showed us the earlier version of the time reactor and Electra was there and her boyfriend who decoded the message was there. He went into complete denial, said it was all fake and he just could not take it. You know, he, he was, it, he, he couldn't, he, he, he couldn't handle it psychologically. It was outside of his um, reference frame. And then we go to autumn 2007 and Montauk's Sleepy Hollow connection. Now, all of the Montauks went to, uh, not all of them, but they, when Chief Weindanch, who was the most famous of the, of the chiefs of the Montauks, his daughter was Heather Flower. And on the night of her wedding, the Narragansetts came and kidnapped her. The Narragansetts kidnapped her, took her to Sleepy Hollow, and a bunch of Montauks moved to Sleepy Hollow, which is where FDR is basically from. You go to Sleepy Hollow, you'll find all sorts of stuff. The FDR library, Hyde Park, it's right up there. So, and this was the Von Tassel, uh, connected to the Dutch Von Tassels, who was part of FDR's family tree. He was tied to the Montauk Indians via the Dutch Van Tassel line. Uh, there was the uh, Dutch connection. The first historical European name for Montauk was Vischer's Hook, named after a Dutch navigator by the name of Vischer. The second prominent Dutch name to appear in Montauk history is Van Tassel. This is a particular noteworthy name to me, and it's first appropriate that I tell you how I came across it. Over a decade ago, I took a trip out to the Suffolk County Historical Society in Riverhead. As Montauk is in Suffolk County, I thought I might find some information there. One of my fr friends, a woman who will, I will refer to as Rose, agreed to meet me at the Riverhead Library. 
She lived out near Montauk and wanted to help me dig up some data. After the curator directed us to the archives, I found those from Montauk and she checked out the archives for Tesla. At first glance, we were both rather dis disappointed. She only came up with an old picture of the Wardenclyffe Tower that Tesla had built. The picture was nothing special. This was all Suffolk County had on the most famous and enigma enigmatic inventor in the history of Long Island. All I came up with was a genealogy on Chief Windange, one of the more prominent characters in Montauk history. It seemed odd that this was the only file they had on Montauk. It was not even about Montauk per se, but only about one particular famous Indian leader. The more I looked into it, however, I could not believe what I was reading. To the astonishment of Rose and myself, we discovered that this genealogy was composed of a lady, composed by a lady named Wilson, who was studying her own family history. This is this Wilson connection that extends all the way to West Point and the Indian tribe out in uh, West Point, California, that are, that are tied to uh, the Miwok Indians of Yosemite, which are also tied to the place where Radu Senamar went into the inner earth on the reservation in Yosemite for his book. Okay, so this lady Wilson was a blood relative of Wyandanch and was seeking out her roots. What was most bizarre was that she lived in the town of Cameron. And Cameron comes with Wilson. This, this is a small town somewhere in the northwest part of New York State. She had traced her lineage back to the Von Tassel family who had married into the Montauks. The story of how this all took place is rather famous in itself and was something I was already familiar with. Uh, common history says well, Chief Wandanch had prepared a huge wedding for his daughter, Heather Flower. When the wedding day arrived, the Narragansetts of Connecticut ambushed the entire wedding party, killing Heather Flower's groom and taking her captive. Only through the diplomatic negotiations of Lion Gardner was Wyandanch able to retrieve his beautiful daughter. The trade-off, although, is not always depicted that way. It was that she would have, she had to marry a Von Tassel. Exactly how she married in the Von Tassel family is not known by myself, but it was probably a forced marriage for purposes of insinuating themselves into the royal Montauk bloodline. It is, however, a known historical fact that Princess Heather Flower, who represented the pharaohs of Montauk, only married a Von Tassel after her beloved bridegroom was murdered. Now, I would also say that Lion Gardner's descendants were always trying to have sex with the Montauks because they wanted the royal blood. That this is historical. They were, you know, trying to rape them. Maybe they were working for them. The Gardners are a very rich family. They have a whole uh, island uh, north of the Hamptons called Gardner's Island. You can't go there. It's their own island. It's huge. Uh, now, the name Von Tossel stood out like a sore thumb to me because I had en encountered it before. My first encounter with a Von Tossel was very mysterious. When I was in high school, I had looked up the address of an author, Robert de Rapp, who had penned a book entitled The Master Game. I was in interested in pursuing my own esoteric development, and this was my first step along the path. He directed me to a man by the name of Edward Von Tossel in San Francisco, who I exchanged correspondence with. This did not amount to anything because I eventually went into Scientology, but I never forgot the name. Had I not encountered Scientology, I would have pursued the path of the Von Tossel family. Only, you know, it's all roads lead back to Montauk. Scientology led me back to, to Montauk via the mind control that I understood. Otherwise, I would have been in the, in the von, esoteric tradition of Von Tossel in San Francisco. I, I could never find anything about Edward Von Tossel in San Francisco. It was a San Francisco address. I wrote him in San Francisco. Over 10 years later, I was doing some filing work. This is after my encounter with uh, Von Tossel when I was in high school. Over 10 years later, I was doing some filing work during my waning days of Scientology. I had announced that I was leaving, so they put me on non-critical filing work while my final walking papers were being arranged. In those files, I saw a PR proclamation awarded to George Von Tossel for his work in pioneering psychic research. This proclamation was only just a goodwill gesture on behalf of the church in an attempt to win an ally of Von Tossel, who was a prominent contactee from the 1950s. This, however, was my first run-in with George Von Tossel. I had never heard of the man, 
And I had to wonder if he was related to Edward von Tossel of San Francisco. To this day, I have no idea. George von Tossel had the largest UFO conferences in the world back in the 1950s. They were located in the desert near Giant Rock, not far from Yucca Valley. He erected the Integratron, a dome-shaped construct that was designed to literally rejuvenate your physical body. It still exists, and I even strongly considered purchasing the land and building back in the early 1990s. One of Marjorie Cameron's contacts was considering buying it, uh, but she demurred and passed along the suggestion to me. This was a, a friend, Sophia. She was in the OTO. She was, uh, she had been in Scientology, and she became a friend of Marjorie. She joined the OTO. She was a really good person. Unfortunately, lost her breasts or one of them, and I, I don't know whatever ever happened to her. Uh, but um, as I continued to pour through Mr. Mrs. Wilson's file on her genealogy, I soon found that the Von Tossel family, including Heather Flower, had settled in the village of Sleepy Hollow, which was a Dutch settlement. The Von Tossel name is the most prominent in the area. From that moment, I wanted to take a trip to the library in Sleepy Hollow and explore the Dutch connection. Keep in mind, this time period referred to Washington Irving and his Legends of Rip Van Winkle, America's first publicized time traveler. Sleepy Hollow is only about an hour north of Manhattan and an hour and a half from me, but I never made the trip. In fact, I did make the trip to Sleepy Hollow uh, because I was working with a cinematographer who was became a very dear friend. She passed away, but she her she lived in Sleepy Hollow, and I remember coming back from. Uh, uh, Mary Hardy's in, in Michigan, and I was going to Sleepy Hollow to see her, and my car conked out, the transmission went dead on the Sleepy, the famous, infamous Sleepy Hollow Bridge. Stopped right there uh, of Ichabod Crane. It was as if it was wanted. Then I, uh, I had to, you know, somehow I got the car just enough to put it into a, a parking space walk, go to a, a car place that was still open because the transmission was going to have to be completely fixed, which was a lot of money. And I uh, somehow, you know, he would look at it and he would uh, give me a, I had, I had to spend the night there. So I remember walking down to a, uh, hotel full of Mexican truckers. They were great. They were such great people. I was the only non-Mexican there. And uh, they treated me with such niceness. You know, you wouldn't get treated that way by white people. You wouldn't. Yeah. Uh, no, no, not, no way, not know how. Uh, and, and this is funny, I find, because people will ridge up and they were just, they were so nice. They treated me just like one of them. And I just smiled and waved and, you know, might have exchanged a few pleasantries, but I didn't, I, you know, went into the, uh, you know, the room and I, I kept trying to contact my cinematographer. She was not answering the phone and it was frustrating the hell out of me because I, I wanted to see her. Maybe she could help me. Maybe she could at least come and, you know, maybe I, I don't know what, the, you know, but, but she wasn't coming through and somehow I guess I had my cell phone and I got a call from my Qigong teacher, which was really weird. And he was demanding, he says, he says, look, we're under psychic attack. We're under psychic attack. This is the only time he ever said anything like that. He says, I want you to come down to uh, New Jersey. We're going to do a seminar. Uh, I want you there. I want you there. I said, well, I really can't afford it. He says, no, it's okay. You come, he says, just, just don't, just don't tell them, you know, these people are paying $500 for this seminar. No, you, you, he says, you just, you just come. Don't, don't say anything. You know, as far as you're concerned, you paid for it. Says, you, you show up. And, uh, he was going to have one of his students come. I said, no. And, and I, I, I was, uh, and apparently his work was being advertised by my friend Madeline in, in the, in the West coast. And, he was going to be doing a seminar and boy, there was just all sorts of trolls coming out against him. 
uh, it was bizarre. Internet trolls, like by the bucket load. Aquino was in high gear. <laughs> this was in Marin County. Madeline was in Marin County, and she just gave him a really nice write up. And and um, Madeline was so spooked, she didn't show up. She got her plane ticket to come out. He wanted her there, uh, and she 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 rabbited, went away from Qigong. So I went to the, I went I showed up. I got my uh, I got my car fixed. I got down to Wildwood. Wildwood, New Jersey, which is down south of uh, Atlantic City, and we're on the beach, two-day seminar. It was incredible. It was just incredible. And she, when I got in, I knocked on the door. He was talking to her on the phone, and, and she, you know, why didn't she come? And that was really the last I ever saw, man. Like a fantastic healer. I mean, we talked on the phone some, I, but I never. She just kind of faded out of my life, and she eventually died of uh, cervical cancer. And it was it was a shame because, you know, she she would have done so well. She was already an advanced healer, but she just phew, it was it was very sad uh, what happened to her. And she will still visit me in my dreams occasionally. But um, so anyway, this is all happening in Sleepy Hollow. I think technically I might have been in Terrytown by by that in, in, while I was in the in the hotel, and. Um, um, so that 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 was, uh, you know, sort of a side story to to all of this in the Von Tossels. I think at one point, maybe when I was visiting my friend Nancy, oh, she called the next morning and said, "Look, I, I'm just, you know, she was just so screwed up with her mother." Nancy had had a, you know, she had cancer. She had a family situation. She had to usher her parents out of life, and it, as soon as she ushered them out of life, took care of their problems and got them through hospice, which she was very attentive to, she passed away. As soon as she got them out the door of this life, she passed away about a year later. She had uh, done, I had taught her a lot of Qigong, took her to my teacher. It really helped her pass, I was told. Um, so that's Sleepy Hollow for me. There is also a very, let me see if I, if I can find it in here. It's a very important It's a very important. Oh, here it is. Curse of the Montauks. This was actually an article I wrote a year previously. Um, let me see. There is a book called. I got. Oh, you see. This. Okay, um, Sharon Jackson, the, the shaman of the Montauks, she said 2007, or was it six? Let me see. Spring 2006. It was 2006, she said, this would be the year in which she and I would work together in regards to finding the lost secrets to the ancient heritage of the Montauks. I think I'm doing pretty good with what I've said so far with regards to that, and I should give her a call too. She's legally blind, and you know she's kind of like out of the loop in a lot of regards. But she's she's got a lot of uh, always has a positive input. She is particularly dedicated to finding out exactly where the former pyramids of Montauk once stood. The first step in her investigation led her to uncover an old newspaper article from the Brooklyn Times Mirror of November 26, 1933, headlined, Curse of Montauk Still Holds for White Man After 200 Years. It is stated that for over 70 years it has been an accepted legend on eastern Long Island, handed down by a generation of Montauk Indians, that the lands of Montauk were cursed as long as white men shall deprive Indians of their rights, and that the curse is specifically mentioned in a historical novel entitled Made of Montauk. The first paragraph of the article by Arnold E. Rattray stated, when will the curse of Montauk be lifted? Is the 200-year-old curse of the Montauk Indian chieftain ever to be disregarded in the face of failure after failure of the white man to take wealth out of the dunes of Montauk? The article was inspired as a result of a tax sale that was liquidating the assets of developer Carl Fisher, who had tried to, to make Montauk the Miami Beach of the North. 
Assets in the sale included the Montauk Manor and the Montauk Tower. It was also mentioned that the Montauk Curse had plagued several earlier attempts to develop Montauk as a port of entry. Old timers stated that the curse would have to be lifted before anything could succeed. A most intriguing aspect of the Montauk Curse is the famous names associated with a huge publicity campaign that promoted Montauk development. These included Will Rogers, Admiral Richard Byrd, former Mayor James Walker, Gene Tunney, the boxer, and a certain Charles Victor Bob. Of all these characters, I found Charles V. Bob to be the most obscure, but also the most intriguing. When I looked into this character, my intuition lights went off big time. A pinnacle of New York society in the 20s and 30s, there is very little written about him. It is known that he was involved with arms dealers and was the primary funder of Byrd's Antarctic expedition. Bob was eventually convicted of securities fraud after the 1929 crash. Looking a bit deeper into what I could find on Charles Bob, I found that he arranged the Comstock merger, a huge mining deal in Nevada, which resulted in him becoming the head of a new conglomerate. As president of the new operation, he sold it to the Cecil Rhodes Roundtable Group, an organization which stands tall in conspiracy literature. After the sale, Bob remained at the helm. This indicates that he was a major player on the world stage and was respected by the world's big time operators. I suspect that he might have been a major financial link to early German operations that occurred at Montauk during the 20s and 30s. The Germans have had a continuous presence at Montauk since at least the 1900s. One of the reasons I suspect this is that he was involved with a bizarre character named Dean Lamb at the Verto Plane Company on Long Island. Verto Plane is V-E-R-T-O-P-L-A-N-E. Verto Plane history is rather scarce, but they publicly were known for creating a biplane that could act as a helicopter or regular airplane. It actually worked, but a test pilot was killed when he tried to change from one mode to the other during flight. He bailed and his parachute did not open. It sounds like the triple nickels, or not the triple nickels, but the, you know, the smoke jumpers that they killed. <laughs> the object of this company was to create a craft that could accelerate or take off vertically as well as move laterally. The Germans were obsessed with this idea with their frill craft and also had a multitude of aerospace engineers on Long Island during that period. Um, Dean Lamb was an interesting character because I said um, the, the bizarre character who was involved with, with uh, the Verto plane uh, was Dean Lamb. He was one of the most curious, character, curious characters ever to grace American history, a test pilot mercenary who seemed to be at every major event from the world's first dogfight during the war against Pancho Villa. The World War I, he ended up running the Flying Tigers Air Squadron during World War II. Lamb was an arms dealer galore, but also worked for Verto Plane on Long Island, where he was associated with Bob. He wrote an autobiography entitled Incurable Filibuster, but it is out of print and hard to come by. Um, my suspicions became further aroused when I discovered that Bob was a funding sponsor of Rainbow Luminous Products. The Frill Society was also known as the Luminous Lodge. Rainbow is, of course, suggestive of the Rainbow Project, the actual name for the Philadelphia Experiment. Rainbow Luminous Products was primarily known for litigation with Claude Neon Lights for stealing their patented procedures. The association with neon lighting, however, is intriguing when you consider that one of Preston Nichols' most fascinating theories ever concerned the use of the noble gases in time travel. Unfortunately, he gave his speech to me and oddly one other person, a girl I've actually seen travel in time, but it was not recorded. That was when Preston, he gave this impeccable lecture on uh, the noble gases in time travel in front of me and, and Maya, the girl I'd seen travel in time, and it was just impeccable. When I, I went back to get it again and record it, he didn't remember it. The noble gases are on the periodic table and include neon, argon, exon, xenon, and others. They were originally designated as noble because the use of these gases was considered rarefied and reserved for the aristocracy of those knowledgeable enough in alchemy to use them. None of this proves that Bob was overseeing vacuum tube experiments with noble gases and a joint liaison with the Vril Society, but when you consider the gap in its history and some of his intimate concerns, it provides a window of opportunity for further investigation. The fact that he was in bed with Richard Byrd and Carl Fisher at Montauk 
seems to be icing on the cake. Of course, this was long before uh, Richard Byrd did Operation High Jump. There is an, but that should not be discounted. There is an even more penetrating association with any of the above. When I told this story to one of my friends, she saw the name Bob as a major flag. Uh, she said Bob was used to come up in alien communications and interventions in in uh, with abductees. It was Bob coming up, Bob. Like I think there's a movie called What About Bob with Bill Murray, which is very funny. Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps this exposure will help lift the curse of the Montauks. Right now, the shaman is seeking to lift the curse against her people as well as the sacred ground at Montauk. The Montauk project itself seems to be the result of an effective curse. Uh, it requires more digging. So this is um, this is interesting, and I have to stop there and ask you, Douglas, if you have anything to say about any of that, because I've touched on some pretty interesting areas that you might might have something. Oh, of course. I mean, it's just all too much. Uh, you'll probably go into it uh, later tonight, but uh, certainly when you speak of uh, the... Uh, uh, yeah, all I can think of is the atomic bomb testing, and, uh, you know, this is what I, I think of Castle Bravo. Uh, and, of course, uh, we've spoken of this before. Um, obviously, uh, David Lewis Anderson, for a while, was living up there quietly in Rochester, New York, in what was effectively an ab abandoned industrial site. And uh, so it was just a, a very mysterious activity, and uh, it correlated with some things that I knew about uh, the Philadelphia experiment and what I had learned from my father. And so uh, all of that is, is what comes to mind my most immediately. I'll, I'll certainly uh, share some of it. And uh, when, it's, uh, when it comes to uh, all of this, of course, it's rather painful for me. And uh, we um, have these same types of, shall we say, convergent experiences. And we're essentially experiencing something different. But at the same time, it's, uh, it's all connected in the end. Uh, certainly, David Lewis Anderson is, he behaves like someone who's uh, not quite human or uh, rather kind of a uh, almost extra dimensional character. And this could be a byproduct. You're totally right there. You're totally right. Yeah. And, and what, I mean, yeah. So, and, and while you're and not, not, not in relation to him, but I realized those dreams that I had uh, that I've talked about before with, with the Asian woman on over me asking me for my crime she just fits right out of the the chichoa and i or the, the i forget the specific name for them you know getting on your chest and getting in your face that's just the dreams i was having were exactly chocho -cho type dreams yes yes and uh and, and this is something that seems to shall we say it, it's symptomatic it's it's symptomatic of uh, of of all of this. So uh, it's something to bear in mind. It's uh, just a a very uh, a difficult subject. And uh, so when I think about it, it it requires if you you know we, is let's just put it this way for our listeners so they understand it better. Uh, our man, Mister uh, Peter Moon, had uh, experience with uh, shall we say certain people who have impacted his life profoundly, uh, so profoundly that they uh, required, uh, shall we say, um, books. They required books to kind of cathart uh, the impact uh, that they had on uh, his life. And uh, when it came to um, my father's experience, there was something that uh, I, I felt uh, would have been a, a creature that uh, could have explained much of the unearthliness of David Lewis Anderson. But uh, Peter Moon experiences David Lewis Anderson as more of an ascendant master, and uh, therefore as a kind. That that's the that's that's what people ascribe to him. Yeah. I yeah. mean, I, I kind of. I mean, there is there is. There is that element to him, yeah. but there's the other, the, the, the non-human element. It's, it's, you know, it's, he's very human in actual fact, mm -hmm. very human, but it's like, there's so much more going on there than right. just an ordinary human. Just like you, you are an ordinary human, but you're not, Right. you know, I mean, you, you know, you do 
stuff that ordinary humans do. You, you know, you can go to a restaurant and eat. Uh, you go to the bathroom, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, you get cold. Uh, but there's so much more going on with you right. than in this same case with Preston Nichols. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, there's much more going on with him. And it, it, there is there is an ascended master aspect to him with his advanced knowledge. Uh, there's an MK Ultra aspect where he kind of like, or 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 at the very least a security complex where you know you you what what you want him to say he doesn't say he doesn't answer the question that he referred to earlier he, and he'll sort of misdirect mm-hmm. uh, and say when I when I ask him a question he, you got to when I was interviewing him not, not uh, with other people you got to rate him in because he can talk for forty five minutes and say very little right he can also talk and say a lot. But uh, it's almost like there's a built-in thing for him to not give too much core information. Yeah. Uh, it's the way it appears. So, uh, yeah, uh, uh, he's, he's cryptic. He's cryptic. He is born under the sign of Scorpio, which, which makes him cryptic and makes him very powerful. So there's all of these things. So anything you want to add on that, please do. I just clarify. Okay, so just so we can uh, go take a trip down memory lane, I've I've spoken of this in the past. I'll be happy to speak of it again tonight. But uh, understand that uh, in terms of what my father experienced and what Peter Moon experienced, uh, basically, I think that uh, Mr. David Lewis Anderson, Dr. David Lewis Anderson, is somewhat more than human as a result of his working with time travel. So understand that he's no longer baseline human. And that's the first thing you have to come to terms with. Is sure, that, easy, 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 easy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's, he's, he's basically severed from baseline humanity. He's not living in the same uh, dimension with us, really. Uh, so you have an individual who, because of this, is in a very real sense, lost to humanity. Uh, and uh, as a result, uh, the way that he experiences time is going to be profoundly different, has, has been so for decades by now. Uh, so he's also someone who, m- you know, may have been part of uh, a kind of dynasty of this. And uh, this is, of course, somewhat uh, what was insinuated, if I remember correctly, by uh, Al Bielik, who was yep. a sort Correct. Of, yeah. said the Anderson family yeah. was uh, the custodians of time. But he, he didn't know about David Anderson until I told him. That's because right. Because David Anderson came into my life. And I, and I remember that story the, the first time I spent time with Al Bielik. Not the first time I saw him, but the first time I really, you know, I drove him out to Princeton. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, and, and sure, uh David was, uh, you know, and then David comes into my life, and I, oh, I remember that name, Anderson. Boy, he, and, and Al Bielik was spot on. He was totally spot on uh, with this. And, boy, did, you know, custodian of time, indeed he is. Yeah. Non-human. Uh, my uh, former girlfriend, uh, she, oh, I call Penelope in the books, she's, Oh yeah, she she had such a component uh, of him, and she would have called it alien, mm-hmm. non-human. Oh yeah, she'd be right on because she had she had seen him in 1976 at Booth Bay Harbor, and then then she's he's sitting right next to her in Belmore, Long Island, where we're having Montauk night, and you know when I tell her he's got a time travel research center, she flips out. Mm-hmm. Don't tell, she doesn't tell me about her experience for another year that she saw him in Booth Bay Harbor. Uh, years earlier just he disappeared he appeared and disappeared out of nowhere mm-hmm. so like wow uh, her her viewpoint she's kind of thin between the worlds you know she sees the other world um, sometimes it's very challenging to put these things in context uh, but um, wow De- yes. de- definitely and uh, that that's just kind of like the warm-up and now I'll uh, try and uh, delve deep into my memory and uh, bring up uh, some of what all of this brings to mind so that people uh, have a greater understanding of just the uh, 
you know, the level of intensity that we're dealing with. And uh, this is something that will ultimately, uh, I think, uh, decades from now uh, or, you know, sooner, perhaps, whenever we kind of expand uh, the Roswell deception, which is kind of like an undertaking that uh, Peter would not see as fruitful unless uh, we sell the book in the first and eventually, of course, it will. Uh, people, of course, the the what's contained within that book is simply an inescapable uh, history that's inexorably. The word is inexorable. It's inexorably going to uh, basically overwhelm our world. And uh, because it will overwhelm our world, uh, people are going to have to start acknowledging it. And uh, when they start acknowledging it, then, uh, of course, history itself, as the West understands it in particular, and even the East, is going to be redefined and we're going to um, uh, just see a, a, a real enlightenment. Now, most of the time, what brings these things about is war. And uh, we have two wars ahead of us. One is a world war and one is a civil war. But all of that is something we can speak of later. When we look back on the last world war is when all of this began. And uh, so what had happened was that uh, in uh, the summer of 1943, of course, the nations of the world were engaged in the most titanic conflagration uh, ever wrought by humankind, the Second World War. And uh, at that period of time, the Americans had come to the conclusion they were going to lose. And uh, when they came to that conclusion, they had no care uh, that the world survived them. Indeed, they felt that the destruction of the world itself would be a victory. So they engaged in uh, that which uh, they thought would destroy the world, which was the testing of the plutonium bomb. And this was different from the uranium bombs, which they knew worked, uh, which they knew the Axis had deployed. But the plutonium bomb, they felt, would uh, basically set off a chain reaction molecularly that would ultimately disintegrate the earth. And by destroying God's creation, they would uh, win a victory against God himself and that the anti-gods would come in to help them at that point and uh, remake the world in their image as the uh, high priesthood of the anti-gods. This is truly their belief system. This is what uh, Aquino was an heir to. And, of course, what they produced uh, in route to that, when they were still trying to win the war, what they thought could win the war, was a full-spectrum dominance. And this full-spectrum means full-spectrum. This is why they used a term that today we would think was laughable and uh, really gay, which was Project Rainbow. So when uh, Project Rainbow was a program, uh, an attempt to employ the principles set forth in Einstein's incomplete unified field theory to render the ships or planes uh, invisible to radar. As a matter of fact, just the other day when I was looking uh, for, you know, the notes on the triple nickels and all the rest of that, and of course I ran again into the notes of the Nazi fischer tropp equations, which uh, enabled the Germans to process synthetic fuel from uh, coal and uh, ultimately led them to conclude that uh, coal was abiotic, that it was a, uh, uh, a, that it was produced by the earth itself and not by dead dinosaurs. And of course, uh, this was all part of other Nazi research that converges ultimately, or at least parallels, or rather, proceeds, uh, in a sense, Dr. David Lewis's Anderson's work, which, of course, he heavily deals with light cones. And what light cones do is they basically place you. Uh, you're on Earth, and everything that you see is effectively a code coming at you, a cone, in a cone effect coming at you from the past. And uh, when you look into the future, everything is a cone that is uh, a pinpoint at the projection point and coning out, spreading out into infinity, uh, the further out it goes uh, away from where you're at. Uh, so this is what David, uh, this was pivotal to Dr. David Anderson's conceptualization that ultimately enabled him 
uh, to produce a practical effect. So somewhat different from what the Nazis were working with. But on this side of the Atlantic, uh, the project that fell under Project Rainbow, uh, that later became much better known to history as the Philadelphia Experiment, was under direction of Dr. John von Neumann, and to a degree, uh, Nikola Tesla. Now, uh, the fact remains, of course, that Nikola Tesla, what uh, was provided was work that was essentially derived from what he released publicly, what he had tried to contract to various investors, uh, what little he shared with the government, and understand that this was the real inspiration aside from, of course, uh, the man who was, um, oh God, who was that mad genius who built the, uh, uh, the spruce goose? Uh, the Howard Hughes. Thank you. Now, who, who employed George von Tassel worked. He was very close with Howard Hughes, George von Tassel. Thank you. Thank you. But when they were inspired uh, in the Marvel comics and ultimately the movies, the cinematic uh, Marvel universe, by Howard Hughes to produce the character of Tony Stark, uh, it asked Iron Man, uh, an individual who's basically producing uh, technology that's decades, generations ahead of its time, but he's not sharing his best work with the government. He's basically contracting with the government and giving them uh, just hand-me-downs, basically like technology that's generations behind what he uses for himself as a superhero. Uh, this is the conceit of that, uh, that concept. Uh, Howard Hughes was not like that at all. Nikola Tesla was. And uh, because Nikola Tesla was like that, uh, and uh, Iron Man is simply a convergence of Nikola Tesla and Howard Hughes, because unlike Nikola Tesla, uh, the Tony Stark character is quite wealthy from his government contracts, uh, very similar to uh, Howard Hughes. But you combine the twain into this superhero kind of construct, and then it makes for this appealing personal drama, uh, a morality play. Uh, behind the power this man has and what he's willing to share and how he exploits it for personal wealth and, uh, and tries to compensate by uh, promoting justice in the world uh, by his own hand. Uh, that is, you know, as in this, the case with all superhero concepts, basically a pathology. But everyone is pathological to one degree or the other. And in Nikola Tesla's case, he was pathologically moralistic. And his morality would not allow him to share what he was producing with the United States government. And uh, as a result, he lost his citizenship. Uh, they, they were going to stick him in a concentration camp uh, with the other Germans and Italians and Japanese. They had interned and he ultimately killed himself, though that was on January 7th of 1943. Now, under the direction of Dr. John von Neumann, and uh, taking what was stolen of Nikola Tesla's work and what was analyzed by Dr. Well, John Trump's, uh, well, Donald Trump's uncle, John Trump, Dr. John Trump, a uh, electrical genius in his own right and someone who was familiar with what much of Tesla worked with uh, and someone who exploited it what he could steal for himself to help uh, really enhance the Trump dynasty fortune. Uh, Dr. John Trump then uh, was able to act as kind of like the man who, under the auspices of the OAP, which he worked for, or rather was un placed under uh, the jurisdiction of, uh, the OAP, of course, being the Office of Alien Property, which stole all American property that belonged to Japanese, Germans, and Italians who were interned. All of those people who were interned, all of their real estate property was stolen, all of their financial property was stolen, everything they had was stolen. The U.S. government confiscated it all, and uh, that was the same with Nikola Tesla's property. All of that was stolen. By the way, none of this had anything to do with George Bush Jr., all this crap about George Bush Jr. being Curious George and working around with Nikola Tesla. It's just bizarre. Crap, it's the kind of shit that almost certainly is an Aquino psyop. It has nothing to do with anything, or certainly nothing to do with reality. Uh, but uh, the stuff that nobody talks about is 
uh, Dr. John Trump. And one of the reasons why is he's, he's a very boring man. He, he, other than what I'm describing now, uh, the only person who would be excited by his biography would be an engineer. Uh, everything he did was quite technical. He was not a personable human being and otherwise had, a, like many engineers, a very flat affect, was not a very uh, charismatic person. Uh, but uh, this individual, um, whatever he could present to Dr. John von Neumann, uh, they and other scientists and engineers of Project Rainbow uh, misappropriated uh, for their experiments. Whatever te Tesla technology they could interpret as applicable, and then they applied that to the uh, destroyer or DE-173, a newly constructed destroyer escort, really, the USS Eldridge. And they fitted it out at the Philadelphia Naval Yard. Now, the Eldridge's gun turrets were removed and they were replaced with massive generators. Um, I learned this from my father, who, of course, uh, was on site at the time and uh, was basically, uh, of course, uh, in one of his many duty shifts, uh, brought back to Asia fairly quickly after that. And this was not surprising because this isn't like... A, just to tell people this, that people are very bizarre and they're very, they always look for holes in experience. In other words, they try to punch holes in a story. And uh, when it comes to my father, he was one of those extraordinary sailors who had a multi-oceanic career. And this was not uncommon. Uh, well, rather it wasn't common, but it was not so rare as to be, shall we say, uh, unbelievable or exceptional. There were many sailors who served in both the Atlantic, the Mediterranean as well, the Pacific. My father was one of those sailors. And uh, this is because men with his level of experience were highly valuable assets that needed to be transferred to wherever they were deemed most uh, advantageous, where their experience, uh, it was felt, could provide a cutting edge to the rest of the crew. For whatever reason, they thought, they thought my father would provide that in the Philadelphia Naval Yards for that experiment. And, of course, it wasn't on the ship. Uh, he, he, otherwise, I never would have been born. Uh, instead, he was uh, on, the, on the docks, and uh, he was just one of the support contingent. And uh, so the entire ship, as he described it, was wrapped in magnetic coils. And uh, on October 28th, shortly after his birthday, which was October 23rd, on October 28th of 1943, the Eldridge went to sea for the final operational test of the Rainbow Equipment Installation. Now, at 5.15 p.m. that day, I remember my father telling me that distinctly, Three electricians' mates threw the switches that powered those, matha, those mammoth field coils. Uh, there's no real describing that ship. As a matter of fact, the closest I can do it justice, really, would be a picture that I had placed of a dirigible that is still loose on the Internet, a dirigible concept where the Americans knowing what the Japanese did, that dirigibles absorb an enormous amount of static electricity, generating it as they move through the atmosphere. And all of that moist, damp air uh, creates lightning all around them. That that could be harnessed as a kind of force field to prevent bullets or deflect bullets from reaching the dirigible. That was a concept the Americans were working with. So they created a concept of magnetic coils surrounding a rigid frame dirigible that would then be used to generate that enough electricity to kind of magnetically repulse incoming bullets. Uh, this is what the Eldridge rather looked like. And uh, that, of course, once those switches were thrown, my father described it as a green cloud of mist that formed around the Eldridge. And it was visible through telescopes at that point. And they had plenty of telescopes set up and, of course, there was aerial reconnaissance that was trying to keep track of the ship and see if it disappeared, uh, grew invisible. The ship just grew transparent. And moments later, it 
vanished completely in what my father described as a blinding blue flash. Now, to the observers on the command and support ship stationed nearby, the small destroyer was simply gone, although all the eyewitnesses at the Norfolk Naval Base, almost 200 miles away at that point, they all saw the Eldridge appear out of nowhere and remain for several minutes before vanishing again. Now, when the Eldridge returned, it was clear that Project Rainbow had far exceeded any expected results. By accident or design, obviously my father didn't know. He was not in the command structure or the hierarchy where he would have that capacity. But U.S. scientists had breached the walls of time and space. They had catapulted the ship hundreds of miles in the blink of an eye. But the experiment was deemed to a kind of failure. Now, understand, of course, in science, there's no such thing as a failed experiment, technically. Uh, anybody who says that is not familiar with science. When they shake their heads, say the experiment failed. The whole purpose of science is to learn. Therefore, you never fail. You're always learning. That's the point. It's still hard to discern what was learned here. In that sense, you might say, it was a failure. It was certainly extraordinarily horrible. Now, the effects on the crew, well, most men on board, the lucky ones, simply went irrecoverably insane and spent the rest of the war confined in a special ward of the Bethesda Naval Hospital in Maryland. Others were burned terribly from the inside out. And in a manner reminiscent of victims of spontaneous human combustion. And a few simply vanished from the ship altogether and did not return with the Eldridge when it came back from wherever it had gone to. But most horrible of all, some men were actually fused into the steel superstructure of the ship when the Eldridge reappeared. So, molecularly, they had become entangled within the physical uh, ship itself. Still alive, but of course unable to remain alive for much longer. Certainly no one was able to remove them without uh, killing them. And ultimately, of course, they died uh, painfully, horribly. The small number of crewmen who survived the experience, with mind and body more or less intact, now they didn't escape the effects altogether. Uh, there was uh, incident after incident after that. My father was witness to at least one of them. In terms of those particular sailors that I'm referencing, they displayed a peculiar tendency to simply fade out of existence weeks or months after the experiment had taken place. My father was involved in a barroom brawl in Philadelphia, where two of these sailors caught in it vanished into thin air in the sight of a dozen witnesses, never to be seen again. Another man was seen by my father and many other witnesses to walk through a wall and vanish, likewise never to be seen again. Now, for a long period of time, decades thereafter, there were hundreds of men living who served on board the USS Eldridge later in the war, uh, but no one aboard that ship on October 28th of 1943 remained alive and sane and able to hold an interview. Now, the Office of Naval Research has this nice form letter called OI-511 that denies any of this ever took place. But that doesn't explain why the Eldridge's logs from July to December of 1943 are missing. 
So then again, there were four men who were found dead near Montauk Air Force Station. The bodies were burned. And uh, the major on site, who was the CEO, the commanding officer, denied supernatural events. This was uh, remembered by myself because it was on a telegram that I was ordered to destroy. A historical telegram. Now, in terms of what uh, was going on with those men who were kind of fading in and out. They ultimately called them Evanessers. Now, the only reason my father was informed about this was because all of the sailors who were involved directly in the project, like he was as part of the support infrastructure, were told to BOLO, B-O-L-O, be on the lookout. And when it comes to uh, these kinds of Evanessers, as the Navy classified them at that time under the auspices of the Department of War, then uh, it was all based on the fact that they felt that those people who had been in the support uh, infrastructure might be able to recognize these men might ultimately lead to their apprehension. So, it's, with that, you kind of have to describe what everybody concluded happened in the end. It wasn't like based on Sailor's rumor. It was based on what basically my father was brought in for a debriefing with many of the other support personnel. And they were given a lowdown on the only thing that the, the Department of War could conclude, which was that these sailors who had returned to, they thought were normal, uh, were not normal at all. That basically they were now something else, that something had entered them and taken their place. So when they were spotted, they were not to be approached. They were only to be identified, called in, uh, watched, observed, followed if possible, and then uh, otherwise never to be engaged. Uh, instead, to uh, just hopefully the government would be able to get there and dispatch enough people to ultimately contain them. And this is because those who had reappeared and were identified they were known to have extraordinary powers, extraordinary abilities. So they ultimately became almost like, in uh, some cases, government consultants. There's no other real word for them. But they didn't uh, exist in the same sense that a baseline human would exist anymore. And they had an entirely new diet that seemed to be based on the need to feed off pure energy. So, when it came to these kinds of men on the outside, they looked like just any other human, because they once were human after all. And the only real difference between an Evanesser and a human lies in the mind and personality. The Evanesser's human persona has been completely compromised or replaced by some kind of alien intellect from some distant reach of space. They don't speak much, and they're often perceived as sullen, expressionless, or even apathetic. How do you spell Ebenezer? 
Now that would be uh, E V A N E S C E R, I believe. So um, these Evanescers seem to download memories and learn from the people they replaced. So they're familiar with the details of the person's life and society. <clears throat> but they're cold, ruthless. They're a copy. They're a copy. Yeah. Uh, well, they're brilliant imitations of the person they used to be. And um, there's one other element to their, the phenomenon thereof. They don't age, or at least not the way most people do. Every Evanesser in existence looks exactly like its body did in 1943. So, in terms of uh, the kinds of uh, the way that it uh, they come into our world, it's obviously through doorways, portals, dimensional gates, or conditions resembling those devices. So, whether they meant to or not, again, that was never specified in the debriefing, and my father, of course, never learned. But the one thing he was certain of because that's essentially what they confessed to, was that the scientists of Project Rainbow stumbled upon the means of creating a doorway and managed to send, at best count, 120 American sailors into a place where they didn't belong. And what they got back in return were a hundred or so lunatics, about a dozen cadavers, and about Half a dozen Evanescers. This was where, where? Where was this? In the? Oh, on the USS Aldrich. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So there was just a few Evanescers. Yes. Only six human beings possessed by alien intelligences. And these Evanescers are driven by two primary motivations. First, they require electromagnetic fields for sustenance. And while they're physiologically human, the alien intelligence that is imprinted over the human mind seems to require EM or electromagnetic energy to stay alive. Uh, this is to the point where Evanescers even started to raid power stations, electrical plants, radar stations, and TV or radio towers when they were pressed. But of course, because most of them preferred to establish a cover identity that allowed them access to EM energy on a routine basis, they usually posed as engineers, linemen, technicians, or scientists. And indeed, some of the faders, which was what the sailors called them, some of the Evanescers would instead sell their technical knowledge in the private sector and use their fortunes to create private power plants or stations where they could indulge their hunger at will. So, an eccentric millionaire whose desert retreat includes hundreds of acres of windmill generators would be a likely candidate for an Evanescer lying low in his stronghold. Other Evanescers, a few of them worked with the government. This is what my father was told at the debriefing because they were boasting about, we have rehabilitated some of these Evanescers, and we would like to rehabilitate all of them. So they were exchanging those specimens, their knowledge of technology for facilities and funds suitable for their work. And some of those individuals were involved in the secret experiments at the Montauk radar station from the mid-1950s until the mid-80s, dabbling in teleportation, time travel, broadcast power, and other phenomena. Now, originally, my father was told at the debriefing there were six. That story later changed because he found out no one really knows how many Evanescers there are. And I was able to tell him what I learned from Michael Aquino, that it wasn't Six, it was probably more like ten of the Eldridge's crew 
and the technicians aboard the ship on the day of the test that were even then, by the time I was working with Michael Aquino, 1980s to 1990s, contemporarily unaccounted for. So when I asked Michael Aquino about that uncertainty, sharing what I dared to share about what my father knew, that stemmed from the question of exactly how many technicians were on board when the generators were starting. So in other words, there were people who were on the USS Eldridge that were not sailors, but technicians working directly for the Department of War, civilians. And that added an entire new component of Avanessers because the alien intelligences seem to prefer the most intelligent available that was presented to them. The technicians represented that. So, there may be more factors, especially if the rumors about the Air Force's Project Montauk or similar Soviet experiments were true. And I certainly know they are. So, when it all came to what my father was told to contend with, he knew what to be on the lookout for the rest of his life. And from that barroom brawl that happened in Philadelphia, he had personally come to blows with an Evanesser. Now, the one thing he told me to look out for would be that an Evanesser sticks to its cover identity unless it's threatened with imminent violence or confinement. That means an Evanesser spends most of its time looking, acting, and reacting like an extremely withdrawn and quietly hostile human being. They don't use two words where a single word will do. If confronted by a small number of enemies, the Evanesser may strike back with all of its formidable powers, seeking to silence them forever. Against overwhelming odds, or in difficult situations, the Evanesser simply leaves using its paranormal abilities. Now, when an Evanesser is not protecting its cover identity or trying to fit into human society, it moves quietly, well and quickly and ruthlessly to neutralize opponents in the most efficient manner possible. My father knew this because of some of the escapes from the insane asylum at Bethesda, where the entire staff was overpowered, or came to consciousness to find somebody had disappeared from a locked rubber room while in a straitjacket. Now, an Evanesser breaking into a power plant simply fades past the guards and murders anyone who happens to stumble across it while it's doing its work. Again, when an Evanesser decides that a situation is irretrievable, it uses its powers to vanish instead of risking capture or incapacitation. Now, Evanessers may make use of human weapons and tactics, but they don't arm themselves unless it fits the cover identity or they don't care who sees them. In a fight, an Evanesser is much more likely to rely on its dimensional science skills in order to neutralize or escape its foes as quickly as possible. So, Like a, like a Jedi Knight. Oh, well, you could say that in a sense. I'm not quite sure if that really does it justice. Uh, but this is the most important thing to understand. Evanessers have an understanding of dimensional physics and the nature of matter that simply beggars all human comprehension. They can manipulate dimensional entities and energies as an act of will to spectacular effect. Uh the things that my father was to told, well, warned to look out for at that debriefing were what the Department of War called a dimension walk 
where the Evanesser would disappear slowly, transporting itself hundreds of kilometers. Uh, and uh, it's not instantaneous. It requires about a minute of travel time for approximately every 100 kilometers that it travels. That's what the Department of War measured out with the few corroborative specimens that they had. Or there was, of course, the fading, which is why the normal sailors simply called them faders. And with that power, the Evanesser shifts itself out of phase with the normal world. It becomes ghostly or translucent, gains the ability to walk through solid matter, and remains uh, out of phase for a very short period of time, probably seconds. Uh, and, of course, ordinarily it would be uh, translucent, partially intangible, but still able to walk through walls and barriers less than 20 centimeters thick. This is what they found out by containing them. And, of course, any attacks against the Evanesser at that time would be penalized in terms of any effect. If it uh, really succeeded in what it was doing, it would be ghostly and intangible walking through barriers or walls up to a meter thick. Uh, and, uh, of course, uh, whereas bullets might impact it uh, in some of the fading stages, at that point they'd probably go right through it. When the Evanesser was truly adept, master of its environment, it can simply become invisible and immaterial, walk through any barrier at its normal walking movement rate, and... Uh, and not be affected by any physical attack, or, or, of course, be able to interact with the world around it in any fashion either. So it's not like it can do that and then hurl objects at you. This, this sounds so much like the, uh, not exactly, but a very close prototype for what L. Ron Hubbard called an OT, operating Thetan, uh, all the miraculous attributes a, a spirit could do on well, its own. My father Sounds was convinced that L. Ron Hubbard probably learned about the Evanesers very quickly, that as a naval intelligence officer, he would be one of the original men to probably have been responsible for the material that was relayed to the support personnel at the debriefing. Mm -hmm. And my own father told me that. Now... The worst thing that an Evanesser can do is why you absolutely must never engage them. They can cause a person or object to become partially permeable to normal matter and then reverse the process, leaving people and objects physically fused in walls, trees, parking lots, cars, and so on. And it's something that the range of this kind of attack was decided or calculated to be at around... It had a short, medium, and a long range, is what the Department of Defense calculated. Department of War, I mean to say. Two to four to six meters. Short range would be two feet... Uh, two meters, I mean to say, about six feet. Uh, medium would be four meters... And uh, long range would be about six meters. Now, anyone fused into stationary objects are immobilized. And trying to remove such victims would inflict damage that would be equal to the damage inflicted by the fuse attack. And um, in the overwhelming amount of cases, simply couldn't be done without killing the victim. So this is uh, one reason you must never engage them. This is something, of course, that uh, aside from that, there's the spontaneous combustion of attack. You can be burned from the inside out. The thing that brought it all back to my father and uh, what he did encounter was an Evanesser yet again was at Castle Bravo. Now, Castle Bravo, of course, was something that was uh, horrific, and people don't understand about it, but I can tell you about it from not just my father's perspective, but a Japanese perspective. And all of you know about Castle Bravo, but you just don't know it. You all know about it from the Godzilla movies. And uh, with the modern 
uh, remakes of Godzilla, they've probably integrated it under the name of Castle Bravo, the actual historical incident. If they haven't, then shame on them. But uh, Jameson Reese calls it the Lucky Seven shipping boat, which might have been in the Godzilla film, or maybe that was the American interpretation. That's probably what the Americans called it just in their translation of it. Oh, oh, oh no, no, no. This is the name of the vessel of the people who were who saw the second son, and uh, uh, one of the guys got killed. Uh, uh, I think most of all of them got killed, actually. Uh, they died of radiation poisoning. I think... Or was it was the boat called the Lucky Dragon? Something like that. Daigo Fukuryu Maru. The uh, Daigo Fukuryu. It's kind of like, you know, along those lines, but really, <laughs> you know, it's yeah, more yeah, like an Americanization. Yeah, yeah they, yeah. they horribly butcher everything in America, so. Yeah, yeah no, no worries, did. no worries. I mean, you, you know why they would give it the Lucky Seven? That's an American sense of humor. It's just morbid. <laughs> you know, they said, oh, that's the Lucky Seven boat, right? Get it? That's just like, you know, that's something a sailor would probably say. Uh, but basically, from the two loud noises at the end of World War II, to the Fukushima nuclear power plant accident that was wildly criticized in the 21st century, in most people's minds, the Empire of Japan is always bound to nuclear. And some even ridicule the Japanese as a very large nuclear energy consuming nation, like Godzilla himself. Uh, but there are unknown incidents that directly caused a large scale anti-nuclear and anti-American movement by the Japanese people. And the Castle Bravo test is called the third nuclear damage by the Japanese people after Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And the way the Americans know about that is through the Japanese director, Aiji Suburaya, getting inspiration from that incident to create the classic Gojira, or the original Japanese Godzilla. And, uh, of course, there's many details about that entire incident that were deliberately concealed by governments on both sides of the Pacific. And even the victims themselves. i, I, I got to interrupt you. I've got to, I've got to run now. But thank oh, you. This okay. has been very fascinating. And I look forward to listening to the rest of it. Okay. Uh, and, but it's, it's really good. Well, I love you dearly. And I'll go on with this then. And uh, share our love with Paula. Thank you so much for coming on tonight. Uh, we'll yeah. continue with this for a while. The, the one thing you might not want to angle back is to is to the relationship between the uh, F, uh, what do you call them? The, the, F, uh, F, the FNSers and how that might parlay into David Anderson and, and, the, and the dimensionality of and, and who exactly are these FNSers and how do they how do they come into being? It's in uh, and does that relate to? You know. I'll tell you what my father concluded, and then what you can do yeah. the next time you're on is you can you can tell us about how you know it is or is not the case based on what you know. And well, so, yeah. there, if if you're not exactly right, yeah. uh, you're in the ballpark. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> in my opinion, you're yeah. in the ballpark if you're not exactly right. Because I mean, I really can't say you're exactly right, but if you're not, you're in the ballpark. So anyway, with that, I'll say good night to everybody. Uh, Bless I encourage you to keep listening because I'm going to listen when I uh, when I get the next opportunity, when I wake up or whenever. Okay, so good night. Good night. And say good night to Paula for us. Bye for now. Okay. Everybody say good night to Mr. Uh, you know, Moon. All of you. Uh, good night, Peter. Good night, Peter. <laughs> Thank you. That was wonderful. And so um, with both of you gentlemen, I'll certainly continue with this. Uh, I'll yes, yes please, please continue. This is this is fascinating stuff. This is the stuff I listen to Douglas Dietrich for. <laughs> You're always kind. Uh, what I'll do now is refresh myself for a few minutes. Uh, if you gentlemen could take advantage of this time, uh, I don't know how much longer our man Salman can stay with us, but I certainly want to take advantage of what time we have with him to have him uh, take the stage and kind of say goodnight to everybody and and uh, go on a little bit about what else he feels needs to be brought to our attention. When I return after refreshing myself in about 10 to 15 minutes at the longest, I'll certainly get back to uh, talking about the subject, and then I'll count on us.
hopefully being able to bring someone else on, perhaps Sammy Romero or Penny Bradley or both, uh, to help us, you know, keep some time after that uh, until I get my head on my ass to really dive into, you know, political analysis or some of the other things that are going on contemporarily. Uh, but uh, in the meantime, I'll try and cover this aspect of reality that people just are completely uh, well a critical omission from their a critical omission from their reality the very reason why we have the name for this transmission of course so with that um Isaman, if you would come on and uh while i go mute if you would be so kind yes uh, thank you so much uh first i would like to say is that my new year's resolution for the year of the tiger it's for all the Pakistani men to please stop messaging. <laughs> yes, I'll stay around a few minutes so I can hear you go through some things uh, before I before I retreat uh, for uh, some refreshment. So by all means, go yeah. on. And uh, I would like uh, for everyone to please follow my example and uh, everyone send a $100 donation to Brother Douglas Dietrich and support his work. I mean, just listen to all of the great information he has provided you. And I feel so educated and honored to even learn about these things, the Evanessers, uh, Vampire Hunter D, seeing his heritage, and all those things that are in intertwined in this human history that is not going to be taught to you anywhere else. So please follow my example and donate to Brother Douglas, PayPal, check or money order on a bi-weekly, weekly, monthly basis. And support his work by the Roswell deception and demystification of World War II. Support the gang stalkers. Give him a five-star review. And support our brother's work because, again, this information, you're not going to get anywhere else. And my, I'm, I'm just mind blown. And I look forward to catching up, catching up on all of these, these things that are out there. It just shows you this um, human realm that we're in. We think that we are the creatures that are running everything on this realm but there's a reality that's been shielded from your eyes and that's what a lot of the sufi masters and sheikhs have taught me as well is the humans are in this illusion thinking that they are the ones going around making the decisions or they're in charge of everything while there's a, a grand reality by what the sufis refer as allah the primordial source creator coming all the way down and it's, it's, it's about time we humans wake up and see the reality for what it is if we want things to survive in the future, especially with what we're doing right now with each other, with the resources of this planet, the environment. So we need to start elevating ourselves so we can coexist with all of these beings that are on this earth peacefully because everything serves a purpose. And just because the human is afraid of another being or spe species doesn't mean that it's right to exist should be nullified in any way so we need to educate ourselves of the reality that is around us and humans have to wake up we have to do the right thing and we have to love and support each other because that's the only way we're gonna get through this phase that we're in is through love through unity and through together and through understanding of that each being and pur uh, purpose that's been placed on this realm each species each being every th single thing that's been placed here has a purpose so once we realize those things in the grand scheme of things, that nothing happens by chance, then you begin to appreciate every little thing in your life. And I'm glad that my life I encountered Brother Douglas, and I've been uh, honored to be on the show, always to participate. It's, it's always my honor and privilege to be here with Brother Douglas and the rest of the roundtable. And uh, again, I, I highly encourage everyone, please support him. And please get this information out there because our this is our collective fight against the enemy. And if we're not going to fight it, then it's, it's our future. Brother Douglas has sacrificed many aspects of his life for those that know his personal story up until this point in his life. So everyone, please pray for him, support him. And I pray may Allah blesses my brother Douglas always and destroy his enemies on the day of judgment. And always make sure that his message gets out there with peace, love, happiness. And with that, I depart all of you with the greeting of Aslam Alaikum. Peace be upon Brother Douglas, all of our brothers and sisters of Team Dietrich. And I look forward to catching up on the monologue tomorrow morning. 
and also uh, in the future to get Brother Douglas back on for part six uh, to talk about the Chochoa and Vampire Hunter D, which I'm super excited for. So I love you, brother, very much, dearly. And thank you again for all of the education on the Chinese culture and what you're talking about right now. I'm, I'm so excited to catch up on this tomorrow morning. God oh, bless you. Thank you so much. We love you dearly. And uh, you have a blessed night and uh, a grand day tomorrow. Thank you. Good night, Jamo. Thank you. Hugs. Good night, Jamo. Yes. Now, Jamo, of course. So let's see if we can call Sammy Romero or uh, Penny Bradley on for a few minutes, and that would help, uh, perhaps, no if doubt. you can't reach no them. No doubt. If you can't reach them, then uh, I'll do my best to just, uh, you know, um, well, I'm sure you'll do your best to hold people without oh, yeah, scaring yeah. them I, away. I can, I can definitely yes. hold it. It's 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 quite interesting. Uh, I mean, the entire topic of Evanescers really does. Uh, it's this this is fascinating stuff. Um, it's 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 what we're not told that interests me more than anything. It's the it's a sort of secretive world, you know. I mean the we I can I can enjoy watching humans uh, batter each other to death uh, in 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 this shit we call realm we call Earth uh, till the uh, sky turns purple. But um, the the truth of the matter is the more interesting stuff is the hidden stuff. Uh, well, certainly uh, that's appreciated. Uh, try to maintain as upbeat a uh, attitude as possible. And uh, uh, well, yeah, please. yeah. I, I mean, granted, you know, I, I'm, 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 of course, going to have my cynicism. That's 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 the Jamal cynicism. But you know, I'm not going to uh, go out of a limb to. At this point, there's no reason to go out of a limb to do anything other than to watch the chips crumble. You know. <laughs> Well, uh, that being said, okay, I'll try to come back as soon as possible. Let me um, uh, see if you reach somebody first. Let's give that a try, see if anybody can be reached. Uh, uh, and, I yeah. got Sammy Romero on. Oh, wonderful. Let me greet him before I take my break. Yes. So, dear Sammy, uh, are you at work? Can you spare some time with us? <laughs> Oh, that's interesting. Sammy. Yeah. <laughs> Holy shit. What was that? Uh, Sammy, are, I, we see you. Are Are you with us? Say something. Uh, he, he might be getting himself squared away with something first. So... <laughs> Hello. Oh, there we are, dear Sammy. Oh, are you at work? Or hey. can, can you afford a few minutes? No, uh, yeah, I, my Bluetooth was connected to my earbuds. So, yeah, my earbuds somewhere. They're probably lost somewhere under my bed or something. Yeah. Sorry. Um, anyways. Yeah. <laughs> hey, uh, what's going on, everybody? You know, well, get well, off the we, good... What we needed to do was to occupy the stage for several minutes while I uh, refresh myself. And, uh, yes. <clears throat> We're hoping you can help with that. And what happened with the latest transmission was Daniel Arola was able to come on with us, but he kind of let uh, our man uh, Jameson run a little wild. <laughs> and uh, uh, we lost a little bit of the audience uh, that time. And I don't know if we ever really got them back in the immediate sense. Obviously, these things balance out because people do listen to the repeats. But we're trying to maintain our numbers, uh, you know, in the right. present. <laughs> so right. Jameson right. and you uh, can take it in. I wouldn't necessarily say an upbeat direction artificially but you know uh oh. you, you know hold the stage while i refresh myself anyhow it's so good to speak to you as always always very reassuring yes, yeah love you was. dearly and i'm going to go uh mute. if you want i could see if i could bring daniel on as well sure sure yeah by all means yeah, yeah. And, I, mean, and, I, mean, I mean the more the merrier um i'm just gonna try to like hit add everyone because you know i i'm a party pooper folks it's it's <laughs> we, sadly it, just sometimes I am. So, sometimes it's not always the case no, sometimes yeah it's it's sometimes it's, GMO. yeah don't uh, worry about it yeah yeah don't dwell on it i mean don't flagellate yourself it's just uh let's just put it this way i will say one thing uh was the other day i had a uh uh, a nice Skype conversation with someone who might appear uh, in the future. And uh, so shout out to Trisha Whit Whitmer 
and uh, two, of course, the lovely Jojo, who's uh, just uh, in the chat room, as a matter of fact, was in the chat room earlier. Uh, I'll take a look at that when I come back, uh, whoever's remaining in chat. But certainly uh, one of the things that uh, I noticed uh, was that that was the first time I'd actually been in chat for a long while and actually didn't feel this kind of, uh, how do I say it? This kind of JMO presence where she was. Uh, uh, oh, he was going through JMO. a phase. He, his, his parents, you might want to share that. You don't, you know, whatever you feel comfortable oh, sharing. Your uh, parents, it seemed like you were pretty angry oh, at yeah. the time. Yeah. Oh, oh, what? yeah. Well, well, that 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 had to do with uh, some, this is some online dating shit. Which okay. you know that that's just uh, at this point I've given up on the technological uh, approach, so I'm just going to focus on my uh, magic, and you know that's that's in a sort of monofocal way, and and you know I've I've given up on sexuality, so we'll just I'll just see where it comes. I got enough party favors anyway to last me to keep me happy, so we'll, we'll just let, put it like let's that. Let's put it this way. You, you know, I I know that the guys usually feel obligated to try and help you get laid so to speak uh, it, let's just tell it's, everyone it, it, yeah it, it, it's not gonna work I'm, I'm, I'm I, I hate to say it I I have for, for whatever reason there's a mental block that doesn't permit me to go past a certain point even when I do get positive attention from women it I I can't explain it it's like something is literally just barring me from doing anything maybe I have a Evanesser of my own who's just like mental mentally cockblocked well if it makes you feel any better obviously uh <laughs> you know uh brendan zogid is certainly no different he, he does everything yeah 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 <laughs> you know you know him and him and me actually had a lot in common when it came to that especially with the card playing obsessions yeah you know yeah. him and Yu-Gi-Oh, me yeah. magic the gathering this kind yeah. of like sort of ugh, i can't I, I just can't yeah inter yeah, yeah you, you you get it yeah yeah okay i'm gonna go mute um and uh you gentlemen i'm sure can handle this and i have every confidence <laughs> you'll be fine uh be back soon enough thank you so much so uh what's going on in your neck of the woods sammy tell you what jamo when i got out of work last night um it was very eerie okay all right i would i I mean, you know, I work in the airfield. Okay, I, you know, I work in LAX. And yeah. uh, when I got out of work, everything was like a ghost town. And, and it was almost like, it felt like the, kind of like the calm before the storm, okay? Um, because there's a lot of uh, advertisement for Super Bowl. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So it's very creepy. Because there's no homeless. It's like someone took the homeless and kidnapped them, and they're nowhere to be found. Who knows what they? That honestly is kind of creepy. Because no, seriously. Because I'm, you know, you with them. Now there's taco stands. You know, one thing about LA. If you ever come to LA, tacos like talk talk tacos is what we do. So there's taco stands everywhere. All right, but there's no homeless. So that was very very creepy but you know you see a bunch of uh billboard signs of snoop dogg and all these performers are going to perform <laughs> and you know it, it's very like it's almost like it felt like um disneyland in almost a sense that it, it didn't it doesn't feel like a sporting event it feels more of a show you know yeah th there because is something it's hollywood it's There's Hollywood. something ominous to that, honestly speaking, because it's like, you know, what do they do? I still took a picture of it. I, I, probably, I still took a picture of it and sent it to you because it was, it was very creepy um, because that part of L.A. is a lot, obviously, because it's close to the airport, there's a lot of tourists. Yeah. There's a bunch of tourists there. And, um, yeah, I mean, you get used to the homeless. I'm sure, you know, New York, you're, you're used to seeing bombs yeah, and stuff. Yeah, we see them all, all the time. It's the, right. the, the, the problem is when I don't see them, I know that either we're under a stricter order of lockdown or something's just off. Oh, you remember I was talking about uh, Newsom last week, right? Yeah. Um, well, Newsom was taking pictures with the mask and, you know, was... You know, taking pictures of celebrities and so on and so forth. But um, last night when I saw 
what was going on, um, it was just like, where the hell's all the bombs? Because, you know, they usually, you know, ask for watching me show, and I usually give them a, a dollar, you know. But I don't know, it was weird. But besides that, um, I've just been dealing with, um, you know, my life. Um, I had to move. Um, so that's one of the many huge things that's been going on in my life <laughs> that I can reveal. Yeah, but, um, yeah. Um, you know, moving requires you to really realize how much shit you don't need. Uh, but yeah, I'm, but I'm touching on that. It it just feels like I don't know. This Super Bowl is going to be um, more than we bargained for because there's just going to be a lot of crazy. Um, I think what's going to happen with COVID is going to it's going to be a, a, a surge. Well, it's interesting you you speak about that because we we do have like uh, when is the Super Bowl supposed to happen anyway? Uh, is that uh, like- next week? Next week. Next week. Yes. All right. Oh, a week from tomorrow. All right, because it seems. Uh, um, all right, so yeah, it's as on the topic of COVID. There's that thing going on in Canada, which is very worrisome, because you have all these, you know, truckers who are like all these people protesting the lockdown in close proximity with one another. Uh, most of them are probably going to be right propagandists, and they're being spurred on by the Republicans, and unsur- unsurprisingly. Um, and I'm thinking about that. I'm thinking about that being the potential for a super spreader event. If not for a super spreader event, we're going to see a mutation coming from something like that. And there was um, well, James, and you know, I'm, go ahead. I'm sorry. Keep going. Go ahead. Well, what's strange is there was a time when you know I was thinking maybe we should go to Canada. We'd be safer up there. Now it doesn't seem to be the case. Yeah. Um. I honestly, I'm, I'm starting to think though. Um, I mean, uh, we've, we've been having sitting council. There's one city councilman, one lady that's saying that masks should be optional. We should get rid of masks and whoever wants to wear them, wear them. And it seems very sinister. Um, keep in mind, we're in Southern California. This is, this is as blue as it gets. Um, and, um, Seeing Newsom not wearing a mask, um, being um, nonchalant about it, it alarms me because we're so wrapped up in entertainment and people want this entertainment so bad that they're willing to die for it. And, you know, we got to look at the bigger picture here where, you know, we're going to have mass death. Oh. Yes, that's and a good. Like, that's a good point. <laughs> well, and, I, it's, and you know, and not to not to sound like I'm paranoid, but um, we can't afford um, we can't afford a a, a, a and a, we can't afford a wave, in other words. Or I mean, we already have one, but to really juice it up, it's going to be um, very uh, nerve wracking, at least to you know the average American. Yeah, yeah, especially if you're someone who's doing the right thing and trying to avoid getting this virus. Because, again, folks, uh, some of you have had it. Uh, for those of you who haven't had it, you don't want it. Uh, you can, I can guarantee you'll, 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 have, uh, you'll need a, a lifelong supply of nasal relief spray, like literally every, like twice every day. It's not right. worth it. Right. <laughs> um, well, in a, for example, um, I've... Um, I've had my first family member who's told me why they're not vaccinated and why they will not be vaccinated. Um, and uh, I'm sure you've had them. I'm sure you have friends like that. Yeah, but, yeah. My my brother's the same way. He he, you know. And it's one of those things where you know I've told them, you know, because you know the, their excuse is, "Well, I work in the." You can get this. I work in the health. I work as a um, as I work in med- medical billing. And because I work in medical billing, I have some insight into why why I shouldn't take it. Um, that's their excuse. Um, okay. <laughs> did did is, they give you the insight? Um, well, this is a thing, JMO. People turn um, researchers overnight. Okay, for some reason they they think they can you know research um, these you know this biocidal weapon 
that's been in the works for decades, you know. <laughs> um, so, you know, you know, because you have to politic with family, as, as you know, I have a huge family. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, um, you know, I, you let people um, have their, their view, you know, um, you let them have their say and um, you, I mean, I, unfortunately, I love them. You know, so I have to hope and pray that they don't. They're not in the best shape. That's the very scary thing about it is um, at least most of the people that are anti-vaxxers should probably get vaccinated because they're not in the very best shape. Um, <laughs> our, our, our law enforcement, okay, are not in very good shape. Um, all the crackheads <laughs> outrun them. Um, LAPD, most of the cops are either meatheads that are juiced up <laughs> on something. And they can't they can't really run fast. They're just, you know, meatheads and all the crackheads, you know, I'll run them. <coughs> and the rest of them are donut eating, you know, fat, fat officers. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Pardon me. So, yeah. you know, it's one of those things where the people that are anti-vaxxers should be getting it. Excuse me. <coughs> My throat's getting kind of dry. Sorry. It's alright, man. You know, neither here the rest. Neither here, you know. You've seen the pattern here, where um, it is a, a, a war of the mind. Um, excuse me, that's my um, water dispenser. Um, it is a war of the mind, and um, half the battle is um, you know, trying to be mentally um mentally um prepare yourself for excuse me um losing a losing a loved one you know losing a loved one and unfortunately they're gonna die with the pride you know or more and more morally their ignorance they're gonna die with their ignorance and um you know do i'm working a little bit in the in the funeral business you know with my sister you know i'm I'm very familiar with that, you know, and he's opened my eyes a little bit to, um, you know, how fragile life is. And um, sometimes the people that um, should die don't, like Mitch McConnell, you know, um, yeah, yeah, or agreed. all those other assholes, you know, but it is what it is. Um, it was a great transmission last last week. I, I heard it, but he's serving his purpose. You know, he, he knows he's fighting a losing battle with 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 time in the future but you know i think we all have to focus on um really um looking into the future in the next you know i would say 35 months so you know we get to see um, the end game when it comes to this election and also you no know, geopolitics a lot of people don't like to listen to geopolitics but it's because they have their head up their ass, you know. We're Americans, you know. We we want our Super Bowl. We want, you know, our Beyonce dancing. We want, you know, our Red Hot Chili Peppers, you know, playing in, in diapers, you know. Um, yeah. We want our entertainment. And um, we want to die for it. This is America, you know. This is this is worse than Babylon, you know. Um, we, um, you know, and I, I don't I don't mean to sound morbid. What, I, what I'm trying to say is... Um, is um it's it's very right now it's a very critical time in history where um america we just still want to revert to the past we still want to relive you know even with our entertainment even with our sporting events like it's not even about sports anymore it's not even you know it, because if it's about athletics then make it about athletics don't make it in entertainment and um unfortunately they they have to interject entertainment and um you know and it's not about a gay agenda or or um you know or a, a woke i hate i hate the term woke okay yeah yeah well, so woke is the way of uh woke is the way of inserting anyone who's not a hyper conservative that's that's it's it, you know i it, it's interesting you bring that up because uh, woke is woke uh, woke is another uh the critical race theory that is another terminology that seems to have the same sort of parallel with woke but you right. know continue right um and it's almost the same as ignorance as just having a conversation with somebody you know 
um, talking to you and, and, you know, especially you, Jamo, you know, I've had to rethink um, someone walking the left-hand path, you know, um, because, you know, it's obviously a path that I don't know, but I have to respect in the sense that you're at least, you can have a conversation with me, you know, and you can be, um, you know, you love your family. You, you don't, you're not, um, so you, yeah. this mindless this mindless drone that um just wants to destroy everything yeah you say those things but i really do connect with you when it comes to that because i do feel that way you know hbo has this docuseries about the insurrection you know and um you know hbo is hbo whatever you know they're it's entertainment they're, they're about shock value you know yeah you, you go from sesame street to you know um sex in the city where you have these you know, postmenopausal women, you know, acting like gay men, you know, you know, they're just, <laughs> you know, they're just, you know it's, it's entertainment, you know, but, you know, it's, 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 but what they talk about it, it's right there. I mean, you know, you don't, you don't really have to look too far for the truth, you know, um, and, um, you know, it, it's a very scary time in history, but it is history and, um, nothing's new under the sun, um, but, you know, I think we're we're experiencing, you know, the fall of Rome or, um, you know, all these great societies that were probably better than us. You know, we're a very young country and we can't even get over race. You know, <laughs> we can't even get over class. And I'm not saying they didn't have the problems, but to me, I just think. I just think we're the counterfeit. Um, we're the counterfeit society. We just we're so full of. We like to steal a lot and call our home, but we just have no, we're not authentic because even the way we took or quote unquote, the founding, the founding, um, they're not my fathers, but the founding idiots, <laughs> um, you know, they, it was all really, it was all really, it was all really chance in my opinion. Things didn't happen different. If you know, we and we can go, we can go on, we can go on to the cows go home. But what I'm seeing in my city is people are really just trying to hold on to living in the past, and everybody wants to stop for this event. And for some reason, after this event or during this event, you know, we're going to feel American. And, you know, they're going to play the national anthem and, you know, they're going to do the dog and pony show. But the problem is, let's see about a week what happened. Oh, about, I'll about, about, say a week and a half when the <laughs> numbers start coming in. When all these people that, could, you know, all these visitors that contracted this Omicron Delta variant, which you told me about, when they go back to their respective cities and it spreads again. And then again, people are going to be asking questions. Well, how would he, how do we get here? Well, it's because we're ignoring and we're not mobilized. See, we can mobilize for the bullshit. We, I'm telling you, we, we can mobilize, but it's for the bullshit. Okay? Yes. We can mobilize to, for some reason, our attack our capital. We can mobilize for that. Uh, we can mobilize to, you know, militarize our police and, beat the shit out of minorities, we can do that. They can definitely, the media can mobilize for that. They can mobilize to, because law enforcement has their PR, okay? I, I, I've noticed this in my city. I don't know if you noticed me. Yeah, York, yeah, their PR is heavy they, out here. They have, their PR is top of the line, including the fire department, okay? All these constabularies, which Doug has talked about, have the PR. There was a, there was a firefighter in, in the valley here that went to one of the fire stations and shot one of his coworkers, and it was over a female it was over a woman as soon as they they just mentioned that the next day they cut it there was no details who this firefighter was apparently they said well the firefighter question hasn't we have they haven't released his identity you didn't hear about it you didn't hear why did he was he they didn't, you didn't hear about if he was a if he was ex-military which he probably was um so on and so forth. But if they arrest you, JMO, 
guess what? They're going to say, oh, well, he was, you know, he was a failed uh, uh, Air Force officer, uh, you know. You know, <laughs> and this is, just, this is just me guessing, okay? I, I mean, I kind of, I know a little bit, but, you know, this is just me mostly guessing. You know, oh, um, he doesn't, you know, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll try to, they'll try to dirty us up even before, or, you know, you know, we're convicted or, or anything, you know, but it, it's part of their PR, you know, it's, it's what the PSYOP they run, that they want to control the mess that's going on. And Doug talked about it, where all these people from Iraq are coming back, you know, all these people from Afghanistan that have witnessed all the atrocities they've done, like the docuseries, um, the dark side of Eldora, which I've seen, which is crazy. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's crazy. Um, all these veterans that have come in from these so-called um, conflicts, we have to deal with these people. And we still have to, you know, cheer them on and parade. We still have to pay our taxes to you know, uphold their VA, which is standing on toothpicks ready to collapse because of so much overspending. You know, all these programs they have, you know, all all the uh, all the you know the mortgage loans they get on these programs, and we're still paying for this. And where's our cut? Where's the tax paying electric cut? Where's JMO's cut? You know, where's Douglas Dietrich's cut? You know. Where's Daniel Rolla's cut? Where are all these lists? Where, where, where's our cut? And why isn't the tax being electric? Why, why haven't they got their just due? Because we really are donkeys. We have to get taxed. The reason why, you know, these, they want us to take the vaccine. Not, not, I'm not an anti-vaxxer. I'm a pro-anti-vaxxer, but the government doesn't want to kill you. They need our tax dollars. Okay. Especially the undocumented workers. They need that slave free labor. Now, they get paid in low wages. I'm not calling them quote unquote full out slaves, but it's pretty damn close, you know? Yeah, it is. Um, they need these, we need these illegal labor. This is why Trump actually, I always tell, you know, some of my Hispanic friends, especially the ones that come from Mexico, and uh, they actually like Trump, but for the wrong reason. And I tell them, too, actually, Trump really likes you guys. Trump really likes illegals because one of the reasons why he likes illegals is because if, they, if the harder they make it on you guys, the more they bring you guys in, you're not acknowledged. See, that's part of the thing. If, if the legal immigrant is not acknowledged, you can bring them all in they want. Technically, you're not acknowledged. So that means you're not on the books. That means I can treat you like shit. But you're still here. In, in, you know, am I making sense? Yeah, yeah. That means they can slave them and nobody exactly. can say anything. But we're against illegal immigrants. But no, let them all come in. They're just not acknowledged. All kind of like the Third Reich. Kind of like... You know, Taiwan. Taiwan is, you know, the nationalist Chinese. They're there, but the UN does not acknowledge them. They acknowledge the communists. But the Taiwanese, unfortunately, they're not illegals. They they have the big guns. They have all our microchips. You know, Doug talked about this, you know, this, you know, you know, I'm I'm just relating this to the audience. Where the the thing is acknowledgement, the thing is um that's part of the, the enemy's plan is they don't want people to acknowledge Douglas Dietrich. Why? Because by acknowledging him, they they can't defend their bullshit. That's it, it, the more the the more the public does not know who Douglas Dietrich is, the more they can run their bullshit and say, "Well, no one even knows who Douglas Dietrich is," and it's not that. It's the truth is the truth, and you can't stop the truth. You know, even when it comes to, you know, um, when it comes to race, you know, the truth is, this should this this 
this acknowledgement of race, which is is still not going, it, it still hasn't been happening, but at least we're yeah. quote unquote talking about it. This should have been happening 50 years ago, you know, but people like, you know, people like Aquino, people like FDR, people, all these, all these people that are in these high positions, and these are the people we know of, um, help to contribute, but really, it's the, it's the public. When you're benefiting from this, when you're, you know, Cracker A, Cracker A, all he cares about is getting his. People see the death and destruction around. But like you said, JMO, they could have, the tax paying electric back after World War II could have said, you know what, let's stop all this. No, they wanted it all too. And just like you said, JMO, when two people have the opportunity and one of them knows it, Usually that one person that knows that the same opportunity can happen to that person is not going to let it. Is that true? Isn't that what you're saying? Yeah. Even if it means that that, that, that the person who has the opportunity is going to lose it, they rather them both lose than um, one person get something they didn't have. Exactly. And this is, this is where, you know, obviously I can draw my line into what I can allow in my life as far as what the, I mean, I'm talking about the difference between you and I. Okay, I have to respect your your walk just like you do mine. But there's always room up one another when it comes to questions, you know, because at the end of the day, we all know what our common goal is. Um, Thank you. By the way, you've both been wonderful. I just got on a few minutes ago. I was able to hear, just got on on time to hear our man, Sammy Romero, express the fact that, yes, uh, the less people know about Douglas Tietrich, the longer they can retain their hold on power. Oh, by the way, um, Holly Koditis Kiefer, who wrote a wonderful little note when she sent me a $100 contribution. She said, thank you, Douglas. Thank you for your great compassion, humor, and sanity. Love you. Keep on. Keep on with uh, the two hearts and a hashtag. Uh, she says, I only heard you speak one time about one. Here she's referring to an Evanesser. I believe in Kenya, but I never forgot it. Yes, she's talking about what was going on uh, in Africa at the time. And what was going on was a, a series of blackouts uh, that the uh, power station had been set up in Chad, and uh, let's take a look. I'm, you know, I, in my, to my embarrassment, my eternal shame and disgrace, I <laughs> need to look at a map. Uh, you'd think I'd have memorized uh, the countries by now, but uh, it's amazing what I bleach out of my brain. Uh, so taking a look at my usual map that I turned to, God, I hope they didn't scrub that off the internet. Uh, available for free and uh, very convenient to uh, access and visualize the world by the map I would recommend for everyone. I'll probably give links to both of these gentlemen just so they can access it themselves. As a matter of fact, I'll give them that now. I'll put that into the text box here so they can access that at their own convenience. And uh, here we are. Uh, and, and by the way, no amount of... Uh, no amount of, of, shall we say, uh, congratulations does justice to uh, our man uh, Sammy Romero and Jameson Reese for the work they do uh, to uh, keep us on while I refresh myself. Uh, still finishing a little bit of these hard-boiled eggs. Uh, should have dumped them in the tea earlier so I could have tea eggs. Oh, you know what? That link's not going to work. Fuck! I hate the way that Skype works. There we are. That link will work. Uh, so there we are. So that that's the best map to use if you click on that. And let me uh, just uh, delete the other one. I guess I can't. Uh, oh, remove. There we are. So remove the other link. And uh, that is a Pacific Center world map that has things balanced out pretty much as well as a person can on a map. And if we go there to the... Uh, where was this? This was in Niger, Chad, Nigeria, Lake Chad. It was in the Cameroon, I believe, was where the Evanesser was settled and where were the power blackouts it was where whichever country was impacted by the the blackouts it was i believe it was uh, it was nigeria wasn't it probably but uh yeah yeah nigeria is big niger 
Yeah, they would have to be. He was, he was Nigeria and Niger. That's right. You remember. remember. So yeah. these were black American troops. Well, blacks were among the American troops. And this was during the Trump administration at the beginning. And that was when there were um, black women were very angry, the wives of these men, uh, because they had uh, been killed horribly. Uh, this was their encounter with an Evanesser, and uh, he was definitely involved with the the power station that uh, continually was blacking out uh, because he was absorbing all of the energy. And that was built in a very uh, strategic area where the um, it, it could get constant energy from waterfalls, uh, kind of a hydroelectric dam affair. And... Um, uh, as my father told me, there's only one way to really contain an Evanesser would be to uh, contain them with uh, basically non-conductive materials. We would talk about lead, uh, various kinds of uh, very dense or even padded non-conductive walls. If you could uh, box the Evanesser in slowly, advance on them and box them in, um, including from the air, you might be able to, such as throwing nets over uh, the area that would be non, you know, very dampening materials. And so uh, Holly Kodaitis Kiefer says, yes, Niger was the second guest. So, yeah, that's what was going on at the time. This is when I first began to talk about Evanesers uh, to the public. And uh, Diane Hillis Buchberger, uh, uh, by the um, way, she brought up something that was very important in the messages. And um, we really have to, uh, uh, you know, keep her in our thoughts and prayers. Um, I hope she doesn't mind my sharing this. Uh, but uh, she brought up something about uh, the Philadelphia Project. <clears throat> and she says, uh, basically, she says, Charles F. Good Eve is the one who invented the apparatus that contributed to the Philadelphia experiment. Uh, she, this is probably Canadian, which is why she knows about him as a Canadian. By the way, somebody is on who's... Um, is, is, is that Sammy? That's Sammy, right? Make it yeah, sorry. Oh, no oh, worries. No worries. <laughs> Just needed to clarify who yeah. that was. I want to make sure it's not yeah. our NSA agent. Uh, and uh, she says the uranium used in the Philadelphia experiment, by the way, for those of you who are listening, I think that th think that that sounds paranoid or weird or kooky or something. Uh, everyone who's with us will attest to the fact we have bizarre people who get in on the call and they just make noises and they don't interact and we haven't invited them and they, th and there's no way we can keep them from going on. So it's obviously just a, a level of government harassment. They could simply listen to the program, but no, they choose to quote unquote participate and they're is a reason for that the method to their madness is so they can shut the call down if i suddenly speak of something that's just too threatening or something that just is too immediate in its impact uh they have the option to shut the shut the call down so they in a sense have to be on the call to do that right so this is why they they join in and um so we're stuck with that uh, um, so what uh, Diane Hillis Buchberger, as a Canadian, brings up is that the uranium used in the Philadelphia experiment was processed in Welland, Ontario, and bought in a raw state down from Alberta by Aboriginal Indians, of course, of which many died, or died a few days later. She says, I can no longer find the article that was written about this, so it is probably being hidden. It has scrubbed from the internet. And she says, terrible, because it involved a lot more people being messed up than just those on the ship and people who were too close to the experiment. Bless you, honey. And so she was asking me, uh, then she brings up that Charles Goodeve was given a knighthood for his various innovative inventions. And she asks, did he deserve it? I don't think so. So uh, obviously, like many criminals, this man was rewarded for his crimes. Um, so she says, does it help your understanding much? I think you know a lot already. Well, this, of course, adds co context. It adds context and um, very important. And I thank her very much for that. Now, the reason everyone maintain her in your thoughts and prayers, this is what makes me angry uh, about what happened to her. Uh, she just said, I was supposed to go to a hospital in downtown Toronto tomorrow, but I canceled because of the mass demonstrations being held there tomorrow. There are already barricades on roads there and a block from the government buildings and hospitals. Oh my God, that makes me so angry. So, uh, dear uh, lady, I hope someday uh, soon you get to 
Uh, follow up on your appointment. Now, I'm presuming this has something to do with those stupid truckers and their convoy, which I have no sympathy for. Yes, yes. <laughs> that That is what we were talking about earlier. Yeah, those those morons. Okay. And you mean Sammy Romero and yourself? Yeah, yeah. We, okay. We, we were, yeah. And, um, uh, okay, good. And, and I'm I mean, glad. I mean, yeah, I'm they're glad. essentially, uh, they're essentially causing more problems and they're, uh, all the people who have amassed, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the Republicans, of course, are trying to push them as predictably as we can. I, I mean, the United States Excuse Republicans, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's totally fucked. No, no, I could go Excuse into me. that no. later. It's one. Yeah, please, Sammy, by all means. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. Does uh does Peter know about you know? I remember you saying that Dr. Lewis Anderson uh, was possibly <laughs> a, you know Yeah. So I, I wanted say? to ask him that, but I'm like, uh, yeah, I, I'm probably not the best person to tell him that because, you know, um, I I sometimes think Peter, um, dare I say, um, he heard me. He acknowledges heard me say ag yeah. acknowledges certain people. Yeah. Um, and other people, he kind of like, uh, let me give you the runaround. Uh, Anyways. It, it's, it's, let's put it this way. He's, uh, he, he's, uh, he, he, Peter, his, his mannerisms are such that Rocco Fowler, um, uh, grew to hate him. So I had to assure Rocco Fowler that Peter Moon had not said anything <laughs> negative about him, but, um, Rocco Fowler was hostile enough about Peter Moon where, um, Salman Sheikh blocked him. And that was because, um, there was, uh, Salman Sheikh was putting up, uh, samples of Peter Moon's books and uh, and then what happened was that uh, when he put that post up, then Rocco Fowler put a ha ha on it. And uh, this was because Rocco Fowler felt that Peter was saying bad things about him. So I assured Rocco Fowler that wasn't the case. Um, I want to congratulate Rocco Fowler that uh, he's got a girlfriend now. And that uh, that surprises me and I'm happy for him. And um, so wonderful, a beautiful young lady. And um, oh, my God, I forget her name already. And yet she's a friend of mine on Facebook. Uh, uh, shit. <laughs> At any rate, they announced their they announced uh, their relationship. By the way, I'm giving you a kind of a run around here at the moment because that's an awkward question when you bring that <laughs> well, so, you uh, know, so i'll follow well, up let me follow up with it yeah go on go on i mean like like any like anything in, in life okay because you know i think everybody as a grown-up yeah. has um has to um sometimes remind or reveal people kind of like when someone owes you money yeah yeah and uh, they, they know you know but you know they want to they want to wait till you ask them but th that being said, you know, um, I remember you, 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 you're alluding to that, but yeah. you know, um, like I said, I'm, I'm just going by what you alluded to. Yes. But, yes. So by the know, way, just to, uh, yeah, yeah, no, just ahead. to answer more directly. So I don't wind up giving you more of a run around and just to finish up the train of thought from before and Christine Fontaine. So shout out to Anne Christine Fontaine and, um, Glad that Rocco Fowler has some fucking adult supervision. Uh, so, you know, keep, uh, keep him out of trouble, honey. And uh, with that, um, uh, you know, really, uh, that just goes to show uh, for both Brandon Zogit and uh, Jameson Reese, you know, if Rocco Fowler can get a girlfriend, I mean, you know, anybody can. <laughs> so no reason to be, uh, shall we say, uh, forlorn in that regard but to get to the question to add yes this is uh the um the point uh when it comes to our man uh mr uh, peter uh, moon he um he is uh profoundly moved by uh, david lewis anderson and because he's profoundly moved by david lewis anderson very touched by him uh very um uh shall we say um protective of him uh uh, he did not agree that uh, Dr. David Lewis Anderson is an Evanesser. Uh, but I will bring up the fact that my father concluded that. And uh, that was uh, he obviously, as Peter Moon said tonight, uh, that uh, he's, if, if, it's, if it's not true, it's understandable why that conclusion was reached. Uh, so I will bring up the points tonight as to why that was concluded by my father. And, uh, and then what Peter Moon can bring up next time is, uh, whatever reasons he's willing to share 
that he doesn't feel that to be the case. Uh, I'll, I'll just put it this way without sharing any secrets that uh, that Peter Moon's experiences with Dr. David Lewis Anderson uh, give him more of the impression that David Lewis Anderson has some human interactions that um, lead him to conclude otherwise. But uh, I would myself say that Peter Moon's witnessing of David Lewis Anderson's human interactions, such as eating or or anything like that, uh, that's something a normal human would do, or rare enough where uh, I don't know if they even really count. <laughs> well, it's interesting you say that, uh, Doug, because, um, I mean, these um, entities or, or these, these, I guess these, these, um, these inter interdimensional aliens um, that, you know, these Evanescers, are they, in other words, are they evil? Or they're just they're just alien is what I'm saying. It's, it's so um, I remember you talking about that where, um, like I said, they're very intelligent. They um, and I remember you saying that you know, uh, if it wasn't Dr. Lewis Anderson, which he was once, he was I guess he was Army or Navy, and then he switched. Um, well, that's the point. He seems to have been a member yeah. of several branches of service, which is so, extraordinarily unusual. Go on, yeah. Um, which. You know, it's very alarming, and, and you know, and this is from a background that I'm, I'm not military. You know, you and JMO have experience in the military. You guys have been there, you know. So this is someone from the outside. Um, but you know, watching a lot of cartoons and you know a lot of a lot of um, X Men and all this, it's very interesting that a lot of this there's some inspiration. I don't know where where. You know, and it's, it's almost when you might, I don't want to seem comical or I'm making fun of this because it's not, it's very real. But, um, well, I was bringing uh, up comic book parallels to start the conversation with Peter Moon when I was to kind of ease myself into the subject because I do feel this is a, a sensitive area with him. Uh, right. Yeah, and, come on. and, and, you know, it, it's almost like you, when you were talking about, you know, the, the goddess uh, protecting Taiwan and um, and kicking the, the bombs like like soccer balls, you know, yeah. um, I believe it. I damn sure believe it because the power of faith and the power of prayer and the power of people uniting in one. And you know, the, the Bible does say there's there's power in unity. Um, um, well, back to you know, back to Lewis Harrison. I remember watching a YouTube video where it's it's very it's a very cheesy, creepy video in a sense that he's talking about time travel. Yeah. But he's glowing. Yeah. He's like glowing. And it's like, who the, who the, what kind of a production is this? Who, I mean, I know he's an Vanessa, but this is very cheesy. Yeah. You know, it's like, I've seen pornos that have better <laughs> uh, production value uh, uh, than this. Yes. Like, seriously. Yes. Oh yes. my gosh. Like, like have a hot chick talking about this or something because it's it's very it's all like this you know the power of 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 uh, time travel is you know it's in our hands it's it's it was he talked about a lot about nothing okay you yeah, by the way peter moon said that peter moon said that if he was if someone wasn't there to rein dr david lewis anderson in that's what he would do is talk a lot about nothing yeah so go on yeah so I mean, you're talking about the regular Joe tax P electric me, yeah. uh, a minority that, that, that I don't know if that even matters, but you're talking about someone that, you know, when you talk, you know, even when Jamal talks, when you guys talk about you guys' experiences with your guys, um, which, which you guys are about, especially you, Doug, it makes sense. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I can connect to it. And, and so you dream. Okay. Um, um, but when it comes to Dr. David Anderson, you know, uh, Peter Moon, I, I, I can appreciate what he talks about. I love hearing about Marjorie Cameron. I like talking about, you know, Aaron Harbert. This is very interesting because, you know, he, he, he has some, some insight into that, which is, is very interesting. I can, I can, you know, take it in to a certain degree. But uh, when it comes to David Lewis Anderson, um, you know, it's it's almost like, um, okay, maybe, you know, you're the Evanesser whisperer. I don't know, you know? 
It's something uh, like it's, that. It's uh, certainly it, Peter Moon. Pretty much, if if he had a role, that is a good title. Uh, it's really a good title because he like uh, he uh, feels that that's his most con- important contribution to humanity is rendering time travel, uh, quote unquote, um, something comprehensible. Uh, in the Einsteinian sense, the way Albert Einstein would say uh, that his uh, theory of relativity, relativity, excuse me, was something that anyone could understand. Uh, and that, uh, you know, there was an old joke where, of course, Einstein is confronted by three men uh, and uh, they each have the archetypal IQ at uh, either end of the spectrum and one in the middle. And uh, so when he asks uh, the one man, what's your IQ? And the guy says, 200. And he says, oh, wunderbar. You and I can discuss uh, the philosophers Nietzsche and Schopenhauer and uh, the great musicians uh, uh, Beethoven and Bach. And uh, then, uh, you know, he says, what's your IQ? And then the next guy says, oh, it's it's a hundred. <laughs> he says, he says, why, that's, that's good. That's good. Uh, you and I can discuss my theory of relativity. And then when he confronts the third man, it says, oh, what's your IQ? And then he says, no, you told me it's 50. <laughs> and he said, oh, the best of all, you and I can discuss the stock market. And so... Yeah, you know, there's kind of like this thought of what is applicable. So in terms of what Peter Moon does is he's he feels he's done this with time travel, that he's been able to, he's been able to render what Dr. David Lewis is Anderson is saying. He's he's been able to render that communicable. Uh the uh the point is I I I, I don't know exactly how many people really understand it and exactly well, the other problem is like the other problem is this uh even if even if uh l- l- let's say we do understand it there's something just some things that should just not be done well well beyond that it's like uh That's say, say you understand one of them. say say you understand or comprehend the concept of relativity what can you do with it Okay, your average person can't do anything with it, so it's not yeah. really a threat. It's it's like somebody might understand or get what, uh, you know, what Peter Moon is saying on behalf of Dr. David Lewis Anderson, but they won't be able. Obviously, no one's been able to do anything with it. Uh, certainly not without uh, you know millions of dollars of investment or something. Well, from but, and it's funny. It's funny you mentioned that, Doug, because that's that's that would be vital information. But I mean, we tell everybody wear a mask and stay your ass inside and don't go to the Super Bowl. And no, you know, we're going to the Super Bowl, you know, and we're, you know, we're spreading COVID. No, God, what, what about the truckers uh, with that stupid, you know, let's yeah, all... Yeah, those, those, those freaking truckers. Yeah, yeah. Those, not only those guys, uh, those guys have been stopping people from being able to sleep, from being able to go to hospitals, from being able to do all types of things because they're just in like this loud ass rowdy convoy of just man sandwiching it's it's just gross thank there's you there's something horribly <laughs> disgusting about it and there's something horribly closet homoerotic about it it's just gross yes oh it's it's, it's, it, it, yeah. it's like a it's like a thousand derek tallies just <laughs> deciding they've had Ooh. enough yes and they um, and they want to eat all the women in the world yeah. <laughs> thank you it's thank crazy. you that describes it perfectly that describes yeah. it perfectly. <laughs> uh, it, it is. Uh, uh, anyhow, uh, they're being warned it must end, and hopefully something is done about them. Uh, it's it's disgusting, and they do not represent uh, the majority. I want people to understand they're disowned by the Truckers Union of Canada uh, and, uh, you, you know, has, has distanced itself from them completely. Uh, and uh, so um, other than that, I, I might speak to the, about that subject more tonight. Obviously, it's uh, something that needs to be... Uh, to be spoken about, uh, I guess, you know, I didn't want to, <laughs> but it's... Uh, I, I, I rather, I, I mean, I rather us continue to speak about everything. Oh, oh yes, of course. Hey, yeah, yeah, I would we will do that. Yeah, <laughs> we will do that. If, if I get to the truckers at all, it's going to be, you know, coincidentally. And, uh, you, you know, or rather, you know, towards anticlimatically in a sense, sometime during the night. Uh, but 
Okay, uh, what I'll try and do is go back to the yeah. FNFs or story. Um, I do hope people will be patient with me and understand that uh, the first thing I'll do is ease my way back into it by going into the chat room. And uh, when I'm done checking into uh, the, the chat room, then I will, uh, where people are going to be discussing it, then I will try to, uh, um, you know, then I'll definitely go back into it. So let's take a look at the, what some of these people are saying. By the way, I do not want to ignore anybody. Um, and, and certainly with Mr. Romero um, just contributing his time like he did tonight, that's, that's just fabulous. I, I want to thank you profoundly for coming in when we need you. And our man, Jameson Reese, of course, obviously, is uh, the uh, Rock of Gibraltar for us. Ballistic Bupa, who is our wonderful lady, Jojo, uh, said thank you to Peter with an XO. And uh, that was around the time, I believe, that Peter was uh, checking out. And uh, so uh, Ballistic Bupa is Jojo Mikolezik. Our, um, actually, the correct Polish pronunciation would be Mikolezik. And Mikolajik is a um, beautiful name, a uh, beautiful woman. And uh, she, of course, is someone who is very familiar with Peter. Now, let me see now. Just had a... Uh, oh, yes. Uh, here we are with Diane Hillis Buchberger. She says the truckers and protesters and counter-protesters are also in Vancouver. So give her a thumbs up for that, uh, for uh, telling me that. Um, and uh, by the way, just so people had, I have incoming questions again about quote unquote, um, uh, I didn't know people wore costumes on Chinese New Year. By the way, this person is actually, I always assume the best. I don't believe they're being sarcastic. <laughs> it's honestly somebody who just uh, is, is honestly, it strikes me as they really just, don't know uh and, and pretty much are wondering if people wear costumes on uh, asian lunar new year uh and uh I understand that um, i always dress up for the occasion and of course i'm in the safe environment in which to do so and oftentimes go to parties where people are doing so such as san francisco used to be great for this until covid and uh now that we have covid i go back to the estates where um, I, I take it Sammy Romero wasn't able to catch the beginning of tonight's program. But uh, in this case, my uh, psychologist went to the estates with me recently. So uh, the photographs on the promotional banner for tonight's show on Facebook show that. So um, everyone That's not is... Dr. Tran, is it? No, 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 no. God, no. no. Oh, okay. Uh, I, okay. I, said in the, in the, I said in the promotional banner... Um, so if you read the text, the thing that I say is that in di disambiguation from my psychiatrist. Oh, yes. sorry, so, my bad. No worries. Sorry. No, no worries. <laughs> yeah. And um, so uh, my psychologist, of course, and my psychiatrist are two very different people. And for those of you, as I alluded to earlier, my psychiatrist is uh, very, um, very profoundly scarred. And uh, this is like over her entire body due to... Uh, uh, just catastrophic uh, napalm burns. Uh, she's Vietnamese, and uh, this was obviously during the Vietnam War era. Um, she was, uh, at some point, uh, got to the United States, and um, I, I don't know the story behind it, but I do know that uh, uh, she's very, she's involved with the U.S. government. I do know that much because that was proven by a journalist, an American journalist, whose name I completely forgot. And, you know, her her book is had a generic title. And I, like, uh, you know, used to be able to spout it off. She was interviewed by uh, James Arthur Yanchik. So if I went through the list of guests that he's interviewed, um, you know, I could probably identify her name. I could look up, you know, maybe the title of her book, but I'd have to remember it and then find her name. But uh, she was, a like, some woman who was, like, a journalist who then took on a number of stories that got her in trouble. She wound up being institutionalized. In other words, like the Soviet Union was infamous for this. Whenever you d would discredit someone, you would institutionalize them. And that way everyone would just say, okay, they're crazy. You can't take anything they say seriously. Uh, well, you know, the United States operates just like that. <laughs> so uh, this journalist was institutionalized. And uh, she uh, ultimately uh, was brought in for um, some questioning and um, they flew in Dr. Tao Tran. And I know it was her, of course, because the woman 
uh, felt that, that this was terrorism. She felt uh, this woman's uh, face was severely burned. She felt she was being terrorized by that. Uh, by the way, it, it was unusual because Dr. Tautran usually maintains a porcelain mask. So she has a series of porcelain masks she wears so that she doesn't upset her clientele or people she's treating. And um, the only person uh, that she felt comfortable removing the mask with was myself in terms of a client relationship because, or patient relationship, because I'd seen so much violence and injuries in my lifetime, I could handle it without getting nauseous or, or, or you know, twitching or looking down at the floor instead of at her. I could look straight at her and maintain eye contact and uh, did not mind her appearance at all. And, uh, oh, by the way, George Knight is asking to come on, so let's bring him on uh, before we return to all of this. And uh, George Knight, so do share with us what's going on and whatever you can, and say hello to Sammy and Jameson. And George Knight, of course, gets very seldom gets an opportunity to speak with us, so we're very glad to have him. He's in England, he's a service engineer, and he's working on 5G, so he can catch us up on quite a bit. So, George Knight, welcome aboard, if he's here. Oh, uh, yeah. I might have misinterpreted his message. He said, "He said uh, I'm free later, so I I can come on your show if you like." Yes. Um. By all means. Um. Tell, all right. Yeah. Tell, yeah. Tell us we have. Yeah. Um, uh. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh. I'm. I'm. I'm gonna type the response. Just let us know when. Yeah. I mean, you know, he doesn't have to let us know when now, but I mean, like when he's ready to come on. But you know, if he's able to tell us when to expect him, then that's fine too. Uh, and, um, so there we have that. And, um, in terms of, uh, uh, Dr. Tao Tran, so she uh, revealed her face to this woman who felt it was an act of intimidation and was completely freaked out by it. But just by her very description, I knew who she was talking about. And, um, so obviously, uh, Dr. Tao Tran has involvement with the government. I know that by other means as well, of course. And, um, this has to do with the Kino mentioning her in the past, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, she worked to cascade memories into myself of the only single altar that I have, which she helped to block away, thank God, or rather contain. She helped to contain. Uh, and that is uh, something that is, uh, obviously, I owe her my life as far as I'm concerned. Because the danger was always there that somebody could trigger that altar with the proper code word and, uh, and then I would no longer be in control of my life. Uh, so, um, at any rate, um, Bazaar HD will join us, uh, George Knight, whenever he's ready. Uh, in terms of, uh, what we were saying about, uh, the questions concerning, uh, the, the time in the estate, my psychologist, it's Tara bringing us back to the costume, uh, as people call it, and of course, it's not a costume, that's a, what, what is properly known as a GERD, and this is, of course, as I've mentioned in the summary to tonight's program, which is available when you just press the show more, and, uh, you'll see, uh, a lot of information, including a link to a New York Times article about when Japan had a third sex. And uh, this was uh, recognized universally throughout the Empire of Japan. And uh, basically understand that the gilded gird uh, is one that is provided essentially for young male prostitutes. Uh, but uh, my mother taught me the art, uh, just as women are taught the art of behaving as a geisha in Japan, she taught me the art of passing as a female and this was a part of that training to maintain a uh, uh, cultural uh, heritage. And uh, as well, uh, it is a basically a carrier for my weapons. So um, it's weaponized, and in this case, it's multi-bladed. If you take a look at that picture very carefully, you will be able to see no less than a score of blades. So there are 20 blades on display in that photograph. So you should be able to count uh, at least 18 to 19 of those blades. And uh, so the, all of these blades, as you can see, are very uniquely shaped. These are scimitar suggestive, hollow bladed bleeder knives. They're forged of metal, but they're modeled on bamboo puncture punjai or bamboo spears that are of course hollow and bleed the victim and they're completely capable of piercing ballistic armor meaning they'll go right through a bulletproof vest like it was butter as well as if you're 
swing is strong enough and well placed, they'll puncture the skull and rip through the brain. And uh, whatever injury you cause, it exposes the gaping puncture wound to bacteria um, and causes a hemorrhage. If you hit the right artery, uh, a jugular or a uh, uh, the uh, femoral artery, any of these uh, major arteries, uh, the person will bleed out very quickly, uh, is, and as well as dramatically. It will be a fountain of blood when you withdraw the blade. It will spurt out like, uh, like water from the blowhorn, the blowhorn of a whale or the blowhole. Uh, that was the effect that um, I don't know how to translate it in English, but the Japanese, it's, it's roughly, it would translate as blowhole effect. Uh, like when you see a whale spout off, it'll uh, just basically, you'll see an ejaculation of blood that's not going to stop. And um, so there you have it. And um, with 20 of them in a outfit, you're, you're pretty much armed for, uh, for combat. And uh, so hopefully that puts a, a bit of a different perspective on uh, the quote-unquote costumery uh, for everyone looking at that. By the way, what I'm uh, within, uh, you might be able to see the sliding uh, kind of cage uh, that is a actual classical Japanese prostitute's cage that was imported by my son's husband uh, for the estate and uh, complete with its own little ball. You can see that in there um, in the classical days of the Meiji era uh, from which that gird was made and from where it went its sources that time period. Uh, the average male or female prostitute would sit in a cage waiting for clients to select them, playing with the ball, uh, reading books, uh, and uh, passing the day. Uh, while various customers uh, would uh, check in on them and then they would be taken out of their cages uh, for uh, work with the clientele. This wasn't a form of bondage so much as a uh, display. Uh, that's just the display that was arranged. And um, so uh, there you have it. Uh, felt quite a home in there for many photographs that have been taken in there in the past. You're going to find more than this one if you take a look through the archives. And uh, with that, of course, we can return to uh, the subject at hand, which will be the Montauk and the Philadelphia Experiment, etc., uh, time travel and the like. And um, uh, with that in mind, of course, um, Sammy, before I return to that, uh, Jameson, of course, is, as he said, dying again. <laughs> <laughs> He's coughing, uh, poor fellow. Uh, I'm so glad you haven't been impacted by uh, the COVID, but it looked like you were very much on a, a good uh, arc of car conversation. Was there anything you wanted to close up about your narrative for the moment before I suck all the oxygen out of the room? Take your time and, uh, you know, share a little bit with us while I finish up some of these hard-boiled eggs. I'll, uh, you know, uh, if you're still there. Yeah. Yeah, I'm here. Yeah. I'm here. Um I pretty much was just relaying that, um, you know, awareness <clears throat> about um, about Doug and, uh, you know, the information he relays is, is very important because it it pretty much limits the denial. Yes. And that, that's really what it is. It's just denial. And um, because you, you can't defend it, you can't, you can't go against it because it's the truth. And the truth, you know, you can't go against it. Um, that's why, you know, um, I just really try to, um, you know, with, with the information that you've shared with, with, with us, um, take it with the grain of salt, but understand that it, you know, in, in, in every walk of life is there. Um, it's interesting when you talked about Confucianism and how we should add this to our, our lives. Um, Thank you. uh, yesterday, um, I was talking to a coworker of mine. Um, he works in the he works in the security field in the airport. He's he works with um, bomb detection, um, and um, he said hi to me. And he relayed something to me about his wife having postpartum depression after the, the childbirth of of the little girl they had. Um, and this is very personal. Um, and I think this is maybe, you know, God giving me uh, maybe an insight into practicing, you know, uh, sensitivity 
and um, I shared a little bit about my personal life with them. Um, and uh, you understand, once we, we know, we'll make time. Um, but um, We will, I promise. I told, Go on. And, um, you know, he talked about his wife going into depression after the, child, the, the birth of Charlie. And I didn't know this. You know, I, I did not know this. This is possible. You know, you think someone having a child, you know, is the happiest time of their lives. But they've been trying for five years. Um, and um, and they finally, you know, had a baby girl, but she she changed, you know, something. She she went into a depression and he chilled. He shared this with me. And, um, you know, um, I relate something personal with my life. And some of it was my relationship with my family, you know. I, I went through quite a um, a struggle with my family, trying to reconnect with them, and and unfortunately, some of them I've had to um, I've had to put on hold because of the toxicity that sometimes they say and their maturity. Um, but what I told them is, you know, listen to her um, and start from from step one. Go on dates a little bit, take her on a date, maybe some coffee, um, and start with little things, you know. Um, and I didn't, I never claimed to know, you know, I, I don't claim to be an expert in our relationships, you know. Um, my relationship is a working one, but I, what the best thing I told them is if it's genuine, then you're going to have to work at it because, you know, women, if a woman doesn't, doesn't tell you there's something wrong, then that's not good because women... You know, women want to be feel protected. Women, a woman that loves you wants to see you do better and wants to make you a, a man, a better man, you know? So, you know, I try to practice that a little bit, you know, and, and show compassion because he did relay something very personal to me. And um, I, I'm just coming out of mute. Things. So I, I'm coming out of mute so I can yeah. respond. So thank you for sharing that. That's very yeah. courageous. And um, uh, so with that in mind, um, I uh, hope you appreciated that. I hope that that helped them. Yeah. <laughs> Help. And uh, it certainly uh, as well. Uh, you know, I, I guess what I'll do is kind of take it from here and um uh, bless you again. You're uh, deeply appreciated. I love you dearly and share that love with all your own. Um, do hang out in the sense of you're welcome to stay on the call for as long as you as you wish. I'm just, I'm just going to go into monologue mode for at least a while. And um, if you wish, you can, uh, you know, drop in later if you feel, you know, that there's something you can say that would be uh, worthwhile to interject, you know, go ahead and, yeah. um, and just keep an ear out. Uh, if we need your help again, we will try and call you again. Uh, uh, if we need you again, and then if you're able to hear us, you can maybe be able to jump on depending on what you're doing. Okay. Good night. Good night. Uh, bless you. Thank you. And that was Good Samuel night. Romero, wonderful human being. And thank you so much, Jameson Reese. And uh, so uh, what I'll do now is uh, just basically kind of take it from here and reintroduce everybody to all of the concepts uh, that we're dealing with. And um, Jameson Reese says he'll be right back and um, uh, we'll, that'll give me some time, I guess, to try and, uh, you know, leech my way back into the subject at hand. And I'll do that through checking into the chat room. And uh, that always helps to tether me, uh, center focus myself in the live stream. Now, uh, we had uh, Phenomenal, uh, who uh, was uh, bringing up um, the Graham Hancock with his book, America Before. Uh, and then um, he says that was all about the Dryas comment. Now, understand that Graham Hancock uh, is someone who was, like many people, uh, profoundly plagiaristic of H.P. Lovecraft, uh, taking many of what uh, much of what H.P. Lovecraft exposed and simply uh, turning that into something that uh, is basically the framework, the parameters of his uh, his own narrative, uh, which is basically Lovecraft's as opposed to his. 
Uh, there's a reason for all of this. I've brought it up before, is that uh, many of these people are propaganda agents of the uh, cult of the kings of Edom, the agents of chaos. And uh, so these are the people who are trying to uh, to profess a ancient aliens uh, paradigm that is profoundly destructive and profoundly diminishing of human accomplishment and uh, profoundly insulting to humanity's place in the universe, which is central and pivotal, both central and pivotal. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the universe uh, needs us uh, f to make the universe complete, to realize the full uh, extent of creation, to realize or rather finalize creation. Um, so then, uh, uh, but what I do appreciate is phenomenal, uh, saying he used to, uh, work with, uh, D something, DLA, uh, I don't know if he's referring to Deepak Chopra, but he feels that he's, uh, an alien, quote unquote, I can appreciate the humor in that. And, uh, uh, then uh, Chris Collins said, could this more than human aspect of Dr. David Anderson have anything to do with the Evanescers? I would argue yes. <laughs> that would be my stance. I'll go into that. And uh, so when Ballistic Bupa brings up uh, Still Task Oriented, she's referring uh, to uh, the Evanescers, I believe. Phenomenal says... Great story. D David Anderson is a kickboxer. Just saying, that's the whole point. How many scientists do you know who are also martial artists? Really? So uh, he's obviously capable of, um, you know, f feats of physical acumen you, that no other scientist is capable of. And, you know, you, you get your, your average scientist is not like that. Of course, people are trying to change that stereotype. You know, there's more and more scientists that might jog or something. Maybe some involved with some kinds of sports. But martial artists, kickboxers, no less. Come on now. Uh, that is really indicative that David Anderson is not your average human being, uh, let alone a scientist. Not your average scientist at all. Uh Phenomenal says, uh, DA was my boss at uh, detection system for three years. Boss said he was alien, non-human, actually, Air Force. Um, he, not quite sure of some of the acronyms he's using, uh, but, uh, you know, being what it is, it is what it is. And, uh, okay, so uh, George Knight says he'll be back in a few hours' time. He'll be uh, likely more than welcome, I assure you. In the interim, uh, to get back to the task at hand, um... Hmm. Now that we've kind of plowed through what everyone else was saying, um, I think that um, th the best way is to kind of um, work, uh, how do I say this, get back into the uh, the narrative, yeah. arc of narrative. James and Reese is back, so uh, James and Reese can hear me. I might as well get back into the arc of narrative then. I was going through the chat room, Jameson, and just thank you for um, everything you're doing. So what happened was that... Um, if you've ever seen the movie Forbidden Planet, it's this great old black and white, so therefore very classical and classy. Maybe some postmodern people couldn't stand to watch it because it's black and white. Uh, I believe it was uh, Peter Moon said his young wife uh, couldn't stand black and white, uh, <laughs> but uh, it's just unwatchable to her. But uh, actually, European art films are notorious for when they want to prevent present excuse me present a subject seriously uh, it used to be in the old days they film it in black and white that was uh that which they considered a a serious uh production to let the uh, people know that this was a subject of gravitas such was the case with schindler's list that was based on that tradition um and i believe it accomplishes its effect so if you ever see our review Forbidden Planet. It's this old 50s science fiction film with some of the best special effects anyone had ever produced up to that time. Of course, Robbie the Robot appears uh, and Leslie Nielsen. Yes, Leslie Nielsen plays a straight role as the captain of essentially a flying saucer. Uh, albeit it is human manufactured 
uh, exploring the cosmos and the monster that murdered Earthmen in their sleep was this terrifying energy beast, invisible and intangible, with a touch that could melt steel and claws like white hot swords. So, get this, the U.S. Air Force managed to summon something a lot like the Forbidden Planet Entity, and, of course, accidentally let it loose on Long Island on a fall day in 1966. Indeed, in, well, on the day I was fucking born, October 20th. In the very year that I was born, there was no accident in that, and no doubt, uh, I have no doubt, uh, that Aquino might have had something to do with it. Probably not, however, whoever his mentor was. Whatever they do in the Sith culture to pass on their responsibilities, I say that sarcastically, of course. Now, in terms of the short version of that story, despite the hazards identified in the Philadelphia experiment, the government was still interested in exploring some of the possibilities offered by the technology inadvertently discovered during Project Rainbow. And so, a few years after the end of the war, or what was popularized as the end of the war, a quiet portion of Montauk Air Force radar station was appropriated for a continuation of the experiments under more controlled conditions. The SAGE radar set, supposedly positioned to watch the skies over the Atlantic for Russian bombers, was actually a massive land-based installation designed to duplicate the effects of the equipment installed on board the USS Eldridge back in 1943. Now, from 1959 through 1983, experiments in teleportation, dimensional transport, and time travel took place on the eastern end of Long Island, only a few miles from the quaint summer beachfront homes of the Manhattan elite. Now, some of these experiments breached the dimensional barrier to whatever place it is the Evanessers come from. And on at least one occasion, something different came through. Now, the Montauk monster uh, so far appears to have been the unique product of an experiment in dimensional physics. No other reports of similar creatures exist. But it's possible that any high-energy physics experiment might breach the dimensional barriers and open a doorway for a similar being to step through. Fortunately, the monsters can exist in our dimension for only a few short hours before they vanish, never to return. Some of the so-called fringe theories suggested that the Montauk monster and the Avanesser are of the same species. Certainly, the similarity of their special powers suggests some kind of link. I myself never dismiss this as fringe. I always was of the intuition that the Montauk monster is simply an Evanesser that couldn't find a body to inhabit. With no body to take over, they could only be in this dimension for a few hours and basically manifest as a rampaging force of destruction that angrily lashes out at anything, living or non-living, that happens to fall in its path. It's normally invisible. Uh, The Montauk monster is... In essence, a cohesive energy field, roughly two to three meters in extent, and more or less manifests enough, or translucently enough, barely visibly enough, to present a more or less 
humanoid shape, which it, in and of itself is mind-boggling. But it goes to show, let's put it this way, that there is a basic design in God's universe and the universe of the anti-gods that mock him, or the anti-universes, the anti-matter universes. This is because, of course, uh, when I was presenting to Jameson Reese at one point how unimaginative uh, that Star Trek uh, can be, or other uh, programs uh, that uh, show aliens all en massing like, uh, like different species in a lineup, something that you would get at the uh, the bar on Tantooine, uh, in the Star Wars cantina scene. Uh, they never have centaurs or centipedal aliens. It's always bipedal aliens, a few that might be rubbery, and uh, but none shaped like spiders or none shaped uh, with an arachnid body of eight legs, etc. It's very seldom that you see something uh, very imaginative that truly breaches species. Now, there's actually a reason for this, and uh, it goes beyond cheap budget, which is, you know, the, the primary reason, realistically, on any set. But there is also a reason we accept it, because otherwise, people would demand, at some point, somebody spare the money to produce such a scene, where aliens are centroid and others are centipedal with uh, multiple legs. And the fact is that the more energy that's expended on size, on extra limbs, all of that detracts from energy that would be expended on the brain. So the form that ultimately is able to retain enough brain power or entertain enough brain power and is able to consume all the caloric intake it takes to heat that brain up and keep it burning. The ultimately most efficient form, or ultimately the most efficient form, is primatoid, uh, ultimately anthropoid, and as Jameson Reese says, the divine template of humanity. By the way, we've got a bot in the chat. And um, the end result is, the Montauk monster manifests then as something that desperately wants to be human or desperately wants to manifest within the corporeal body of the humanoid form that could entertain or feed its intelligence. I've said that you're talking about the human brain is the equivalent of an incandescent light bulb. And uh, this is a literal parallel uh, that functions well. A entity operating on uh, feeding off electromagnetism would have a lot more wattage and be more like a super light bulb that is uh, one, of the, one of these forever bulbs. And, uh, but nevertheless, invisible, quote-unquote, more like uh, translucent as it is, it essentially manifests in humanoid shape. And its interactions with the physical world, including its attacks, cause the creature's form to give off brilliant flashes of light. The only time it's visible to the naked eye, as a matter of fact, is when it's picking up objects to throw at you or the like. So that's when the lightning coursing through its veins, so to speak, enable you to see it in its translucent humanoid form. It is intensely hot and gives off an audible crackling or humming sound. And it attacks with powerful punches and slashes of its extremities, causing horrible burns. It also shares the Evanescer's ability to fuse people and objects together. So, the Montauk monster is, in essence, an Evanescer in reverse. It must use its dimensional walk capability to maintain its existence in normal space. 
And this allows it a minute, five minutes, 10 minutes of activity for its efforts. When the when this is expended, all of this energy, the Montauk monster dissipates and cannot return until it recovers enough energy from whatever it fades into to basically dimensionally walk itself back into a manifestation that can do more damage to our world. So, with enough failures to recover enough energy from whatever side of the veil it fades into, it's banished to its own dimension and cannot return. Unless, of course, someone else opens a dimensional doorway for its use. Of course, uh, it's... How would I say? Uh, Jameson Reese says, can we assume that the things aren't living in our sense of understanding? Well, I think that goes sans saying, yes. <laughs> now, uh, the one thing I can tell you with certainty is that the Montauk monster frequently attacks while partially or completely out of phase with the normal world. So it is, by my intuition, this is what Dr. David Lewis Anderson would be if he wasn't inhabiting the body of what we have come to identify as Dr. David Lewis Anderson. And that kind of brings us back into step. Now, in 1921, two years before my late and sainted Cyrus, uh, Diana Sujin Lynn Dietrich was born. And uh, a few years after, two years after my father was born in 1919, or rather the man who raised and guided me, George Joseph Henry Dietrich, the German mathematician Theodor Kaluza uh, helped to develop the Kaluza-Klein theory of five-dimensional physics. This was the five-dimensional physics model of unified general relativity and magnetism. And, of course, uh, this was prior to Einstein's torsion tensure, which Einstein himself says may, well, well, may represent the same thing or something different. Uh, I wish I were trained enough to really interpret some of these notes I took so long ago. And I uh, wish I would retain more of what I understood back then. Now, in terms of the unified spherical theory of gravity and physics, electromagnetism is perceived in shape as toroidal. Uh, so it's electrically engineerable, despite being an incomplete theory. So the Hungarian electrical systems engineer, Gabriel Kron, surname spelled K-H-R-O-N-E, I believe. Gabriel Kron worked with anomalous energy. And he was the first to apply Einstein's unified field theory to explain electrical phenomenon uh, via uh, hyperdimensional physics to mold space-time reality. It's like I said, you know, Einstein can explain his general theory of relativity. You might even rock it, as our man Robert Heinlein would say. Uh, Sammy Romero says, X-Men, the animated series. Um, let me recover that so I can read the rest of that. Uh, by the way, uh, don't roll your eyes when he starts bringing up that, because as I said, some of these parallels, there's nothing else you can do other than to bring up popular cultural parallels. He says, X-Men, the animated series in the 90s, had an episode describing the Montauk monster. Do you remember, Jambo? Holy shit, I never do that. <laughs> there you go. Uh, somebody see if they can find that on YouTube. Probably can. Uh, and uh, with that, um, they also had the effect where Wolverine, of course, was a World War II veteran. And he used to go around uh, and, uh, you know, all these old men would say, 
hey, uh, you look familiar, but you can't be, that guy couldn't be your age, that kind of thing. And of course, he was supposed to be Canadian, right? So he was Canadian, and he was always like pissed off that uh, he never caught the Red Skull during World War II and shit. <laughs> Just anyhow. Uh, so, in uh, basically, when it comes to uh, the in 1935, the University of uh, I, I think it's Beige in Belgium. Uh, two years after the Third Reich was established, uh, they helped to apply uh, the mechanisms of Dr. Gabriel Kron. And, of course, this had to do with applications of the Kaluza-Klein theory of five-dimensional five physics. As I said, uh, you know, it's great that some people could understand or grok, you know, comprehend the Einsteinian equations, but what can most people do with it? Nothing. These were people who could do something. But what they did was four decades ahead of everyone, save the Philadelphia experiment. And this was, of course, Die Glocke, the bell. And uh, so when you see people speak about it, like Nick Cook and other such people who are journalists in the field of alternative en energy and uh, a kind of metaphysics, what they are relying on is Polish research. And the Germans knew what they were doing, as opposed to the Americans with the Philadelphia experiment. And the Germans were seeking the anomalous result that the Americans probably accomplished accidentally or collaterally. So you had the Philadelphia experiment at one end when exposed to magnetic field the sailors would disappear and the Americans very likely from all results. In other words, the term you would use is evidently simply didn't know what they were playing with. Whereas with the Die Glock, the Nazi bell, that was the basis behind Nazi UFO technology. So by the late 1920s, you had the unified field theories in the plural. There were different paradigms operative in the Reich. Now, just so people comprehend it, the correct translation for Reich would be realm, as in a knight of the realm. So the Germans only use that for a certain third state as in a empire state fusion of culture, meaning culture, state, and Volk, or race. Race, state, culture. That triune fusion creates a specific realm that manifests on earth. And it's only happened three times thus far in history. So when we use the term Reich, we're talking about its own reality, a reality operative in a very real sense on its own physics. And in 12 short years, the Third Reich exploded in technological growth. There being no theoretical possibility of local variation of extreme gravitational or slash magnetic anomalies over the surface of a planetary body via Einstein's general theory, it was this kind of torsion that allow us such. So the rotating magnetic fields behind both the Philadelphia experiment and Die Glocke, or the Nazi Bell experiments, produced torsion tensor behind the unified field of the 1930s. Space-time was now like a soda pop can spiraled 
and folded and pleaded. This was Gabriel Cron's Applied Physics. So what the Third Reich did with Einstein's theory of relativity, which don't believe the propaganda that this was dismissed as a Jewish science. If anything, Adolf Hitler and the Third Reich took Einstein to be a product of excellent German education. They thought of him as a product of German culture, as opposed to some Jew who came up with this all himself. So, in 1929, Benito Mussolini had established a ufological studies group, headed up by, uh, well, Marconi. And uh, Marconi, of course, was a uh, member of the fascist party, and he was the man who had, uh, in his own right, developed the Marconi phone. And, of course, uh, this was, of course, something that many people say Tesla developed, etc. Regardless, if the man knew how to use it and got it copyrighted first, um, he, was certainly, he was certainly first on the initiative, if nothing else. Now, in terms of Marconi's full name, let me look that up because I believe it was Gavrio Principe Marconi or, oh yes, Guglielmo, uh, Guglielmo Marconi, uh, Guglielmo Giovanni Maria Marconi, first Marquis of Marconi, uh, yes, a nobleman, no less, uh, definitely um, a man to be reckoned with. And uh, he headed up Mussolini's ufological studies group for a reason. Uh, after the development of the Mussolini Mata, and of course the Black Forest crash of 1936 happened after this group was formed. Now the Black Forest crash of 1936 is where, of course, uh, the ancient aliens hype. Uh, their historical, uh, their pseudo-historical sewer shit <laughs> would feed you the turd that it was aliens, like in extraterrestrials that crashed. Now, you might say, isn't this contradictory when I'm talking about Evanescers and the Montauk Monster, and they're really, the Montauk Monster is really an Evanescer who didn't find a body to uh, Jack? Uh, isn't this all like, uh, are, uh, isn't this aliens? No, 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 not extraterrestrial aliens like you're imagining. Here's, here's the trip all you uh, popular cultists are on. You popular cultists who are watching Ancient Aliens, uh, the longest-running series in human history, as Peter Moon has emphasized. All of you people are basically, uh, y yes, as, as Jameson Reese says, they're like us. They shit and piss and breathe and all that shit. Uh, they're like, uh, they're basically humanoids who have evolved to basically burn calories. And they're, they're humanoids who are burning calories and they're like you and me, except they are missing genitalia or something or something stupid like that. They're just uh, super Asian stereotypes, you know, because they're super smart and uh, do math and science better than you. Uh, th this is all just crap. It's not like what I'm talking about is th these, these are not aliens in that sense. They're not extraterrestrials that evolved on a different planet, somehow just like ours to the point where they burned calories like us. Uh, to maintain their intelligence. No, there's something that is is not literally not of this earth. Uh, all the aliens that people are fantasizing about in popular culture are simply of Earth clone worlds. That uh, there may there basically is no other planet like Earth. But whatever other planets there are out there that are close enough they're not close enough that we can live on them without terraforming them. It is re-engineering them. We would have to geo-engineer them to make them like Earth. Geo meaning make like G-A, our goddess, the Earth goddess on which we live. Now, so there was a... So when you take a look at the first point of Gabriel Caron's Applied Physics... Time is involved throughout spatial travel, 
which would be the first point, you're traveling through space, you're traveling through time, because space and time are one. The further out you travel in space, the more you're traveling through time. This is why the astronaut comes home, a young man, and all of their lovers and relations are dead, as presented by Einstein, Einstein himself, with his time paradoxes. So, when it comes to looking through my notes here and seeing if I can interpret them at all, spatial travel via the torsion tensor field repulsion, the electromagnetic field propulsion. That would be point number two. This is what takes us into the free zero point vacuum flux energy because spatial travel through this electromagnetic uh, twister torsion or torsion tensor, the proper term, brings us into the vacuum flux energy that most of you would call, well, that's free zero point, zero point energy, free energy. But the Third Reich took it to its third logical conclusion in the midst of war. It's weaponized. So the weaponized torsion is manipulating space-time far beyond mere propulsion. So this is a prototypical technology to strike at will on the planetary scale, and it's an entry into all the three areas that I've pointed out as components. Spatial travel via field propulsion, free zero-point vacuum flux energy produced thereby, ultimately weaponized into a torsion that manipulates space and time itself, meaning the Germans were able to mechanically rip asunder the very fabric of space and time without reverting to the occult enslavement of their very souls to the anti-gods that the Americans had to rely on. This is the power of the gods themselves, as Jameson Reese does say. All three of these elements, space travel via the field propulsion, the vacuum flux energy leading to free zero-point energy, uh, the weaponization thereof into torsion, manipulating space and time far beyond propulsion into the sundering of the universe, or the fabric of the universe itself, at least regionally, all, well, time is involved in all three of these components. All of this then collaterally produces time travel, just as you're collaterally moving through time when you move through space. So, uh, in the 1980s, there was a so-called trilogy of books yeah probably a trilogy and the franchise altogether of that trilogy was called the lightning series this was produced by dean Koontz, all about the rotating drum and when henry stevens interviewed the german scientists in nasa who were still around at the time by the way jameson reese says he read that as a kid holy shit yeah. see what it did to him <laughs> Now, Henry Stevens interviewed the German scientists who were still alive in NASA at that time. Oh, Jameson Reese says his father loved those books. Incredible. Thank you for sharing that. So when Henry Stevens was interviewing the German scientists still alive and working at NASA in the 1980s, he interviewed them on Project Kronos or Project Saturn. Kronos, the real Greek term for the... Father Time. The Greek name for Saturn is Kronos, the god who devoured his own children because he feared that they would usurp him someday, which they ultimately did in Greek mythology. And when he was interviewing them, he wasn't interviewing them about space travel. Henry Stevens was interviewing them about time travel. So then again, uh, in terms of Gravitics, the magnetic vortex, compression, 
and mag spin or magnetic spin resonance bell. Well, that involved Dr. Walter Gerlacht. And Dr. Walter Gerlacht won the Nobel Prize in physics. So you had a Nobel Prize physicist who helped construct the magnetic vortex compression and mag spin resonance glock or bell. That was the full proper name for the Nazi bell, which had a higher classification of security than the atomic bomb. And he resumed his university post and never published again within his specialty to prevent the Soviets and the capitalists from exploiting his work. He swat Adolf Hitler. He said, I'm too old to move to Unterland. I'm going to stay upon the surface world. You have my contributions in terms of my science. And I swear my oath unto Führer and Fatherland. Führer and Fatherland. Or how would they say it back in the day? Unto Führer und Vaterland. That the communists and the capitalists will never benefit from my work. So he never published in his specialty again to prevent the Soviets and capitalists from exploiting his science. Albeit he resumed his university post to raise a new generation of German geniuses on the surface world. So the Schutzstaffel, of course, the security service, the SS, of uh, my biological father's bodyguard, so to speak, his immense second army. The, oh God, I believe they were called the Imbixenteller 4. That was the SS Development and Research Bureau. And Imbixenteller 4 made, or rather, strove to make Der Vaterland, or the fatherland of Germania, energy independent via drawing power from the very vacuum. This is why Michael Aquino told me that the four great Nazi secrets of life, the secrets of the universe, that the third realm had conquered, were the four secrets all mankind has sought for all eternity. Uh, water is fuel, time travel, anti-gravity, and immortality. By which, of course, the Third Reich entered a, well, they entered singularity, uh, became a breakaway civilization, so advanced beyond ours that we cannot even comprehend the very thoughts of their individual citizens. So, when it comes to Hans Kammler, affiliated with the uh, SS uh, Bureau involved with these tasks, these accomplishments, in Bixentel 4 of the SS Development and Research Bureau, he disappeared with the Bell Project and all its documentation, leaving behind, of course, what was left in the Canary Islands to threaten the Americans with a mega tsunami. And whether or not that was completely disabled or disintegrated by the latest volcano, or whether it's still a ticking time bomb that will ultimately uh, phase enough of uh, La Palma into another dimension and generate thereby uh, enough displacement of matter or material uh, universe within our dimension as to trigger that mega tsunami after all, the ultimate black swan event, remains to be seen. So when it came to the heavy lift six-engine Junkers 390, 
that flew nonstop to Argentina, and the independent post-war Reich space program was brought with it. This was to evade the Brits from taking all of Germany's famous atomic bomb scientists, which they claimed that they, that they basically transported from mainland Europe or continental Europe to Farm Hall. Walter Gerlach came to the U.S. for further interrogations, which are still completely classified, after which he resumed his university post and never published again in his field. So he could fuck both America, well, gave both America and the Soviet Union the big middle finger because he was serving das Drittmacht, the third power, the Third Reich. Einstein worked for the U.S. Navy during the war, and, of course, we see the results in the Philadelphia Experiment. Now, an inside joke amongst German, the German scientific community and certain Apollo missions was that they all landed on Hitler's birthday. You can look that up yourself. So, this was all part of a cosmic war for the unified field. The ultimate prize of them all. Overtly, your space program was motivated by an occultic agenda. Whereas your covert space program is practical. In other words, the space program that you know of is all just esoteric flash and bullshit launching on days when the astrological window is opportune as opposed to the astronomical window. Your covert space program has to deal with the secret war in space against the Soviets in some cases. It would be the communist Chinese today, but ever and always against the thousand-year Reich in exile. Now, in terms of the torsion tensor physics, it explains temporal axial displacement. That would mean, you know, the axis of time travel, displacement of time, putting you in a different time-space continuum, right? Or along the same continuum, rather, but displaced within the different time and space along the line, so to speak, up the timeline, down the timeline. All of this brings us to what was called by the people working at Philadelphia, in the Philadelphia shipyards. My father kept hearing the term Tesla's egg, as opposed to the Nazi bell. So, just as the Philadelphia experiment in which Tesla was involuntarily involved until his death in 1943 when he killed himself so that he wouldn't have moral responsibility for what he knew was to come. In fact, during World War I, Tesla presented the Undersecretary of the Navy, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, with his concept of torpedo deflection, uh, or rather torpedo and projectile deflection, via via rotating magnetic field, Exactly what I was describing earlier. This has the collateral effect, based on torsion tensor physics, of potentially temporally displacing the object so defended, in terms of rendering it able to have its invisible force field, its Star Trek force field to uh, bounce bullets off of, you wind up taking it to a different time and place, collaterally. Not until somebody can take care of that side effect. Then you get the object phasing out, as Jameson Reese says. So, again, this was in World War I when Tesla presented this to the United States. By the time they were ready to put it under Franklin Delano Roosevelt's presidency and his executive a commander-in-chief status as uh, the leader of all America's armed forces, uh, then Tesla was no longer willing to play the part 
of their puppet. By the way, uh, Jameson Reese brings up that Michael Aquino talks about all of this in code in his books, and that's quite true. Well, no, he, he actually talks about it in some of the interviews, which if you can find any more of them, they've all been scrubbed. But uh, when he speaks about um, he speaks about going faster than speed of light, he talks about phasing out. So obviously, you know, this is what this, he's this, describing. This, this, yeah, this reinforces everything you're saying. I mean, he, he obviously got the well, obviously you, you two, you know, were important at exchanging this type of information. This is incredible stuff. Bless you. Thank you. Appreciate that profoundly. So, when Tesla killed himself, then Einstein was brought in to finalize the 1940s Star Wars Initiative. In other words, what Ronald Reagan did in the Third World War, what people so mistakenly call the Cold War, uh, with his Strategic Defense Initiative, what was popularly sold to the public as Star Wars, Einstein was finalizing the Star Wars of the 1940s. And as with Diglokas, Diglokas are the Nazi Bell's hyperdimensional rotational physics, the physicist David Lewis Anderson is manipulating small portions of time via rotational lasers. So, hopefully, that puts that work into some context. Now, Werner von Braun, ultimately, was brought into Roswell. And that's because the Nazis, uh, again, you're going to hate that term because it's been so propagandized, but the members of the party the National Socialist uh, German Workers' Party. You can just call them NSDAP. Nas that's the acronym for National Socialistische Deutsche Arbeiter Party or the National Socialist German Workers' Party. Just say NSDAP so you avoid the Nazi triggering effect. They had their hands in every aspect, the party boys, of the U.S. spatial development. And it's all crashed and burned when they retired. When all the Nazis left, the American space program, well, there wasn't any. <laughs> After that, that was it. Without a German space program, you don't have a space program. And the Soviets had von Braun's brother Magnus. And when all their Nazis died. Their space program crashed and burned. Now, this isn't necessarily genetic, like only Germans can do space, like only Germans can do hard vacuum or something like that. Only Germans breathe in space, something. They, you know, don't start thinking like that. But it's the culture. Germans use the term Kultur with a K. K-U-L-T-U-R. Without that Kultur, the spark that the Russians and the Americans just don't have, there's no final frontier. It's more cultural than it is genetic. So, the Philadelphia experiment, which was primarily uh, projectile deflection and secondarily radar stealth, was tertiarily, or thirdly, potentially trying to grab as the cherry on top optical invisibility. So, the Philadelphia experimental attempt was a three-pronged outreach. And whatever effects they could grab, they'd take. But primarily, they're trying to deflect incoming torpedoes, right? Projectiles. They, uh, secondarily, if they don't appear on radar, they're by. That's great. And if they happen to be invisible to the naked eye, that's even better. 
But modern war is a war of distance anyway, so you almost never see your enemy. Of course, World War II is a bit different, but you get my point. The experiment instead achieved unexpected results, and ultimately, believe it or not, the entire project was dumped on the Coast Guard, which is something a lot of people don't know. And we had our own Coast Guard station at the Presidio military base, and I found that out by having to basically deliver some papers to the Coast Guard station on site the Presidio military base. That Coast Guard station was reputed to be terribly haunted for reasons I don't know, but it ultimately became the headquarters for the Gorbachev Foundation after he defected from the Soviet Union. He was hoping to run the United Nations from there. Oh, the... How do they say it? All the dreams of mice and men. Anyhow, the unexpected results of the Philadelphia experiment so appalled Albert Einstein that he retracted his unified field theory. You can look that up. I don't know if any of you even know that. So, Chris Dunn was investigating his paradigm of all of this being part of a cosmic war, which of course it was. These are outsiders looking in. People like Chris Dunn and Nick Cook. But those men are reputable compared to pieces of shit like Graham Hancock and all the ancient alien motherfuckers. Chris Dunn and, uh, you know, Nick Cook, they're on the level. And they're just outsiders looking in, trying to find out what they can. And they come across what I already knew. This was a cosmic war being waged between the Aryans and the anti-gods. Bear in mind that 65 million years ago, you had multiple cults. And 3.2 million years ago, the Vedic texts emerged. 13,000 years ago, a power plant was built in all due speed to deal with an emergency as an antidote to other weapons threatening the genetic baseline environment. This was not conventional warfare. Rather, it was weaponized hyperdimensionality. All of this is laid out in the tetrahedral geometry of the Shield of David, what you call the Star of David, which is why it's the sacred symbol of the Empire of Japan, which is on the three Japanese treasures that no mortal man is allowed to see, or woman. Only the imperial family, closest and purest in draconic, or dragon, or rather hachurui, or serpentine lineage. The Shield of David, it's not a star, it's a shield, being the two-dimensional analog of the two tetrahedrons. The details of which comprise the Ark of the Covenant. This was in that cosmic war so long ago, the first manifestation of this conflict, when Atlantis... Lemuria and Mu all sank beneath the waves, used off-world, deployed to destroy Phaethon, the planet between Mars and Jupiter that now exists only sundered into shards as the planetoidal belt, the so-called asteroids. Asteroids means little stars, and it's just plain stupid. They're not stars, though they shine as such. Uh, rather, they are best referred to as planetoids, albeit because they were furtive, like rats in the telescope. They were referred to 
even more appropriately as the Vermin Stars. That's the planetoid belt. The human genus was not confined to Earth at that time. This was not a war of any goddamn ancient aliens. It was just humans who had sided with the anti-gods or turned to them in their corruption and those who fought against them. Now, General George S. Patton's advanced units, their field intelligence reports that I was ordered to either, after collate, you know, on collation, after collating them, either to classify or destroy, the field intelligence reports told of the secret installations of the Third Reich, or the Thousand Year Realm. This was the kind that you saw these installations were just recapturing what was forgotten, remembering what was forgotten from the Cosmic War, where energy coming into our planet three million years ago was the covert weapon. Uh, the Let's put it this way. There are several things that are rather unconventional in concept that need to be understood before you can understand even that. You have... Uh, oh, God. Who was it? There was a contemporary of Jack Kirby's, who's, of course, the Jewish comic book artist. Uh, then, of course... Uh, You've got the Warren Casey, I believe his name was, who speaks of the expanding Earth. This is somewhat, shall we say, a poor introduction to this kind of topic, because obviously the Earth was once very hot, much more compressed. As it cooled off, began to expand. The universe, therefore, grew and is to an extent still expanding. I believe, unfortunately, the way Warren Casey interprets it or presents it is kind of like the universe is expanding because all else is expanding, right? That's how he kind of thinks about this, which is like, that. don't go with that. That's kind of like saying, the universe is expanding. We're all getting bigger. Yeah. Okay, dump that. But when it comes to this covert weapon that utilized the energy of, well, planetary energy, like the energy of our magnetic core. This is why so many planets in our solar system are deprived of their magnetic cores. They were all used up. This is the kind of weapon that corks the steam vent of hyperdimensional energy expanding the planet. And, of course, it equally impacts the field of acoustics. One of the things that happened before that Evanesser disappeared out of Bethesda was his scream was sonically so piercing that people felt their eardrums were going to rupture and they collapsed unconscious. And when they awoke, the patient in that particular padded cell was gone. My father warned me, of course, to contain an Evanesser. You don't need a rubber room and a straitjacket. You need the dampeners of whatever will absorb tremendous electrical attack. Lead walls and the kind of cork, lots and lots of cork, that would pad that kind of cell to keep an Evanesser starved to death. You could kill an Evanesser. You could kill the Montauk monster like that. Now, as I brought up before, I could go into Keith Chester and uh, Strange Company, which was all about, uh, well, it's subtitled Military Encounters with UFOs in World War II. That would talk about uh, Goebbels' greatest victory, really, without their knowing it, convincing the Allies that the phenomenon of ufology, well, of the Ufonauts, they were on the side of the Axis. And uh, 
I've explained everything behind that before, but for our man uh, George Knight, it's another book for him to get a copy of. Strange Company, UFO Combat in World War II, subtitled Military Encounters with UFOs in World War II by the author Keith Chester. Uh, so, um, by the way, Sammy Romero says X-Men Season 3, Episode 27 and 28, Out of the Past. All right, so let's take a look at what Elsie says here. I'm going to have to recover that note, his notification. He says, kind of late, but found it. No, that's fine. <laughs> Better late than never. We're slow, but we get there. He says, X-Men Season 3, Episode 27 and 28, titled Out of the Past and The Spirit Drinker reminded me of the Montauk monster. I think that's, uh, I think that does well. Okay. And, uh, by the way, so people know that there was a, uh, he, by the way, Jameson says, damn, Americans, some dumb mofos believe in alien propaganda and shit. Yeah. Well, you could almost understand why. In 1933, you had a Scandinavian wave of sightings which was considered uh, premonitory. And aircraft obviously needed a very large fuel capacity and aerodrome assets. So you had to wonder where these aerial objects were sourcing from. And uh, in 1943, with Allied bombings consuming Europe in flames, the entire wave recommenced. Joseph Goebbels, in his genius, could take advantage of that and say, these are the aliens returning on our side. So, yeah, the daytime sighting of August 28th, 1945, over open waters. Uh, and, uh, anyhow, um, when it took off uh, in terms of Mussolini's Manta program, which later became the so-called UFO to crash at Roswell, one of the many, that took out of Turin, Italy, uh, you know, of Shroud of Turin fame, what my gang brother Beaver refers to as the Jesus rag. And uh, you had a Lancaster British crew taken out a tour in Italy in 1942 talking about encountering a rocket zeppelin. 1942. And uh, by the way, uh, Eisenhower ordered in 1953 with the Japanese having won the war and Truman being ousted as president, Eisenhower ordered the CIA Robertson panel uh, this was, uh, Robertson was the scientific advisor to Eisenhower's SHAEF, or S-H-A-E-F, Supreme Headquarters, or Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Forces in Europe. SHAEF was the acronym for that. Now, um, by the way, when I'm talking about, uh, let me see. All of this, uh, I'm sorry, I'm going blank now because I'm seeing an image in the text box on Skype that shows me uh, <laughs> Wolverine's claws and he's looking at, oh God, what is this thing? It is, uh, Sammy Romero says, LOL, I knew it. We the best cartoons, JMO. Uh, Jameson saying, yep, that's the episode I remember, you know. If these kids had grown up just using the services of hookers before they turned 18 like I did uh, and consuming pornography instead of this shit, you know, maybe they would have made something of themselves. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> They're all right. They're all right. They really are. All right. This is kind of like the Montauk Monster, except it's more like... This looks like one of the Eyes of the Beholders from Dungeons and Dragons, except it's got Tyrannosaurus Rex forelimbs and shit that it's walking on. And it's like, uh, you know, Cyclopean, uh, big ball with a big mouth. 
it had a big eye. This is like a penis head, uh, except instead of a piss slit going up vertical, it's got it, you know, split sideways. Uh, and uh, still got the one eye looking at you. And uh, the two little um, arms are so it can jack itself off. Oh, yeah, it's got maybe like fourth, maybe maybe like smaller arms in front of the mouth so that it can, I guess, feed itself. I mean, it's energy. It doesn't need to eat with a goddamn mouth. <laughs> Uh, okay and it, it doesn't need an eye to see its energy you know the uh montauk monster by the way this is fine i mean it's an apropos parallel it's an apropos parallel and uh, uh what wolverine expected to do with his claws i can't imagine uh yes uh by the way jameson says well at least Sammy succeeded er, mm, getting there. Yes, yes. Anyhow, uh, so I get it. I get it. I get where this comes from as a parallel, and it's something I would have thought of myself. It's it's apropos. Uh, but um, yeah, understand that the Montauk monster, as it was truly perceived or historically perceived, no eyes, no mouth, uh, vaguely anthropomorphic shape, uh, but that's the most practical shape with which to interact with the physical realm. Uh, so, uh, so Jameson saying something about a big fucking black shadow. I, I'm not quite sure what, uh, he means by that. Maybe it's something he saw at one point when, you know, when he put his fingernails into the light socket, then I'm sure he was seeing all kinds of shit and, uh, you know, never really came back the same. <laughs> So, uh, uh, he's laughing at that. Yes. Uh, he handles it well. All right. So 1156, it's close to midnight now. Uh, oh my God. All right. I think that now I'm not going to quit and I think we're still streaming. Let me take a look at where we are on the stream, the live stream. Cause they had that alarming shit that was displaying it says duration 300 minutes still, but we still seem to be streaming. Uh, do give us some feedback. And, uh, you know, even if I were to shut down the transmission at this point, which I don't intend to do, I feel that I've made it worthwhile uh, for the ladies who were expecting something. So uh, thank God for that. We got that out of the way. And now I can relax with the geopolitical analysis. So uh, Sammy Romero says, let's take a look at what, what he says here. Uh, then he laughs out loud. He uh, does an LOL after he says, he says, I didn't know the show was outsourced to be produced in, to, produced in, be in Japan. So technically anime. So what Sammy, I think, is trying to say uh, here, and something happened where he started talking like he was, uh, he, how would I say it? Like English was his second language. He doesn't normally talk like that. <laughs> I think what he's trying to say is that this was outsourced from Japan. In other words, it was outsourced by the Americans who paid for it to produce it. They outsourced it so the Japanese would produce it so it could be distributed here. So it's technically anime. That's what I think he's saying. Laugh out loud, right? Yeah, so there you go. The Americans can't do shit. Give me a break. Everything's produced in Asia. It's kind of like, this is like, if you ever see that movie, oh God, what's the title of it? robot wars i think that's the title is robot wars and they show this is during the time of the 80s when everybody's afraid of asia yellow peril uh you know japs taking over everything they're buying up uh wall street and shit and uh you know uh, market square all the rest of that Times square excuse me central square <laughs> you know everywhere in every city and uh then uh the americans produced robot wars where they show you know uh Asians that are supposed to be Chinese, but they're dressed in kendo outfits and doing kenjutsu and shit. Kendo, that's Japanese martial art. And uh, so uh, basically they're like, uh, uh, in that film, uh, they're stealing American robots to fight other American robots. But... At the same time, they're supplying an American insurgency uh, called the Centros or something. And the Centros, maybe that meant Central America, like the Central Americans are trying to fuck up North America. And they're still projecting into the future, but they're thinking of the future as still a, a very white America that, you know, all the Americans are white. <laughs> and, and then the guy keeps like telling uh, his 
superior uh, and there's some kind of corporate military merger where, you know, the uh, there's like no definable barrier or boundary between the twain. You got men in business suits wearing medals. But, um, you know, that's kind of, all right, that's cool. I can get that. And then they're like, well, we're doing business with the Asians, the Eastern powers. But the guy says, look, they're supplying our Central insurgency, I guess, Central American insurgency. And it's like, see, this stuff's all made in Asia. And, you know, I'm like, well, no shit. Everything's made in fucking Asia. That's like, <laughs> that doesn't prove anything. Uh, and yet the two robots in the film are American made, but they're like, it's like the Americans could only produce one of each. They pretty much say that in the film, that there's only one of each robot. It's like, but this is America with its defense contracts, right? You put, you produce one multi-billion dollar fucking concept model, you know, proof of concept model, and then nothing gets produced again. Yeah, and because it's American design, the bots suck. <laughs> That's what Jameson says. I didn't say that. But yeah, yeah, you could tell that by looking at them. The bots fucking suck in the movie Robot Wars. They, they yeah, they suck. Uh, you know, you get a few minutes of conflict at the end. You know, and they, the, the robots move like shit. So, mm. it's not that bad. I mean, but yeah, it's pretty bad. <laughs> but it's charming. It's quirky. It's quirky and charming. And I love the woman in the film. The woman in the film, it's, it's, it's worth it. Every female actress in a science fiction film in the 80s looks like a porno actress. Because most of them are. And, uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, like Jameson says, damn, Japanese got to do everything mechanics for us. Yes. Yeah, there you go. Uh, and uh, Sammy's saying, yup, laugh out loud. Okay, um, do me a favor. Why don't you two guys come on, spell me. If you two guys are able to do this, come on, spell me for a few minutes. I've got to refresh myself, try and get my head out of my ass yep. and maybe do some analysis on something more contemporary. Um so uh, both of you gentlemen, hopefully what I produce put things into some level of perspective. And oh, God, no, I didn't even begin. You know what? I have to go into Castle Bravo. I got to bring this back to Dr. David Lewis Anderson. How the fuck could I forget? I'm so sorry, guys. All right, let me try. Get my head back into the space and then um, get back into how David Lewis Anderson manifests the way he does to us and why my father concluded what he did. How could I forget? Holy shit. Um, I mean, it's, it is painful. And, um, so uh, if you guys are still around after that, we can see if you can spell me a bit and see if we can bring on uh, Penny Bradley for a few minutes. But, um, honestly, uh, let's try and tell people what happened. Uh, basically, um, when it comes to, uh, the, the whole experience that my father had with Castle Bravo, which the Japanese called uh, basically the, uh, the third atomic attack on Japan. At the time, it was the most powerful artificial explosion in human history. And it wasn't supposed to be. On March 1st of 1954, the United States detonated our empire's first thermonuclear. It has fusion bomb as opposed to fission bomb. And uh, that was at Bikini Atoll, from where the word bikini comes from, in the Marshall Islands. A small coral reef and uh, 23 surrounding islands that are populated have always been. And it was, again, the month of my sister's birthday, long before she was born, March 1st. 1953, this coral reef, 23 islands, almost equidistant from Australia and Japan and Hawaii, equal distance almost from all three of those strategic, some of the most strategic points on earth. And it was in the days and weeks, well, actually years and decades following those blasts that the American empire would be forced to compensate the natives for essentially exterminating them, annihilating their way of life, and therefore their culture, 
a cultural and ultimately physical genocide by how many were evacuated and re-evacuated but ultimately died of cancer anyway. The Japanese called it the second Hiroshima, which no one in Japan would ever say lightly. So, it was all unspeakably wrong. The Castle Bravo device, the day that it sat silently, sun-kissed, really, out where the sun could shine on it, as my father called it, sun-kissed, where he could see it on the morning of March 1st, housed in this, moved into later on, an ugly concrete bunker that was itself on an artificial island. They had to build an island to bunker it. And that was on a beautiful reef off Namu Island in Bikini Atoll. You had this array of parallel vacuum tubes running from the bunker to basically uh, transmit data. And um, the data that they were transmitting was relayed down these parallel vacuum tube rows. A data bunker 2.2 kilometers away was ready to measure all the various variables. Numerous towers with mirrors rose up out of these man-placed, uh, well, man-placed uh, sand embankments, really, that the sailors were all helping to build, especially the CBs, the construction battalions. And uh, all of this sand was at equidistant, ready to reflect all these giant mirrors, all the milliseconds of explosions for the cameras. All smoke and mirrors, if ever there was any. Just uh, different distances. Just to catch those first few milliseconds of the explosions in ultra-fast and very different cameras before the towers themselves vaporized. All of that set up to follow within one second of the explosion of America's uh, first fusion bomb. Fusion is the power of the sun itself, very different from fissile. And uh, that fireball that was to be produced, well, it was almost five miles wide and hotter than the sun itself. And immediately, everybody in attendance knew something went unspeakably wrong. Within a minute, the mushroom cloud was higher than most commercial planes could ever fly, and in under 10 minutes, the results of the explosion were 100 kilometers wide. For context, 100 kilometers is the same distance from the surface of the Earth to space itself. And the fireball was seen up to 400 kilometers, or 250 miles away. Now, in 15 minutes, you had... General Curtis LeMay of the Strategic Air Command asking what went wrong. Everything had been miscalculated. Uh, there was a book by that title, 15 Minutes, that was the countdown to nuclear annihilation quote. You know, within seconds, of course, every sailor, including... My father, all of them battle-hardened men, veterans of the Pacific War, the greatest war there ever was, they sensed that, well, they all went to their knees and prayed. They all went to their knees and prayed that indescribable flash of light from that horrific explosion when they were all on their knees and praying, they could see the bones through their very hands. Their hands were all glowing in the dark. That was... They could see through their hands, if you can imagine that. Not just the bones in their hands, but they could see to a degree to the other side because their flesh was rendered transparent. Their bones were like an x-ray, like a light through a chicken egg. If you've ever held a candle in school to see the embryo of the egg inside the chicken, they could see everything within their own bodies. That was something that, the way that my father described it, what all the sailors felt, 
Those that weren't on their knees were flat on their back and unconscious. Or too injured to even get up. Bones were broken. The heat that followed, as my dad described it, the blast was a blowtorch running over the side of their bodies. Those that were facing the bomb, 30 miles away, that was the worst disaster in America's atomic testing history. Castle Bravo's yield was supposed to be 6 megatons of TNT equivalent energy, and it exploded with 15. 15 megatons. So, originally you had this metal cylinder, 23 and a half thousand pounds, and uh, had about the diameter in what was called the shrimp device in that bunker that uh, my father had seen them in turn it into. And they called it a shrimp for reasons I can't remember. My father may have explained it to me. Uh, maybe because they thought the metal cylinder was like a shrimp's shell. Anyhow, the diameter was about uh, as wide as uh, most people are tall. And uh, the physics, of course, was that unlike a fission bomb, which uses conventional explosives to compress radioactive material down to critical mass, thermonuclear weapons use fission bombs to kick off a fusion reaction, which needs much more temperature and pressure, hence the thermo part of thermonuclear. Basically, a thermonuclear weapon works by chaining together increasingly destructive stages of the first stage. Uh, the primary fusion bomb, well, fissile bomb, I mean to say, being the first stage, in a progressive series of destructive stages. So, when you chain these stages together, as Jameson says, they create a star. The fission bomb, of course, is the Hiroshima bomb part. You use a Hiroshima bomb to trigger in the sense that conventional explosives trigger a Hiroshima bomb. In this case, a Hiroshima bomb uh, is engineered to release its obscene amount of energy into the interstage, where expanding hot gases, plasma radiation, and neutrons are directed via the casing's geometry and material engineering at the secondary, which is a reservoir of fuel by that secondary stage. And that reservoir of fuel triggered by that primary bomb it would be, as I said, think of the gases on the sun, plasma, burning plasma. The geometry of the casing, which is almost alchemical and occult. This is the secondary reservoir of fuel that gets bombarded by neutrons at incredible heat and a pressure a thousand times that at the center of the Earth. And this fuel undergoes fusion, a process releasing many more times more annihilating energy per kilogram than fission does. In essence, that's how all thermonuclear weapons operate, and in theory, a secondary stage could be used to ignite a third or tertiary stage of fusion and beyond. It's speculated that this is how the Russian scientists ignited the largest bomb ever detonated, the so-called Tsar Bomba, or the Emperor of Bombs, an explosion so unimaginably immense that measurements at the time showed the resulting shock wave circled the planet three times. Fusion is ferocious. The Castle Bravo device used a solid fusion fuel called lithium, deuteride, an isotope of the element lithium with six neutrons bonded with an isotope of hydrogen with a single neutron or deuterium. The enriched lithium used in the bomb was 40% lithium-6, which, when bombarded by neutrons from something like a fission reaction, completes an exothermic reaction to form the radioactive sort of hydrogen with the two neutrons known as tritium inside the hell that is a nuclear explosion. Trit tritium and deuterium fuse. And, well, when they fuse, and by the way, it reminds me that we have a helium crisis. Ah, uh, that's all too real. Stop using those goddamn birthday balloons and making your Donald Duck voices. So when it comes to that incredibly precious element, as I said, you've got two neutrons known as tritrium, uh, tritium, 
and the nuclear explosion, tritium and deuterium fuse into helium. And that, of course, is, well, uh, how does that go again with the helium? I keep going back to the balloons. Well, helium and a relatively large amount of free energy. The energy that makes a bomb a bomb. Luthium-6, deuteroid is the primary fuel in the thermonuclear weapons. And in the Castle Bravo device, it was also the fuel for the critical miscalculation. It was assumed that the enriched lithium-6 would be the only source of the bomb's energy and that the 60% of the fuel that was lithium-7 would be inert and wouldn't react at all. And then it did. So, the day before the Bikini Atoll gained a crater, the salty ocean uh, flooded into, the extermination culturally and physically of the inhabitants of the island was considered acceptable fallout. So nobody warned them. They were simply told a bomb would be blown. It's all right. Keep doing what you're doing. So when that ocean flooded into the center of what was once an island the day before. The wind was blowing, as expected, to the north. Uh, nobody was north in the early morning hours of March 1st, 1954, but the wind unexpectedly and dramatically shifted to the east, over an area where a small but very present population of islanders lived in the declassified film known as, oh God, what was the name of that? But the task force commander who was interviewed in this declassified film, Operation Castle, the task force commander, uh, he was uh, Major General Piercy Clarkson. He indicated on a diagram that the wind shift was uh, still in the, how did he phrase it? When I think back to this film, I had to classify this film and then they declassified it indicated that the wind shift was still in the range of acceptable fallout when the castle Bravo casing bunker and artificial island became a blinding ball of plasma. It created crater two uh, meters wide and over 75 meters or 250 feet deep. What was inside that crater just milliseconds before was coral reef and sand and now a pulverized coral radioactive and falling like ash was being carried on an unexpected wind toward an unexpected people or unexpecting people. 20,000 people who were resident at that time in, uh, oh, they resided in the path of the fallout. And Rangelop and the Euterica tolls, they were the hardest hit of them all uh and these 20,000 people at Rangelop and Euterica Tolls felt the effects of radiation sickness they would not be evacuated for a full 48 hours every effort was instead made to assure the comfort and well-being of the natives radiation survey teams flown back to the atolls in which time a soil and water samples were all taken. Data obtained from evaluation of these samples was considered valuable in the Gabrielle studies. It would be three years before the former residents of Ranjalop were allowed to return by the United States' Atomic Energy Commission when the islanders began to put the pieces of their experiences of why their lives, their very bodies were falling apart. It took the Ronjalop residents that was began to, they were trying to reconstruct their lives. The fish were making them sick. The crops were either gone or again sickening. There was cesium-137 in the coconut milk. And I believe it was about 82 residents that were allowed to return first. And, um, of course... It couldn't support life. They had to be re-evacuated. By 1963, the year my sister was born, nine years after the bomb, according to secret medical studies where white scientists were simply using the islanders as lab rats, as if they never had enough people to test on, all of this ultimately was simply purely gratuitous sadism, satanic sacrifice, 
They already knew what radiation would do, yet they had to keep watching it destroy lives again and again and again. They couldn't get enough. And their medical studies of the natives of the larger Marshall Islands developing thyroid tumors. When Bravo detonated, 29 children eventually encountered fallout. 20 of them developed tumors. The woman of the islands now had a mortality rate for cervical cancer 60 times higher than that of the American woman on the mainland. Breast and colon cancer risks increased by five times. Lung cancer by three times. Birth defects were reported. Monsters were born out of women's wombs. Island men started dying of cancers at a rate 10 times what it was before Castle Bravo. <sighs> what else can I remember? The photographs. Oh my God, the photographs of these people. Faces burned off. Dying from oral cancers. All of the men. Eventually, all of their lower jaws removed. 7,000 square miles of the Pacific Ocean. 15 islands uh, impacted. Uh, in the end, what was it? 253 residents? I think that uh, were dying immediately. It's all of this considered acceptable fallout. And everyone felt some consequence of radiation sickness. By 1995, the Nuclear Claims Tribunal reported that it had awarded um, its entire amount of funding. Everything in its bank account was uh, basically awarded to the people of the Marshall Islands. And it was nowhere near enough. There's nothing that can compensate for what was done to them. 43.2 million United States dollars, the entire fund, was awarded to 1,196 claimants for 1,311 uh, radiation-induced illnesses. Uh, as I remember, all the fallout from the Castle Bravo test, the worst in human history. The designers of the Los Alamos National Laboratory had made a mistake. Castle Bravo's fusion fuel was 40% lithium-6 and 60% lithium-7, an isotope that, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, has an extra neutron. Uh, at the time, lithium-6 was scarce and expensive, so a compromise was made to add lithium-7 to make up the rest of the mixture, and it was that compromise that led to something that some of the smartest people on the planet either discounted or just didn't expect during the fusion reaction in the secondary of a thermonuclear bomb. The inner lithium-7 is supposed to, you know, the secondary stage I'm trying to express. Understand that when I say discounted, there was one scientist in particular my father saw immediately, knew what he was doing. Knew this was going to happen. And lithium-7 is supposed to absorb uh, in that second phase of hell, of a nuclear explosion. Uh, the inert lithium-7 is supposed to absorb a neutron, become lithium-8, and then decay into two helium nuclei in about a second. Now, one second is extremely quick, but on the time scale of a nuclear blast, it might as well be a lifetime. And the thinking was that when everything is over in just milliseconds, it shouldn't matter what some element like lithium-7 did when it could have already been vaporized a thousand times over in a fireball. This was the mistake you see in everyday physics. Lithium-7 should behave as we just described it. But in the atomic apocalypse of a fusion uh, reaction, uh, it's, <sighs> it's, well, lithium-7 is hit with neutrons with vastly more energy. Smashed by high-energy particles, lithium-7 almost instantly decays into a helium nucleus. Tritium, and another neutron, if you recall, tritium is the real fuel of a thermonuclear device, and neutrons are the particles that sustain the chain reactions of both fusion and fission. But the result was a much more efficient fusion reaction than calculated by Los Alamos scientists. And what was supposed to be a 5 megaton bomb detonated with 15 megatons of TNT energy equivalent to 60,000 trillion joules. 
J-O-U-L-E-S, because of this so-called tritium bonus the blast of Castle Bravo had, the same total energy as all the bombs the Allies dropped during World War II together. But that's what brings us to Lucky Dragon number five, the ship that was being referenced by Jameson Reese. And, uh, of course, uh, uh, oh God, the 23-man crew of the Japanese fishing boat, the, uh, the Daigo Fukuyu Maru, the Lucky Dragon 5, as it roughly translates. I don't believe that that does the name justice, but we'll fly with that, simply because that's what you're going to be able to look it up with. That was supposed to trawl for tuna near Midway Atoll. Instead, after losing many of their nets in the Midwest Sea, they changed course, headed south towards the Marshall Islands, towards Bikini Atoll. On the morning of March 1st, they were unknowingly just a few kilometers outside of the project's range. The projected danger area for Castle Bravo test site and it was not detected by radar or spotter planes in the air that day, so it wasn't warned off by the U.S. military. As fate would have it, the unlucky ship, well, it would, uh, it would be where the wind was blowing when they were overwhelmed. So, it was the east of Bikini Atoll that day, where the wind wasn't supposed to blow. The Lucky Dragon wasn't damaged by the blast, but like the test personnel watching, the men witnessed an expanding light brighter than the sunrise. And as one of the fishermen wrote in a journal, quote, nine minutes later, a roaring sound arrives. How did he describe it in the Japanese? Uh, basically, if I remember... A roaring sound arrives like overlapping avalanches. Bang, 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 an awful sound like the Marshall Islands are sinking as angry waves into the sea. Of course, the men were completely jolted, tried to resume fishing, but this ghostly right white rain, this, uh, this rain of ash, snow, it snowed on the equator and the sky was black and the snow began to fall and they scooped up the dust into the bag well into bags with their bare hands for disposal and of course that was uh something that thinking it was snow some of them even tried to see if it tasted like snow when they were scooping it up for disposal, Oshi Mustashishi, he licked his hands. And uh, Gritty had no taste, didn't know what it was. Of course, it was atomized sand and coral from the Castle Bravo explosion, contaminated with strontium-90, cesium-137, selenium-141, and uranium-237. The dust stuck to their clothes, got in their eyes, inside their noses and ears, accumulated in their underwear, settled in their lungs. And, of course, they were alarmed by the red rain and black rain. And, of course, tried to escape the area to get back to Japan as quickly as possible. But it was a full six hours radiation sickness set in within, literally, imagine that, six hours. Dizziness, vomiting, fever. And uh, there's no way to describe radiation sickness. It's just, you may as well kill yourself. You don't want to die that way. But to have it happen in six hours, before they even reach Japan, dizziness, vomiting, back to their port, home port in Yaizu, Japan. It was, uh, how long did it take them to get there, if I remember correctly? Was it uh, something akin to almost uh, two weeks? Well, the 23 men arrived two weeks later on March 14th. And, of course, they were... Well, by that point, their skin had literally fallen off. Uh, that was, uh, of course... Uh, 
how to express this. What they were about to experience would render the islands surrounding Bikini Atoll, what they did experience, render the islands surrounding Bikini Atoll uninhabitable for years. Well, effectively forever. And when their boat first docked at the fish market in Yazoo, you could detect the irradiated ship from over a hundred feet away over the next few days. The entire crew of the Lucky Dragon Number no. 5 would be transferred to Tokyo University Hospital and remain there for up to 14 months. The crew was constantly monitored by MDs who just, this is the pragmatism in Asian culture, wouldn't let them die. It's simply disgusting. Monitored throughout the day by scientists, daily blood samples revealing internal hemorrhaging, reduced blood cell counts, constant fever, diarrhea, bled from their noses and gums, reduced sperm cell counts or no sperm cells at all. Uh, the prescription was rest, antibiotics, blood transfusions. Radiation was attacking their bone marrow so intensely it was interfering with their body's ability to make blood cells in the first place and to add insult to grave injury, contamination in the hospital at some point during the multiple blood transfusions gave all the crew hepatitis in the third week of August. Uh, Kobayama Aikichi started to die. He presented with meningitis, forced doctors to strap him to the floor with madness, fell into a coma and developed pneumonia. He became the first victim of a thermonuclear bomb when he died on September 23rd of 1954. Though the rest of the crew would be released the following May, they would all die. There was one who had a pregnancy that ended with a stillborn deformed child. The Japanese public would come to call the white ash and rain that painted the unlucky fisherman that day. Shinohai, the ash of death. Now, the official position of the United States was that the danger zone for fallout did not include the Lucky Dragon and denied its crew uh, any compensation or their families. They refused to apologize to the Japanese, and uh, they denied the crew had been exposed at all, said they did it to themselves, that it, uh, basically you had an increase in radioactive fallout in the United States that expanded the danger zone. Uh, there were a hundred other ships that were exposed to the death ash, and obviously as the news of Castle Bravo got out, panic and political pressure followed. But the zenith of the public outrage, I think that was around the time when, who was it? With a hundred ships and a hundred crews, someone was bound to have a friend in journalism. Sir Joseph Rodblad, a Polish physicist, published a paper questioning America's official reports. He was the perfect man to do so. And... Uh, Basically, uh, when it comes to uh, Sir Joseph Rodblad, I think that was his name. Again, he was Polish, so his name was almost like Rockblade. It sounded like that when you Japanized it. He, uh, I remember the Japanese kept calling him Rockblade, Rockblade, but I'm certain that wasn't his name in Polish. He felt personally betrayed that nuclear bombs were used on Japanese cities to end World War II, and he had recently done months' worth of lectures on why all research on nuclear weapons should cease. And so after Castle Bravo, Raplat did the physics himself to reveal not only that Castle Bravo was a multi-stage weapon of uh, monstrous proportions, uh, but that... Oh, what was it he said? Uh, for the first time, he exposed to the public it was a thousand times more radioactive and more dirty than what the United States was claiming. Now, why would anyone believe this lone scientist? Well, in 1944, Rotblat, Rotblat, I think that was his name, Rotblat, R-O-T-T-B-L-A-T-T, -T -T, and uh, 
1944, he wasn't lecturing or teaching or railing against nuclear weapons. He was working on the Manhattan Project. He was the only scientist to leave the project on grounds of conscience. While the Americans were downplaying the true cost of Castle Bravo, the man who the Japanese called Rock Black, he published the first exposition on American crimes against humanity in the nuclear age. A true hero and a man who should be honored. Uh, the Polish people should be proud. What else can I remember? And, of course, uh, it was picked up by an increasingly tense Japanese government and public. The resulting outcry in Japan strained diplomatic relations to the point of breaking. And they almost ceased altogether. Some of the Japanese public and government officials had dubbed the Castle Bravo test the third nuclear attack on Japan. The two countries, the empires, eventually came to an agreement and the United States was forced to secretly transfer how much was it the united states government because the japanese had won the war and said we won the second world war and you're still attacking us we demand compensation so it was within days weeks at the most the united states government transferred 15.3 million united states dollars to japan that was, as well as, on top of that, the equivalent of 53,000 United States dollars to each of the surviving Lucky Dragon crew members. Joseph Rapplatt's paper and the incident overall was a real turning point in public awareness of the dangers posed by nuclear weapons. But it took a lot more than that by the way, I'm happy to report that when I think back on it, if I remember correctly, Rotblatt won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1955. Not the Nobel Prize in Physics, mind you. The Nobel Peace Prize. Totally different animal. In 1955. Now, of course, what the Americans have never done is formally apologize. Now, of course, people have presented why don't the americans apologize for hiroshima and nagasaki uh i don't even expect the americans to apologize for that nor would i even ask to me that's a non-issue but the americans must inevitably apologize for castle bravo and that is a different animal entirely what else is it that i remember about my father's experience in particular Cool. All right. Just got a message that uh, it's pretty neat. All right. Somebody's managing their page. Now, let me try and tell you about this from the Japanese perspective. Like I said, since I've given you kind of like an overall strategic perspective before I go back to what happened with my father in particular on that island or out at sea off the islands of Bikini. Now, like I said, aside from those two loud noises at the end of the proactive stages of prosecution of World War II to the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant cluster accident that was so wildly and ignorantly criticized in the 21st century. In most people's minds, the empire of Japan is always bound to nuclear. And as I said, the real idiots even ridicule the Japanese as such a large nuclear power, which they so obviously are one of the most nuclearized nations on earth. But it's unknown incidents like this that directly caused a large-scale anti-nuclear and anti-U.S. movement by the Japanese people, one that almost led to a second Pacific War. And as I said, what's called the third nuclear attack by the Japanese people after Hiroshima and Nagasaki 
rendered even more legendary by the Japanese director, Aiji Tsuburaya, Tsuburaya, getting inspiration from this incident to create the classic Gojira, the Godzilla. The details of the entire incident were deliberately concealed by governments on either side of the Pacific, without even the victims themselves knowing how serious the situation was. It would not be until half a hundred years later that people would have the opportunity to revisit the full picture of the incident from what information was released at that time, and it won't be till half a hundred years from now that more information still will be released, perhaps even concerning the Evanessers at that point. But as we know, on July 15th of 1945, the first American manufactured, well, researched, produced, conceptualized, researched, produced, and manufactured the first all-American bomb of the Manhattan Project, the gadget that would be reincarnate in the fat man, appropriately enough for an American bomb, was successfully tested in the desert of Alamogordo, New Mexico. And in less than a month, the atomic bomb was dispatched to the Empire of Japan's home islands as soon as it appeared publicly, causing civilians to experience hellish torture. And less than 10 years later, Americans came up with new ideas and designed a new type of nuclear bomb using the principle of nuclear fusion triggered by chain nuclear reaction. Well, chain nuclear fissile reaction. And since the initial hydrogen bomb used liquid deuterium, it had to be cooled strictly during transportation. So it had almost no practical value. You couldn't deliver it in war to the front where it could be deployed. It was strictly satanic sacrifice, mass satanic sacrifice, and gratuitous sadism. The Soviets preemptively created a practical hydrogen bomb using lithium deuteride. In 1954, when the United States finally produced its first practical hydrogen bomb, the test site was Bikini Island that year. Soon after, it was tested again in Bikini Atoll in the Pacific Ocean, which caused a global sensation. The bikini that we think of today as uh, symbolic of sex was something developed at that time when the Americans were sexing up the bomb and selling it as sex. Potency. America's phallic blast power, it's Viagra, for their flaccid empire. But this time was a little different because of that gap between a hydrogen bomb and a pure fission atomic bomb being far more than a star and a half. The power of the previous bomb had exceeded human in that imagination at the time. Its power can reach the equivalent of tens of thousands of to hundreds of thousands of tons of TNT. But the only few hydrogen bomb tests that have easily achieved this power, well, besides the radioactive pollution caused by the explosion of the hydrogen bomb being serious to the point of catastrophic, rendering it necessary to delineate a dangerous forbidden zone before the test explosion and thereafter, not only to prevent accidental injury, but more importantly, to block the enemy's intelligence collection. The problem also lie within the estimated power of the codename Castle Bravo. And due to the scarcity of data, even today, there is no reliable calculation method. It can only be estimated by scientists. So in the end, the estimated equivalent of Castle Bravo was set at 6 million tons, and the site clearance work began. And at that time was when the Japanese fishing boat, the Daigo Fukuryu Maru, the Lucky Dragon 5 ship, sailed out of Yaizu port in Shizuoka Prefecture, Japan, 
And after, as I said, more than a week of sailing, the Daigo Fukuryu Maru finally came to the waters of Bikini Atoll itself to fish for tuna. And it just so happened that the Lucky Dragon 5 was located 19 miles from the restricted area and naturally did not receive any warning from the U.S. military. And in the early morning of March 1st, the crew of the Daigo Fukuryu Maru dropped their anchor with the joy of a harvest and ended their day's work. And it was at 6 a.m. the next day for them that the weather was fine. The U.S. military patrol aircraft patrolled the security area, found no ships that entered by mistake. When the auspicious hour came, the hydrogen bomb detonated without notifying anyone outside of the military. And this explosion released 15 million tons of TNT energy, far exceeding the power previously predicted. The most powerful nuclear bomb ever detonated by the United States military today. Second only to the Soviet Tsar Bomba in the history of the world. And the so-called success, truly a failure of the experiment, gave the U.S. military complete surprise and brought red ruin on that small fishing boat. When Castle Bravo exploded, you had a crew member of the Daigo Fukuryumaru watching the fish float at the stern when he suddenly saw the dazzling light from the west and seven minutes later there was a huge explosion. Of course the crew subconsciously speculated it might be a nuclear test conducted in the west. The captain ordered the crew to hurry up and get away, but while they were running at full capacity to escape, like in the story The Call of Cthulhu, you got this violent westerly wind suddenly blocking their path. A full head-on encounter, and the strong wind brought a lot of radioactive dust that I was describing falling, falling all over them. Heavily with the rain. Rain that was pitch black and blood red. And then another crew member, now that I remember of the Daigo Fukuru Yumaru, wrote in the day's fishing boat diary, Hydrogen bomb nuclear test was conducted on Bikini Atoll. Before dawn, the sky was illuminated very brightly, and soon a plume of smoke rose. Two hours later, we found a lot of ash from the explosion of the hydrogen bomb scattered on the ship. So, basically, uh, you had people, as I said, uh, Mr. Kubayama was, oh God, the telegraph operator of the Daigo Fukuryumaru, curious about what he thought was snow at first pinching it with his hand, crushing it into powder, putting it in his mouth. Of course, he didn't taste it. But the act of eating radioactive ashes made him the first person to die from a hydrogen bomb on planet Earth. And after those white ashes fell, the crew members of the ship experienced headaches, nausea, burning skin as their flesh melted off. And at that time, few people knew how these symptoms were related to a nuclear explosion that occurred far away. And as I said, it took a four twin knit, 14 nights before the Daigu Fukuryu Maru returned to Yaizu port with a boat of a boatload of tuna. Jameson Reese has found footage of this individual. All the crew members were taken to the local hospital. Uh, so the two severely ill patients included Kubayama and they were taken to the hospital attached to the university Now, the government did not intend to deal with this matter in a high-profile manner, but a high school student told reporters the gossip he had heard from his relatives. And two days later, the Yimuri Shimbun, the local paper, published exclusive news about the nuclear explosion of Fukuryumaru by the United States, which caused a sensation throughout Japan. As I said, uh, I'll go into it. The authorities immediately dealt with it by recovering all the fish caught by the Fukuryumaru. Uh, There's a file photo that's available on the internet taken on March 16th in 1954. 
showing officials measuring radiation levels of a tuna that had been purchased uh, at the Tsukiji fish market in Tokyo that had been unloaded from the Fukuryu Maru number five. And uh, the authorities, the officials, buried them in a corner of the market and set up a nuclear explosive tuna mound as kind of like a memorial. So here you have the atomic bomb having just been developed. Japan, the Japanese people being the only people on earth to have ever uh, suffered the burns of atomic fire firsthand. And then the hydrogen bomb wherein Japan becomes the first victim, not to discount the people's suffrage on the islands, but in their stupidity and acquiescing to allowing the Americans to do what they were doing, they were, in a sense, complicit in their own extermination. However, the Japanese Prime Minister, Shigeru Yoshida, advocated a diplomatic line of coordination with the United States, planning to negotiate with the USA and get some compensation for some quiet, private recompense for the victims. The Shigeru Yoshida government sent Foreign Minister Katsuo Okazaki to negotiate with the United States, but unexpectedly, the United States refused to apologize or compensate and insisted that the ship, the Daigu Fukuryu Maru, had definitely entered the restricted area without authorization, quote-unquote. Now, the New York Times even took a bite back, claiming that the Japanese fishermen were spying on America's nuclear tests. That this was another thing that almost launched a second Pacific War. And it, understandably, not only further angered the people, but also offended the Japanese Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So the Japanese authorities spoke with the facts, investigated the situation at the time of the nuclear explosion in detail. And uh, the Fukuryo Maru was determined to be at Anchorage at the time, at least 19 miles away from the circle drawn by the Americans. While on the other hand, the United States never concealed the slightest evaluation of the hydrogen bomb test. Holyfield a member of the Atomic Energy Commission said the explosion was unexpected and it could be said that it was completely out of control. And combining those two points, Okazaki delivered a demand for both an apology and a compensation request to the American Empire. Mm. And finally, the United States ambassador to the Empire of Japan, formally apologized to the Japanese Empire and promised that the United States would pay compensation. Of course, there were some new contradictions that had arisen at that point in the handling of injured crew members and the ships. The United States proposed that the injured crew and ships should be handed over to the United States for handling because of the risk of their falling into the hands of the communists. Now, Japan temporarily agreed in the sense of a compromise and accepted two American atomic energy experts to assist in the treatment of the critically injured. At the same time, Japanese biologists further investigated and found that tuna contaminated by radioactivity was also found in fish markets in Tokyo, Osaka, other places. And in fact, apart from the ship, the closest to the nuclear explosion, nearly a hundred other fishing boats were contaminated by radioactive dust, and the tuna pollution incident frightened the Empire of Japan's very large and powerful body politic of housewives, who basically, in a very real sense, run Japan. No one dared to eat tuna for a while, causing the price to plummet. And even no fish were allowed to be seen on the royal menu. The emperor himself stopped eating fish completely for a time and panicked 
the housewives in Tokyo launched a signature campaign to ban atomic and hydrogen bombs. And the anger quickly overwhelmed the Empire of Japan. The American experts who came to assist in the treatment of the injured were also secretly resisted and eventually expelled from Japan in a fierce uh, expulsion. Uh, they basically were evicted from Japan in, well, in anger. <laughs> and, uh, in other words, they were run off the home islands of Japan, run out from Japan itself. Again, this is not the way a defeated nation acts. Japan was acting in the role of a victor who had been wronged by uh, the defeated. Now, uh, so the previous negotiations and compensation had stalled, so this was all part of Japan's plan of action. The United States uh, believed that compensation matters should wait for the treatment results of the wounded to be discussed again. And, of course, the act of driving away American experts also meant ending treatment as soon as possible. So the Americans were forced to acknowledge that treatment was, well, well, it was untreatable. Now, Kobayama, the most seriously injured crew member, became the first victim. Um, of course, few Americans cared about his life or death. But he's kind of like a national martyr in Japan. And, in a sense, the father of Godzilla... Uh, in the sense that uh, the director who produced uh, Godzilla was so inspired by him. Uh, and uh, for those of you, of course, who don't know, that's the same man who gifted you Ultraman, the Aiji Tsuburaya, the man who brought you Ghidorah, Rodan, all the Toho monsters, Ultraman and all the Ultra monsters, uh, the maker of monsters himself. Now, what else can I dig from my memory or my mind? Uh, now, <clears throat> I do know something else about this. It became international. Uh, in the enthusiastic atmosphere of the national anti-nuclear and anti-American movement, with Kobayama becoming a national martyr, dying of radiation sickness, becoming the first person ever killed by a hydrogen bomb, the news of Kobayama's death once again pushed public sentiment to a climax, and at that time, the communist Chinese and Soviet brothers in the socialist camp took the opportunity to light a fire and issued a joint declaration with Japan. So at that time, 18.2 million people participated in the nationwide anti-nuclear signature campaign. And Prime Minister Shigeru Yoshida proved completely unable to control the situation, and the anti-Yoshida forces in the political parties of Japan moved towards unity. The Shigeru Yoshida government could, well, they couldn't resist the pressure and they resigned in protest. And so, with the Prime Minister of Japan resigning in protest to make the American Empire look like the aggressors and perpetrators the criminals that they were, the United States at that point, fearing that the Empire of Japan would now enter the Sino-Soviet Sinaxis and render, at that point, well, the three of them together could have conquered planet Earth. They finally agreed to compensate, as I said, two million United States dollars the following year, and that increased by orders of magnitude based on the demands made by Japan. So the Lucky Five Fukuryomaru incident had temporarily come to an end. The atrocities in the United States have not stopped. After the Castle Bravo hydrogen bomb exploded, radioactive snow, their dust, white ash, quickly spread to the entire Marshall Islands with the wind. And, of course, it goes sans saying, the United States military, uh, well, they uh, not only failed to take remedial measures after the incident, but even used the residents on the islands as test subjects for the radiological research. A large number of indigenous people on the island suffered from radiation sickness for decades throughout their lives, a life of 
slow death. Death in life. That is the Japanese term for radiation sickness where you live on for decades. So um, it is something that uh, there's no real equivalent for it in the English language, uh, but there should be. Let me try and see if I can remember the exact phrase, uh, and um, maybe that will... I mean, um, this is something that entire books have been written on this uh, phenomenon. And um, so, oh God, how do we uh, describe it? Uh, the Hibakusha, of course, are the people affected by um, the explosion. Uh, but uh, the term death in life itself, I'm trying to remember the exact Japanese term for it. Uh, but, you know, it's amazing. Sometimes I forget these, these specific terms, but they come back to me later when I least expect it. Now, when it comes to what I was talking about, how America still refuses to apologize and they should apologize for this. Well, they apologize to the Japanese because they won the war. But in terms of their arrogance, the United States refuses to apologize to the people of the Marshall Islands. So you had the, uh, how would I say it? The fifth Fukuryomaru, the fifth lucky dragon ship. Uh, that's why it was called Lucky Dragon Number 5. Their incident is not the most tragic among oh so many nuclear disasters. In fact, it's not even the most famous. You had the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear incident causing sensation even more than half a century later. But in that half century, with the arrogance of the United States, in everything it tries to get away with. And the only reason it can't is because somebody better than the Americans forced them to repent. In this case, the empire of the Japanese. I would hope that in half a century from now, whenever the remaining information about Castle Bravo is reportedly to be released, that the wish before... Well, Kobayama's own wish before his death will not be shattered. He said, I hope I'm the last person to die from a nuclear explosion. But in terms of what my father experienced, to render the personal, and again, understand the context that, uh, again, to reiterate, so that you understand what my father was dealing with. Castle Bravo was the first of several tests of a brand new series of high-yield thermonuclear weapons conducted by the U.S. military in the Marshall Islands under the overall umbrella term of Operation Castle. And that detonation was the first atmospheric test of a nuke fueled by lithium deuteride based on the Soviet model. It was expected to yield a six megaton blast, but nuclear engineers were astonished by its ultimate power. So when my father was there on March 1st, 1954, and Castle Bravo's detonation produced a 15 megaton yield, in terms of energy release, again, it was about a thousand times more potent than the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombs. That incident became the most powerful nuclear explosion that the United States has ever detonated. And the miscalculation occurred because, as I said, the engineers only considered the lithium-6 isotope to be reactive. And that isotope accounted for about 40% of the lithium content of the weapon. The remaining 60% was lithium-7 isotope which produced a larger neutron flux than expected and contributed to the detonations increase in yield by orders of magnitude. The explosion resultantly sent a giant mushroom cloud nearly 22 miles into the air, leaving an enormous 250-foot-deep crater, 
with the radioactive fallout from that blast covering over 7,000 square miles, including the inhabited Rongelap and Utrecht atolls. It also spread over the seas, damaging countless maritime flora and fauna. And evacuation efforts organized by the United States and the United Nations proved too slow to prevent lethal radiation exposure. In the Rongelap Atoll, white powder resembling snow fell from the skies while young children played with it, ate it, licked it off their fingers. And an hour and a half after the detonation, the radiation remnants reached that Japanese fishing vessel, Lucky Dragon Number 5, which was about 80 miles east of the test site in the middle of the ocean. And 23 crew members suffered acute radiation syndrome, and the Japanese government expressed their outrage. Not long thereafter. So the gaseous fallout continued to spread beyond the atolls and around the world. Some radioactive material traces were discovered in India, Australia, Europe, and... Aside from the Empire of Japan itself, all the way across the Pacific in these United States. So the blast understandably incited international outrage over the morality of atmospheric thermonuclear testing. The fallout from Castle Bravo has also been linked to a bout of several types of cancer, such as leukemia and thyroid cancer, in all of the Atoll's residents. And despite the indignation, Castle Bravo's tragic miscalculation did not stop thermonuclear testing. That took something else entirely. Operation Castle continued with a series of nuclear tests on the Marshall Islands. The Americans were determined to exterminate the Marshallese and... During the 12 years between 1946 and 1958, the United States conducted no less than 67 nuclear weapons experiments in the Pacific Ocean. Now, in terms of my father's own experience, which, of course, I've described in the past, this was when he encountered for a second time, an Evanesser. My father at Castle Bravo, when he was on the carrier deck, like so many sailors standing at attention, we are, of course, talking about a man who would ultimately murder the man who had hanged the Nazis at Nuremberg, George Dietrich, the man who raised and guided me. And uh, in terms of that, that was in the course of the nuclear testing. <sighs> Let me try and rack my brain for some of the things my father told me. And uh, John C. Woods, of course, John Clarence Woods, was the United States Master Sergeant who hanged the ten former top leaders of the Third Reich that the Americans could present for the hangman's noose. And he died on July 21st in 1950. That was when they were beginning to set up the islands for all these nuclear tests. Now, when it came to, of course, Castle Bravo itself, and uh, that was conducted on March 1st of 1954, my father had murdered John C. Woods, four years beforehand, in cold blood. Because, as my father said, the man deserved to die. 
My father thought he was going to face the death sentence himself for what he did. But it turned out the Navy was willing to throw a bone to all the German scientists involved in their nuclear scientific projects. And all of the Germans that were on those Pacific Islands, scientists transported there to help the Americans establish the testing sites, wanted John C. Woods dead. My father was the man who killed him. And he never had to pay a price in this life because the Navy let it slide. I explained how that happened before. When my father was brought in after having electrocuted John C. Woods to death, effectively given him a electric chair death in the water where my dad threw him a line after my dad had pushed him off the pier, so to speak, pushed him off the dock, and when he was saying, throw me a line, my dad threw him a live wire, a electrical line that my father himself had cut with his machete tossed that to him in the water and uh, he fried like a fish. When my father was brought in before the review board and uh, the man asked him to sit down and said, tell us what happened, George. He didn't even look up from his paperwork. My father said, he lit up like a light bulb. And that's when, without even looking up, the officer said, you said he... Uh, was electrocuted while trying to change a light bulb. And that's when my dad said, yeah, yeah, that's what I said. And the officer said, dismiss Mr. Dietrich. And my dad took off and left. Now, my dad was cold-blooded enough to do what had to be done in that case. For anyone who knows John C. Woods, this was a serial murderer. He was responsible for the deaths of young girls in the United States. As a matter of fact, raping and torturing them to death. That's why he was dishonorably discharged from the U.S. Navy. That's how my father knew him. My dad was the man who reported him. When he was discharged from the U.S. Navy during World War II, the U.S. Army took him in. Dishonorable discharge, mind you. And promoted him. Gave him an instant promotion to the rank of Master Sergeant. If you don't think the army is a satanic bunch of baby rapists by now, your head is so far up your ass in rectal defilade, it'll take major surgery to extract it. Till then, you're just going to get high on your own fumes. And I hope you choke on him. If you're that stupid to think this man did mankind a service. He made certain all of the executions were botched so that the... German leadership that was captured for execution would take the longest time to die. A gratuitous sadist, he would grab them by the feet and hold them up so they wouldn't choke to death instantly, holding them up for as long as he could, as long as he could stand, as long as his strength would uh, serve him until his strength ran out. So it would usually take half an hour for each one of the men who uh, was hanged. This is the kind of sick motherfucker this guy was, so he could feel him twitch. And that was how he had told my dad in the Navy he liked the young girls dying, twitching while he ejaculated in them. Apparently he was orgasming with each leader of the Third Reich that was executing. My father did mankind a favor by eliminating eliminating this man's seed from the human gene pool. And yet, Castle Bravo almost broke my dad. In fact, he did break. He did something that he never would have done in his right mind. There was one of these officers on board in the Navy and all the services. They called them 90-Day Wonders. Usually men who were given rank simply because they were scientists or technicians. And because they were educated, uh, they simply got the rank of an officer. And one of the scientists, who was obviously not a military man, 
by any bearing, by the way he comported himself, but nevertheless, still very fit, very tall, standing up very straight, but obviously not one who followed orders the way other military men would. If you're an officer or an enlisted man, you're not going to be able to help yourself at all. You're going to act in a certain manner. Somebody could expose you if you were in civilian clothing just by shouting, Tonight! And you would probably reflexively stand at attention. And in terms of these guys who were made instant officers during World War II, you would know that the way they acted, they didn't do that. They hadn't been through the ranks, either commissioned or enlisted. So this guy had that casual air of arrogance about him. And when the test was about to go down and all the men were standing at attention, there was something in the way the man was looking at everyone and smiling. My father had seen him during the preparations for the test. Something that reminded him of someone who knew something was going to happen that no one else was in on. And for some reason, the man's bearing, the way he stood with his feet apart, at ease, his arms crossed across his chest, while everyone else stood at attention during the countdown. Something snapped in my father. Now, my father's not that kind of man. He didn't even snap when he killed John C. Woods. That was premeditated. But something snapped in him then. And my father felt himself, well, found himself, overcome with a rage that was completely irrational. Because he suddenly suspected this man was an Evanesser. That he was the man he had seen walk through a wall in 1943. My father was so overcome that he flung himself on this man with a sudden overwhelming madness, the desire to push him off the deck, to push him off the deck to fall into the sea. But when my da dad flung himself against this man bodily, the man essentially solidified, became inert like a wall of lead, fused together, so to speak. The way my dad described it, you couldn't see the severance of his limbs anymore. It was as if he turned to a pillar of salt. And my dad was behind him, directly behind him, when the bomb at Castle Bravo blew. Everyone else was flung back 20 feet. Everyone else went flying. They slammed back onto the deck so hard, some men's backs were broke. Some men's spines were snapped. Those that could crawl up on their knees began to pray because the world was pitch black at high noon. There was... No sun in the sky after that blinding flash. The flash so bright that everyone could see their bones through their hands and see through their hands to the other side. But my father didn't see any of that. All he saw ahead of him was pitch black. He said nothing could get through the man he was trying to push off the deck. The atomic winds weren't blowing him down. Didn't knock the man back. My father was behind him and relatively shielded. He said his feet flew off the deck. If you can imagine this, my father's feet flew off the deck and he was then hanging onto the man to prevent himself from flying off the deck completely on the other side of the aircraft carrier. And when he landed back on his ankles, his ankles crunching, the bones, the metatarsal, 
snapping and crunching under his the force of his own landing, his feet landing back on the deck. The man in front of him resumed more of a physical normal, normalcy, a more normalized physiology. And just kind of turned around and laughed and winked at my dad. And my dad knew that this man who had been part certainly acknowledged because sailors had been told to show the man around, that particular officer, as he was preparing for the test. He was one of the advisors who was working in affiliation with Los Alamos, a specialist on physics, everyone was told. And this physicist turned around and smiled and looked at my dad and winked. And my dad knew this man had calculated exactly what would happen. None of the human scientists were smart enough to know what they were dealing with. But this man did, and he knew that because he wasn't a man at all. When I asked my dad to identify this individual, he said he could never find a picture of him. And it wasn't until we came across an image of David Lewis Anderson that my dad pointed at him and said, that's the physicist from Castle Bravo. So, when you think about David Lewis Anderson's ability to understand space and time itself, to throw people 10 feet away from himself with his kickboxing, Hurl people away, kickbox people down to the ground. Then do a little time travel on the side. That alone doesn't clinch it. But something else did. For my father and myself. For the longest period of time. Understand where my father was born. Rochester, New York. He ran away from Rochester, New York to join the Navy when he was but 16 years of age. You've all heard the story. And in Rochester, New York, the reason he ran away was because he didn't want to become some chemically poisoned monstrous freak like his father or any of his brothers. And you all know the story of my grandfather, my first kill at the age of three, my father's father, who tried to rape me, orally. But I bit his dick off, and he died in agony. Even then, at that moment, all I could think of was, blood's got to taste better than this. It tasted like turpentine. Peter Moon described it best, Kodak blood. Rochester, New York, was a Kodak Company town run like a concentration camp. People get offended when I say that. They say, oh, we had privilege and life was good. There was no freedom in Kodak World. Kodak World used its own calendrical system. Eastman, George Eastman, the owner of Kodak, designed a calendar. You can look this up yourself. He wanted it to be the international business calendar, had appealed to the League of Nations to make it the calendar of international business. When the League of Nations did not uh, follow or his request, follow through on his request and realize his wishes, he used it as the Kodak Company calendar. So this is kind of like the railroads, which were on their own time zone. For those of you who don't know, we had to develop time zones originally because of railways. The railways enabled Americans to cover more distance than humans had ever covered before within such a short span of time. And they found themselves, people traveling fast enough to outrun the sun, in a zone of night, whereas the people they may have been telegraphing cables to 
or telegramming cables to via the telegram, they found themselves in darkest night while the people they were communicating with were in the daylight or vice versa. The only way that people could compensate for this was the creation of time zones originally, but this was only done on rail lines. The rail lines developed a standard time for the rails. There was the rail time, and there was the time everyone else was on. So those involved with the rails were on a completely different time zone, so to speak, that ran along the rails. But Kodak, they had their own calendar that went out of synchronization, as calendars will do, just as the Julian calendar went out of sync when the Gregorian calendar was established and months were lost. A same amount of time. Years were lost with the Gregorian calendar overtaking the Julian. So too, what happened with the Kodak calendar? This is why I would deal with records from World War II where the Kodak company was involved designing optical sites for bombs, binoculars, photograph technology for gun cameras, all of this on the documents was built on Kodak company time. This didn't mean people were clocking in and clocking out. It meant that this was according to a totally different calendrical system that had to be taken into account whenever anyone was trying to deal with business company contract history uh, for the Department of War, later the Department of Defense. And within that system of time compression, Time binding the people to a totally different temporal experience. Talk about time travel. That Eastman Kodak did with all his employees. He had their own company hospitals. So all of those injured at work wouldn't be able to be exposed as being subject to company standards, safety standards that didn't match those demanded by the government. They, Kodak, people had their own school, their own amusement park, and playgrounds for the kids so they would never have to leave all behind miles and miles of razor wired electric fencing keeping these people virtual prisoners within their own kodak company town separate from rochester new york itself which effectively was owned by kodak anyway and then they paid all the locals to accept their waste products especially the farmers all of that leaked into the table water led to mutations in birth, led to the famous, what was called Rochester Dick phenomenon, where people born in Rochester, New York, were being born with their penises right next to their anuses like dogs. Woman could suck a man off from behind like that. Uh, the male genitals were being placed, or men were born with their genitals in place, where a woman's genitals would be, as if they had tails hanging between their legs. And some of them would get an erection where it would manifest between the buns of their ass. This is the phenomenon known as Rochester Dick. There's an actual medical scientific term for this that Laura Lee Solomon once looked up. Got it somewhere in my files, some, somewhere. I'd have to look it up. Of course, Rochester medical school was dealing with all of this for years generations my dad didn't want to turn out like that or his children to so he ran away from all that joined the navy and they fulfilled his wish got him as far away from rochester as possible but when the japanese won the war and ran rochester industry to the ground with japanese digital technology then who moved in to the abandoned Rochester Industrial City? The industrial park slash urban zone. What was once the core of Rochester Incorporated. Where there were enormous vats of chemicals. Vats for chemicals that used to turn the rivers round Rochester chromatic technicolor rainbow. Those components of the Rochester labs that specialized in producing the color green would bleed green into the river. Those that produced red would bleed red. 
the rainbow of color would be a different chromatic spectrum all up and down the river in solid streaks, blue, red, white, separate from each other like a liquid rainbow flowing down the Rochester River. All of this released by the chemicals of Kodak. All of that died off, but those chemical vats still there. You could melt entire bodies in those vats with the corrosive elements that collect it. And most importantly, Rochester, New York had its own within the company town behind all that razor wired electric fencing its own power plant its own ability to generate enough electricity to power an industrial site it was enough to light up new york fucking city the power that was generated there and one man had it all to himself david lewis anderson moved in Somehow, one way or another. George Eastman, of course, had killed himself long ago by that time. In perennial pain. From all the chemicals he had worked with. Permanently damaging his nervous system. And with a diseased nervous system. Well, with a diseased nervous system. Or rather, a nervous system so damaged that it was diseased enough to deliver only the sensation of pain. George Eastman, his very life turned to living hell. Every moment he was alive, he felt like he was burning alive. His nerves would send the message of agony to his brain with every breath he took. So he finally blew his brains out a victim of his own chemical madness. Employees like my grandfather, my father's father, were insane enough to... He produced... Seven sons, maybe? Of all the sons he produced, my father George was the youngest, the man who raised and guided me. There was only one girl produced of that man's seed, and he broke both her legs so she couldn't run away while he was raping her. He was so poisoned by Kodak chemicals, his blood tasted like turpentine. My father escaped all that. And when he found out that Dr. David Lewis Anderson moved into what the dead city, the dead industrial park and city, complete with its own hospital, its own power plant, its own cemetery, what had been abandoned by industry, was taken up as residence by David Lewis Anderson all alone to meet his power requirements for time travel, because time travel required enormous amounts of energy production, was all the traits of an Evanesser feeding off his primary food source. All alone in an, in an industrial park that nobody could penetrate. And there was plenty of industrial chemicals by which to melt their bodies down if they ever did. That's what convinced my father that David Lewis Anderson is an Evanesser. He told me he looked the same as he did in World War II. I had no reason to doubt him. You're talking about a man who basically teleports at will, according to some eyewitnesses. So with that in mind, we'll see how Peter Moon responds to what I've said. I've taken us now to close to 2 a.m. How much time do we have left before uh, transmission ends tonight? I honestly didn't expect to go in this direction, but I'm fine by it. I could easily bring on somebody to spell myself, of course, while I refresh myself again. We've been on eight and a half hours, so we've got nine to ten, ten to eleven, about three and a half hours left. Uh, we've maintained good numbers throughout, and of course, Veronica Pereira says uh, hello. So, uh, buenas noches a todos, 
uh, Senora Veronica Barrera. <coughs> Love you, darling. And uh, there we have... Uh, where are we now? Oh, yes. The other factor that I would express is um, David Lewis Anderson has been in two services. I noticed that he was uh, uh, working for the Air Force and the Army at different times. I've seen him in both uniforms. Again, it's almost as if the man can just change his uniforms without anybody questioning him. The sign of privilege. And when my father heard Al Bielik, when uh, I relayed to him that Al Bielik said that uh, he was part of a dynasty, a family of the masters of time, my father said, that's no series of generations. It's the same man over and over again, just saying he's the next generation. It's all David Lewis Anderson, or rather the same Ev Vanessa. Yeah, well, it all makes sense. Of course, Al Bielik felt that there were men before him, before the Philadelphia experiment, perhaps. But I wouldn't know. And uh, what I do know, I've already shared. There's probably a lot that I've forgotten, but I might be able to dredge that up at some point. In the interim, we've got an excellent connection. Let's see if we can call on Sammy Romero and uh, Daniel Arola. Well, Daniel's probably asleep by now. Uh, he's a good boy and gets up early in the morning. And, of course, George Knight is eight hours ahead of us, so he might be able to join us. Hopefully he can join us along with Sammy Romero and Jameson Reese. Let's start calling people out of the woodwork and see if anybody's ready to come on. And if not, then, you know, well, let's hope they come on. <laughs> then I can avoid doing analysis of this wild world for, uh, for a few hours. And uh, other than that, um, okay, well, it turned out to be a bit of a tour de force after all. And uh, happy to see we maintained a much larger number than last week. If I can get anybody on, I'll start finishing up the last of this egg here and uh, some of the sausage I've got hanging around. Salami, that is. Uh, and, um, hey, who can we bring on? Uh, let's see. Who's responding? Uh, yeah. So there we are. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Appreciate you coming. <laughs> let's see if you can bring on anybody else. Try Amanda Ute again. Penny Bradley. Uh, you know, Sammy Romero and George Knight. See, uh, you can just send George Knight a kind of text asking, um, you ready now? Or just curious. You can just ask him, you know, feel free to jump on anytime you want. You can remind him, you know, just say reminder. Feel free to jump on anytime you want. All right. Okay. And, uh, okay, then let's see what, uh, who else might, um, jump on, uh, and, uh, who else was uh, had odd sleeping patterns where they were up throughout the night? I could try to hit uh, uh, Sammy Romero again. Sure, of course. And uh, uh, you can describe to us your symptoms. Are you still symptomatic? or? Uh, you... Yeah, sadly, I, 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 I still am. Uh, Sorry to hear that. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. This thing with the nose is actually, the sinuses are actually getting worse. Uh, I, I think I'm going to wind up dying from this. <laughs> I, um, I, you won't. You won't. <laughs> chances are, you know, it's there's a, there's a slight 50-50 possibility. Uh, my cat might, uh, one of my cats might outlive me. Uh, <laughs> at least. Uh, the other one seems to not be doing well, so I'm, I'll try to keep an eye on her. Um, of course, age being what it is. She's you know. dying for you. She's dying in your place. You're not going to die because she'll die for you. And if she doesn't die, uh, you'll still live anyway. Um, you're a bit of a hypochondriac, uh, but that's okay. I mean, you've got good reason to be. You abuse yourself ceaselessly. Yeah. And relentlessly. So I could understand why you have that concern. Uh, but uh, you don't get the impression that's what's going to happen to you. Um, that's uh, mankind won't be relieved of your presence for a while yet. Uh, so. Oh, damn. Yeah. Oh, man. See, I, 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 I can't seem to even do the job right. Damn. <laughs> uh, uh, such being said, we got, like I said, three and a half hours remaining. Let's see who else we can bring on to Hello? help. Hello? There we are, Mr. Romero. How are you doing tonight? Tell us a little Good, bit. About... Uh, Good. I was dying. You were roasting her. My <laughs> X-Men cartoons, man. <laughs> That's funny. 
Oh, thank you for taking that well. Yes, I'm oh, no. sorry. That was... It's hilarious. Yeah. It's hilarious. Um, yeah, when I type sometimes, um, my thoughts actually are faster than my hand. So Understood. sometimes. Yeah, that's the way it is with everybody. Um, that's the way it is with everybody. Most people, their text is just incomprehensible. It's, um, it's pretty alarming. <laughs> you, you know, to text, you do have to force yourself to truly slow down. It's actually really demanding, to tell you the truth. When there's an emergency and you're trying to text somebody something, it's incredibly frustrating. So you really huh. have to, yeah, learn to slow down. I'm not talking about you personally, just everybody. And um, But uh, so so tell us how your sleeping pattern is these days. Is it okay? I mean, do, do I forget. Are you normally a night person or normally up throughout the night? Yes. Um, I, I work so many shifts at my job, so okay. um, I usually now by a little bit later. I'm like almost midnight, so okay. it's it's not too bad. Lately, I had I've had to return back to my normal um, sleeping pattern. Okay, but um, if I can say one more last, uh, oh please take your time. Thing. I'd like you to stay on as long as um, you wish. You know, <laughs> when it comes to tonight's uh, topic about yeah. Castle Bravo, yeah, um, they can also go to Taboo Bros. Um, um, Daniel Rolla actually has. Um, has a um, has a time stamp on previous. Oh, wow. uh, when you discuss this, um, so they can go to Taboo Bros too, okay. and they can go down and um, they can actually hear um, that version. That version is very um, it was very emotional when you talked about that. Um, I remember because it's seared in my mind. It's just Castle Bravo to me. It's it's so unbelievably. It's unbelievable in the sense of how, how, when I talk about payback, yeah. that's going to come tenfold to you know this godforsaken nation. It's it's stuff like Castle Bravo that really boils my blood, um, because um, we had no business. We had no business doing that, uh, that testing. Uh, but anyways. Um, they can they can review that on Taboo Bros too. Um, Daniel did a great job uh, posting that uh, a couple of years ago. Wow! And among other ones, he, he has um, the Michael Jackson, and you broke that down on the the the, the docu series on HBO. Um, you broke. He has that timestamp there. Um, he has quite a few. Um, he has the. Um, How do we get the, there? Because I entered t- Taboo Bros too. And I get these like uh, you know cheerleader uh, movies and shit, which is cute, uh, but uh, no cigar. Uh, then I enter Daniel Arola after it, and it's not coming up. So how do you, how do you get there? T A B O O space B R O S space two, right? A Roman numeral two. Is it Roman numeral two? God, that's what it was, wasn't it? There we go. So let me try that. And that hopefully will get us there. Fuck, that's not it. Okay. So there we are. Taboo Bros, Roman numeral two. There we are. Got it. Okay. So now that I'm on Taboo Bros two, uh, and he's got one that's 351 subscribers and 196 videos. And another one with 17 subscribers and 17 videos. He's got one person tuning in for each video <laughs> what do we holy shit uh how do we find it uh we'll go to this one and then we'll look up uh castle bravo perhaps let's let's try that uh castle bravo on taboo bros 2 so you got to use a roman numeral 2 it had been a long time since i brought that up so castle uh bravo and see if that turns up anything taboo bros 2 castle bravo and it takes me out of the channel uh, to uh, other um, other stuff. Let's see, where would we find that? Oh, you would go to his videos. Let's take a look at his uh, videos, see what's on it. Or he might have it on... Okay, here we are. Uh, War Crimes, Douglas Dietrich, Whoever Dies, Lies. There we are. Unveils the history. It must be on here. And uh, let's take a look. Unofficial Religion of the U.S. Military, Title 38 uh and uh answers the question uh here we are um uh, and uh founding fathers spanish speaking candidate here we are um it's got to be here someplace <laughs> we'll see what it uh and uh occult ties 
I really thank you for bringing this up, by the way. And Daniel thanks you too, I'm sure. Um, it's, uh, oh, you're welcome. Yeah, and and so uh, so tell us, uh, you know, anything else that comes to mind. Obviously, you're 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 very helpful with this. So let's take a look at matrix and misinformation. Oh my God, uh, one of these white mass shooters. He just looks like uh, oh Jesus, that's just so creepy. Uh, go on, warning signs. It's amazing what Daniel put up. I wish he would be doing this more often these days. He's kind of like uh, really uh, toned down. On the... Well, he he does a he does a lot of planting, and he he lets me see a lot of the things he's 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 working on with the uh, with the plants, uh -huh. and and of course there's the cat in the background. Um, there we are, yeah. And she uh, seems fine at the moment. Uh -huh. Good, good. There we are, and um, here goes one with uh, you know uh, uh, Carrie Lynn Cassidy and. Uh, the escape of the Dietrich Ardell act. He's got uh, challenges he faces. Cooper, yeah. And uh, uh, so here we are. Um, let me see how the uh, U.S. lost the first nuclear war. The doo doo plutonium bomb. Uh, occult scenes behind account general. Let me see JFK. Developmentally disabled. Uh, Pedopathocracy. Oh, uh, by the way, uh, both of you guys start to talk, please, by all means. I mean, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they got some really nice gifts Hello? of uh, the Castle Bravo explosion as well for, you know. Hello? Yeah, yeah. Oh, you, you're there. Oh, Sammy, as well. yeah, I found it. I you, found you found it. How the fuck did you find it? How did you find uh, it? You have to keep in mind, though, that um, especially when I go to, like, my mom's house. Yeah. yeah. My mom's ranch. I, I actually binge on some of your stuff. Okay. So, um, cool. obviously, I can't do 12 hours, but um, Daniel's channel is very helpful. Okay. Um, and, um, you know, obviously, I try not to because, it, you know, you know, too much of it is not that it's bad. It's just, um, and I, I, tried not, I try not to do it as much. Or if I'm thinking about something, mm -hmm. then I go. I just, because, like, I, I don't know if I told you one time, I was dreaming about... Uh, <laughs> Uh, about the burning, um, burning babies. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what do you call it? Um, uh, um, Operation Baby Lift. Yeah, Baby Lift. Yeah, I ended up falling asleep to one of yours, and I actually dreamt of Operation Baby Lift, yeah. which was pretty crazy. But well, you know, it's because you're describing it. It's very visual, but it's actually called. What it, the snippet that he has is called. Uh, one second. No worries. So he's taking care of something with that, and you can go on talking about what you... It's called Chief <laughs> Petty Officer George Dietrich's Encounter. Okay. And and do you know the, what, which... Oh, go on. So on. Yeah, yeah um, let me take a screenshot of that. Or, or, you know, the link. You can get the link, or... Oh, yeah, yeah it's on my phone. Hold on. Oh, okay. On. Understood. Yeah, or a screenshot will be fine then. Uh, yeah. Well, we also have uh, George Knight. Oh, he's with us. Oh, good. So um, George Knight will now tell us a bit about what's going on, too. And thank you so much, Sammy. Oh, my God. Uh, you know, the moment you can get us a link will be wonderful. We'll, we'll publish that link and uh, or attach it. There we are. Sammy Romero gave us a link. I can now take that and I can put that into tonight's description so people can confer it. And uh, thank God for that. What happens when one becomes an ally? Un interesting. So it's uh, titled and George Knight is with us. And by all means, George, how, how much time do you think you have with us? And thank you so much, Sammy. And stay with us, Sammy. Uh, also, Jameson Reese is providing a GIF and um, haven't seen that yet. But uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Go on. Who is going to talk? Any, any one of you, go ahead and talk. Hello, Douglas. Yes, hello. Oh, my God. So good to have you with us. So, so thank tell you. Us. Yes. Yeah, thank you for having me on, Douglas. It's so good to speak to you. It's yes. been so long. It's and, been so long. Yeah, so good to speak to I've you. Uh, on yes. yes. So tell us about everything. And thank you so much, Sammy Romero, for this link. I'm going to enter it into description of tonight's show right now. Uh, in the meantime, George Knight is with us. And hopefully you heard a bit about what I was saying about the... Uh, uh, the bell, the science. If not, you'll hear it later. I went deep into the uh, physics behind the uh, 
uh, the Die Glock or the Nazi bell. So, um, it, you know, aside from all of that, you've learned quite a bit about it yourself over the years. Uh, share with us anything you want, though. Talk, talk to us about what's on your mind, what's going on in England, how's your family doing. Uh, Bojo the Clown, if you want to tell us about <laughs> everything going on, you know, whatever, yes. whatever you want. Oh, God, Douglas, there's and, so and do much say hello to, to Sammy about. and Jameson, of course. Sammy yes. Jameson. I would love to say hello to Sammy Romero because it's been so long. I've never, I've never directly spoken to Sammy, but like I've I've noticed he's been on the shows for the last, I don't know how many weeks. So it's lovely to have him on because I know he's been with us for so long for, for many years, just like myself. And uh, it's just nice to get him on the show and to, and to hear from him. So it's lovely. And I just want to say hello, Sammy. And I just want to say my love to you and um, Jameson and our brother, Sam and shake and everyone else. There's so many people. It's just wonderful to have so many wonderful people with us. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, no, thank you. And unfortunately, Douglas, I I've, can I've only be on for about half an hour or so at the most. Okay. But because th- this week I've, I'm off work, which is fantastic. It's my first week off since joining OpenReach in August, since August. And um, this week I'm off. So this Thursday on Wednesday night show, I'll be able to be on with you for at least two, two hours. Wonderful. So I'm really looking forward to that. We could, we could go to town this this Wednesday's transmission, so that'll be fantastic. Yeah, thank you. But yeah, there's so much to talk about. (laughs) I don't even know where to begin or where to start. Oh, you can tell us a bit about (laughs) how the English people, and thank you again, Sammy Romero. It's like he truly dropped off. Thank you, Sammy. (laughs) Oh my God, hug Sammy. Uh, And then it's, uh, so tell us again about how people are reacting to, first off, um, how's your, um, oh oh my God, your your wife, when I was reading about nurses and all the problems that nurses are going through in England, uh, she must be monitoring this and just so relieved that she's on maternity leave. Is she still on maternity leave? Oh, she's she's gone back to work now, Douglas. Yes, so she's back on the the front line. It's not too bad. She she works at a, um, you know, practice clinic. So in just up the road and one a bit further down the road. So she works at two clinics and uh, she's just doing immunizations and just doing, and you know, you know, just checks on people. So she's thankfully she's not no longer at the red hub with or the front line, the frontier line of, of the pandemic anymore, which is which is wonderful. So, yeah, there's and she does, you know, these PCR tests um, almost every day. She does lateral flow tests every day. So we keep on top of it. And none of us have had COVID yet, which is fantastic. Oh, <laughs> which is always a good sign touch wood yeah. yeah i was going to ask yeah. about that yes and 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 that's miraculous uh yeah. and, and and so tell us a bit about uh uh y- you've all had your shots of course and this has been a very big deal and uh in terms of england and bojo the clown's trouble he got in trouble <laughs> yeah. with you know what is it that you find the most amusing about this i'm sure that this must be <laughs> yeah oh my god tell us a bit about this yeah it, well, it's just amazing Douglas, how people have just only just realized what a clown he actually is Yes. Yes. <laughs> they only just realised what they're so uproared about is the fact that on his birthday and when um when yeah unfortunately when um Prince I'm um, sorry yeah Prince Philip passed away on the 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 eve of his funeral he had a Bor- Boris Johnson had a party at Number Ten Downing Street and this is what people are just so frustrated about with him this is what people are getting and you know the, his his own cabinet his own um ministers are telling him in his own party to resign they're forcing him you know they're saying to him you've got to resign now because this is this can't go on any much longer right. but it's just amazing how the public are now just only starting to realize that mm-hmm. what what but yeah an utter utter like incompetent leader he is yeah. and just you know and all these you know compulsive lies he's been saying for over the years it's just like it's only just starting to come to light now which is just, you know, eventually, you know, like, as we know, everything does come to light eventually. Everything does come out eventually. People then start to realise and then they just realise how, you know, doof they've been. And so, yeah, it's, it's yeah, it's, that's all you keep seeing at, on the news. I really don't really pay much attention to it, to be honest with you, but I do keep up with it every single day, but I don't dive into it too much. Yeah, but I just see, you know, the, the news articles about, yeah, just all these parties have been having... There has been this uh, Sue Gray report, this um, inquiry that's gone on, this investigation that said there was multiple parties that were going on during the lockdown. So this is what people are now just finding out. <laughs> that he's just been having all these parties. Jesus. And so, yeah. yeah. And so, yeah, it's quite um, hypocritical. He's been telling people to stay at home, um, but he's been doing the opposite. 
So, like, you know, it's one rule for one, one rule for another, and he's above the law. So, yeah. And he even, he, they tr- they tried to pardon the, the Queen for Prince Philip's um, funeral, that you can have more people. And she declined, you know, most gracious, right. gracefully. that so, no, I'm going to stick to the rules. And she only had 25 people yeah. attend the funeral, you know. And so, yeah, it's just, yeah, people and, are just and, up. And, and what she said now is that Charles is wife prince charles's current yes. wife will be the queen and uh, uh so the consul yeah yeah so, yeah thank you yeah, yeah. Doug, sorry i didn't mean to interrupt you douglas yeah that's absolutely true that's correct yeah so she says she's going to be the queen consort for the the jubilee the mm-hmm. i think it's the yeah the jubilee um event yeah so and it's quite people i don't know like i was speaking to you know sarah my partner and um she was saying she was reading all the comments saying that it should be passed on to william but i've told her all along no it's going to be charles he's the he's the heir apparent to the throne after queen elizabeth yeah. and um people are just saying that it should be passed on to william um just because of all the scandals that have gone on over the years yeah. no no i get it i, oh. I understand i but it, yeah. it, it was definitely this maintains a kind of consistency obviously and charles of course was waiting for this all his life but go on you know. No. Yeah, yeah, no, no, thank you. Yeah, absolutely, Douglas. Oh, so it's just... Um, and, and, oh, and what about 5G? God. So tell us about how people are responding. <laughs> How's the public responding to what you do, for instance, what you're encountering, uh, you know, how personally, like your average day in life and how things are going, you know, with all that? Yeah, no, thank you, Douglas. Yes. Yeah, so, um, yeah, 5G is actually um, rolled out in certain areas. So I've got 5G on my phone. I can access it and it's... Holy I shit. get a really high speed. Yeah, yeah, I've got 5G on my phone, my mobile itself. So it's been rolled out um, in certain areas. So you can, um, wherever, it, like, the lower the frequency, the lower the frequency wave, you get, like, 3G, yeah, the the, the third generation um, Wi-Fi connection. Um, but in certain areas, mostly it's been 4G, but now it's been rolled out. In my area, I can connect to 5G anywhere, and I'm getting... 80 megabits per second, uh, a very high speed, you know, it's, you know, it's wireless. So it's incredible. It's just like, you know, you can stream anything um, without any interference. It's just, yeah, it's remarkable, but it's rolling out. It's getting there. These from the telephone masters being, you know, emitted from, but yeah, it's, it's, it's really good actually. Yeah. Wonderful. It's not a lot, you know, it's just, it's, it's a wonderful tech, it's wonderful technology. And yeah, like, you know, we've, we've said in the past, you get all the people that, um, you know, peddle the conspiracies on it behind it. Well, you may have heard uh, me yeah. say the other day where I told people yeah. that, uh, plants absorb radiation and you get the radiation yeah. when you eat the plants. And I said, you'll get more radiation from a <laughs> banana having absorbed all that social, you know, that solar radiation, you get more yeah. radiation or isotopes from a banana than you would from 5g. Uh, so, uh, you know, and uh, so people who were against it, they're just not operating in the realm of scientific reality. But, uh, so aside, uh, from all that, Jameson also brings up more from honey. There's more radiation, solar radiation, of course, uh, that that's from honey. I don't know if the word isotope, I should use a different term, but it might be the measurement, but anyhow, so do go on. Tell us about, uh, what you encounter, of course, when you're working like this, I mean, obviously there's photographs of you climbing climbing poles is that common is this yeah Douglas. yeah i do i do an average climb at two or three times a week okay. um uh, these the yeah because back the the network we maintain the network in the whole uk so we have these oucs we have these patches that we uh, maintain so i'm in my local area but um yeah these the poles uh, going back 100 years ago there was no underground feeds to the houses to right. you know to provide and connect the network so it used to be overhead that's what we call overhead um in connection spans that um distribute um, copper wiring from the from the exchange which is where the dial tone starts from that's where all when you communicate you know when you communicate with anyone it, you have a dial tone you have associated number with your with your address and it starts off at what we call the exchange and that's where the dial tone starts from these are line cards it's a line card technology where it's just like ticking in a box and then it goes through it goes through a pathway to your house and these these um, overhead um, poles are the ones that that connect you to, from from the network from the exchange what we call the e side the exchange side to the d side the distribution side and that goes straight to the house and that's where your telephone line starts off from it's just from your junction box or your master socket the what we call the nte 
that's where your your phone starts and you know over the years over the last 20 odd years um, bro- with broadband being introduced and the internet um if, if i don't know what the technology was like in the united states but we used to have here called dial tone where it would run down the two copper wiring it started off and whenever someone made a call it would uh, disconnect the broadband, the, the Wi-Fi, the internet. It would cut you off because when someone makes a call, it's interfering with the um, – it's basically just electrical conductors. That's what copper is. Wow. And if we have aluminium and copper. That's the old network. It was just basically – it was 50 um, DC volts um, mm. going down a 75 AC um, connector um, oh alternating. Yeah, it's just – sorry, I'm talking, I'm talking a language which a lot of the viewers won't understand, but – but, well, basically, over the years, it's evolved from it used to be an ADSL um, broadband. That was when it went from dial tone to ADSL, which was frequency, which meant that you could uh, have filters at your home where you can make a phone call and use um, broadband at the exact same time. And then over the years, we've got faster and faster speeds of broadband. We've, it's now gone to from ADSL to like VDSL, very high speeds, um, digital subscriber lined um, technology. So it's just evolved over the years. But yeah, those poles are basically where what we call DPs, the distribution points where you can literally have the feed go off to a pole from your house to the pole. And then it goes, it, then it shoots underground and then goes off to the exchange. And whenever there's a fault on the line, that's where I come in and it's my job to fix it. That's what I do. So it's just keeping people connected. And so it is now a utility. It's classed as a utility, just as water, gas and energy, like electricity. Um, now, con- communication is also utility. So it's a necessity. Everyone must have it and they have the right to have it. So that's what um, is so important. That's why um, it's important to have people like us out there. So that's why through the pandemic, um, Open Reach were out working. They were key workers, just like anyone else that's classed as a key worker, basically. That's because we're now classed as a utility, um, a utility service. Yeah. Right. So. Right. And 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 the moment that you're available right now is because you're kind of just home alone, or. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, basically, Douglas, I was going to say, I was going to say, if you hear me cut off, it's not because of you know someone's cut a transmission or anything like that. All my Wi-Fi is gone. It's because I'm getting beaten by. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding, ah, too. <laughs> understood. Yeah, I'm oh being yeah. God. And, and, I'll be and in so, the yeah, so so I'm so glad to to realize to find out that you don't have to climb every day. So this is no so, but it, dangerous. Yeah, yeah, it, it's <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's several yeah. times a week, but it's it's still it's several times a week, so it's quite a bit. Uh, so yeah. that's um and so when you like do this and you're you're up there high, what what does the world kind of look like? What does the world what's it the experience like? I mean, do you ever do this during inclement weather or that it's Oh yeah. Yeah, you, you have to the only time where we don't climb and we don't operate in the network is when it's lightning, when it's thunder and lightning. We have to sit in our van and we have to wait, I think what you know, through the um health the the assessment we do um health and safety assessments. And it, it, according to what we've been taught, it has to be 20 minutes but from the last thunder strike. So we have to stay in and we have to wait for a thunder strike and it has to last longer than 20 minutes and then we can start to operate again. So, yeah, that's when we're allowed to go back out. But it's just so dangerous. Yeah. I mean, that's, yeah. that's incredible. And, and uh, so... Uh... Uh, what about uh, in, in terms of what else that, yeah. that you're doing? What other responsibilities that you have are willing to share with us? In terms of... Oh, yeah, yeah. No, basically. Oh, yeah. And Douglas, and the thing that, you know, from when you work for the Department of Defense, you, as you've like, um, you know, you've explained many, many times for many years that um, when you're government contracted, it's very hard to lose your job. Yeah. <laughs> you, you can't get fired. Right. And that's when when I joined the first week when I joined Open Reach on the 8th of August, um, we went to a place called Yarnfield. It is basically a military installation. It is a converted into a um, it's basically an old military ground. And so when you when you arrive, they send you in line. There was 90 of us that arrived in buses and on trains. And um, it's basically like being um, being drafted into the military. They sent us down a corridor. They weighed us. They, um, you know, they took all our 
identification certificates and um, passports and all of you know all of our um, belongings and they took us down this <laughs> corridor where we picked up our uniforms so it was like being drafted wow. and so oh, since shit. that week we've yeah we've learned um yeah they tell us a bit about overreach and what our role is and stuff and it, it really does feel like you know you're you're part of it really does feel like you're you're part of you know well you are you're part of uh yeah. national defense infrastructure really it, yeah it is yeah yeah exactly yeah it's national security so um yeah so we we get these um what we call obas cards the security clearance cards where we can access these exchanges so anywhere in the network i can i've got access to our entire area which is thamesway which is what we call it um thamesway in the south it's it covers a vast area so there are multiple areas in the uk um you know all over and um yeah so i can access any you know restricted building from the public with just this card so it does feel like that it does really feel like you know but they were telling us that you can't it's, it's impossible to get fired even if someone dies <laughs> It is impossible for you to get fired, even if, you know, on your watch. It's Holy just, they put it down as, it just puts it down, it, they just put it down to like, oh, it's incompetent training, you know, they need more training. That's yeah. what they, do. yeah, that's the, it's just incredible, really. Oh my I was God. thinking, wow, oh, this is just like, this is just like what Douglas has always been saying. Yeah, yes, it's just, yeah. yes. It's not Crazy. only that, it's almost like James Bond, you've got a 007 license to kill. <laughs> <laughs> You're just not encouraged like to that. abuse it. Yeah. <laughs> a... Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, just can't abuse it. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. So, so uh, <laughs> in, in, in terms of that, that's incredible. Uh, so is this yeah. essentially, as you said, this has a very uh military uh feel to it what about uh your um so are there any women working in the field or or no yeah okay yeah there is Douglas. The, the the group that i was training with for eight weeks so after yarnfield we then did an eight-week training course on just on every every section every department in the field where we'd be working so yeah two weeks was climbing poles so mm -hmm. that was two weeks was just primarily just with the ladders and uh, the, the poles and all the safety um, you know the risk assessments and all that and um yeah in our group there were six of us half of us was male and half of us was female so oh. they are they are more they are diving to towards more inclusion so more diversity they mm. want to have more females because at once upon a time going back you know even as recent as like 10 15 years ago it was all predominantly males that you right. know operate in open reach yeah it was just a male dominated um yeah well understandably so uh, yeah it's 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 like but so w when you're up there kind of like high up what does how does it feel i mean uh, the world just looks different what do you, what do you see i mean it must be some incredible sights <laughs> yeah yeah thank you Douglas. and i take my you know i've got my mobile in my pocket and i take it out and i record myself up there so i do cool. take videos and you're so safe because you got this um, new system called tetra which was only introduced two years ago it stops you from falling so before they were having like i think the statistics in yarnfield like i said they were going through a lot of the the stats with us and there was something ridiculous like so many thousand people fell a year falls they've showed you the, the statistics because there was the the company is one of the largest it's it's got um employment of 30 like 36 thousand employees in total and so there was a huge it was a huge number of people falling even from a one meter mark people were just falling so they introduced this system called tetra which prevents you from falling off your ladder and off the pole so once you're up there you trust the equipment and i'm just i'm just there you know with my arms waving in the air and you know you're not going to fall the only way it's going to fall is if the actual pole itself snapped wow. right. because of because of deterioration <laughs> yeah right. holy shit yeah and, and uh, yeah, are you so ever concerned literally... about that do some of these poles look back well, at Oh, wow. Well, you, you hear stories because um, uh, we got this thing called Workplace, which is equivalent to Facebook, and it's only associated to OpenReach um, employees. And they people upload videos all the time, pictures of aftermaths of like cars crashing into them. And so, yeah, you Ooh. just you just hope that never happens when you're up a pole because yeah. they're all the, by the size of the roads, because just like with anything, it follows the road, the, the, the plant line that the network follows the road. The infrastructure is always following the road, just like, you know, the water and, um, it, you know, everything just goes down the same path as roads, basically. They're all interconnected, you know, just like the, the American highway system. It's just all interconnected, follow, following the roads, basically. And so, yeah, you just hope that nobody crashes into the pole when you're up it. <laughs> oh it does happen. Yeah. It does happen. I, oh, I can imagine. I mean, it's Fine just, there's just, 
and and the driving is so different, of course, in England than it is here. Uh, yeah. So, it, 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 what about uh, in terms of uh, aside from all of that, you have the yeah. uh, kind of uh, so some of this, I presume, is kind of in countryside, and some of it's in developed area. Or is your area more developed or more countryside? More so? What, it is. Oh, thank you so much, Douglas. Yeah, the um, yeah, it's more rural. It's more yeah, it's more countryside more than anything. You get villi- You do work in some villages and towns. Like I live in a town, and and so the the surrounding areas are all mainly like town town based. They're not city. There's very few cities. You know, you're going into like Guildford or um, Southampton, which are cities, and Portsmouth because I'm in the south in Hampshire. So yeah, you you have to go further afield to get into the more congested areas. But yeah, um, some of the the network lines that we work on are sometimes nine kilometers long. So the the, oh. the network, it's the wire is going, the the cable is going nine kilometers. So if you've got a fault somewhere that line, my job is to go out and find it and fix it. And you're kind of across fields sometimes. <laughs> They're just carrier poles taking this this cable from one to another, going across nine kilometers. So if you've got a fault on that line, you've got to go out there and find it, and it could be anywhere. <laughs> Jesus! So, oh my God! So, those those jobs can take up to, can take a whole day to to resolve. Yeah. Right. Oh my god. It's and just yeah. And what about birds? <laughs> Do you encounter birds? Oh, all the time. Yeah, all the time. What? Insects, spiders. Yeah. They're all in every all parts of the network. They're everywhere. Yeah. So they and and you know rodents as well. You encounter all that. Yeah. Oh my <laughs> so. god. Yeah, yeah, you do. You see it all. You do see it all. It's quite an interesting job, actually. I do enjoy it. The thing is, Douglas, also, um, I've been, you know, it's been difficult for me to pursue what I enjoy doing, which is like research and to, you know, get to get, you know, information from yourself. And so it's been difficult because I've been trying to learn this job at the same time. So I've kind of like stepped back from that, from like doing what I love to do. And so now, thankfully, I'm getting to a stage now where I'm I'm getting pretty comfortable and confident with what I'm doing. So now I've I've now started to pursue what I enjoy doing the most, which is just you know, w- with like I, what I managed to do. Yeah. You know, the other w- w- tell people how ago. you were banned from Facebook and then you appealed. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Of course, I'm not even not even spoke about. It, but that's what we'll do yeah. Wednesday. We'll go into more about what. Yeah. yeah, we'll do that. Yeah, exactly, Douglas. Um, yeah, I was. Yeah, it, I got the the notification. I've got it saved on my phone here. Let me just get a picture. It was to do with the album, that album that um, Penny Penny Bradley shared, which was wonderful. I'm so glad she did that. Yes, that was fantastic. Yeah. And, and someone she, I wanted. She, she to bring said up. you were one of the few people who spelled the name of quote unquote her people correctly. Or she was saying that to myself. I am certain she was really referencing you. And uh, well, thank you. Yeah, and and it was uh, so that was interesting. And um, so she's yeah she's. I'm glad her surgery was successful. So 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 that brings us back okay. to the 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 health of your um your family seems to be excellent. Everybody's doing well. I mean, you know. The... Yeah, yeah. No, all good. Thank you, Douglas. Yeah, everyone's doing really well. I, I I'm so so grateful, so thankful that everyone's still here and safe and sound, okay. which is the most important thing. But yeah, my my account, yeah, it was restricted. Content of it was restricted, and that was to do with that video I had in that album, the mm-hmm. Thousand Year Reich in Exile. So that was what was reported, maybe by someone. Like, someone. It's reported. over a hundred photographs, right? So it's a hundred. Yeah. Oh, Douglas, I've got thousands in my on my iPad. What I'm talking from now, I've got thousands. I've uploaded two hundred so images, but I've got a thousand I can upload easily. I've got so much to yeah. upload. So what? It, and it will. So, yeah, well, it will yeah. be added to the album. Yeah. Sorry, so, so, oh no, no! I was just gonna say what I'll do is, uh, like I do with Peter Moon, I just give him a link to the episode uh, shortly after transmission, and uh, I timestamp it. So I'll do that for you, so that you can, you know, review that when you get time, and you'll hear what I said tonight about Die Glock. I was talking about the uh, uh, the the Third Reich technology, which I haven't talked about in a long time. And so uh, mm-hmm. I think that's important. And uh, certainly you really took it upon yourself to find out quite a bit. And it, it's very impressive. And also uh, you've uh, done a lot of work on just everything uh, imaginable. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and, and, and so 
considering what little time you have, uh, and, and that brings us back to, you know, y- your responsibilities as a father. So this is obviously yeah, you're kind of, difficult. kind of, yeah, yeah, I was about to say, oh my God, feel free to vent or cathar. Tell us about how, yes. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Like, honestly, like, that's what I mean. We've got so much to talk about and there's so much like it, my mind right now is going a thousand miles per hour because there's just so much I need to need to get out. Right. <laughs> but yeah, it's just been, it's been difficult, but now it's getting easier. Now I find it a bit easier to actually, I can now do my own thing again because mm-hmm. I took it upon myself to do it all. Like, as, as you know, you know, I, what I was doing was listening to you and then going off and just verifying everything you said, because this is the thing that you've always told everyone is everything you say is verifiable. And I took it upon myself years ago to actually dive in and actually do do that, <laughs> do the research into it. But it was so I was so grateful a couple of years ago, just days before Everly was born, that you came on to Skype with me. For, we were on Skype for about two or three hours, and you 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 gave me all the information on the the the, the Schitt's Creek on the Disc War period of 1951 to 1956, and because I couldn't find anything on it, but that really helped. And it and I've got the and. You know, it got me to buy the book, the Shoot Them Down book by right. Frank Fraschino. Th- there's and a, I've got it right. There's, there's another I've got book it right I, here. Yeah, there's another book I oh, recommend yeah. it tonight, and uh, you'll you'll hear it. But I'll just I'll yeah, let Keith you know Chester, for now. Is that, the, yeah, yeah, Keith, Keith Chester. Chester. That's right. Keith, you heard me. You. you heard me say that. I, and do you know the only reason why I was I was doing my morning business, and I only tuned in because I haven't been tuning in, but I tuned in at the precise moment you were talking about Dr. Paul Yosef Goebbels and. Yeah. Yeah, and I was like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. This is yeah, this is good. This is good. And then it was like, oh yeah, for George Knight, this is an author. There's a book you got to read called from from the author Keith Chester. I was like, okay, so I've noted that down, and so I've I've got on Amazon and I have found the book. So yeah, I already, do that. Oh, incredible. Yeah, like, <laughs> yes. incredible. Yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely. But Douglas, yeah, it's just I've got the book here, and you know, shoot them down, and um, just for people to understand, it, it, there's a quote here in the book. I just wanted to read out the Defense Department since 1950. It was reported from 1951 until the dated October 10th new release that there were 7,600 service personnel killed in all types of United States military aircraft. And it was the six most deadliest years on record for any airman in the United States military or in the Air Force. And so this book is remarkable because I've got so much information about even down to the names of the pilots who died. And I've got like from the New York Times, this story appeared on the front page of the New York Times, July 8th, 1954, and involved the mysterious crash of an A Alpha F 84 F jet. And it's a picture on the front page of the New York Times of the, the craft that has crashed in an urban area over some houses. And yeah, Air Force jet crashes and cuts fury swath in Kansas City, killing four. So it's just remarkable. Uh, and it's just this is this is a this is a period where most people most people aren't aware of. And when you go on to these, you know, these cargo cultist um, pages on Facebook, where they say they say things like, "Oh, extraterrestrials, they've never killed anyone, they've never hurt any humans," and it's just like you have no idea Thank what's going you. on in the fifties, sixties, and seventies. Oh you God. have no idea, and this is all kept from the public. Yeah, yes. yeah it's, it's just it's, it's yeah, true. this book's remarkable. But I'll go into it. Thank you. you. Know, next transmission. Thank you. It's so important. It's so important, and I think that yes. this is uh, this is something that, uh, in this way, you can do more than I can to help educate the public. After all, you remember oh, no, what yeah. Aquino always said: for Americans, yeah. they hear something in a British accent, <laughs> they yeah. accept it as important. <laughs> <laughs> that's brilliant yeah absolutely yeah. oh god and, yeah uh, absolutely done this yeah and, exactly and, and, and so well in terms of how's your uh weightlifting i take it that that's something you don't need anymore you're pr- pretty much maintaining no. your health by your job right thank you yeah douglas unfortunately i was i did actually because i'm off this week it's my first week off since joining and i was actually going to plan on going back because i haven't really since the start of the pandemic and that was you know that was 2020 march 2020 when we went into the first lockdown when gyms were closed it feels like 20 years ago go on (laughs) it feels like forever yeah i've not really gone in and so um, yeah i really do need to get back into it just for my own benefit my own health you know benefit basically yeah just 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 to make yeah but yeah the job is quite demanding for the physical side of things and so um yeah i really do need to get back into it really well, um, well i think i, I think just for my general health <laughs> well, well more like vanity to tell you the truth i think your general yeah. health is excellent your general health i mean Thank obviously you, yeah it would have to be excellent <laughs> or you wouldn't be able to do your job 
It's that simple. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's very, and, it's very yeah. Tree, so, so with uh, the kind of, uh, you know, uh, job that you do, it, they, they were demanding people in excellent health anyway. And by the way, I was, I, was, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I won't tell the listeners what I said to you privately. I was just amused. At, uh, yeah. it, you know, uh, we'll go into that some other time privately because it was so amusing to me about uh, different yes. things. But um, in terms of uh, the other things that, uh, you were, um, you know, how much time do we have left before you, you know, before? Uh, I'll, I'll give another five minutes, Douglas, okay. I think. Five minutes sounds so good So in five me. minutes, go ahead and, and wrap up you, what you feel about Brexit and the international situation. And, you know, shopping, is it any more difficult or is it? Oh, yeah. Oh, God, Douglas, yeah. I think every single, I think every single time I come on as well, just, uh, yeah, it's just a bit of, it's just... There's a good radio show that I've actually only started listening to the last couple of days, and I just watch snippets on YouTube of it. And um, it's just basically an, a radio show called LBC. I forgot what it stands for, but it was just callers calling in and just talking about Brexit to to the presenters. And the presenters were telling them, "Well, can you name me something that is that is bad about Brexit? Uh, sorry, can you name me something that is um, good? Can beneficial. you mention a, a law? Could you? Yeah, could you mention something that is? But you know." mention a law that the European Union force on you that is bad and they can't name a single one but they just come on and just think Brexit is good that we are going to be you know we're going to have our own sovereignty we're going to have our own make up our own rules and our own laws oh, God. and then it's just they can't mention a single thing they can't articulate what they're speaking about and it was just the same with COVID as well the amount of people that will come on and tell people that they're not going to wear a mask and they're not going to take the vaccine it's exactly the same thing you just got this divide and we know where it all sources from all this disinformation that comes out yes. and it's just it's really quite frustrating but i don't want to like badmouth the public i don't want to come in here and slander and def defame any, anyone you know uh, it's, it's it's just sad how it how it's all panned out the way information people gather their information yeah and wh where they get it from and it's all just basically <laughs> all shit yes it's so but, true it's so sad uh, government yeah and it's it, really frustrating i could vent on this for ages douglas and this is why i'm so grateful to come on and speak to you because you're like the only sane person out <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and, i can't, I can't it, talk to anyone oh my god <laughs> i feel like i'm isolated from everyone else i'm I, totally I, I feel like i'm i'm different to everyone else oh my god and it's basically we, because i've learned so much from yourself well, I, I so well, I know I know the reality. Yes, yes, it, I, I so it's appreciate true. that, and it's so important that uh, you know when um, it, obviously this this you know, but you're going to be able to adjust because you have a narrative. Everybody else is just wandering around dazed and confused. Yes, yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly. It's like with World War Two. Yeah. I I always like. You know, it's quite when you got to someone just say to them, Oh, can you um, talk about World War Two? They can only say it in a soundbite, they can only talk about it in a soundbite. They don't know anything at all, they can't articulate it, they can't put anything into context, they don't know any names of anyone. <laughs> oh, oh it's God. just like you just think of how ignorant and naive everyone really truly is. Yeah. They have no idea about history whatsoever, but that's why people don't even they haven't got the they don't I don't know if it's because they haven't got you know, I think it's because they don't simply either they're bored or they're, they're they don't have the time to listen they just don't want to learn they yeah. just literally and they're learning with life itself i know it's hard for people to you know to go out there and make make ends meet and make a living but like you know it's it's something i put up put up on myself to actually learn mm -hmm. to actually you know i've inherited i've basically invested so much time into actually doing all this what yeah. i've learned over the years and it's so important but a load of people they just haven't got the time to do it and, 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 and they, so... they, they don't know anything no, no, they don't. And it's so sad because, you know, they, they certainly don't know even, you know, I'm, I'm glad that Britain's been very um, helpful with Ukraine. Thank God for that. So, uh, oh, yeah. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 and uh, so I'm sure you've been monitoring all that as well as best you can. Uh, but uh, yeah. uh, and, and uh, so, so aside from that, the British and the Americans are, I think, both uh, certainly the British were intercepting some some incoming Russian flights recently. You've heard of this, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Over Scott, over Scotch waters over in the north. Yeah, absolutely. Douglas. That's what I've like I said, I, I see the articles, but I don't yeah. read into them. Right. So I just see what's been going on. So yeah. but I, I kind of get a logist over the years of what I've learned, yeah. you know, with with what they've been doing, yeah. you know, through throughout what, what we know is sorry, just just being a bit quiet. <laughs> 
yeah. I don't blame you. It's I get it. Issue. If you hang up, it's I get it. Issue. Yes, yes. Yeah, it's issue. yeah, but um, yeah. I so I've been gathering what's been going on. So I've um, yeah, seen that the yeah, and they've been doing this for years. They've been doing it since they've been doing they, uh, <laughs> and obviously at, at this point in time where tensions are rising, so called. Whereas I've I did say to I said to my partner that I don't think they're actually going to invade. They're going to what they're going to do is just mobilize troops, a hundred thousand troops along the borders. I mean, it's it's a NATO country where we're all you know with with NATO, the North Atlanta Treaty Organization. We're all part of it, you know, Britain and the United States. So an invasion will be quite d- detrimental for the Russians. Yeah. I don't think that I don't think that they're going to go into like into a, like a suicide sort of mission. They're not going to. Um, th- that's why it hasn't happened yet. It's just. It's been escalating, but whether or not that turns into something, it's another matter. But we'll have to wait and see because I can't predict anything that will happen. But um, yeah, that's what the Russians do all the time. They they fly over our airspace and they will just we'll send off our interceptor fighter jets to intercept them and to warn them off, yeah. you know. But that's what they've been doing. They've been testing our our radar systems and our security systems, and that's why they do it. They just they like to see how far they can go. And they were doing it over and they were doing it in the southern waters of Ireland as well. Only about two weeks ago, right. in the, the naval fleet was, um, uh, you know, in international waters, but it was drawn very close to it. Was, I forgot how many kilometers out they were, but they were very close to Irish waters. So, yeah, they're doing the exact same thing there as well. Well, they're basically doing to uh, the British Isles what the Chinese are doing to Taiwan. Uh, yes. Thank you. And sorry, Douglas, yeah. interrupt. I was going to mention about Taiwan also because this yeah. is someone posted a meme the other day on Facebook about Ukraine and Taiwan. Mm-hmm. And I had to had to say with Taiwan, you know, from what I've learned from yourself yeah. is with Taiwan, they've been at war. Yeah. They've been legally at war. The Nationalist Republic of China have been legally at war with with communist China yeah. um, for for decades now, going decades. And uh, so it, the population of 25 million. And because it's not part of the United Nations, it's not recognized. They don't realize the defense mechanisms that Taiwan has. And I said they have hundreds of nuclear weapons. I said any invasion is, will be detrimental for the communist Chinese on the mainland because they're so they're quite close together. Yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> oh, very much so. Like like India and Pakistan. And, yes. Uh, and, and, yeah, 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 and yeah, and they've been having battles. You know, tank battles, the largest on scale. Yes. Since World <laughs> you know, War Two. That's right. Since okay. World War Two, the largest yeah. tank battles have been going on in Pakistan and, and India and the, across the borders. Yeah. So tensions there have been rising. They're both nuclear armed. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. It's 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 uh, definitely, uh, but uh, with, with uh, just so that you understand specifically, yes. unfortunately, Ukraine is not part of NATO. It would dearly love to no. become part of NATO, but uh, so Russia could potentially invade. Okay. But the yes. the point is, if the, honestly, the potential is here for this to become just out of control obviously <laughs> easily yes. easily so if, if that happens then then uh it's definitely going to be a situation that will uh we'll see what happens i'm very disappointed yeah, thank of you. course as i said with germany because germany has been trying to maintain neutral because they're, they're, they're so dependent on yeah. russian gas now it's sad really fucking sad uh, yeah but... the shitty gas they have yeah yeah, yeah that's it Don't so, just... so no, in, thank you. in that sense uh, britain thank god will um you know be a bit into of that mess <laughs> so yeah, if anything you. would come of this you know britain's just going to have to find its own way they're forced to now and even though there's the Brexit, no yeah. yeah there's no benefits <laughs> in the immediate sense the one thing that will happen is they'll have to reforge an empire and the world's changing enough rapidly now where that's actually possible um yeah. you, you know the world's going to hell in a handbasket so uh, in in terms of uh things in the way they're um evolving and all the rest of that the important thing is that you did the right thing you've got yourself a um you know a Agreed, wonderful yeah. job and your wife is working your child is secure you've got something most british just don't have most of them live in such a state of insecurity and it's just so sad um, um, and and with uh, most of them, it's you know um, you, you've managed to you know do more than survive in a situation that is uh, otherwise uh, very distressing. <laughs> you know. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Douglas. Yeah, no, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, no, I'm so proud yeah. of you. Oh my God, I'm so proud of you that you managed you. to accomplish that. And um, yeah, you know, it's been a journey. Uh, yes, it, it it has been, but you've you've excelled and. Uh, 
uh, so other than that, you're, um, you're, 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 do you have that? Like, uh, as I said the other day, um, most men, of course, they, they spend 60 hours a week working and then the, the, the rest of their life is at home. And it's basically, so just a curiosity, you, you, no friends, basically. It's just basically your work, your, 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 your wife at home, the family, uh, your own family, of course, that you have and, and kind of like that odd, her family. And then, then how is that going? She's got this kind of odd family, the kind of, <laughs> you know, how's that equation working? If, uh, yeah, no, that's pretty much that's pretty much it, Douglas. Yeah. To be honest with you, yeah, that's that's pretty much the life I'm living at the moment. It's just work and family, and yeah, I'm at an age now. You know, I don't want to, you know, really go out and party much anymore. Right. You know, yeah. I did over ten years ago, so yeah, that, that's basically it. Right, right, and you <laughs> don't, basically you, it, Douglas, you, you, but... and, and basically, uh, you you never were much of a you did the you did the bartending so you saw what damage that the pub life could do to everybody so it's not like you go pubbing really it's not like uh and, and there's no other kind of club i mean i think you're doing well enough obviously as far as i can see you're emotionally and psychologically healthy so you, you've got the balance that you need and uh I, I you know i'm just glad that you have that um oh my god what about the uh so other than that and your father's doing well you yeah, right? Oh yeah, but your pardon. Sorry, Douglas. I just had to leave the room very quickly. And uh, yeah, no, no, everyone's all good. Thank you, Douglas. I do, I do apologise. Yeah, you don't mind if I shoot off, and I'll come back. Sounds good. And be Sounds with good. you Wednesday. I'll be with you Wednesday. Look forward to that. Much love on love, you, Douglas. I'm so you. sorry. I'm no worries. Right love you dearly. Hugs. No, you take care, and everyone else, everyone else that's joined us this morning, uh, yes. all evening. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. We, much love on to you. Bye bye. Much love. Bye bye, Douglas. Bye for now. Much love. Bye bye. So that's our wonderful George Knight, such a gentleman. And with that, I'll go back to giving people some more information about what happened after Castle Bravo that impacted the world, thanks to the efforts of a Japanese scientist, a female, who took advantage of Japan's victory and uh, forced uh, America to stop above-ground nuclear testing. And uh, this lady was Saruhashi Katsuko. Uh, so let me go a bit into her. I'll check a little bit on the time we have remaining. And uh, so it's 9.30 p.m. now, or rather, it's not 9.30 p.m. at all. Uh, it's 2.30 a.m. on Pacific Standard Time. But it is, uh, we've been on for about 9 hours and 30 minutes approximately, close to that time. So we've got uh, 10 to 11. We've got two and a half hours left. Uh, let me take a little of that time, then we'll see if we can bring someone else on after that for a little bit. You know, who knows, maybe Peter Moon would have woken up since he went to bed early. Uh, but uh, yeah, obviously, one of the things that people may remember is that above-ground nuclear testing came to a halt, atmospheric nuclear testing. How did this happen? Uh, people would tend to think that after the horror of Castle Bravo and all of those nuclear tests, that sheer outrage uh, all over the world from the people of the world, the baseline populations of these empires, the uh, Greater British and French empires were also conducting uh, monumental testing campaigns, uh, as was, of course, the Soviet Union and Communist China. But no, um, all of this ended because, effectively, the Japanese Empire conquered the world. When they won World War II and became one of the most powerful economic empires, uh, then uh, they basically were able to call a halt to the madness of atmospheric above-ground open-air nuclear testing. So uh, Saruhashi Katsuko was the woman responsible for that. So her very name translates from the Japanese as strong-minded or victorious. And her achievements leave us in no doubt that she lived up to that name. So as a woman who certainly lived up to her name, uh, which is kind of like, you know, its best translation would be triumph of the will, are will triumphant, are or simply victorious. Uh, she was born on March 22nd in 1920. Uh, so you're talking about someone who's uh, three years older than my late and sainted mother, four years older, really, because my mother was born on December 5th. But like my mother, she was born in Tokyo, Japan, uh, you know, a full half decade before the Great Oak Tokyo earthquake and fire into which my mother was literally delivered in this world. 
uh, and uh, she basically uh, well, it's according to from what my mother told me uh, Saruhashi she was uh, first drawn to science by watching raindrops slide down the window in her primary school classroom wondering what caused rain um, so her parents were supportive of her education, at least to a point, and ultimately Saruhashi had to convince them to let her quit her job at the age of 21 at an insurance firm to attend the Imperial Women's College of Science, which is now Toho University, you know, like Toho Studios. That brings you the uh, Daikaiju, our greater cryptid, you know, the Godzilla films, okay? And uh, she had help from World War II, of course. Both she and her mother saw many women struggling without husbands or fathers with little professional training to help them have successful careers. So realizing this, Saruhashi's mother encouraged her to gain technical knowledge herself and to achieve financial independence. So at the age of 21, Saruhashi quit her secure job at the insurance film to attend the Imperial Women's College of Science, Toho University, where she earned a degree in chemistry. And after graduating in 1943, the year of the Philadelphia Experiment, uh, and of course, as every year in World War II, uh, an eternity took place within the span of a single year, uh, she got her undergraduate degree in chemistry that year, I took a position at the Meteorological Research Institute, which was essentially considered a branch of the military in some ways because weather was so important, is so important for all military operations. And it was there she worked with her mentor, Miyaki Yasuo. Uh, that's when her scientific career took off. Now, bear in mind, these are all people who were in one way or another involved with the bombing of the United States via the, the balloon bombing campaign uh, that forced the Americans to respond with a highly trained elite all-black smoke jumper unit. And of course, uh, they took advantage of the Japanese setting America's forests aflame to also uh, use that as a, uh, well, a free open air gas chamber in which to not only uh, kill thousands of black conscientious objectors, but incinerate their bodies uh, with their bleach bones, uh, uh, fertilizing the, uh, the soil uh, uh, throughout the frontier west. So, mm. all of that being said, after graduating, as I said, in 1943 with her undergraduate degree in chemistry, joined the Geochemistry Laboratory at the Meteorological Research Institute, uh, now called the Japan Meteorological Agency, the JMA, which I explained at length the other day, was responsible for so much more than any average weather agency in any other country. And she didn't study rain at that point in her life, but the oceans, specifically carbon dioxide, CO2 levels in seawater, you know, anticipating climate change. So um, Saruhashi uh, Katsuka, she developed the first method for measuring CO2 using temperature, pH, and chlorinity. This is called Saruhashi's table. You can look it up. Of course, pH is something important if you have an aquarium and want to maintain the health of uh, your fish. It's basically denoting the potential of hydrogen, uh, a scale used to specify the acidity or uh, basicity, uh, basicity, they call it, basicity. Uh, it's a scale... Uh, that, uh, well, of any aqueous solution, you know, when you're measuring the acidity or uh, basicity, basicity of any uh, aqueous solution, any liquid, uh, acidic solutions are measured to have lower pH values than basic or alkaline solutions. Uh, and uh, the measure of how acidic or basic water is, uh, the range thereof goes from 0 to 14, with 7 being neutral, which is how you generally want your aquarium water, uh, depending on what kind of fish you have. Of course, it changes. 
the pHs of less than 7 indicate acidity, whereas a pH of greater than 7 indicates a base. So pH is really a measure of the relative amount of free hydrogen and hydroxyl ions in the water. Um, so this, of course, is uh, one factor or one element of what is integrated into Saru Hashi's table. And her method became the global standard. Uh, just like Emperor Hirohito as a great marine biologist, this woman was kind of like uh, his uh, champion in the field, his avatar, a kind of uh, Wonder Woman, if you will, of Japan. And um, more importantly, she discovered that the Pacific Ocean releases more carbon dioxide than it absorbs. That's a concept with dire consequences today as our climate changes. Now, as a young scientist, Saruhashi was largely protected from the gender discrimination we so often hear about in science. And of course, we hear about that for good reason. Uh, it was for the for all too long a period of time, a matri excuse me, a patriarchy and downright misogynist. So uh, she was protected from all of that largely due to her mentor at the Meteorological Research Institute, Yasuo Miyaki, who was a prominent marine chemist and the director of the geochemistry laboratory, who had a strict no-tolerance policy for gender discrimination. Mm. This is what brings us to uh, Oishi's observation, or the jet stream discovery, or we could go in that direction because of what was ultimately so important to the balloon bombing effort in World War II. Because although aircraft encounters with strong westerly winds during World War II provided the stimulus for post-war research into the jet stream for Americans, Wasaburo Uishi he observed these winds in the 1920s, the decade my own late and sainted Cyrus, Diana Zuchin Lynn Dietrich, was born, delivered into this veil of tears. And so his work was uh, basically uh, reviewed in the context of earlier work in the upper air observation and post-war work on the jet stream. And efforts were made to reconstruct Oishi's path to the directorship of Japan's first upper air observatory by reliance on historical studies and memoirs from the Central Meteorological Observatory. And archival records from Japan's aerological observatory were then used to document Oishi's upper air observations. And um, the first official report, uh, well, that was from the observatory written in 1926. And uh, it was written in the auxiliary language of Esperanto that assumed a central role in his study. And in that report, data was stratified by season and used to produce the mean seasonal wind profiles. So the profile for winter gave the first known evidence of the persistent strong westerlies over Japan that would later become known as the jet stream. So um, he was a geophysicist um, at, uh, well, there was a geophysicist that comes to my mind in America uh, at Columbia University who did contract work for the military. And like every other red-blooded American then, uh, Ewing, that was the guy's name that I'm thinking of, he dreaded the prospect of the Soviet Union acquiring the bomb and uh, then developed a system uh, in America that would help measure radiation and see if the Soviets had blown the bomb and then the radioactive isotopes would be detected on the aluminum foil of his mogul balloon system, which is what Americans are now trying to convince you was the cause 
of the Roswell incident. So uh, there is a interconnectivity between all of this, the Japanese balloon bombs from one side of the Pacific, the uh, bombs, of course, uh, that were, um, uh, well, uh, the American attempts to try and detect radiation if the Chinese were blowing uh, bombs, or rather if the Japanese were blowing bombs in communist China, uh, because the Americans knew the Japanese already had the bomb. The Japanese were still very much in mainland China, uh, even with the Americans occupying Japan. And anybody who looks at the repatriation of Japanese from China after World War II knows that this took a long time, the process of half a decade, five years at the very least. And during that period of time, uh, the imperial Japanese were aiding the nationalist Chinese. And, of course, uh, there was all that uh, was involved with, by the way, Maurice Ewing was the name of the guy who ultimately developed the technology in America for what became the Americans' mogul balloon project, something the Japanese had already developed by World War II, thanks to uh, all of these wonderful meteorologists and geophysicists and chemists that I'm bringing up with you now. And of course, uh, when it comes to, let me see, what else uh, that I can think of that I need to emphasize about uh, Sa Saruhashi, uh, all the work she was doing, uh, the fact that uh, she overcame um, substantial challenges, the war itself. Uh, we had, of course, uh, the Roswell atrocity, that uh, was going on uh, even before uh, Project uh, Castle Bravo, even before you had the, um, uh, even before my father murdered uh, the Master Sergeant Hangman of the so-called Nuremberg war criminals. So when it comes to this world in which so much was going on, and I'm trying to retrieve from my memory that which is most relevant. Uh, you also had a lot of people who were trying to claim that somehow uh, sunspots and solar storms knocked down a extraterrestrial craft at around the time of 1947. People weren't claiming that then. That's what they're trying to claim now about 1947. <laughs> Uh, if you're like a pro-alien propagandist trying to say that there's extraterrestrials who were attracted to us blowing the bombs. Like I said, I called them loud bangs at the end of World War II. It's all they were. It, they, it, it's something that's not visible from space. It didn't release that much energy where that would have been visible from space. The atomic bombs uh, dropped at Hiroshima and Nagasaki were simply firecrackers. Uh, in the realm of, uh, shall we say, detection capacity for anyone from space. No matter how advanced a technology, this is just not impressive enough where people would say, oh, let's travel that void between the stars to check this place out. It's, they would have to have been here already and they still wouldn't have seen it. <laughs> so uh, on April 7th, 1947, uh, and remember, April, May, June, July, the Roswell atrocity was uh, the week of July 4th through the 7th. But on April 7th of 1947, the largest sunspot in recorded history was observed, 40 times the diameter of Earth itself. And high energy ultraviolet and X-ray radiation increases during times of intense solar activity. Uh, this radiation is harmful to life, but thankfully, an upper layer of the atmosphere called the thermosphere, the thermosphere absorbs it, and this layer, 500 to 1500 kilometers above the surface, is where the International Space Station, the Hubble Space Telescope, and many other satellites reside. This is to protect them, to buffer and cushion them, ye exploiting the thermosphere from solar storms and space weather. So we think of this region as outer space as the atmosphere is so rarefied there, but rarefied as it is, an increase in solar activity can expand and increase the density of the thermosphere enough to drag orbiting objects 
to a lower altitude as well in the case of skylab in 1979 uh, they dragged it back down to earth itself in other words they crashed it and just solar solar weather phenomena uh solar activity and um, some have claimed that the mass of solar activity of 1947 is responsible for an extraterrestrial space vehicle crash near Roswell, New Mexico that year. Now, what crashed in Roswell, New Mexico, uh, well, in New Mexico at several sites, was quite terrestrial in origin, uh, but solar activity would never bring down an extraterrestrial type of craft at any rate. Skylab was an abandoned space vehicle, and it took several years for the energized thermosphere to drag it down to Earth. An advanced interstellar vehicle with propulsion would simply compensate for any decay in its orbit with a minor burn. Orbiting satellites perform this maneuver routinely. And now, at any rate, going back to Saru Hashi, while she was at the University of Tokyo, she designed techniques to measure carbon dioxide concentration levels in seawater circa 1950 after Roswell. And upon request of the Japanese government, she directed research of widespread affects of nuclear bomb testing circa 1954, discovering, or rather proving, that fallout from the American bomb test site, Bikini Island, had spread to Japan seawater 18 months after test. AT or after, you know, or rather uh, uh, ACB after Castle Bravo or AC after Castle. Now, because Castle was the name of the entire series of tests, uh, Castle Bravo was simply the second test. Get it? Bravo, Alpha Bravo. Now, um... So her research uh, persuaded uh, the United States and the Soviet Empire to stop above-ground nuclear testing circa 1963, the year my late sister was born into this world, uh, because she proved that seawater in the Pacific releases twice as much carbon dioxide as it absorbs, negating the hypothesis that seawater carbon dioxide absorption would ever stop global warming. Now, Saru Hashi actually went back to school after all this to get her PhD in chemistry at the University of Tokyo in 1957, where she was to become the first woman to graduate from that university with a PhD in science. Now, Saru Hashi faced many challenges as a woman in science. Uh, despite having already produced significant work, she still faced discrimination at the University of Tokyo while studying for her PhD. She recounted how her professor, suspicious of her abilities, gave her a false sample to test her. Now, in Tokyo, a professor asked her to conduct Microanalyses on bikini snow. That's this white dust of contaminated calcium oxide from corals created by nuclear blasting. The snow in the Pacific that I told you about. But first, however, he gave her other calcium carbonate samples to check the accuracy of Saruhashi's analysis. And in, this is all outlined in Japanese in a 2009 biography that was published uh, a few years after my late and sainted sire, the man who raised and guided me, George Dietrich, had uh, been thanatized, processed into death. Now, in terms of the history and nuclear weapons scholar, uh, Sumiko Hatakayama, they observed that while it is possible the professor did this to conserve the material, there's no evidence for that. It rather proves that he was skeptical of her abilities, but nevertheless, she prevailed and was to become the first woman to graduate with a PhD in science from the University of Tokyo. Now, Saruhashi also led the way in studying ocean-borne nuclear contamination. And although World War II had ended years before, the United States continued to carry out nuclear tests, particularly in the Pacific Ocean near Bikini Atoll, 
2,300 miles southwest of Japan. As I said, it was essentially equidistant between Japan, Hawaii, and Australia, and uh, three of the most strategic um, land masses in the world. Uh, and in terms of, uh, you know, all that was going down with that, you know, it wasn't that long after World War II when, of course, uh, you realize that, uh, well, World War II didn't end until 1952. As a matter of fact, what made Castle Bravo uh, what it was, it was only two years after World War II had ended. Uh, and yet this was what made it uh, apologetics worthy. You know, the, the Japanese got their apology because the Americans attacked them in peacetime. And uh, it effectively was taken as an attack. Now, um, in 1957, as I said, when Saru Hashi became the first woman to receive a PhD in chemistry in Japan, her work focused on measuring the molecules in seawater, like carbon dioxide, oxygen, and also radioactive molecules like cesium-131. Just 12 years before she received her PhD, the United States had dropped those atomic bombs that devastated the cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in a terrorist attack because these were militarily useless uh, assaults. They were only... Uh, acts of terror because they simply forced many civilians to live uh, death in life, uh, a, a life of, in which one would normally prefer to be dead because of their pains, their sufferings, their debilities, uh, and yet many of them lived to be over 100 years old who survived both Hiroshima and Nagasaki. That's a fact you can look up for yourself. So God knows there may be something to radiation making people stronger and uh, giving them a super boost. At any rate, uh, after that, in its bitterness over losing the war and in a desire to try and um, destroy the Sentoku submarines that prowled the American Atlantic seaboard uh, by catching them in their long uh, voyages back to the Pacific, uh, the United States just unleashed a torrent of radioactive fallout throughout the Pacific as it quote-unquote tested bigger and bigger bombs and by 1958 the United States had exploded 67 nuclear devi devices all of them around the Marshall Islands leaving a permanent legacy one where the half-life is in terms of centuries uh, the world will end and the scar will still be there of contamination uh, that the Americans decided that they were going to impart upon the earth because of their uh, hatred of humanity for uh, in, in their bitterness over having lost World War II. Mm. I've already gone over all of the context, more so than you would ever hear anywhere else, about those Japanese fishermen becoming mysteriously ill, quote-unquote, uh, obviously radiation sickness uh, from exposure, uh, where many of the crew already immediately realized nuclear testing was what they had experienced, all while out trawling downwind of the testing site in March of 1954. That's when the Japanese government asked Saru Hashi and her colleagues at the Geochemical Laboratory to investigate. Now, collecting, or rather, you know, beyond collecting samples, conducting a study like this was no easy task. Mm. Let me get myself together here. And um, I'm finishing the last of this bowl of tea, and it um, has particulate matter in it that just, you know, sucks the wind out of me have to drink water uh, to wash that down. Now understand that um, Toshihiro Higuchi, a historian at Georgetown University and an expert on the sciences of the Third World War, what we call so disastrously, so stupidly, the Cold War, he 
stated in his work that the amount of fallout we're talking about is really tiny. And we're talking about this enormous ocean that covers the majority of the Earth's surface. So tasked with developing more sensitive measurements, Saruhashi and her team ultimately found nuclear fallout didn't travel evenly throughout the ocean. They tracked ocean circulation patterns using radionuclides, very similar to what they do when they're testing you uh, in the hospital and they put a little radioactive element or isotope, uh, just a little bit of a radioactive tracer in your bloodstream so they can see where it goes and thereby t test uh, where there's blood clots or where your blood is not circulating. Uh, this is how they tested ocean circulation under the command of uh, Saruhashi Katsuko. Mm. And um, they discovered that currents pushed radiation contaminated waters clockwise from Bikini Atoll northwest towards Japan. As a result, fallout levels were much higher in Japan than along the western United States. So this was obviously the Americans attempting their chicken shit revenge in an attempt to radiate the Japanese archipelago and ultimately render its inhabitants uh, carcinoma ridden or riddled with cancers and to try to radioactivate, you know, radioactivate their crops. Uh, it's a terror, just uh, trying to render Japan ultimately uninhabitable. So the results of the Saruhashi studies were stunning. The radioactive fallout released in the testing had reached the Japanese archipelago in just 18 months. So if testing were to continue, the entire Pacific Ocean would be contaminated by 1969, proving that nuclear tests even conducted out in the middle of the ocean, seemingly in isolation, would have dangerous consequences. Even now, more than well over 60 years later, Bikini Atoll is still unlivable. Now, these data, unsurprisingly, sparked controversy, and the United States Atomic Energy Force ultimately funded a lab swap, bringing Saruhashi Katsuko to the Scripps Institute of Oceanography to compare the Japanese technique for measuring fallout with the American method, uh, developed by the, uh, shall we say, white male oceanographer, Theodore Folsom, whom they named the Folsom Street Fair after in San Francisco. You can look that up. I'm kidding about that, but it's the ultimate joke against this man because the Folsom Street Fair is where all the leather faggots get together and uh, show their butt cracks between the leather and public and whip each other silly and shit. And it's a big bondage fair and uh, as well, straight bondage, uh, I guess, well, bondage is not exactly straight. It's kind of, you know, off the beaten path, but, uh, you know, all the twisted sex you can imagine and everybody's having their fun, uh, you know, riding each other like horses and whatnot. So there you go. That's a perfect name uh, for a fair. Uh, I'll say it's named after Theodore Folsom. Now, worse than that was uh, the experience of Saruhashi Katsuko at, the, at Scripps Institute. Because after being invited by none other than the U.S. Atomic Energy Force, she was asked by Folsom, her U.S.-based counterpart, to not commute to the Institute every day. She was provided a wooden hut to work in instead. They did not want her physical presence at the Institute. Now, this is uh, obviously attributable to gender and racial discrimination. Uh, but beyond that, there was complex geopolitical prejudice because whoever was involved in that misconduct uh, may well have thought that Folsom, as a Western male figure representing this quote-unquote victorious empire, 
that he could not be shown to be inferior to a small Asiatic woman from a quote-unquote defeated nation. That's how they were propagandizing it to the Americans. Well, after the half a year, the six-month lab exchange ended, uh, it was clear that Saruhashi's method provided incredibly accurate and consistent results. And therefore, as a result, they were impossible to dispute. And since they were no longer subject to dispute, Saruhashi's indisputable findings then served as her justification for demanding the prohibition of above-ground nuclear testing on behalf of her emperor. Her method turned out to be more accurate, settling the science, and providing all the critical evidence needed to bring all the Allied powers, the American and Soviet, British, and French empires, along with the Communist Chinese, into agreement to end all above-ground nuclear testing in 1963, the very year that my sister was delivered into this world, and John Fitzgerald Kennedy was delivered out of it, assassinated. An amazing accomplishment at the height of the Third World War that Americans still try to evade in its implications by calling it the Cold War, like an oblique reference to something just too big for your mind to encompass or wrap your brain around. Now, Saru Hashikatsuko returned to Japan and later became the executrix directoress of the Geochemical Laboratory circa 1979. Later, come 1980, Saru Hashi became the first woman elected to the Science Council of the Empire of Japan. Now, this is obviously a fantastic role model for young ladies, this is a woman who literally saved the fucking world. The Americans have nothing to beat that. And it shows, of course, you bloody fucking lost the war because a little Japanese woman gave you the order to stop fucking testing and you all stop testing. Uh, if the Japanese did not have that kind of clout, do you honestly think the commies and the Yanks and the Brits and the frogs would ever come to their senses? Obviously, Japan was in a position to back up its demands. Uh, and uh, this was uh, something that forced the Allies to obey. So, who do you think won World War II now? Get your head out of your ass. Nobody's going to know about this unless you spread the goddamn word. It's your war. You've got to fight it. So, this is why... Uh, my transmissions are so important, my books are so important, and why you've got to spread the word. It's up to you. Spread the goddamn word. As for Castle Bravo, of course, we're still talking about the king of disasters. Uh, it's, uh, you're talking about a thousand times more powerful than each of the atomic bombs that were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the fifth largest nuclear explosion in history, international, uh, furor over what was considered an idiotic, though albeit from what my father determined with his encounter with the Evanesser, uh, an intentional mischaracterization of lithium meant that the American empire was forced to reveal that it had the ability to make deliverable thermonuclear weapons, and more importantly, it had to reveal that information to its third world war adversary, Soviet Russia, that test was supposed to be a secret, <laughs> if you could believe that, whereas the gaseous fallout, as I stated, from Bravo eventually spread as far as Australia India, and of course, as I said, the Empire of Japan and the United States, and, uh, well, I've, if I remember correctly, the rest of parts of Europe, at least. Uh, of course, uh, the radioactivity of Bikini Atoll is a, well, 
I guess if we want to get down to Jameson Reese kind of thinking, it's uh, well, it's responsible for the uh, uh, it's responsible for the birth of SpongeBob SquarePants too, I guess. <laughs> well, there you go. He was born at Bikini Atoll. I think that's the actual uh, plot device or the conceit of uh, his origin, right? Gazing at a crater while flying over Bikini Atoll in 1954. 1954, the film producer. Uh, he, what was his name now? It, we're not just talking about uh, Surubaya, uh, the maker of monsters. Uh, Tomuki, Tomiyuki Tanaka. He went on to create a film uh, uh, personifying nuclear annihilation with Surabaya, uh, the about the fishing vessel encountering radiation, uh, the original Godzilla. Uh, so the Lucky Dragon, by the way, was deemed safe for public viewing in 1976. It's currently on display in its own museum in Tokyo. Uh, you're talking about a ship barely 100 feet long. That was one of the catalysts uh, or evidence presented for uh, the end of above ground atmospheric open air nuclear testing. So, uh, very, very happy to share the outcomes of this. If you don't understand now that Japan won the war, uh, again, you're just in denial. So, spread the word. Tell the people how the Japanese told everybody to stop testing. It wasn't like the Allies would have stopped on their own. <sighs> So, aside from that, let me take a look at how much time we have remaining. I think I pretty much exhausted myself for tonight. I really didn't think I'd uh, go in this direction, but I'm glad I did. And hell, it's a lot better than all of the analysis I would have done otherwise on contemporary affairs. We've all been, you know, stuffed to death with that shit. Uh, now, maintain good audience numbers, too. We've got two fucking hours left <laughs> oh, uh, of transmission. So far as I know, let me take a look at what um, our um, stream says. Still says duration 300 minutes. So uh, whatever that is, I have no idea what that measures or what that's about underneath my fade on the uh, scene transitions or something like that. So I guess it does this kind of automatic uh, thing. And, uh, but, uh, ultimately what happens is, um, if I go past 12 hours, the live stream just screws up. All right. So what do you think? Should I end the show two hours early or should I go on about something? You just start, you know, um, really hitting it with some current affairs. I mean, we could certainly in depth cover something. Of course, I might bring Jameson Reese on for a few minutes, cover my ass, see if he can bring anyone else online. Uh, you know, call Penny Bradley, uh, uh, somebody else. Uh, by the way, uh, here we are. Jameson Reese says America really sucks, and he brings up Castle Bravo IPA Fro Fro Frog Island Brewing. Uh, this is an imperial style beer brewed, you know, called Castle Bravo. I guess it's supposed to have that nuclear bite. And as for what happens when one becomes an ally with uh, the dark forces, uh, this is the video by our man Daniel Arola that our man uh, uh, past um, experiences with what I um, did uh, on part of another Bill Hemmingson. At the time, he was hosting The Art of Dreaming on Revolution Radio. Uh, and, um, of course, he wound up dead in Mexico and interviewed Michael Aquino. And so that was the one time that Michael Aquino was um, on air on Revolution Radio. And, uh, of course, Sean, uh, they uh, earned something like, you get five Michael is, I don't think this is the one that was talking. You're going to wish you never had. About uh, and I say this uh, with the uh, all the facts to back me up. It, just look at the experience of all the people that I... I, I really would like some opportunity at some point to personally explain to her my motivations behind what okay. arch nemesis uh, and his uh, kind do you know who is a in his interview on uh, the by, Jimmy by Church the way, station the with uh, that, uh, Solaris Blue Raven. Now, used here is just uh, 
you know, the photograph you see of me here, I'm just totally bloated on antidepressants. Uh, there no, was one time he was stuff. interviewed, Michael Aquino, with Michael Hemmings. Yeah, yeah, this is not this is not the one where I talk about Castle Bravo. So we're going to have to get Daniel Arola to show us <laughs> which one I, where I was talking about Castle Bravo. Uh, but, you know, Sammy Romero, thank you for bringing that to our attention. Uh, and um, we'll, it might have been on a channel that got blitzed, but if our man Sammy heard it recently, Daniel Arola should be able to find it. So we'll, uh, you know, I'll re-edit and take this uh, this link off. I will kind of uh, just, uh, what do I do with this link? Um, save it. Um, and uh, uh, But otherwise, uh, let's uh, do what I can here to burn bandwidth and just, let's see if I can bring our man Jameson on. Jameson! Oh, hey, buddy! Hey there, son! Yo, Jameson, my man! Yeah! Jameson, my man! Yes! You there, son? Yeah! How are we doing there? Fuck, he, he dropped. <laughs> Holy shit! Oh my god. Oh, that sucks. Damn, man, if he dropped and I'm unable to get any backup, I may end transmission early tonight. Uh, God knows, I think I earned it. So let me uh, take a look at what's um Gia Love Bella Child. Right? This is interesting. And um, so that's cute. So I'll just give her an upvote on that. And um, all right, then. What am I doing? Fuck. I'm trying to get... Oh, yeah, this link. What I need to do is go back to the live stream. All right, and press the edit button and then get that uh, link out of there because that's just going to fucking confuse people. Actually, it's a good link, but, you know, uh, it's not necessarily parallel uh, to, well, you know, it's parallel to every episode. I could prefer, you know, I could refer everybody to this link on every episode, what happens when you spend your time cavorting with uh, the chaos side of uh, the equation, uh, of the life equation. Same. All right, Oops. and press the edit button. Press the mute there and uh, get that back on play. Oh my God, what a night. Now, um, you know, frankly, that exhausted me. Honestly, all, all that I went into, it's, it's uh, you know, it's a tough topic. And uh, again, trying to educate people, it's not an easy task. It takes a lot of energy. All right, so this one, let me see here. Confer uh, this link. Let's, let's put this here. Uh, get this here. And then take the um, link. Let me see where we got here. Uh, okay, there we are. Turn this off. Uh, there we are. And then cut and paste this. Uh, God, our man, uh, Daniel Arola, he's really such an ally. Um, he's the best. You know, so many of these men working around with me are. Couldn't do anything without any of them. Uh, and... Uh, how about anyone out there want to come on the program? <laughs> Take my place for a bit here. Yeah. And, uh, you know, give my ass a break. Clarice Claudette. Where's Clarice Claudette? When we need her. Yes. Oh, my God. This was put up in October 7th, uh, 2018. What was it that, uh, you know, Jameson Reese was saying that... Uh, Daniel Roll is doing these days planting you know the, the point is that they've taken away the free program that he used to use to make these videos that's the problem and he he can't pay anything uh, for new ones uh, you know um, I'm, I'm not quite sure if sending him money would even help I'll have to ask him about um, you know maybe being able to do something uh, like I mean help me figure out what can be done so that he can get back to uploading videos again. Um, and uh, talk to him about that. So let me uh, send a message over here. Let's take a look at... Because, uh, tell you what, you know, I haven't felt like this in a long time. Not that I feel bad. 
<laughs> but I just feel like, you know, calling it quits for the night, to tell you the truth. Uh, so I know most people like me to go the full 12 hours. I mean, that's what you're here for, right? So um, let's take a look at um, our uh, lady uh, Penny. Oh, let's let's call her up. You know, send something in Messenger. Uh, here we are, um, Penny Bradley. Penny, and because uh, she's a lady that can just uh, you know take the bull by the horns and keep that with burning. Uh, uh, let's ask her. Uh, <laughs> All right. Aside from that, I wish Holly could hide his key for head Skype. Oh, then of course there's our lady in Australia. She's got her Skype going. Can't call her, of course, without, you know, uh, warning her first. Uh, and uh, let's see now. What else have we got going here? Who else do I have as a potential backup? Oh, Amanda Ute. And of course... Uh, She's nowhere to be found. Oh, how about Amanda? Um, all right. B E. Huh? Darling. Oh. And of course, aside from that, oh, Aaron Tice. Oh my God, that guy's a father. He's probably, you know, he's got to be asleep. Uh, so. Let's take a look at him and uh, say, uh, how are we doing? God, well, you didn't tune in to hear this. So let me see if I can get back to some analysis. All right. Um, and uh, uh, let me specify to him by that. I mean, how are you? <laughs> uh, uh, by that, uh, I mean, how are you? How are you? Ding. ding. I wrote how we ding. Yeah, there we are doing. Okay, get back on the call. If anybody wants to get into the chat room, go ahead. This is the first time in a long time I've just been like, uh, kind of like, fuck, past the point of giving a shit. <laughs> uh, all right, let me try and get my head out of my ass. Uh, see if I can get a little bit into some analysis tonight. Tell people about... Uh, uh, you know, things that have been happening that are indicative of uh, where we're at in this world, where we might be going, you know, all the shit that everybody's been talking about. Uh, Asian Lunar New Year, of course, so just uh, that you know. Oh, fuck yeah, here's one thing I can do. The solicitation. How could I forget? Um, all right, let me call that up because I'm never able to remember it. Uh, despite, you know, all these years, I just kind of bleach it from my mind every time after I say it. It's not like I hate it, but maybe there's something there that just, uh, you know, something about it just, uh, you know, does me in that certain way. All right, then, uh, calling up the text so I can read there from, and of course, do my duty in that regard, and earn what pay I get from my sponsor, uh, who didn't see fit to provide me a uh, Christmas bonus, but, hey, uh, you know, can't have everything, I guess. He does what he does, and I should appreciate that for what I do. One among the creepiest true crime tours in America is the Tucson Murders True Crime Tours. The Tucson Murders True Crime Tours provide us historic crime investigation into forgotten lost crimes in Tucson, Arizona. These small private tours are hosted by the Mr. Ben Baron Astenius, a true crime researcher and enthusiast who will personally take us the to real historic crime locations related to these crimes in Tucson. Relive these events and hear the untold stories behind the stories. 
The Baron Ben specializes in the seemingly ever-developing case of the late serial rape killer, Charles Howard Smitty Schmid Jr., alias the Pied Piper of Tucson. An aftermath tour. See theunfinishedman.com for excerpts from his yet-to-be-published, the Baron Ben's yet-to-be-published book of that very title, The Unfinished Man, and review scenes from... uh, uh, cinematic documentaries currently in production at theunfinishedman.com. But other cases, such as the strange case of Morris Brady, the Dr. George Marvin Tejudine case, and the Red Rapist are also within his repertoire, as in fact are all the crimes that shocked the Southwest throughout the 1960s, the very decade I myself entered this veil of tears. These devastating crimes stained a city so deeply, they may never be removed. For tour information, contact the TucsonMurders.com. Spell Tucson as you would Tucson. T-U-C-S-O-N. Put the word the in front of it. The TucsonMurders.com. Or telephone the Baron Ben privately to personally guide your tour at 1-520-323-3406. That's 1520-323-3406. Oh, God. Okay. There we go, people. Uh, Did my duty. Performed my responsibility. Oh, God. Go back to see how much more time has passed, how much time we got left. And uh, somebody talked in the chat room. We got a comparatively high number of viewers. Uh, And, uh, you know, well, all right. Let's try and analyze a little bit about, uh, well, Asian Lunar New Year. It was, of course, uh, yesterday when we started transmission. Well, uh, Meta erased $251 billion United States dollars in value. The biggest wipeout in history. Uh, Frank Fuckerberg is no longer the top man. I think that uh, some of those space billionaires, the the phallic uh, uh, rich who ride up into space on columns of flame and giant dildos uh, now surpass him as richest man in the world. Uh, so, wow, that meta was one bad deal. Uh, and of course, what the fuck was his intent behind that? Uh, I forget. He, I guess because Facebook is kind of like, uh, well, fossilized, right? It's frozen in time. And, uh, so, uh, that was, uh, the sixth day of Asian Lunar New Year and uh, reflective or commemorative of the sixth day of creation in which the divine empress Nian Wang, uh, she created the the horse on the sixth day. And uh, of course, uh, it's all about visiting relatives and friends throughout Asian Lunar New Year, Sinoviet um, uh, moon festival. And uh, after uh, the day before, which was known as Po or Break Five, people could truly begin working again yesterday if they wanted to, and or had to. Uh, and uh, they also would send Song Chu Gui, uh, the spirit of poverty, away. Uh, this frail-looking ghost who liked to drink thin porridge in life and purposefully turned his clothing into rags. The prince, uh, the heir of a dynasty gone mad, uh, who became the spirit of poverty that haunts mainland China. They sent him away by burning scraps and offering banana boat candles. Uh, In fact, they do that wherever uh, Chinese live, uh, Taiwan as well. Now, at home and in the streets, basically the public holiday period ended yesterday. Uh, China is preparing to go back to work, uh, or much of it is. Transportation was very busy, more city return journeys. Uh, In terms of what's open in China, some businesses reopened a day early. 
uh, the superstitions and beliefs, of course. It was believed that uh, the god of bathrooms, was visiting uh, everyone's uh, lavatory to check sanitary conditions. I probably got an F-. minus. So every household was normally using that day to clean. Uh, now, in terms of uh, today, we've entered, taking you all the way into Renri, the day of the human. For on the seventh day of creation, humans were created uh, by the divine empress, uh, Nyue, the seventh day of gen Genesis, I mean to say. Celebrations for the day of humans, as I said, originated from the Han dynasty, the first ethno state of China in which the ethnic Han majority uh, uh, accomplished a race-based rule in mainland China. At that time, that wasn't necessarily something that was a negative. Now, uh, in terms of uh, ancient China, they had the tradition of wearing a hair accessory called the Renxing, uh, colorful cutouts and gold engravings of flowers and people uh, were pasted onto screens normally to, on a day like this today this day in the midst of the asian lunar new year cycle uh life is returning to normal in mainland china schools will be reopening on the 20th february 20th uh, the decorations will be up until the lantern festival on the ides of february until basically the big lantern festival will be right after St. Valentine's Day. It's perfect this year. We've got the Sainted Valentine's Day on the 14th and the lantern festival the day after. All very red theme, all very um, beyond beautiful. Um, transportation today on mainland China was crazy busy. Uh, return travel rush. And in terms of what's working on the mainland, it was business as normal by... Uh, the Sinoviet uh, Lunar New Year, uh, day eight, the, the eighth day of uh, uh, that. And I realize now I have to correct some of the acronyms I put on these descriptors here. Uh, as for food, um, you know, there's uh, Qi Bao Ging, or the seven gem porridge. That's the dish of today. It includes seven types of vegetables, kale, leek, mustard leaves, celery, garlic, uh, chunkai, or spring vegetable, and the hubankai, the thick leaf vegetables. Um, and in terms of superstitions and beliefs, fair weather today is a sign of a safe and sound year. Um, so hopefully that gives you some perspective of a little bit of flavor of uh, uh, Asian Lunar New Year, and certainly uh, gave me the, uh, the notice I've got to make some little minor corrections in um, some of the spellings. Oh my god. Oh, thank god. Real Technique is talking to me. <laughs> uh, he's talking to Jameson, really. <laughs> he's at first. Says, you're right about the cytokinetic storm. Look up the King of Bitters. Order that. Uh, Thailand has used it to help a lot of people. Maybe consider ivermectin. And then, uh, that's not that, uh, that veterinary uh, parasite uh, thing, is it? Anyhow, uh, he says, Happy Chinese New Year, Douglas. Thank you, sir. Love you dearly. Uh, hugs, dear brother, real tech geek. And, uh, oh my God, somebody give me the motivation. It's it's not like I'm lacking strength. It's motivation. I'm just feeling, uh, you know, not like I'm depressed or something. It's just like, oh my God. Uh, you know me, normally once I start, I can't stop, but, you know, for some reason tonight, it hit me. Just, uh, you know, the gravity of the stuff that I'm talking about. Well, let me catch you up a little bit about San Francisco. Um, they've got, purchased a, uh, a hotel, the, formerly the Gotham Hotel in San Francisco. Uh, and it reminds me a lot of my old, uh, well, the old, uh, uh, apartment complex we used to live in on uh, 270 Turk Street in San Francisco, uh, the El Cerrito Apartments, which unbelievably are still standing. As a matter of fact, you could probably look them up using, you know, all of that uh, Google map shit. And you could take a look at the home in which I effectively grew up in 
uh, in the Tenderloin. Let's do that for a little trip down memory lane. I mean, I shouldn't do shit like this. It's always depressing beyond, beyond belief. Why do I do this to myself? El Cerrito, oh, because I'm talking about they bought another hotel in San Francisco to basically house the homeless. You know, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to look at El Cerrito apartments. And uh, I'm going to just, you know, leave that to somebody else. Uh, but, uh, you know, basically after San Francisco's attempt to buy a Japantown hotel to house homeless people failed amid intense neighborhood backlash, uh, the city faced no meaningful resistance when it chose an alternate site less than a mile away. Uh, and now the 114 room Vantagio or Vantagio, I believe that's what the name of it is, the Vantagio Suites once known as the Gotham Hotel. Uh, that's uh, preparing to become the latest addition to our city and county supply of permanent supportive housing. So the Board of Supervisors on uh, Tuesday, um, they agreed to spend 34.8 million United States dollars, something equivalent to what the Americans provided the Japanese in compensation after Castle Bravo. But, uh, you know, back then that was the equivalent to what would have been hundreds of millions of United States dollars today. The Japanese really wiped America's face, really mopped the floor with America's face during World War II, or they never would have, you know, surrendered to uh, these demands. They would have just said, you lost the war. We don't need to do shit. Go fuck yourself and keep testing, you know, themselves as well as everyone else into oblivion. But uh, the fact that the Japanese gave the order to stop and all five allied powers just stopped. Well, again, ask yourself who won the fucking war. You know, common sense. I'd hate to keep reiterating that, but, you know, how many times can you start spreading the word? Just spread the word. And um, so what San Francisco paid for that. Gotham Hotel, or Vantagia, uh, Ventagio, or Ventigio Suites, was about 305,000 United States dollars per unit to buy the single-room occupancy hotel at 835 Turk Street, aiming to start welcoming new tenants this summer. So one day after that acquisition was approved, Shireen McSpadden, the executrix directoress of the San Francisco Department of Homelessness and Supportive Housing, toured that Turk Street residential hotel. And she saw the building's community kitchen with its two ovens and stovetops and a dining room that can seat 20 people. Then she went to three rooms of varying sizes, all of which had private bathrooms, a microwave, a mini fridge, at least one desk, a bed or two. So it's certainly a departure from the photographs I saw from many other single-room occupancy hotels that have shared bathrooms, fueling complaints from residents about a lack of privacy and dignity. Uh, you know, the building reflects the direction San Francisco leaders want to move in when providing more homes for the city's massive unhoused population and taking advantage of tax revenue from the 2018 local ballot measure, Proposition C, as well as a California state grant funding, well, San Francisco's been buying more properties for homeless people as it aims to add uh, 1,500 new supportive housing units by July. So our city's more than halfway toward meeting that goal. So, um, you know, basically it's, uh, it's just, uh, it's pretty incredible uh, that this is being done. Uh, I'm, you know, impressed. Uh, of course, you get a bunch of crazy homeless people in there. It's probably going to turn into a hellhole. Hopefully, they're all women with children, like homeless family people. Uh, but, uh, you know, think about this being done to help the homeless when we've got so many vacancies in San Francisco and the city should have the right to just confiscate those vacancies if the landlords don't get them occupied. Uh, so, um, the Turk Street acquisition, that follows three other recent purchases San Francisco has made to expand housing for homeless people, including facilities for young people, one for adults and families, and those buildings spread across the Mission, Outer Mission, South of Market neighborhoods, they total some 237 units 
Um, of course, our city has more than 8,000 homeless people, with many needing intensive services to rebuild their lives. And more than two years ago, our city identified 4,000 homeless people who were struggling with addiction and mental illness and set out to prioritize, well, what few hundred they could. So, uh, at the Turk Street building, um, an opportunity is open now to provide housing for a mix of homeless couples and single adults. So, it's got wonderful character right now. Of course, no one's moved in yet. That character is really going to change quick. <laughs> Uh, you know, it's got these community spaces and private bathrooms. Of course, you're talking about homeless people. They're disturbed in the first place. It's, uh, oh God, uh, this building was constructed in 1930 in what is called what you would think would be an elite area by its name, Cathedral Hill. It was last renovated, uh, 2014, not that long ago. Uh, but a lot of international students and legacy tenants, you know, people who have lived there for decades, it has about 30 residents already, down from 42 when the city purchased the facility. Uh, of course, no one who currently lives in the building will be displaced by the city's acquisition, uh, though they expect everybody living in there to leave voluntarily. In other words, they're going to be driven out by all the homeless crazies. They're going to say, fuck this. I don't want to live in a place where I get mugged or raped as soon as I walk outside my door. Or, uh, you know, eh, oh God, they're just going to leave. It's just going to become unlivable for them. Um, so, uh, it's, there you go. And uh, But we've got, you know, how many homeless did they say we had? 8,000, right? That they know of? I mean, that's a lot, right? I mean, that's not shit compared to our vacancies. I mean, really, we've got 8,000 homeless people on the streets and we've got 40,000 vacant homes in San Francisco. As a matter of fact, the report that was commissioned really identified at least 40,458 homes and condos sitting vacant in San Francisco. So it's really 40,000 and plus half a thousand more. And that number would potentially go down if the city were to introduce a vacancy tax that would fine homeowners who leave their properties empty. But, you know, why do that when you can just confiscate their prophecy, confiscate their property if they don't get it occupied, you know, for long enough and you check back on it and it doesn't stay occupied, ultimately confiscate it from them and make it available to the homeless. I mean, you'd be able to give every single homeless person a unit all their own, with their own kitchen, with their own bathroom. None of this community shared shit. <laughs> uh, oh my fucking God. I mean, how many more, you know, um, I mean, this is just, how do you work this? What are the calculations here? Um, you know, I used to be able to do this in my head. Okay, 40,500. We've got 40,500 vacancies divided by 8,000. You, you've got five times the open units with all the commodities, all the amenities, all the amenities. You got five times the amount that you've got homeless people in this city where they're charged in thousands and thousands of dollars for rent, which is why all this shit is empty. Nobody can afford to rent it. Uh... Yeah, the homeless would live like kings then. Uh, so, all right, enough of that. Um, we've had Whoopi Goldberg's American idea of race expressed to us, which I think was admirably um, articulated by Jameson Reese the last time. I really shouldn't uh, even devote any time to it. He, he, did, uh, he did what he could uh, very well, very adeptly. But um, uh, understand, of course, there's a lot of difference between the American idea of race and that of cosmopolitan uh, peoples, diasporic peoples, like the Jewish peoples. Um, obviously, the racial distinctions between master and slave are much more familiar to Americans. 
but uh, no more real uh, than those between Gentile and Jew. So, let's take a... You know, there was a New York Daily News sports editor once. My dad told me about when he was bitching. Not my dad. This New York Daily News sports editor was bitching about these guys dominating basketball. He said, The game places a premium on an alert, scheming mind and flashy trickiness, artful dodging, and general smart aleckness, not to mention their God given better balance and speed. You know, he wasn't talking about blacks, he was talking about Jews in the 1930s. Paul Gallico, that was his name, was trying to explain away what was then a Jewish dominance of basketball, came up with the idea that the game's structure simply appealed to immutable traits of the wily Hebrews and their scheming minds. You know, it sounds really strange to our sensibilities today, but only because our stereotypes of who's inherently good at particular sports has completely shifted. Uh, you know, his theories not any more or less insightful now than it was then. His confidence should remind us to be skeptical of similar supposedly explanatory arguments that abound today. Uh, but looking back at these old stereotypes is a useful exercise. It can help illustrate the arbitrary nature of the concept of race uh, in terms of uh, a cultural conceptualization. Obviously, I've told people race is very real. It's not a construct. You are medically impacted by what race you are. Uh, but uh, definitely, when it comes to the cultural concepts of race, as opposed to the physical reality, the genetic reality, it's malleable enough uh, to be made to serve the needs of those in power to define it. Uh, the certainties of one generation giving way to the contradictory dogmas of another. Um, perhaps I'll go more into this um, some other time. I mean, it's a turgid enough subject where I just feel maybe I can't do it justice right now. We could go into the black history aspect of this month about the black female justice. Uh, but probably, you know what, in the time we have remaining... Uh, you know, we'd better get to Ukraine. And uh, obviously, we've got that uh, that problem overseas that, um, you know, see if I can kick up enough geopolitics, I'll probably get everyone to leave. <laughs> they, uh, I notice my listeners just don't share the passion for geopolitics that I have. We could bring up the fact, of course, civil war is coming, and now you've got investment specialists who are um, pointing that fact out. Uh, and um, all of this uh, goes back to, you know, the Republicans and their, their stance on vaccines, for God's sakes. Uh, again, really, I should also cover that stupid trucker's uh, Carney Act, but you know, it'll still be going on Wednesday or just breaking up, and uh, we can um, get back to that again. Uh, but uh, all right, then. Um, Trump, of course, has got criminal charges up the ass. Uh, there's clashes in open court that are going to, and he's yes, he's expected to be in court. <laughs> Uh, there's the fact, of course, that the Ivy League is uh, regretting America's persecution of Chinese. And meanwhile, uh, the Sino-Slavic Synaxis is very real. Russia and China have aligned against the American empire. They're issuing demands to Joe Biden. Dictators Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping have given a defiant message to the American empire and the West following their meeting in Beijing on Friday, ahead of the Winter Olympics opening ceremony. The Russian dictator, Vladimir Putin, and the Chinese communist dictator, Xi Jinping, issued a joint statement of cooperation after the summit, calling on NATO to rule out expansion in Eastern Europe and criticizing Asia-Pacific security blocs. 
So Russia's and China's leaders also called on the U.S. to abandon plans to deploy intermediate and shorter-range missiles in the Asia-Pacific region in Europe. So that statement released by the Kremlin uh, said China and Russia uh, oppose the further expansion of the U.S.-led alliance, calling on the organization of NATO to abandon the ideological approaches of the Cold War era. Oh, thank God, I've got somebody sending me a message. Let's see what this is. Let me see if I can get past uh, the, uh, you know, what is it? The ads I've got up for lingerie that I was staring at. All right, got two notifications coming in. And this is the lovely Elisabetta Carlotta Del Perro. And um, uh, I wish Clarice Claudette was in the chat and I could have asked her to come on and... Uh, that uh, probably would have helped immensely, but uh, sadly, she just wasn't there. And, of course, uh, Diane wasn't up. Facebook, what have we got going here? Oh, yes, that's right. Yes. Uh, my little trip going on there is uh, cool. Um, that was fascinating. There was a response. Probably this is something that's going to lead to kicking my ass in the future. Something that uh, I'll probably get myself into deep trouble with this. But anyhow, uh, when it comes to uh, the... Oh, yes. Let's see what she said. Uh, lovely lady. Uh, she leaves this little... Um, what is it? Symbols of herself. Emojis of herself. That... Uh, oh, she says, love this. Okay. Love you too, honey. Uh, let me give her that. And give her a flower of some sort. Um, okay. And uh, with that, uh, I'll go back to uh, the shit that the Sino-Slavic sign axis is pulling. You know, honestly, with what they're saying, everybody knows this. Uh, they're effectively creating a military alliance. They're training together. This is, uh, you know, actively the enemy now. Um, they are not to be divided into separate parts. Uh, they are what uh, they are, uh, a two-headed monster at this point. They're, they're very much uh, operating together because they need to. Uh, they're, uh, they're unable to accomplish what they want without each other. Um, so let me get this saved to send to this lovely lady. The Melina collection. Okay. And um, all right. Get, the, get back to her over here and uh respond and uh she says love this okay oh, fuck isn't this working here there we are love you too okay oh yes i forgot how can i forget the response reply get her name going up there there we go okay in fact i'll probably like in my analysis just kind of choke uh uh, what comes out to mind rather than the kind of in-depth analysis that I usually do. The, fuck, the Molina collection. There we are. Center that image. There's a uh, nice set of flowers for the ladies, of course, that are so kind to me. All right. That takes care of that. And uh, going back now to the task at hand. Uh, shout out, of course, to Salman Sheikh, who sent me a hundred United States dollars. Haven't opened the envelope yet, but uh, okay, with uh, everything going on uh, overseas, uh, let's see now. Um, so you've got this Friday summit into this weekend last, the first in-person meeting between Putin and Xi, Xi and Putin, for two years, in two years' time, expected to cement the ties between their countries as the Russian dictator faces global pressure over the buildup of troops by the border with Ukraine. And in what appeared to be a reference to Russia's position on the Ukrainian crisis, Red China said it understands and supports the proposals of Moscow on the formation of long-term, legally binding security guarantees in Europe, meaning demands 
where the Allies effectively surrender the sovereignty of an independent nation-state. Now, Reuters has reported that the meeting also yielded a gas deal, with Beijing pledging to increase its imports of the fossil fuel from Russia. Uh, Putin said Moscow had prepared very good new solutions on hydrocarbon supplies that included a new contract on supplying 10 billion cubic meters, that's BCM, per year to Red China from Russia's Far East. Now, Russia is Europe's biggest provider of natural gas, and there are concerns that if the Ukraine crisis spills over into conflict, this could strain supplies. Uh, however, the new deal with Beijing would not see Europe-bound gas diverted because it involves supplies from the Pacific island of Sakhalinsk, which is not connected to Russia's European pipeline network. Russia's just swimming in this shit. It's just a big hole in the ground that can provide everybody with, you know, raw materials to consume, uh, but, you know, doesn't offer pretty much anything else, uh, you know, that humanity can use or wants <laughs> uh, right now. Uh, by the way, I see that our numbers have kind of gone down to our average, you know, late morning uh, time. Probably everybody got, everybody got tired of hearing me just mumble and putz and futz around, uh, and I certainly don't blame them. Uh, so in uh, the little over an hour we have remaining, uh, the United States has warned that conflict would hurt Red China's interests, uh, its international interests in particular. NATO's chief rejected a demand made by the Russian dictator Vladimir Putin and the Chinese communist dictator Xi Jinping that the military alliance halt and any expansion eastward, uh, reasserting that European states have the right to choose their own paths. Well, Putin in Beijing for the opening of the Winter Olympics, which, you know, I'm so glad to see that little Russian girl who was enjoying herself in the ice skating in the Olympics. Well, everything that she did was so talented. I mean, she deserved her medal. And, oh, you had this poor Chinese girl who slipped. And, uh, oh, my God, uh, communist Chinese, or rather mainland Chinese, I mean to say. And, um, of course, uh, you know, China's still going to get a big haul in the medals. I mean, you know, like, who to thunk, right? You got China hosting the Olympics, and they're going to haul away the majority of medals on their own home turf. Well, no surprise. Uh, the Winter Olympics are what they are, and, uh, you know, this is just a really weird, hard time. I mean, reporters are being dragged away. There's no freedom of press there. Mm. So goons are literally dragging reporters off. Oh. And these are, of course, the foreigners. In fact, what was it? They, they were trying to forbid them from coming in at all, if I remember correctly. In fact, I know that was the case. How any even got in is beyond me. Uh, but, um, you know, they're doing their best to just, uh, how would I say it? Just maintain total control. Control freak bullshit. Now, um... So, at any rate, um, what's interesting is that when Putin was in Beijing for the opening of the Winter Olympics into this weekend and met with the Chinese dictator on Friday to exchange views and pledge a bilateral friendship with no forbidden zones... Now, that sounded gay as hell, <laughs> but, you know, this means that the Sino-Slavic uh, Synaxis is no borders. They are now a twin tyranny. They are a twin tyranny that is the enemy. And meanwhile, Russia's foreign minister brushed off American claims that Moscow plans to release a fake video as a way to justify an invasion. Of course, this was always the case, and uh, we knew they were going to try this. The British exposed the uh, Russian objective to replace the Ukrainian government with a puppet state. 
Uh, but the United States has been, uh, well, they've uh, confronted the Chinese and said, you know, this could hurt you. The Biden administration officials have cautioned Beijing that conflict between Ukraine and Russia would affect Red China's international interests. The White House press secretary, uh, uh, Jen Psaki, related that to um, the American public after the meeting between Xi and Putin. Uh, Saki told reporters on Friday, uh, after she was asked about American reaction to the meeting between the two American adversaries, she said, we've also conveyed that a destabilizing conflict in Europe would impact Red China's interests all over the world, and certainly China should know that. So the Biden administration, she was emphasizing this fact, has its own relationship with China in which, uh, by her words, we engage directly at a very high level. Our focus right now is continuing to unite with allies and partners to respond decisively if Russia further invades Ukraine. Now, of course, uh, Lithuania, the nation on the forefront of uh, Western civilization, standing up against... uh, both Russia and Communist China, all on its own. Uh, They are seeking greater deterrence efforts. The Lithuanian Foreign Minister, Gabrielis Landsbergis, called on NATO to step up deterrence on the eastern flank of the alliance as uh, Russia is moving more troops into Belarus, which directly threatens Poland and uh, Lithuania. So... In a statement, Landsberg has said, The growing number of Russian military forces in Belarus raises questions not only about the future of Belarus as an independent state, but also increases the threat to the security of Lithuania and the Baltic region. And uh, Stoltenberg, the NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg, uh, dismissed the Sino-Slavic demand to halt NATO. That was whose name I was trying to remember earlier. Uh, So he rejected claims that the 30-member alliance has expansionist ambitions. He just dismissed these assertions as, these allegations, as wrong. Uh, And in an interview with Bloomberg Television, Stoltenberg said, this is about respecting the sovereign right of independent nations to choose their own path. Go, lad. And, um, all right, five minutes to the top of the hour. Oh, my God. Uh, Got more people watching now. For some reason, they returned just to hear my, just to hear me drone. (laughs) Oh, my God. Uh, so, basically... Stoltenberg was saying that the NATO alliance is keeping an eye on the Sino-Slavic Synaxis as they coordinate more closely militarily, and he emphasized they're operating more together. They have more exercises together. Just a few days ago, and they had a joint naval exercise with also Iran. So, of course, this is something we follow and monitor. Now, understand that when, you know, uh, empires exercise together, this isn't like a couple doing, like, exercises together, just trying to motivate each other. Well, it's kind of like that. But um, they're learning to coordinate in the field so that the Russian and Kamu Chinese armies can operate together in the field, which uh, shows you the gravity of the situation. They're operating as a military alliance so they can coordinate command, a combined arms, uh, combined command, uh, a united front. So um, the Baltic leaders, of course, they're showing a common front of their own on energy security. So NATO's Baltic members have gas reserves and a liquid natural gas terminal all their own, uh, making them resilient to any potential shutoff of supplies by the Russian Empire. The Latvian Prime Minister, uh, Krisienis uh, Karins, uh, at a press conference with his Estonian and Lithuanian counterparts, 
Uh, those three prime ministers discussed energy security at their meeting in Riga, the Latvian capital. And the Estonian prime minister, uh, Kaja Kalas, said she wasn't convinced Russia would hold off using gas supplies as a weapon. And um, also, Russia's starting to be, well, they're funneling fuel, hardware, and drones to Donbass. This is confirmed by Kiev, the capital of Ukraine. Uh, the Ukrainian intelligence services indicated that Russia continues to supply Kremlin-backed militants, the, the insurgents, in the Donbass region, and uh, Russian military personnel in that separatist-controlled areas uh, in the eastern Donbass uh, and uh, Russian authorities dispatched some 9,000 tons of fuel, several tanks, armored vehicles, self-propelled artillery units, Russian-made drones, and other weapons by rail and road to Donetsk and Luhansk on Ukraine's eastern border. Uh, the United Kingdom is backing American claims of this fake video attempt by the Russians. The United Kingdom Prime Minister, Bojo the Clown, I'm sorry, Boris Johnson, his office, saying that American claims that Russia plans to make a graphic video of a Ukrainian attack to justify an invasion were credible, extremely concerning. Uh, the Bojo, or, you know, Boris Johnson spokesman, Max Blaine, he told reporters uh, that we've conducted our own analysis on this intelligence and share the United States' conclusion. Uh, the UK is considering options for further military deployments to support NATO's eastern flank. So glad that the British are into this. And, uh, you know, eventually United Kingdom, when they lose Scotland and Northern Ireland, uh, when Ireland unites and the British lose Scotland, and ultimately perhaps even Wales, and the Isle of Man, uh, the term United Kingdom will ultimately come to refer uh, to the unification of Britain and Norway and Morocco as a United Kingdom because those nations also have their own kings, constitutional monarchies that will unite in a triune crown or United Kingdom with England. The title will be maintained the flag can be rearranged, uh, so you have kind of a similar effect to, you know, the uh, cross upon a cross we've got now, but uh, changed a little bit more. Uh, the British are going to uh, be glad that they've got so many Muslims at that point so they can coordinate with the Islamic world. <sighs> and I um, guess I could go into that if you really want to hear my vision of the future about how the world is going to divide rather than just hear the current, you know, skinny on all the shit in the world that's going to shit. I can tell you about um, my vision for a more hopeful future or the future that I feel is almost inevitable and one that I think will be uh, far more conducive uh, to, uh, well, uh, constructive uh, competition. Honestly, what we're going to have is basically a kind of, uh, if I were to look at our world powers and uh, we're going to be losing parts of the United States, we're going to, all of the former allied nations are going to be essentially dismantling. Dismantling in a matter that in a manner that changes their shape completely. Uh, all of the former allied nations are just, they're composited. They're composited and their components are ready to split, so to speak. Ready to secede. In the hours we have remaining, let me share my vision of where this is ultimately going. Certainly, this will be the end result of the next American Civil War and the next Great World War, in which America may be a front. But what will arrive out of it will be a renewed, reconstituted, single-party state 
democratic America, a the very term Gotterdammerung meant twilight of the gods. Gottermorgendammerung means the dawning of the gods. A democratic party that's heavily influenced as I foresee it by fascism with the human face, meaning certainly adapted to the new millennium, one based on uniting our many ethnicities and religions in democratic America would be truly a dawning of gods, a gutter Morgan democratic can America, a core of Canada and America together. This, of course, would be the basis for a capital socialist empire based on a kind of corporate community socialism where corporations, well, we would all be the shareholders and stockholders in major corporations that would then serve the social good. That would be something that maintains a true balance of where we can take our civilization. You would simply kind of refer to the supraculture. This would be spelled S-U-P-R-A-K-U-L-T-U-R, a supraculture, the German word of culture there, to imply a kind of, well, a pervasive impact of cultural influence. And it would be interdependent, multicultural, multi-ethnic, all united by a super, or rather, supra-culture. Supra-culture. You can look up the term supranational, S-U-P-R-A, national, as opposed to S-U-P-E-R, and there's a difference. You can understand, then, what I mean by supra-culture. And uh, so what we would have would be a core America, which would be the Great Lakes region, core of America and Canada, uh, with, of course, an outlet to the Pacific through the continental United States, but that outlet being more towards the Los Angeles area uh, and uh, San Diego area. Really, uh, much of California would probably still be under uh, American influence, very much so. But uh, in a sense, the Native American nations would occupy most of the Northwest, the First Nations of Canada, the large tracts of uh, reservation land in, well, we'll have to clear Montana and Wyoming of, well, maybe not. Again, that would be a white settlement region, like a giant white reservation. Uh, for many of the rabid nationalists or ethno-nationalists of the white race who are not Southerners. And it could kind of contain them there with an outlet to the sea through, uh, of course, uh, well, the uh, Idaho has an outlet to the sea through uh, the Oregon River. Uh, I'm sorry, is it Oregon and Washington State? The... Uh, I'm getting punchy enough right now where I'm losing uh, track of the maps that I usually maintain in my mind. Uh, but uh, at any rate, in general, we can have a giant white reservation in the north, kind of with a, its own outlet to the sea, but one that's monitored and uh, therefore not too many weapons coming in of mass destruction amongst uh, the reemergent first person's nations that will generally surround it. Of course, uh, in the sense of Hong Kong being a uh, once a city-state like Singapore, wealthy city-states, I foresee that sort of Chinese-influenced uh, Vancouver to be like that. Uh, California will simply be a state of such entities, uh, so to speak. Not really a state anymore so much as a region of uh, micro-statelets. And uh, with that, facing the Pacific, 
Um, you would have access ultimately to Saka, Kamchatka. These would be maintained uh, because uh, they would fall into kind of that uh, Native American national uh, uh, identity, the Saka people being an indigenous people, the people of very far uh, East Siberia, Siberasia. Uh, they uh, should have a bridge connecting the land masses through the Chukchi area of uh, that far eastern tip of uh, Russia uh, should really be one with Alaska. So when you have that kind of composite, that would be combined, of course, with uh, the kind of New Zealand influence. New Zealand's on the other side of the Pacific, but uh, they have a huge Maori population. Why, they just had a Maori holiday. And uh, they've done their best to try and uh, recognize and integrate uh, the Maori culture. They're really part of a new movement of indigenous awareness. They would do well united with the Native American nations of North America. And uh, so I imagine that as a trans-Pacific supraculture of white and indigenous peoples uh, living in greater harmony. Uh, of course, you can't, of course, ethnically cleanse the whites from many of these Native American nations. They would simply be more, uh, shall we say, uh, integrated under a Native American cultural spectrum, which at that point would be fairly similar to the way that nation states operate uh, today, not particularly different. After all, the uh, Native Americans pioneered federations among themselves and confederations uh, that the Americans were modeling their own uh, constitutions after. So uh, I'm talking about those Americans who arrived from across the Atlantic and saw what the Native Americans had going for them. They rather emulated their form of governance. You can look that up. That's a fact. Uh, so in terms of a, uh, a, shall we say, a kind of real Trans-Pacific Alliance, it would be core France and core America. France would be capital at Orleans. Uh, Paris would be more of a capital of the United Nations, as Gene Roddenberry envisioned. He envisioned San Francisco as Starfleet Command via the Presidio military base, but uh, the world political capital he envisioned as Paris. And, of course, uh, this core of France would be uh, united with Quebec overseas, or a core Quebec, by that I mean shorn of its many Native American aspects, which would become more of the Native American nation's cultural spectrum, spectrum I mean to say. Uh, and, of course, uh, uh, this would be something that uh, would be the core of a kind of capitalist power block, democratic, liberal, progressive, multi-ethnic, multicultural, uh, West India, and... Uh, the Allianz Pacifica, the Inc. Aztec uh, co-prosperity coast that includes Mexico and Colombia and Ecuador and Peru and Chile uh, that exists already. That would be kind of the hemispherical extension of this. Uh, this would be one super alignment, one of the four corners of the earth. I had said if it were not for that comet destroying Hopewell culture and were it not for uh, slavery overrunning the world as a economic imperative, you would have had African and uh, Native American cultural poles to kind of counter uh, Europe and Asia, uh, a four corners of the world, a hemispherical balance to human culture. We're going to be heading back to that. Of course, it would be somewhat subdivided. The uh, Japanese referred to that ultimate balance. They uh, ultimately said must come about on planet Earth would be the eight corners of the Earth manifesting. The octagon, like you see with the trigrams of uh, 
the Chinese Tao and uh, occult uh, magical methodology. Uh, you're going to have kind of eight corners of the world manifesting in a time after our next world war and after our next civil war, as well as four major hemispheres comprising two of each of those components are corners of the earth. So in terms of a subdivision, you would have more of this kind of America of democratic, uh, liberal, progressive, single party state, Democrat America that would, of course, not include uh, black America below the Mason-Dixon line. That would be more of a protectorate. And it would not include the southern white states or rather uh, geopolitical entities down south. Those would be more of a British protectorate, as Britain was want, very seriously considering, recognition of the Confederate States of America uh, during the last American Civil War, which we're still fighting today and will not be shorn of until we have this shedding of the South from Core America, where Core America can act as the protector uh, of uh, black America below the Mason-Dixon line and the British from across the Atlantic can act as the peacekeepers and protectors of the white South or the white elements of the southern states. And uh, that way we can both act as peacekeepers shoring up our protected populations. Uh, in terms of uh, the British, they had helped uh, the Seminole Indians remain independent from the United States. Again, you can look up everything I say. The Seminole Indian tribe was the only tribe that never surrendered to the United States of America. Uh, technically, legally, they're still at war with the United States. Many of them escaping into the swamps. Many escaped slaves interbred with them, and this is how uh, the swamp Indians of the Seminole uh, became, uh, well, very blackified, negrified, uh, touched by the tar brush enough where many of them look and appear black. Now, uh, in terms of what I foresee with this hemisphere, it would be the core United States, West India, the Allianz Pacifica of uh, Mexico, Colombia, uh, Ecuador, Chile, Peru, uh, and of course, uh, uh, stretching into the north, uh, a jurisdiction of a kind of uh, parkland to be made of the Kamchatka Peninsula, while of course building a canal through there to give access to Saka, the Congo of the Russian Empire, from whence they get their diamonds. Russia should be shorn of that, what's supposed to be a semi-autonomous, actually independent nation anyway. Should have been shorn of that long time ago. And, uh, of course, uh, the Chukchi Peninsula, which borders on Alaska, should belong more to the direct juris jurisdiction of the Native American nations, the First Nations of Canada, uh, uniting with those south of the Canadian border, uh, uniting several tribes that are split by borders and boundaries, uh, just as we'll be doing uh, with those in Mexico, uh, along with those in New Mexico and Arizona. These borders really need to be eliminated. Uh, the outlet to the sea for Core America will be Los Angeles and San Diego. Uh, the Los Angeles, Agris, uh, or sea outlet, mostly uh, under the jurisdiction of a very independent, more, uh, but united with core America and purpose and economy, a kind of uh, Mormon uh, America that would be our bridge to the Pacific. And uh, they're solid capitalists. Uh, they're, of course, eager to have the right to proselytize. And they had originally converted the Queen of Hawaii to Mormonism. There was going to be a Mormon Polynesian Empire. Uh, certainly, uh, there should, of course, be a retention of the uh, old uh, Pacific territories of the United States, 
that would be our bridge to ultimately Taiwan. So that's kind of one hemisphere that I imagine in this world of four major super alignments, four hemispheres, eight super alignments essentially. The other super alignment component of this hemisphere I'm imagining or envisioning would be the French dominated uh, new United Nations, something to take the place of the United Nations, something to supersede it and uh, in this new world order with the capital at Paris of effectively world administration or administration of at least uh, communications between the different polarities. Uh, and the French, of course, have a huge empire. They're one of the largest nations on earth. Nobody understands this, but all the territories are overseas anyway. So with the French uh, maintaining all of their overseas territories, as well as the core uh, of France, capital at Orleans and united with Quebec, uh, and uh, ultimately a kind of Grand Paraguay, then uh, you would have a kind of uh, transnation. By that I mean a nation that would be a supranation in and of itself. Not supranation, but supranation, meaning a kind of uh, French Foreign Legion becoming the professional peacekeepers for United Nations efforts. You'd have the United Nations as an empire in its own right with a base culture. The international language would be French uh, as the diplomatic language of the world. Uh, and of course, uh, in terms of their ability to uh, uh, basically maintain peacekeeping for the new Native American nations, the French were always the best in relations with the frontier Indians. Uh, they would intermarry with them, trade with them, unlike the British who were much more neutral and detached, and unlike the Spanish who were simply genocidal and enslaving them. Uh, the best historical relations are between the Native American nations. As I said, those would dominate the northwest of the North American continent, a good deal of all of Canada almost, uh, minus near the Great Lakes and uh, that little peninsula where the overwhelming majority, 90% of white Canadians and all other ethnicities live anyway. And uh, the rest above that parallel, uh, combined with these kind of mountain states uh, would provide the core of many different Native American nations uh, surrounding and in a sense containing a great white reservation uh, in that region and uh, they would consider themselves indigenous as well. You could call that New Vinland uh, the supermassive reservation of uh, the Aryan nations and uh, referring to the whites in that region of course and uh, then, of course, that would not be part of America. That would be, uh, well, basically kind of like uh, an autonomous state all its own. Something like uh, an independent Tibet should be, uh, basically left to their own devices. And uh, other than that, uh, uh, provided open trade to the outside world, but monitored with their outlet to the sea, uh, being controlled through uh, the city-state of Seattle, uh, Washington, uh, that would, of course, uh, prevent them from getting weapons of mass destruction from the outside world, so they wouldn't try to exterminate the rest of us. That would be where many red Republicans could, would go, along with many in the South staying where they're at, but, you know, supported, sponsored, monitored by the British. And, uh, of course, the, um, uh, the Native American nations uh, uh, basically... Uh, well, um, united along with these new transnational United Nations uh, sponsoring entity of core France with New Zealand. Both France and New Zealand are Pacific powers along with the Native American nations uh, with their supermassive uh, Pacific coastline. Uh, and of course, uh, that in itself would be kind of a sub-entity uh, the indigenous peoples that would dominate the Maori in New Zealand and the First Nations of uh, Northwest America, comprising Alaska and Canada, Alaska and the majority of Canada, what you could call Canarctica, Canarctic, uh, Canarctic Alaska, uh, this kind of uh, super entity of 
many uh, reconstituted first persons nations. This would represent with the Maori of New Zealand a new indigenous people's uh, empire, a kind of uh, uh, thousand tribes, if you will, uh, that would uh, do its best to revitalize their cultures and uh, perhaps even adapt enough foreigners where the Native American nations might change a bit physically, but uh, experience a cultural renaissance. Now, uh, in the time we have remaining while I'm thinking aloud, uh, just kind of, uh, uh, you know, I can map all this out, but uh, right now I'm just providing you a, a general outline. Uh, in terms of, uh, let's take a look at the time we have remaining here. Uh, well, I managed to eat up some time with that, and we got a bot in the chat. <laughs> I'm still retaining numbers. I don't believe how I'm doing that. I guess everybody finds what I'm saying so whacked out. They <laughs> just continuing they're listening with their jaws hitting the floor saying man he's tripping balls that's uh, some good shit he's got the good shit uh so uh well uh you know i haven't even started yet but i will after this anyhow uh in terms of the kind of power uh, across the atlantic uh we would have more of a uh a trade rival all its own uh, this would be the co-regnum, um, a, co a co-regnal federation, uh, meaning the constitutional crowns of Europe would be reconstituted, reconstituted under a democratic, uh, federative, uh, socialist network of nations, uh, something that actually brings cultural identification back to uh, the transnational entity of European Union, which will, of course, dissolve at that point and be replaced by more of a Holy Roman Empire confederation uh, that uh, will be centered, obviously, on Germany, uh, a kind of Kaiser collective. And uh, between uh, that, of course, uh, well, this side of the Atlantic, Americans will have their own Israel, a kind of Long Island, that will be uh, very much a kind of Jewish cultural enclave. Uh, I think that that um, is something that would um, help immensely with, uh, in terms of uh, what we would have here, along with a kind of Mormon empire in the heartland, or, you know, little west of the heartland there, uh, kind of the frontier before you hit California. Uh, of course, I don't know what um, we would do about Nevada, but, um, you know, believe it or not, probably if that were under Mormon influence, they would just keep it operating the way it's operating now and just take advantage of it to proselytize people there to gamble. I'm not saying that's the way it should work, but just thinking aloud. In terms of the other side of the Atlantic, of course, North Israel would be united with a new Warsaw Pact centered on Germany, centered on Berlin, uh, combined with Poland and uh, Belarus and Ukraine and all of the Balkan satellite states, inclusive of Greece, all the way down to uh, Cyprus or the southern half of the island, which is still independent. And uh, obviously... Um, uh, this is something that, uh, well, that along with Boer Africa, a white Africa split off from South Africa. So the Boers, the Dutch-speaking Boers, can maintain their cultural integrity with South Africa and freefall and head it towards inevitable collapse. And uh, that will be maintained uh, with German sponsorship, uh, along with North Israel, which will be the progressive liberal Israel, as opposed to the reactionary fundamentalist Israel down south, which will be probably reconstituted as Judah. Uh, then um, in between the demilitarized zone would be that bridge between, uh, well, uh, the West Bank and Jordan, the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. So uh, in terms of... Uh, the Jordan, that would simply be part of the Arab collective of nations that all send their sheikhs to be trained at Sandhurst in England anyway. Uh, so uh, that won't be part of the uh, German realm of influence. Uh, rather, the uh, new Holy Roman Empire, uh, based on the First Reich of Germany, albeit less 
religiously oriented uh, that would, of course, integrate what is today the uh, economic alliance of communism in Alba. By the way, just to give you an example of why that makes logical sense, Germany is, of course, home to Karl Marx Stadt, the city of Karl Marx. And uh, in case you didn't know, the communist Chinese go there on pilgrimage to visit the birthplace of Karl Marx. And the Red Prussian, of course, is uh, honored in East, Eastern Germany. And in Cuba, uh, they only recognize East Germany. So there would be enough of a kind of East Germanic influence from the days of communism. They could easily recognize Transnistria, the enclave of the Soviet government in exile. For those of you who don't know, Transnistria borders uh, Moldova and is essentially a Soviet state, the, the remnant of the Soviet Union. It, it could be recognized by Germany as the legal government of former Russia. And that would be their checkmate to Vladimir Putin and his expansion. And, of course, uh, at that point, oh, Jameson Reese says he'll be right back. Yeah, that's, he just woke up and had to pee. <laughs> I'm sorry. Don't mean to be so vicious. Uh, and, you know, you go to Cuba and they still have towels that say East Germany and shit in their beach hotels because they refuse to recognize Germany. They only recognize Eastern Germany. So Cuba dominates its own colonial system called ALBA, A-L-B-A. You'd have to look that up as ALBA Economic Alliance or ALBA Communism or, you know, that includes Venezuela and uh, Bolivia and uh, these uh, very um, communized nations of Latin America, several Caribbean islands, uh, Nicaragua, where the Germans could build a Panama, their own Panama through, their own uh, canal. So Nicaragua, Cuba, the Cuban Empire of Alba would be integrated into the new Warsaw Pact. And uh, that would counterbalance the British influence in the Caribbean with their sponsorship of the southern white states. And, uh, of course, uh, this new Warsaw Pact would... Uh, basically be uh, one component or one other corner united ultimately as a hemisphere uh, with uh, the Roman Catholic Church, which can easily regain its dominance in uh, as a world power with the collapse of Italy. And uh, honestly, they could just really purchase the entire peninsula outright with the money that they have in the Vatican coffers and just kind of buy uh, the peninsula from the government and reconstitute the papal states. And uh, once they do that, they can consecrate the army. And that would again be the first crusading force they've had in Europe in hundreds of years. They could reunite with Ossetania uh, the um, uh, southern France and uh, the former home of the Cathar heresy and of course uh, from that a land bridge into Iberia or Cor Hispania uh, Spain you see and Britain are destined for war because of the well because of Gibraltar and it's a war that uh, the British would likely win because they are a nuclear power and would probably employ some tactical nukes and uh, not only uh, retain Gibraltar, they would unite with, uh, well, Morocco because Morocco wants uh, the parts of Spain that are in Morocco, the most heavily security fortified borders of Europe are in Morocco where Spain retains uh, their lands, in case you didn't know. And so if we take a look at Spain in uh, Morocco here, uh, that would be, of course, uh, the protectorates of... Uh, oh, God, what's the, the names again? How do I forget these things? You know, normally I'm, uh, you know, just 
geography, geopolitics, it's my thing, right? But what the fuck? You know, I've been dealing with so much. Here we are. Uh, this is, of course, Sweta and Malila. Sweta spelled C-E-U-T-A. Malila spelled M-E-L-I-L-L-A. And Sweta and Malila are the two most heavily fortified uh, borders of Europe in Morocco. Morocco wants them back. Uh, in terms of um, Spain, of course, it also suffers from a uh, danger of uh, a secession. And its uh, secession states could include southern Spain, where they speak a far more... Andalusia. Andalusia would be... Um, liberated by Britain, so to speak, so they can maintain true control over Gibraltar and Catalonia by Britain uh, helping them and the Basques. Uh, Spain can be pretty much sundered, but core Spain would be, of course, reachable uh, to uh, uh, the, well, something that could connect via a terrestrial land bridge Kind of like the way that Putin aims to try and connect with Transnistria by taking all the coastal areas of Ukraine and thereby retaining total control of Crimea, his idea of Gibraltar. Uh, the British would uh, have what they get out of Spain. The Spain Spanish would reunite, uh, well, unite with Occitania of southern France and connect thereby to the Italian peninsula. Uh, of course, there'd be that tiny land bridge that would be the strip of land between Italy and, uh, uh, you know, that goes right into uh, Monaco, the little kingdom thereof. Uh, that could retain its independent status, obviously, uh, and uh, for obvious reasons. But, uh, okay, let's see what time we have left while I'm redividing the world out loud. Uh, half an hour left. Unbelievable. I could go on doing this. I guess I'm ha I'll have to. <laughs> and, um, but um, so uh, Britain has a ready ally in Morocco. Uh, the Arabs, as I said, the sheikhs of Sandhurst would ally with Britannia if it plays its cards right. Uh, they could retain as a, a part of their United Kingdom, the kingdom of Judah. Hell, the people in Judah are so fundamentalist, they could probably coronate their own king. As a matter of fact, just coronate uh, Rothschild as the king of southern Israel. That could be a kingdom, and therefore part of the United Kingdom. And uh, Rothschild uh, helped to establish the original state of Israel. Um, certainly one of his descendants would be willing to be coronated as the king of Judah. That would uh, be uh, along with the many Arab statelets whose sheikhs are trained at Sandhurst, uh, all under a unification with uh, Britain, uh, particularly based on its uh, uh, Moroccan, uh, uh, Andalusian, and uh, uh, you know, Catalan core into the Mediterranean. Uh, then the United Kingdom would kind of have a a chain through the Mediterranean that they would maintain. Of course, they've never annexed or accepted Malta into the Commonwealth or the United Kingdom. So um, basically, they wouldn't even need to connect through the Mediterranean. There's other aspects that uh, would connect them. Let me see what I can find here with Andalusia, just to make sure I've got my geography right for southern Spain. Yes, Andalusia it would probably be severed off from Spain by a British war over Gibraltar, providing the British total security for Gibraltar on one side, with their alliance with Morocco as part of the United Kingdom. British civilization would re-emerge in Gibraltar. It would re-emerge around a Gibraltar dam and bridge that they could then build to connect Europe and Africa. At that point, enormous amounts of power, hydroelectric power, would make them one of the wealthiest nations on earth. And uh, Britain would have its empire back. Uh, they would, of course, uh, unite with uh, probably the worst elements that we're combating now. Uh, first off, they would unite with Norway easily because Norway is not part of European Union. And since Norway is not part of European Union, Britain would create its own new NATO. Its North Atlantic Treaty Organization would uh, it would center on uh, well a colonial collective 
uh, NATO II, a MACTO, Mediterranean Atlantic Caribbean Treaty Organization. The MACTO would be Core Britannia, sands all of its Celtic fringe, meaning Wales and uh, Isle of Man and uh, Scotland. And of course, I Ireland being reunified would not be a part of it. All of those elements want to be remain part of European Union. Uh, rather, Britannia's new United Kingdom would be based on Norway, Portugal, which has its own king, Catalonia, Magrebia, South Israel, as I said, coronate uh, Rothschild, a Rothschild. Uh, they all have royal titles, in case you didn't fucking know. They're barons uh, by dint of their investments in the British Empire over the centuries. Uh, and, of course, uh, Britain's Caribbean possessions and Dixieland, the white southern states, along with Russia and Ifriqiya. This would be the new NATO, the MACTO that would surround and contain uh, the new Warsaw Pact, comprising Germania and uh, Poland, the Baltic nations, the Baltic littoral of Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, White Russia, Belarus, and Ukraine, uh, along with Greece and uh, southern Cyprus. Uh, now, in terms of uh, this... Uh, Confederale, along with a Karaj, a kind of collection of Arab states, uh, ethno-Arab states, Arabic-speaking states, uh, not all of Islam, uh, but uh, those uniting with uh, quite easily with southern uh, Israel or Judah because of Britain's intervention overall. Uh, this would be, well, along with that, Thailand, an independent uh, kingdom. Uh, Britain could help to build a Croix Canal and thereby uh, perhaps retain some influence in Singapore, but that would likely fall uh, more into Chinese orbit of uh, the new kind of China, post-communist. But uh, in terms of uh, the uh, core British alliance, don't forget that Karl Marx died in England and his bust, which is enormous because the size of his head was swollen along with his ego by the time he died, Karl Marx was financed out of London, responsible for the spread of communism uh, out of London, and therefore Britain has every right to probably unite with the Maoists in India, who will come to dominate East India in South Asia. You can look up the Nazalite Revolution in India. Just look up Nazalite India, N-A-X-A-L-I-T-E, and you'll see what East India I'm talking about. That with Iran, that they can sponsor uh, the victory of the Mujahideen, uh, El Halka, which is more Marxian socialist. Uh, anything would be better than the Mulocrats they've got in Iran now, but a red Iran combined with uh, an East Indian South Asia, uh, combined within the British uh, cultural matrix. There's British Empire reconstituted with a new ideology uh, based on their own Marxian interpretation that uh, kind of like their kingdom would be a people's serenity, meaning a people's empress, so to speak. Uh, their queen would be recognized by the collectivist peoples in their empire as a kind of a protector in the way that the British used to claim to be the protectors of Islam. Uh, that, of course, uh, they would uh, maintain in alliance with uh, what Australia is becoming, a casto Slovakracy, importing the overwhelming majority of its migrants to do all of the scut work and ultimately uh, replacing the old colonial powers of Spain and America and the Philippines as white overlords. By the way, I don't say this because uh, the Filipinos are incapable of self-governance or something. It's rather that the Filipinos don't seem to want self-governance. They are forever seeking uh, a kind of external empire with which to maintain 
some level of sponsorship thereby, somebody who can supply them with a kind of um, leg up in everything they do to simply maintain the infrastructure of civilization. And that would be another hemisphere where they interculturally, a kind of serfdom. By the way, serfs have more rights than slaves. You're talking about more like a subordinate middle class, if you will, uh, conducting all of the auxiliary work with, uh, the, with the Australians literally running the plantations because the Filipinos have a plantation economy that would bring one of the largest archipelagos in the world under Australian control, something they could handle easily. They would be the officer class of a massive Australian military force that would comprise as its infantry uh, Filipinos uh, by the millions. Uh, that's something that is quite easily possible and that would provide them all the labor that they need uh, labor would become a thing of the past for your average Australian. And uh, the quality of life for Filipinos could only improve. Uh, dare I say it, are they incapable of self-governance? Well, yes, <laughs> they're incapable of self-governance. Your honest Pinoy will tell you that. Uh, ergo, a... Australian, it has a Macronesian empire as opposed to Micronesian. Uh, and of course, uh, their support would be for a kind of South Brazil, a white Brazil separate from the black and uh, hybrid North Brazil that is evolving in the Brazilian Civil War. Uh, by the way, in case you didn't know it, the Confederate government reestablished in Brazil after the fall of the Confederacy. You can look this up. Jimmy Carter, a Baptist Southerner, went down to visit the Confederados in Brazil. Everything you read will tell you, oh, they have no influence in Brazilian politics. They're just like uh, an exclave. They're an exclave. Uh, it doesn't matter that they don't have any influence in Brazilian politics. Now, they're an exclave of Confederates flying the Confederate States flag in Brazil. And uh, they're tolerated because Brazil is in the South, the area that they're in, white supremacist. Break the blacks in the North from the whites in the South in Brazil. And the white Brazilians of the South will maintain their Japanese middle class. The largest Japanese population in the world outside of Japan is in Brazil. They do all of the work, uh, the science research and uh, uh, thinking, and the whites, you know, just like the blacks, spend all day partying when the whites aren't hunting down blacks and killing them. Or the blacks aren't killing each other up north. Uh, anyhow, it's... Um, uh, the blacks, of course, would be with the indigenous population of Amazonia in the north. The white Brazilians would lose Amazon... Well, they deserve to lose the Amazon. They can't do shit with it other than sponsor tearing it down and filling it up with cattle ranges. So fuck them. So they would be united more with the white supremacists of Australia, which is effectively a white supremacist nation state anyway. And uh, you would have this white world order, essentially, that would be this other hemisphere. Of course, they could be united with uh, basically... Uh, the, well, I foresee a kind of return to a Marcus Garvey movement in terms of some blacks, black Muslims, reestablishing themselves back in Africa in the Saharan region, uh, the southern Algerian region, separated from the coast but open to the sea through Dakar. That would be something that, uh, could easily be sponsored, armed, supplied by the Americans, and uh, would ultimately be, as the black Muslims are black supremacists, uh, they're also, by the way, heavily influenced by Scientology. It would kind of realize L. Ron Hubbard's vision of what he was kind of imagining as an empire in uh, the Sahara, only blackified. And... Uh, 
That may sound far-fetched now, but how else would the black Muslim state continue to exist? They're too extremist and black supremacist to maintain in the United States when you have more liberal blacks down south who would be sponsored by liberal America up north. Yeah, by the way, Jameson Reese, how to, he asks, how the fuck does that work? This concept of black supremacy and exclusivity is what I assume he's referencing. Yes. Uh, yeah, it's a, they, they believe. Well, but, well, yeah. no, what are you well more or less with Scientology. How, oh, yeah. How did, oh, God, you wouldn't believe it. They, they use it to brain. What, what, I, yeah, yeah, let's use the term basically to brainwash their members they basically see what scientology when our man um peter moon talks about say for instance auditing he'll use the term auditing that's a scientology term what that really is is using a polygraph machine a lie detector which just is using galvanic response i talked about galvini when i talked about frankenstein and tambora galvini invented the lie detector the polygraph because you start sweating more when you lie unless you're psychotic psychotics can lie without sweating but if you're an average person and you have some figment of a conscience you sweat when you lie so the lie detector is used by scientologists to really break a person down like are you gay no oh you're sweating you're really gay you know something like that it's just whatever you're lying about they dig out they expose they break you down and then ultimately this auditing clears you ultimately it clears you of your lies to yourself that's the idea this is what the black muslims use scientology for basically this auditing technique of using the lie detector so that there's no secrets nobody has any secrets if you've got no secrets you're a member of a collective you've got nothing to hide get the logic that's that's insane well okay <laughs> i think i have that no you may not want to live like that but you get the logic of what I'm saying. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, that yeah, that's that's no different than uh, the socialism of the uh, Marxists and shit. Actually, it's worse. <laughs> but uh, in some ways, yeah, the Marxists are worse because it's it's just worse in many ways. But uh, uh, you know, it is what it is. You know, people grow up in that; they don't know anything else. Uh, you know, and by the way, all the black Muslims, they believe that whites are like this monstrous leprosy, which by the way, Peter Moon, that's his belief is that whites are like a product of this kind of mad scientist. He leans towards that. He leans towards that because of oh, all his contacts with the Moors. Yeah. That yeah. shit with Yaku and all. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh? And, huh? Yeah. All right. Yeah. It, it's, why am I not surprised? Yeah, Ugh. yeah. Well. And uh, so uh, in the 10 minutes we have remaining, glad you could wake up and join us. And, uh, you know, uh, I was giving people my concept of these four hemispheres. The other hemisphere would, of course, be Asian, uh, a Sino-Japanese uh, axis. And uh, that would be that other quarter of the earth. So you would have what I've described with the indigenous populations, kind of united nations uh, under a French superculture, uh, French as the language of diplomacy, uh, the uh, French Foreign Legion as an international peacekeeping force, vastly expanded to include mercenaries. It's a mercenary force from all over the world uh, for peacekeeping operations. Uh, and uh, Whoa, of all people, the French for peacekeeping. <laughs> That yeah, is, yeah, just, that's I, hilarious. <laughs> Holy shit. Okay. <laughs> that is, it's, look, all of this has shortcomings. Historically, all of these cultures have their faults, right? I mean... No shit. <laughs> no. No shit. Well, uh, I, I think I'll just do my happy way of trying to get my way over to wherever the J Japanese have their power and say, fuck everything else. Yes, yes. And Japan, this, yes. There we are. I, I, I really don't see anything here in in the states getting any better i'm sure well i'm sure there's future evidence to support that so yeah i mean well hey it can only get better there's no place we can go but up well it'll go down first in terms of quality of life with the civil war and shit but anyhow yeah you know. yeah uh and you know all we need is like supplies uh, supply shortage like you know what's going on in the uk and oof. There we are. Yeah. And and for this fourth hemisphere of the Asians, a commercial spear, uh, a kogunit established over Beijing. Beijing, of course, is uh, one of the largest cities in the world. 
uh, I imagine that becoming more Japanized, a kind of Japanese resettlement on the mainland, uh, and uh, that would help to decommunize the mainland completely. Uh, the Chinese capital would move to Kunming, where Chiang Kai-shek was going to relocate it, and that would unite it with uh, in the region of Vietnam, and that would be a Sinoviet Union, both uh, Sinitic races and uh, speaking Sinic languages. The Vietnamese could take back on uh, a calligraphic uh, writing style rather than using this horrible English alphabet that they're using now in Vietnam, which is just communist bullshit. And <laughs> yes, they could become the new dynasty over China. Uh, China has lived under foreign dynasties historically. I would imagine a Vietnamese dynasty after China's uh, population collapse due to its dis catastrophic, cataclysmic, apocalyptic one-child policy. Uh, and, of course, the Japanese would take all of Mongolia and the Soviet Central Asiatic Republics all the way to Turkey, a kind of Turco-Mongolica that would bring the Japanese to the Mediterranean. They would ally with uh, the United Celtic Nations of Ireland and Wales and Scotland and uh, uh, Brittany of France and uh, Basque land. And uh, that would be uh, along with Newfoundland and uh, New England. Uh, this would be a kind of, shall we say, uh, a transatlantic uh, uh, white world order that the Japanese could align with uh, to uh, connect to the, to the Atlantic, from the Atlantic to the Pacific through uh, their um, extensions in the world. Of course, they would have an outlet to the Indian Ocean through uh, Baluchistan, uh, which is not independent yet, but uh, always wanted to be. And uh, Baluchistan is currently divided between Afghanistan and Pakistan. Uh, but, oh my God, probably time for us to close stream in a few minutes. Yeah, yeah, we got two. Yes. And, uh, oh, what was that sound? Two messages coming in? Or what was that? No, no, two two minutes, I think. Oh, okay. No, no, it's about three or four. Uh, I did get some incoming messages. Let's see what they were over here, uh, what we're getting on Facebook. Okay, just some uh, further uh, tags and the like. 